Wait, nothing. I said you were nuts, crazy. And no, no, don't. I'm sorry, Hook. Very sorry, but I had to have it. I'm going to have it. And once you're dead, you'll never miss it. Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest, and our strength. At its lowest ebb, midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Dead Hand. of terror and retribution by one of radio's best-known mystery writers, Robert Newman. Its title, The Dead Hand. The small studio cottage on Dr. Martin Trent's estate, seated at the piano, alone in the gathering darkness, is Roger Blaine, the famous pianist, and playing as only he can play. Can't you hear me, Lorna? You must hear me. You must come here now to me. I'm calling you, Lorna. Calling to you in a way you could never resist. With my music. Making your heart beat faster. Your breath come quicker. Lorna. Hello, Roger. Am I disturbing you? Always, Lorna. Just as I disturb you. As we disturbed each other since the first time we met. Martin's out at the hospital, and I heard you playing, so... That's not why you came, Lorna. You came because I called you. Because you promised you'd come and give me your answer. What we talked about last night, my going away with you? Roger, I I must have been mad. I I don't know what got into me. Don't you, Lorna? This is what got into you. My music. Telling you things I never could tell you in words. Roger, stop. I I can't think when you're playing like that. I, I can't leave him. He's my husband. I love him. Respect love. him. Can you love a surgical instrument? Can you compare what you feel towards him with what you feel to now, this minute? No. No, it is different. Roger, how can we? He's your friend. It was he that brought you here, gave you the cottage. And haven't I given him anything? Music like this... Music such as no one has ever heard before. Roger, I... Lorna, listen to me. To what I'm saying here. I love you. I need you. It was you who helped me find depths within myself I never knew existed. You've got no. to come away with me. You owe it to me. To yourself. To the world. Roger, you please. You want to. You know you want to. And you're going to. Roger, no, I... I, going I can't, to... I tell you, you are. I... You are. All right. We can talk to Martin when he gets home tonight. Tell him. I, I think he'll No, Lorna, there'll be no talking, no explaining. My car's outside and we're leaving right now. The music, my music, was still with me as we drove out through the gates, down the highway, 
pulsing, throbbing. Yes, I could hear it, but could Lorna? I glanced at her sitting there beside me. Happy, dearest? What? I, I don't know, Roger. You don't know? Don't you realize what this means, Lorna? I'm playing better than I ever played before, and this is only the beginning. After my New York concert, South America, then Europe. Roger, are you sure you love me? Me as a person? My sure. Well, what do you mean, Lorna? I know you've said you do, but whenever you've talked about it, Roger, ab- about us, you've talked in terms of your music. Roger, are you sure that's not what you love? Well, of course I'm sure. If I didn't have my music, if I couldn't play, I don't think I could live. But I know. it was you. You who lifted me to heights I never dreamed of, technically, emotionally. Roger, stop the car. Turn around take me back. What? Take me back. I don't understand. I do, for the first time. With Martin away so much, I was lonely, flattered by your attention. And your music was like a drug, keeping me from thinking. But now I can think. And I know you don't love me, and I don't love you, so... Please, Roger, take me back. No. But, Roger, can't you see? This whole thing was a mistake. It was not a mistake. And I won't take you back. Well, I'm going back, whether you take me or not. And if you won't stop the car... No, no, let go of that brake. Let go of that That did look out. We're going to... When I opened my eyes, I was in a bare white room in a hospital. Standing next to the bed, Lorna... And Martin. Hello, Roger. How are you feeling? What? Well, I... I don't know. What happened? You were out driving with Lorna. The car got out of control and you had a smash-up. They rushed you here to the hospital and... Smash well, you've up. been here for two days. Smash-up? Yes, I remember. Are you all right, Lorna? Yes, Roger. I was shaken up. Come oh. a little bit. Oh, my hand hurts. Especially the fingers. Nothing happened to it, did it, Martin? I've got a concert in a few weeks, you know. Roger, don't stop it. What? What? Why are you looking at me like that? Oh, I... Don't worry about it, Roger. Not now. But I've got to know. I've got to see... Roger, please! (laughs) Go My hand. My left hand. Martin. What did you do to me? Roger, I think you know how I feel about you. About your music. You've got to believe me when I tell you there was nothing I could do about it. Nothing. It was your hand or your life. My life. And what is my life without my music? Nothing. Worse than nothing. A living death. Why didn't you let me die? Don't say that, Roger. We'll do anything we can. There must be something. Something. There's just one thing. You've got to get me another hand. We will, Roger. There have been some wonderful developments in prosthetics as a result of the war. I don't mean an artificial hand. I mean a real hand. What? Roger, you're mad. No, no, I'm not. You took my hand and you'll get me another one. We'll talk about it some other time. You think I'll forget about it, don't you? Don't you? Oh, and I won't. I say I'm going to have another hand, and I will have one. And what's more, you're going to help me get it. You're here. You're going to help me. I was able to get up and around a few days later. I didn't talk to anyone if I could help it. Because somehow I couldn't ever look at their faces, only their hands. Big hands and little ones, long-fingered ones and stubby ones. Yes. They each had two hands. And I, I to whom my piano meant more than life, had only one. Then, sitting alone one evening, I met Hook. I looked up, and there he was, a small, slight, sharp-featured man. Hello. Nice evening. Yes. I suppose it is. Hey, you mind if I sit down for a couple of minutes? No. I uh, wouldn't usually bust in on anybody except... Well, I'm getting out of here tomorrow, and I feel pretty good about it. Oh? What was wrong with you? A bad heart. I'm going to have to take it easy from now on. It's going to make it kind of tough in some ways, but... 
Uh, you don't happen to have a cigarette on you, do you? No. Oh, yes, I do have. It's uh, there. Well, at least I did have a silver cigarette case. I can't see. Is uh, fine. This it? What? Oh yeah. Where did you find it? In your pocket. You, you mean you, you took it? Uh, my name's Harris, Joe Harris. You usually call me the hook. Uh, oh. This is my racket. Or you rather, it was until I... Your pickpocket. <laughs> well, one of the best in the business. But now with my ticket going bad, I guess I'll have to lay off, except like now for a gag. <laughs> you didn't mind, did you? <laughs> well, certainly not. I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, do you mind if I look at your hands? Look at them? What for? Beautiful. As beautiful a pair of hands as I've ever seen. It occurs to me that you... You say that you don't know what you're going to do when you leave the hospital here. Well, I just hadn't thought about it much. Why? I've got a proposition that might... It just might possibly interest you. No kidding. Why? Well, I'd rather not discuss it with you here and now, but I expect to be leaving here myself on Friday. If you'd like to come and see me sometime after You that, say where and when? Well, I've been staying at a little cottage on Dr. Martin Trent's estate. I'll probably be going back there. How about uh, Saturday night? Late, around 11.30. Fine. Okay with me. Then it's a date. I left him there, hurried back to my room. I wanted to be alone. Had to be alone, for I was afraid that what was on my mind might show in my face. It certainly was a date. A date with death. A man obsessed, half mad and his unsuspecting victim. Will both of them still be alive to hear it when the clock strikes 12 for... Murder at Midnight. Roger Blaine to continue Murder at Midnight. I did leave the hospital on Friday, went back to the little studio cottage. By Saturday night, my arrangements were completed. They weren't very complicated. I made it clear to Lorna and Martin that I wanted to be alone, and I picked up a length of iron pipe. The pipe I hid inside the piano when I heard footsteps coming down the path. There was a knock on the door. Come in. Hi. Uh, not too late, am I? No, you're not too late. Hey, pretty nice place you got here. Yes, it is quite nice. Sit down. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Now, what's this here proposition you want to talk to me about? It's a very simple one. How would you like to make $10,000? <whistles> what do I have to do? You don't have to do anything. Just <laughs> sell me something. Your left hand. What? <laughs> Are you nuts? No, I'm serious. I've got the money right here in cash. Oh, I, I don't, I don't get it. I just don't understand. Look, I'm a musician. I'm a pianist, or I was until I lost my hand. If I can't go on playing, then life doesn't mean anything to me, my own life or anyone else's. But you, how important is your hand to you now? An artificial one will do almost as well, and you can live for quite a while on ten thousand dollars. You mean you really thought I'd sell you my hand? Let you cut it off? I'm getting out of here. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, nothing. I said you was nuts, but I didn't really think... Oh, what are you going to do with that? No. No, don't you can't. <laughs> Some way. Somehow I'll get you with this. I swear. I'm sorry, Hook. Very Sorry. But I have to have it. I... 
rather not go into what happened after that. I... I got rid of the body. And then I went to see Martin. You don't look well, Roger. Anything the matter? No, I just came to see you about your promise. My promise? Oh, your debt, whichever you choose to call it. I told you I wanted another hand, that I was going to get another hand, and that you were going to help me. Well, now you can help me. What? What do you mean? Look in here, in this package. See? Good, Good Lord. Where, where did you get this? It might be better if you didn't ask too many questions. I'm fighting for my life, for more than my life. You took my hand away from me. Well, now you can give me this one. You mean you honestly, seriously think that I can perform an operation of this sort, do a graft, and that after I'm finished, you'll be able to use the hand? Why not? Operations of this sort have been done, haven't they? With other parts of the body? The eye? The cornea, not the eye. And some nerve grafting has been done. But this... Look, Roger. I know what a shock this whole thing has been to you. Know it better than you. You're, you're not a well man. <laughs> a well man? I'm only half alive, and I'd rather be dead than go on living this way. But if I do die, I won't die alone. That's why I brought this along. Roger. Roger. Got Quick, easy, painless. If you won't do what I want, you die. And so does Lorna. Both of you, along with me. You, you don't give me very much choice. No. All right. You win. Get me the hospital. Even before I became fully conscious, before I opened my eyes, I knew, knew that it had been done, that it wasn't his hand anymore, but mine. And still, there was something wrong. I couldn't analyze what it was at first, but it was there. A feeling that something wasn't quite right. That perhaps... It wasn't entirely my hand. I sat up. The hand was a mass of bandages, stiffened with splints. And inside the bandages... Careful, Roger. Don't touch them. Huh? Oh, Martin, I didn't see you. I've been here with you ever since last night. Last night? You mean I... I've been out that long, 24 hours? It was very important that you keep quiet. You've been under sedation. Oh, oh yes, of course. But this isn't the hospital. No, I brought you home with me, back to the house. Oh. I thought it would be best for several reasons. Oh, that's very smart, Martin. We don't want any questions, do we? Not yet. You did do it, didn't you? What? Uh, oh, uh, oh yes. I knew you would and could. And it's going to work. It is working. I can feel it. Please, Roger. You must be careful with that bandage. Hmm? You can't touch it, move it, disturb it in any way. I won't, Martin. But I don't have to. I tell you, I can feel the fingers moving, even inside this. And in another week or so... We'll see. Yes. We'll see. Got a cigarette, Martin? Of course, I have it right. <laughs> That's funny. Hmm? What is it? My cigarette case. It was right here in my breast pocket. I... I must have left it downstairs with the hospital. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I can do it without. Martin. Yes? I... I think... Here. This here. Here it is. Under my pillow. What? How did it get there? I don't know. It must have fallen out when you bent over. But... No... Why are you looking like that? Because I think I know how it did get under my pillow. What do you mean? When fingers learn something, a special skill, they don't forget it, ever. Mine never have. Even when I'm not thinking of what I'm doing, they go on playing by themselves. These fingers here, they haven't forgotten either. You understand? I'm afraid I forget it. I'm awfully tired all of a sudden, Martin. Would you mind? No, Roger. I'd like you to get as much rest as possible. There's a friend of mine coming here tomorrow to see you. Another doctor. That's fine, Martin. I'll see you in the morning. (laughs) 
Yes, I was tired, but that wasn't why I asked Martin to go. I did it because I wanted to be alone, because I had to be alone. Because I knew now what it was that I'd only sensed before. The hand, Hook's hand, had a will of its own. It had picked Martin's pocket without my even being aware of it. I lay there alone in the darkness after Martin went, not touching the bandages, but flexing the fingers, forcing them to obey my will. I had to do that. I knew I had to do it because I suspected what might happen. And what did happen proved that I was right. I fell asleep finally. And while I was asleep, I dreamed. I dreamed I was walking down a dark, labyrinthine corridor somewhere under the earth. Then... A little closer, Roger. Huh? Just a little closer. Who's there? Who's there? Just me. Waiting for you. Hook! Yeah, Hook. I said I'd get you. In the well... Out of the darkness came a hand that clutched me by the throat, gripped it tighter, tighter, tighter. I fought against it. I tried to scream and woke up. Yes, I woke up. And my waking was more horrible than the dream, for the hand was there, gripping me by the throat, moaning, exerting every ounce of my strength and will. I fought it off and pulled it down. I lay there, bathed in a cold sweat, staring at it. Feeling the fingers quivering inside the bandages. My hand or his, I was tied to it now. Tied to a thing that was seeking to destroy me. Shaking convulsively, I leaped out of bed. I ran out into the hall and down the stairs to the living room. The piano. That was the one thing that might save me, save my reason. Seating myself at the piano, I started to play. Using only my right hand at first. But I tried to force my left hand, his hand, to join in. Then suddenly... No, Roger. No. That won't work. Yes. No music. Stop it. Stop it. Do you hear it? It's my hand now. It's mine. No, Roger. Never. But it is. I'm stronger than you are. Nothing is stronger than I am. Nothing in the world. <laughs> and there's no escape. Because we're one now, Roger. And wherever you go, I'll be there too. It's not true. It's not... What... What are you doing? Just a little closer to the desk, Roger. A little closer. That paper knife. You can't. But I can, Roger. I told you I'd get you somehow. Some way. Put it down. Drop it. You can't fight against me, Roger. I told you. I'm too strong. Roger! Water! Quick! The hand sink! The hand! Ah! Is uh, where is he, Martin? The living room. I heard the piano and good, good Lord. Oh, he's dead. Why? How? He was saying something about a hand. He was in a completely psychotic state as a result of shock and a sense of guilt. The state psychiatrist was coming tomorrow to commit him. Oh, Martin. That hand he brought me wanted me to graft on. I. I don't know where he got it, but I suspect that was behind the whole thing. Behind it? Yes. Well, what do you mean? You don't really think I did graft it on, do you? Why? He was desperate, and I had to do something to quiet him. I splinted his left wrist, wrapped it in bandages, and told him not to touch them. But, Martin, that paper knife in his chest. Which hand is holding it? His right one, his good one. Yes. And still, in a way, it's possible that the dead hand, the one he was so concerned about, did guide it. Her eyes wide with awful comprehension, Lorna stares at her husband, then down at Roger Blaine's body as, somewhere in the silent house, a clock starts chiming for... Murder at midnight. (laughs) 
remember to be with us again when death stretches out his bony hand and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight is directed by Anton M. Leader. This is the place for it. Deep down under the city, under the earth. The concrete cold and damp as the stone of a mausoleum. The question is, which one of them shall it be? You, sir? You with the gray hair and the briefcase. Allow me to introduce myself. I am death. <laughs> Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Man Who Was Death. Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Robert Newman is The Man Who Was Death. It's late afternoon in the studio of Jan Roth, the sculptor. The rays of the setting sun come through the smoke-filmed glass of the skylight at an angle, casting long, dark shadows on the dusty floor. His face intense, Rolf stands before a more than life-size head of gray granite, cutting away some of the hard stone, then pausing to examine his work. It's still not right. I still haven't got it. And I don't know where I've gone wrong. The eyes, they would be brooding and half-closed. But shouldn't they be all-seeing? Let's try it. Who's that? Who's there? It's Aline, Mr. Rolfe. Aline Moffat. Aline? Oh, yes. Just a second. What is it, Aline? Uh, I told you I wouldn't be able to get here until late, Mr. Rolfe, that I was going to be modeling for Clayton in the early afternoon, but you said it didn't matter. Oh, yes, I forgot. If you don't need me, don't feel like working. No, no, it's, 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 uh, it's all right. Maybe it would help if I worked on something else for a change. Come on in. Something else? Oh, that... that head. Is that the first time you've seen it? Yes. You always kept it covered up before. It, it looks very powerful. Powerful, eh? Go on over to it, closer. Tell me who you think it is. All right. It's... well, it's a man. Pretty big man. Man, I knew it wasn't right, but if that's all you get out of it, where, where, where's that mallet? Mr. Roth, what are you going to do? Yes, I'm going to smash it. 
Almost six months' work, but... There! You know what that was supposed to be? Death! Yes. For centuries, man has been haunted and obsessed by the fear of death. I'm going to do something no artist has ever done before. Show mankind the face of death. Mr. Ralph, I, I don't think I feel like modeling this afternoon. You're frightened. I, Why? I don't know. The, the whole idea of... You too. What I wanted to show was the beauty, the peace that lies in death. Death's strength and inevitability and... Wait a minute. I'll phone you tomorrow, Mr. Ralph. I said wait. It's, it's beginning to come to me. What was wrong? To do a study portray something, you've got to understand it. Inside and out. You, you've got to know how your subject thinks, feels, project yourself into it. To do a study of death, I've got to know all those things about him. I've got to become death. And that means... Mr. Ralph, no. No, you can't. But I can, Aline. I must. How can I understand death? Become death? If I don't... Kill. Miss Craig? Yes, Nancy Craig. I'm Jordan, Harold Jordan of Homicide. I imagine you know why I asked you to come down here to the morgue. Well, they, uh, they said it had something to do with my roommate, Aline Moffat. Is, is she... If you think you can take it, we'd like you to make the identification. I think I can. Ah, good girl. She's right here under the sheet. Ready? Yes. Oh, Lee. Uh, how did it happen? Yeah, I'll cover her up. Well, we traced the laundry mark. We're pretty sure we knew who she was. How did it happen? She was found in the river. But she was dead before she went in, strangled. Murdered? But why? By whom? We don't know. We thought you might help us with that, too. Tell us what you know about it. There's not much to tell. She was a wonderful girl. Came from out of town, out west somewhere. Mm -hmm. She... You wouldn't know it from the way she looks now, but she was beautiful. She used to do modeling. Any boyfriends? Oh, no one in particular. She went out with a lot of different men. Everyone liked her. That's why I can't understand. Who does she model for? A few photographers, but mostly painters and sculptors. Let me see. There was Jensen, Clayton, Rolf. As a matter of fact, I, I think she was posing for both Clayton and Rolf. Better this time, much better. Things I can put into it that I never knew. Never felt before. Now, let's see. No! Still not right. Still something missing in... Not just a shade of expression, but something basic. One of the keys to the whole concept. But what? Haven't I played death's role, killed just as he does? Haven't I... Wait, that's it. Of course. Is that how death strikes? Without thought, on the spur of the moment. No. He picks and chooses. Decides just who shall die and who shall not. What's missing is the consciousness of power. The knowledge that there is no appeal from death. That he is the supreme authority. And that means that... Yes. I must kill again. And this time... Who? Oh. Who's that? Police department. Can we come in and talk to you for a minute? Why, oh, yes, of course. Just a second. Police. They don't know anything. They can't know. But I'd better cover this up. Mr. Rolfe? Yes. I'm Jordan of Homicide. This is Nancy Craig. Sorry to bother you at this time of night. No bother at all. Please come in. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm investigating the murder of Miss Craig's roommate, Aline Moffat. Murder? You didn't know? Why, why, no, I never read the papers. And the last time I saw her, two or three days ago... Well, it happened just two days ago. Now, we've been checking back. We have an idea that you may have been one of the last people to see her alive. 
If there's anything I can do to help, anything at all... Could you tell us what happened when you did see her last? Of course. She was due here at three o'clock, but actually came at about five. Mm -hmm. She said another artist had delayed her. Uh, Clayton, that's right. I had already started working on something else, and since she looked so tired, I suggested we call the whole thing off. She seemed pretty happy about it. Left, and I'm afraid that's all I know. Uh, Was there anyone else here? Anyone that actually saw her leave? I'm afraid not. You see, I'm the only tenant in the building who lives here, and I'm afraid everyone else had gone by then. Mm. Well, that sounds pretty straight to me. I guess that's that. Thanks very much, Mr. Roth. Not at all. I'm afraid I haven't been much help. But if you can think of anything I can do... Uh, We'll keep in touch with you. And uh, in the meantime, well, uh, maybe you should start reading the papers just every once in a while, huh? Right. I hope you read them too, my friend. Especially tomorrow's papers. Because I have a feeling that there just might be something in them that will interest you. And a fine, small rain. Yes, this is how he would move. Walking slowly through the darkness. Searching. Weighing. Selecting his victim. I beg your pardon, what? sir. But could you tell me if that's the uptown subway over there? Why, why, yes. I believe it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Not at all. Subway. What better place to make my choice than there? Deep under the earth. The concrete cold and damp as the stone of a mausoleum. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Yes, this is it. This is the place. The tunnel dark as a yawning grave. The platform edge like the verge of infinity. And this is how he must feel. Studying. Selecting. Which one of you shall it be? You, madam, with the worn coat and the draggled hat. Why are you looking at me like that? Do you know what's in my mind? Don't be afraid. It won't be you. You, young man, with the books and the glasses. No. Then what about... Yes. Down there at the end of the platform, my friend who suggested this. My prosperous-looking friend with the gray hair and the briefcase. Don't look up at the track so impatiently. A train is coming. But so am I. Good evening. I beg your pardon, sir, but uh, I'm afraid... Oh, I didn't recognize you at first. Why, you're the chap. Directed you down here, yes. But I felt that you should know exactly who it was you spoke to. Allow me to introduce myself. I am dead. What? What do you mean? What are you what are you doing to me? Let go! Let go! Quietly, the man who is dead steps back from the edge of the platform as the train grinds to a stop. A woman screams. And somewhere in the distance. A clock strikes twelve for murder at midnight. Back to the story of The Man Who Was Death. It's late the next afternoon, and Jordan is alone in his bare cubbyhole in police headquarters when there is a knock on the door. Come. Hello, Mr. Jordan. Oh, hello, Nancy. You don't seem very happy to see me. I am, and I'm not. It's a nice change to have someone as pretty as you come down here. 
On the other hand... You haven't gotten anywhere with Aline's murder. No, no motive, no clue, no nothing. I'm afraid we're licked. But you can't be. You can't give up. I'm sorry, Nancy. I don't like it either. But, well, it happens sometimes. But you can't let it happen. Not in this case. Uh, you're, you're pretty well wound up, aren't you? How about letting me take you out by your dinner? No. Uh, I, I am upset, yes, but... What's the matter? Oh, maybe it's nerves. That trip down to the morgue, the whole atmosphere around the case, but... Would you think I was mad if I told you I... I felt that some horrible power was abroad? That death himself was stalking through the city? Mm -hmm. You and Mrs. Dolan. Mrs. Dolan? Who's she? Well, that accident in the subway last night. A guy who fell or jumped in front of a train. Didn't you read about it? No. Well, this Mrs. Dolan was one of the witnesses, and... She swears that just before it happened, she went all goose pimples, felt as if death was breathing down the back of her neck, and that she was going to die. It's true, Hal. I know it is. I mean, well, that's exactly how I felt. I can't remember just where or when, but sometime during these past few days, I I felt that I was in the same room with death myself. Hmm. Well, like you said, it's probably nerves, strain you've been under. Just the same, it's kind of a funny coincidence. I think maybe I'll go see Mrs. Dolan, talk to her. Do you want to come? I I don't believe so, Hal. Somehow I feel we're awfully close to the answer. If I could just remember where and when it was I felt that way, that I was in death's presence. I think I'll go home. Okay, Nancy. I'll call you there after I talk to Mrs. Dolan, and, uh, well, maybe we'll find that we really have something. Just a little more off the cheekbones. Get the gaunt feeling of a skull under the flesh. No, no, it's still not right. Still something missing. But what is it this time? Didn't I stalk and select my victim? Didn't he recognize me for what I was? Death himself. And didn't... Wait. Of course. It's never just the victim alone who knows, fears, and fights against death. It's all of society, medicine, science, the police. All of man's resources from time immemorial lined up against death. And he still triumphs over them. That is the secret and the measure of his omnipotence. That is the last missing element. And that means that I must kill yet again. And this time, not just the victim, but the whole world must know it. And be powerless to stop me. This time. Who? Who's that? Who's there? Nancy Craig, Mr. Roth. I don't know if you remember me. Nancy? Oh, oh, yes. Just a second. I'm... I'm awfully sorry to be bothering you again, but... That's perfectly all right. Isn't Mr. Jordan with you? No, I... I came alone. I... Well, there was a little experiment I wanted to try. Oh, please come in. Thank you. Just what was this experiment? It, uh... Well, it was probably pretty silly, but I had to try it. Thinking back, I had a queer feeling that I... What? What's that? A bust. Something I'm working on. Something I hope will be my masterpiece. Do you like it? I'm afraid I... No. Oh, it's awful. It, it's terrible. It, it... It was here that I felt it. Here in the studio, and... And you... Yes, Nancy. It was I who killed a lean Muffet. And also a gray-haired gentleman with a briefcase in the subway last night. That, that piece in the paper, Mrs. Dolan. Exactly. You see, that bust over there is a study of death. And to do a study, you must project yourself inside your subject. That meant I had to become death. Oh. Where are you going? Oh, you're mad. No good, Nancy, no good. I locked the door when you came in. Oh, but you can't. Help! Help me! Help! Help! No good either. We're five stories up, and all the other tenants have gone. You came here at a very opportune time for me. I had just decided I needed one final victim, and I'm afraid that's going to be you. <laughs> I'll never 
forget it, Mr. Jordan. It was pretty late, about 12 o'clock, and it was raining. There were only a couple of people on the subway platform, three or four, and I was standing by myself, not thinking about anything in particular, when suddenly this this feeling came over me. Uh, what kind of a feeling? Oh, a feeling that, that this was the end, a feeling that death was standing there, right close behind me. I got so weak and shaky that I thought I was going to faint. I shut my eyes and leaned against one of the posts, and that's how it was that I, I didn't actually see the accident. Mm -hmm. Well, did you did you turn around when you had that funny feeling? Did you notice whether there actually was anyone standing behind you? I did. There was just a young fellow with glasses and another man, kind of strange looking, now that I think of it. Strange? How? He was about 35 or 40, pretty big. I guess it was his hair. He, he wasn't wearing any hat, and well, he was almost white and very long and bushy. What? Did he have a thin face, uh, gaunt and uh, deep-set eyes? Why, why yes, I, I think he did have. Do you know him? I'm not sure. If I do, then I may know a lot of other things, too. Good Lord. Nancy. What? I, I've got to get out of here. <laughs> Just a second, young fellow. Where do you think you're going? In there. No one's going to... Hanrahan. Oh, there you are, Jordan. Where the blazes have you been? What do you mean? What's going on? A devil of a business. A lunatic in the top floor studio there. He phoned headquarters, asked for you. Said that he had a girl there that he was going to murder. Said that he wanted us to know, even though there was nothing we could do to stop him. We thought it was a gag at first. Well, but... what are you doing about it? Everything that can be done. I've got men all around the building. Up in the roof, across the street, outside his door. Well, can't you break down the door? Sure, and finish her off quick. He said that if we tried it, he'd bash her brains out with that big hammer that he's working with. But there must be something a Tommy got from the roof across the street. He's got her right in front of him, so that if you got him, you'd get her too. I tell you, there's nothing, absolutely nothing anyone can do. You're wrong, Hanrahan. There's just one person, one thing that can stop him. What's that? Death. Oh. Uh. You're getting impatient, my dear. Oh, why are you doing this? You know you can't get away with it. You lose. Get away with it. You think I care that it matters to me whether I live or die when I finish this? I'll never be able to surpass this, but neither will anyone else. I know now how death must feel. I've caught it forever, for all men to see in stone. Yes, friend Rob, you have, and you've made me very proud. What? Who's that? You don't know, even though I've been on your mind for months now, even though you're just finishing my portrait. You? Where? Where are you? Where would I be? Everywhere. Outside in the hall. Down in the street. Here in the studio with you. Can... can you be seen? I... I must see you. I must... Very well. Walk this way. Over towards the door. A little further... Little further. All right, here I am, Ralph. Maybe I don't look the way you thought I would. Jordan. Yes. Now drop that mallet and get your hands out. It was you. And I thought... Get him up, I'm... Ralph, I said. I'm... I'm... Okay, you... that's the way you want it. Help. Help. It's okay, baby. It's all over now. I'll have you loose in a minute. Jordan, are you all right? Yes, break the door down if you want to come in. I'm busy. You got him. But how? Well, I, I talked to him through the vent pipe from up on the roof. I figured that if he was crazy enough to do all the things he did do, he might be crazy enough to believe death could pay him a visit. When I'd maneuvered him far enough away from Nancy here, I jumped through the skylight. Hell, Hell, look. Good. Good Lord. What is it? That, that bust he was working on. 
He said it was a study of death. And in a way, I guess it is. Because it's a self-portrait. Two men and a girl, staring down at the body of the dead sculptor, lying next to his weird masterpiece. But is it possible that there is still someone else in the studio? An unseen presence that has been there since the clock first struck twelve for... Murder! At midnight. again when death walks through the darkened streets while the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Jan Rolfe was played by Frank Barrows. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leder. darkest, our fear is the strongest, our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Secret of XR3. of mystery and terror by radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Max Ehrlich is The Secret of XR3. The Death House. A man sits in a tiny cell, his head bowed, waiting for the moment when he will pass from light to eternal shadow. The clock ticks on, but the time is not yet, not quite yet. Then footsteps sound in the corridor. The door opens. It's almost time, my son. Yes, Father. I know. Is there anything I can do? No. Still, I'm glad you've come. Father, uh, look at me. Look at me closely. Yes? I frighten you, don't I? I terrify you. No. No, my son. Nothing frightens me except the ego in men's hearts. Am I evil? I... I don't know, my son. Father, I... uh, Sit down. Let me tell you my story, and then 
When I'm finished, perhaps you can tell me. They call me Gorgo. All my life I've been a little man, only three feet high. Perfectly normal in every way, you see, except for my height. Perhaps you saw me down at the Century Theater not so long ago, the vaudeville team of Petrov and Gorgo, acrobat supreme. Petrov was a huge, ape-like man who tossed me through the air like a rubber ball. The audience liked the act. The contrast between the big, big Petrov and the little, little Gorgo intrigued and amused them. And on the stage, I, I laughed and smiled and went through my tricks like a happy little fellow. But in the dressing room... It was different. I did not like your performance tonight, Gorgo. But, but uh, what, what was wrong with the Petrov? You were slow. You landed too heavily. You did not smile enough. No, but they liked this, Petrov. You heard them. We got three curtain calls. We should have gotten five. Petrov, I, I did my best. My very best. Believe your me. Your best was not good enough, little one. Perhaps you will do better tomorrow. If I lock you in your room tonight... Without supper. That was Vladimir Petrov, a gorilla of a man and master of my body and soul. How I hated him. How many times I, I wept in the silence of my room. All my life I had walked in the shadows of bigger people. See, all my life I had looked up instead of straight ahead. Endured the stares of the curious and sensed the pity that was in their hearts. And that was why I used to wait in the alley near the stage door between performances, because it was dark there. I loved the dark. It protected me and hid me from those who stared and mocked. One night... I beg your pardon. You were Gorgo? Yes. Uh, my name is Dr. Mead. I saw your performance earlier tonight. I was just coming in to see you. Yes? What about Oh, I happen to be an expert in glandular work, particularly in the function of the pituitary or growth gland. I think the results of my recent experiments will interest you. I, uh, I don't understand, Dr. Main. Did you ever hear of XR3? XR3? No. Well, it's an extract, a uh, synthetic, I discovered about two years ago. In my experiments to date, whenever I injected it into stunted or dwarfed animals... They grew. They grew? Yes. You, you mean to normal size? Well, by using controlled doses, yes. You mean if you could do this with, with animals, then, then you could... I don't know, Gorgo. I think the time has come to try. Except for your size, you were perfectly formed. Just what I've been looking for. I came to ask you if you'd volunteer. Yes, yes. You understand, I can't guarantee a thing. I understand, and, and that doesn't matter. I, Dr. Mead, you don't know what it means, even the chance. A chance to grow to normal size. Why, uh, I... One thing, though, I must have your written permission. My permission? Yes, yes, Dr. Mead, I'll give it to you gladly. I'll do anything, anything. You speak a little hastily, do you uh, not, Gorgo? Petrov. Yes, little one. I'm sorry, Dr. Mead. I'm afraid you will have to find someone else for your experiments. Someone else. My little friend cannot act as your guinea pig without my consent. You see, I am Gorgo's legal guardian. And I have the papers to prove it. No, Petrov, no! No, you've got to give me this chance! Violence, little fool! As I said, I am sorry, Doctor, but... But, my dear sir, if I can make Gorgo grow to normal size... If you did, what would become of our act? It would be worthless. The people come to see Big Petrov and Little Gorgo. Do you mean to say, Mr. Petrov, that you would let your vaudeville act stand in the way? Yes. I spent years building the team of Petrov and Gorgo. Do you think I am going to let you ruin my investment now? Petrov, please, please, please let him do it. You've got Shut to. Shut up, you little fool, and get inside. Petrov! As for you, Doctor... I wouldn't advise you to come around here again. This was a blow I could not stand. Dr. Mead had opened a prison door for me and Petrov had slammed it shut again. I resolved then that come what may, I would have my chance. 
The very idea of the XR3, of becoming a man like other men, made me drunk and gave me daring. One morning, while Petrov was away, I paid a visit to Dr. Mead at his office and begged him to try the experiment without Petrov's permission. I'm sorry, Gorgo, but I cannot. The experiment would be very delicate if anything should happen without your guardian's legal permission. No, I'll run the risk, Dr. Mead. I'll be glad to. I'm sorry, but it can't be done. I see. Dr. Mead. Yes? Just what does this XR3 look like? Well, I made it up in capsule form. Here, I have a whole bottle of the capsules in my desk drawer. As you see, they're green in color. So those are the magic capsules. Thank you for letting me see them, Doctor. Thank you very much. Late that night, I slipped out of my hotel room and down the fire escape. Keeping in the shadows, I went to Dr. Mead's office and climbed through the grilled bars in the window. It was easy for a man of my size. And when I left, I had the bottle of XR3 capsules in my pocket. Well, that was Saturday night. I took one capsule and then another. They made me ill, lightheaded. Then I fell into a deep sleep. And then a knock on the door wakened me. Uh, 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 who is it? Petro. <laughs> Why are you sleeping so late? Uh, uh... I don't feel well. Ah, my little one does not feel well. Let's speak. Please, uh, uh, Petrov, I want to sleep. Very well. Today is Sunday and there is no performance. But tomorrow, my little Gorgo, you had better be in the best of health, understand? Otherwise, I'll see that you really become sick. After he left, I fell into the deep sleep again. And then something woke me. My muscles ached as though I had been stretched on a rack. It was daylight again. It was Monday. My pajamas seemed uncomfortably tight, and I looked down, and the sleeves only reached my elbows. I stared, and my heart stopped beating. Then I remembered the XR3. Like a drunken man, I staggered over to the mirror, looked. Yes! I had grown. I had grown. My pajamas were stretched to bursting. I was growing. I was at least five feet tall. Five feet tall. It was almost time for the performance now. Petrov would be coming for me any minute. And I didn't want him to see me. Not yet. So I piled furniture against the door. And waited. Time to go to the theater. I, uh... I can't go, Petrov. Not tonight. I'm still sick. What? You little swine, do you think I'm going to postpone a performance? Because you're sick? Open the door. No. Petrov, no. Don't come in. Don't come in. You little fool. I'll break every bone in your body. I the key, and I heard a turning in the lock. The furniture against the door would only hold for a minute, and I ran to my valise, took out a straight razor, and then, like a frightened animal... Gorgo. In the name of heaven, what... Yes, Petrov. I got it. I stole the XR-3, and I took it. Now, you see... You idiot. Do you realize what you've done? You've ruined the act. You've ruined it, do you hear? Yes, but I'm a man now. I'm a man, not a dwarf. They won't stare at me now. They won't... No? That's what you think. If that doctor could make you grow... He can make you small again. <laughs> Smaller than ever. No, Petrov, no! Yes, Gorgo. Huh? You've grown, but not so much that I can't handle you. We're going to see him right now. Petrov, no! Let, let me alone, for heaven's sake! Oh, struggle, you! I'll... Razor! No! Don't! I told you to leave me alone. I told you. Now it's all over. We've played our last performance together, Petrov. <laughs> 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 
A doomed man sitting in the death house pauses in his story, recalling the first time the clock struck 12 for murder at midnight. <laughs> Again, continuing his story to the priest in the death house. I stayed in my hotel room another day and took two more XR3 capsules. And when I looked into the mirror that night, I was over six feet tall. That was enough. That was all I wanted. Now I would leave the hotel. They'd never know who killed Petrov. They'd be looking for Gorgo, a three-foot midget. Never suspect me. Yes, I was in the clear. I stripped Petrov, put on his clothes. They were a little tight, but they did well enough. Then I went through the lobby and into the night. The mere experience of walking was exciting, exhilarating, as though I were walking on a high fence. And nobody looked at me twice. The staring eyes were gone. I was normal, normal. First, I had to find a place to live. I passed by a boarding house with a sign, Room to Let. I rang the bell. Yeah, what is... Oh, hello. Hello. I, uh... My name is... Baker. John Baker. I, uh, saw your sign about a room. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, would you like to see it, big boy? If you don't mind. I don't mind a bit. Come in. Come in. <laughs> it's a lovely room. We got a nice class of people. <laughs> I'm sure you'll like it. I'm sure I will. Uh, but uh, first, Miss... Um... Devlin. Rhoda Devlin. Yeah, I... Uh, well, uh, Miss Devlin, I just wanted to say I've been living in hotels all my life, and I can't give you any references. Forget it. My mother owns the place, and... Well, we're not exactly formal. Besides, you look good to me. I do? Yeah. I... Well, I always did go for big men. Big? Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I, uh... I've always liked pretty girls. <laughs> this was a dream come true. I was a normal man, and a normal girl was attracted to me. She was blonde and blue-eyed, and her head came up to my shoulder. A week passed. A week that was beyond my wildest dreams. I took Rhoda out, and we went everywhere. I fell in love with her. Madly in love. She was so small, so delicate, I... I, I wanted to protect her always. She had opened up a new and magic world to me, a world of light and love and laughter. And then, one night it happened. I was taking Rhoda home from the movies, and we were passing a billiard parlor, and there were several idlers in front of the place. They began saying things. Hey, look at the giant! Yeah! <laughs> How's the weather up there, big boy? Hey, Charlie, what do you got there, Pike's Peak? <laughs> you wait here, Rhoda. I'll shut their mouth for them. All right. I crack the skull of the next man who opens his mouth. Please, please, Johnny, don't bother with them. No, but they're saying... I they... know, but don't mind them. Let's keep walking. No, I please. will Please. All right. Well, what do you know, the big baboon? Trying to throw his weight around. <laughs> I wanted to smash their jeering faces, knock them down. But Rhoda and I walked on to her mother's boarding house. And she was strangely silent as we entered the dimly lit foyer. She hadn't said a single word since we had passed that billiard parlor. I was vaguely disturbed. I took her in my arms... But she pushed me away. Oh, no, please don't. What's the matter, I, baby? I, I, Is it what those men at the billiard parlor said? I, I don't know. It's 
seems to me you're growing bigger. Right before my eyes. Growing bigger? Yeah. Yeah. I thought at first I was seeing things, but now I know it's true. I know it's crazy. It's crazy, but when we first met, the top of my head reached your shoulders. And now, now... Yeah? What about now? Now it doesn't reach your shoulders anymore. You've grown bigger. No, Rosa, you don't know what you're saying. This is your imagination. No, no, it's true. We'd better not see each other anymore. I'm afraid of you, John. You're too big now. Good night. No, Rhoda, listen. Oh, don't no, Rhoda, me. please. Don't let go of my arm. No, not until you hear what I have to say. Rhoda, I love you. Do you hear? I love you, and I'm not going to let you just toss me aside. Oh, don't no. get big luck. I mean... Oh, stop that. No, stop that screaming. You want to wake the whole street up. Stop it. Stop it. Stop that screaming. Stop, I say. body sagged in my arms. I'd forgotten my own strength. And in my fury, I'd strangled her. Like a man in a dream, I lowered her body gently to the floor and then turned to look at my reflection in the full-length mirror in the foyer. Yes! Yes, it was true. The pitiless mirror reflected a giant. I'd grown at least six inches. The XR3 had continued its work, was making me grow even now. Now I was a freak again. They stare at me again and pity me. The beautiful, normal world I had so briefly enjoyed came crashing down over my ears. I ran out of the house like a wild man and into the street. Dr. me. Yes, I had to see him. At once, I ran to his office, avoiding the well-lit streets, and the light was on. I prayed that he was in. I knocked on the door. Yes, what? Good Lord. Hello, Dr. Mead. You remember me? Why? No, I can't say that I do. Look up into my face, Doctor. The features are the same you looked down upon not so long ago. Go, go, the midget. No, Dr. Mead. It's Gogo the Giant now. So it was you who stole the bottle of XR3 capsules from my desk? Yes, yes, yes. And this is the result? This and Petrov's murder? He deserved to die. It does not alter the fact that it still was murder. Dr. Maid! I'm not here to argue law with you. I want you to save me. You've got to stop this growing process. But how? What can I do? An antidote. You must have an antidote. I'm sorry, but I haven't. There just isn't any. What? No antidote? No, oh, you're lying. I assure you, I'm telling the truth, Kogo. I was interested in making things grow, not making them smaller. Yeah. Then I'm lost. There's no way out. I'm sorry. All my life I was a little man. I wanted to know what it was what it was like to be a big man. Now I am big. Too big. <laughs> Isn't that amusing, Doctor? <laughs> too little and then too big. <laughs> like the swing of a pendulum. <laughs> I wish I were little again. As I knew what to expect then. <laughs> I was used to that. Now they'll stare at me again. They'll laugh and jeer at me. Gorgo the giant. Gorgo the giant. I think we'd better call the police, Gorgo. (laughs) 
Well, Father, that's... That's my story. See, that's why I'm here in the death house. Now, tell me, am I evil? No, my son. You have been unfortunate, but not evil. You have sinned, yes. But you have been sinned against, too. And, uh, they're coming for you, Gorgo. I hear and I'm glad. Glad? Yes. Glad. I don't mind dying now. This world, Father, what has it ever meant to me? But there, in the next world, there no man will be strange and all will be equal. And perhaps there I will find peace. With firm and measured tread, the man who was first too small and then too big walks down the corridor. And the iron doors along the way rattle and clang like the chiming of the clock when it first struck twelve for murder. Remember to be with us again when death walks through the darkness with giant strides and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Gorgo was played by Carl Swenson. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. won't do you any good. Besides, you're pointing it the wrong way. I'm pointing it right between your eyes. That's what I mean. I... Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fear is the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight. When the graves gape open and death Strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute, then. Wherever I go. of mystery and terror by Masters of the Macabre. Our story, A Study in Crime and Retribution, is by William Morwood. Its title, Wherever I Go.
the music room of an old country mansion. Seated at the piano, playing with the skill of an accomplished musician, is Gordon Ormsby. Engrossed in what he is doing, he is not aware his wife, Ellen, has come in until... For goodness sakes, Gordon, what are you going to stop that pounding? What? Well, I thought you enjoyed music, my dear. I do, when it's well played. Oh, don't be childish. She might have a little consideration for my headache. You and your headaches. There's nothing whatever wrong with you. The doctors have as good as told you that. It's all in your mind. The affectation of a silly, rich woman. Lucky for you, I am rich. Well, where would you be now? Someplace where I'd amount to something. <laughs> I had talents when I married you, Ellen. I could have been a great musician or a great painter or a writer. You were what you are now, what you always will be. A dilettante, a dabbler. It's your money that ruined me, softened me up, robbed me of my ambition. If you hate my money so much, there's nothing to prevent you walking out on it. I will, someday. Not if I know you. You'll stick around as long as I have a penny left. Oh, my head. Oh, you poor, poor darling. Oh, I don't expect sympathy from you, but, oh, when I feel like this, I could kill myself. That would be too much to hope for. Wouldn't it be nice for you, Gordon? Little me out of the way. And all my wicked money to spend exactly as you pleased. But don't worry. I'll live to a ripe old age. Just to spite you. I'd never thought of it before. Her dying. Never. But after that... I couldn't get it out of my head. There was so much I could do with her money. I could go abroad, study. But first, I had to get rid of her. It was dangerous even to think about, but I conceived a plan and developed it carefully, slowly, step by step. Ellen, we've got rats in the cellar. I saw signs of them today. How awful. We must do something about it. Ellen, have you done anything about those rats? I ordered some stuff from the drugstore. Well, there's only one thing that's any good, and you'll have to get a prescription for that. Arsenic. Let's eat home on Thursday, Ellen. Oh, but it's a servant's night out, and we always go to a restaurant. I know, but I want to try my hand at cooking up something. Well, it's sure to be poison, but... <laughs> All right. We ate dinner at home on Thursday, the two of us alone together. Afterwards, Ellen complained of a headache and went up to her room. And I followed a little later. This is a surprise. <laughs> I brought you a cup of cocoa, my dear, to help put you to sleep. That's suspiciously thoughtful of you, Gordon. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid it's still too hot to drink. I'll put it down here. What have you done to your hand? What? It's all bandaged up. Oh, I scalded it in the kitchen. It's a nuisance, too. I, I wanted to write tonight. What are you working on now, Shakespeare. Your memoirs? <laughs> no, dear. I don't expect to die for a while yet. No, it's a story about a girl suffering from an incurable disease who uh, commits suicide. It sounds morbid to me. Oh, but it's not. I'm making it, making it very tender and beautiful. As a matter of fact, I did mean to write the death scene tonight. With this hand, I'm... Say, Ellen, hmm? would you help me out? How? Well... I've got the girl's suicide note all set in my mind. But I can't write with this. Uh, w would you write it down while I dictate it? Oh, do it yourself tomorrow. Oh, please. It'll only take a minute. Please. Oh, all right. Where's some paper? Here. But that's my very best stationery. I hate to waste it. <laughs> it won't be wasted. Ready? Yes. Here goes. It's, uh... uh I can't stand the pain any longer. Um, nobody knows how much I've suffered. Death will be peaceful compared to this. Wait a minute. What? What's wrong? You're going too fast. Oh. Death will be... What? Peaceful compared to this. Uh, forgive me for what I'm doing, but this is the only way out. Signed... Yes? Ellen. What? I named her that, dear, because she reminded of me of you, so noble in her suffering. I, I thought you'd be pleased. Well, I'm not. You'll have to think of some other name. All right. 
Jane. Jane? Do you remember Jane Turner, the girl I was going with when I met you? I don't think she'd mind. But I would. There. It's signed, Ellen. Thank you, my dear. You don't know how much this means to me. Oh, my head's listening. Oh, I'm sorry. Some cocoa? Ah, drink it. That should end your headache. Drink it, Ellen. Tastes queer. Well, I, I couldn't find the sugar, so I sweetened it with maple syrup. Well, I don't suppose it'll kill me. Drink hmm. it all. Drink it all. There. Oh. What's the matter? Oh, that pain. God, do something. <laughs> Why are you... It won't be long now, Ellen. You mean That arsenic you... you bought for the rats. You... You're, you're mad. They'll, they'll hang you for this. <laughs> no, Ellen. Oh, no. You have left a note behind. It's a clear case of suicide. <laughs> I was shaking all over. Yet my nerves had to be steady for what lay ahead of me. My own life depended on it. Music. Music. That would relax me. The piano. I raced downstairs for the music room, but before I reached it, I heard the playing. I pushed open the door. A man was sitting there. A man I'd never seen before, but who was somehow vaguely familiar. Hello. Who are you? Don't you know? Of course not. What are you doing here? There was nobody at the piano. I didn't think you'd mind. Well, I do mind. I... How'd you get in? The door's locked. Is it? I didn't notice. Breaking and entering, huh? I've got a good mind to call the I'm police. I'm sorry you're so suspicious. Still, I realize the strain you must be under. What do you mean by that? I'm afraid I'm interrupting you in business vital to both of us. I'll call again some other time. Oh, wait. wait. You can't leave like this. At least tell me your name. I have many different names. When the time comes, you can call me by any one of them. Goodbye. <laughs> I put the stranger out of my mind. Too much depended on the telephone call I had to make. A single slip-up now, and a rope was waiting for me. I dialed with shaking fingers. Dr. Sampson, this is Gordon Ormsby. You must come at once. Ellen is dead. I... I think she's taken poison. <laughs> worked out, just as I'd planned, just as I'd hoped it would. The doctor's visit, the police, the inquest, no false moves, no suspicions. I became the sole inheritor of a large estate and a free man. I moved out of the old house and into a hotel suite in town. I don't know when it started to happen, but I first knew that something was wrong. My fingers would no longer obey me at the piano. Nothing. Come. Rather, nothing but discords. I decided that my nerves were overstrained, that I needed a rest. I figured a trip somewhere would do me good. I went to the telephone to order my car brought around first thing in the morning. But before I picked up the receiver... Yes? I'm going with you, Gordon. Who is this? Your friend. Uh, uh, I'll see you first thing in the morning. But, uh, oh. Jump up, please. Uh, operator, uh, you, you cut me off. I was making a very important call. There must be some mistake, sir. There was no call on your line. I didn't wait. I couldn't. I packed that evening. I slipped a gun into the, my pocket. I left the hotel. By 11 o'clock, I was far out in the open country, driving west. The night was pitch black. And every mile I burrowed further into the darkness. And then suddenly, a terrible conviction came over me. I knew I wasn't alone. I'm coming up front now, Gordon. You! I said I was coming with you. When did you get in this car? I've been here right along. Oh. You drive well, Gordon. A cool head and a steady hand. But then you had to have them, didn't you? What does that mean? I was just thinking out loud. The money's nice... But music means a lot, too, doesn't oh. it? Oh. A pity that went sour on you. Look, I don't know who you are or what you're talking about. And yet you proved a point to Ellen. 
You proved that you were an artist in a way, even though she couldn't live to appreciate it. Her death was your masterpiece. The sweat stood out on my forehead. My mouth was dry. I... I didn't want it this way. One murder was enough to haunt me. But he left me with no alternative. He knew too much. Somewhere along that road, when the night was darkest, I knew I had to kill the stranger. Yes. The mysterious stranger seems to know a great deal. Is it possible he knows even more than Gordon suspects about his plan for... Murder! At midnight. And now here is Gordon Ormsby to continue our story. I knew what I was looking for. A lonely stretch of road with no sign of life. At last the headlights found it. A valley with trees growing down to the edge of the road. The stranger seemed asleep, but he stirred as I jammed on the brakes. Hey, what's wrong, Gordon? Must have a flat. The wheel feels funny. Uh, would you mind having a look? That would be very unwise for me. Why? You have a gun in your pocket. I would make a perfect target out in the headlights. Well, since you're so suspicious. Here, take it. You amuse me, Gordon. However... How do they look? All right on this side. I'm sure it's one of the front tires. I'll see the other side. Got him. I got him. He was standing squarely in front of the radiator when I got him. Just to make sure, I backed the car over his body. I dragged him across the ditch and into the woods. I dug a shallow grave with a tire iron, hacking in among the roots and the rocks. And then I covered him over. I got back into the car. I needed a drink. And when I came to a juke joint along the highway... I stopped. All right. What's yours, mister? Scotch, straight. You been driving hard, mister? Why? You look all in. (sighs) Give me another shot. Uh, no, no, wait. Uh, Look, I'll buy the bottle. I don't know what's going to sell. You know, scotch is hard to get around here. I'll pay for it. The bottle over to a booth and began putting it away. I felt better, warm inside. <sighs> it was going to be all right after all. The stranger was dead, and they'd never find his body. I was in the clear with nothing to worry about. Help a poor blind man! Help a blind man! There was something about that blind man's stick that got on my nerves. He came up to my table. Help the old blind man, please. Get away from here. Please, sir, if you'd be so kind. Will you get away? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I don't want any favors from anyone. I, I said did. be it. Oh, hey. I'm going, but you shouldn't have done that. What's going on here? What's the idea of shoving Nettie? He was annoying me. He... Then I saw him. He had the blind man by the elbow and was leading him toward the door. The stranger... What's the matter with you, mister? What are you staring at? There. Don't you see him? Oh, blind Ned? Well, sure. No. The man with him, opening the door. There's nobody with him. Blind Ned don't need nobody. He's been going in and out of here by himself for years. But it was he. I knew it was. I'd killed him, buried him, and... Well, was he dead or wasn't he? I had to know. I drove back up the road. There were the trees and the broken weeds and the ditch through which I dragged the body. I walked carefully among the leaves, searching for the grave. Hello there. What? What you doing? Oh, 
who are you? State trooper. Saw your car parked on the road, followed you in. Well, I'm looking for my watch. I lost it here this afternoon at a picnic. I didn't realize it until I got home, so of course sure, I Sure, sure. I'll help you. Oh, no, please don't bother. No bother. I got a flashlight here. Well, it's, it's awfully nice of you, but I don't think... Hey, I'm... what's this? What? Where? Ground's all scraped up into a... Looks like a grave. Oh. Well, what would a grave be doing here? That's what I'd like to know. Give me a hand, will you? Fresh dirt and rocks digs easy. Why? Well, what's the matter? Scared? Well, no, no, no. It's just a... down to the bottom, anyhow. Oh. Well, I'll be. What is it? It's a grave, all right. But if there was ever a body in it, it's gone now. I had only one idea after that: to get away, to get away as far away as possible. I drove like a wild man. The rest of the night and all next day, stopping only for gas. Finally, I just couldn't drive any farther. I stopped at a small hotel, went up to the desk to register. Hey, sign here, please. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm driving across country, and I've got to start first thing in the morning. Hey, certainly, Mr. Uh, uh, Ormsby. Ormsby, Ormsby. Okay. Uh, what time would you like to be called? At daylight. And another thing, I don't want to be disturbed under any circumstances. Yes, That's important. No matter who wants to see me, on what excuse, I don't want to be disturbed. I understand, Mr. Ormsby. Now, if you follow the point. The elevator doors were just closing when I saw him. He'd come in from the street and was walking across the lobby to the desk. I reached my room, dismissed the bellhop, and locked the door. With a shaking hand, I picked up the telephone. Uh, this is Mr. Ormsby. I thought I recognized a friend of mine in the lobby. A uh, man about the same height and build as myself. Uh, dressed in a gray suit. I am afraid... Well, he came in right after me. I haven't seen him in some time, and well, I've forgotten his name. Would you mind looking in the register and telling me what it is? Just a minute, now, look. Here we are. Your signature, Mr. Ormsby, and uh, then... Yes? I'm sorry, sir. There is something, but the name's blotted. I, I can't make it out. I knew now there was no escape. I took the money from my billfold and piled it on the table. I examined my revolver to make sure it was loaded. And then I sat and waited. A few minutes before midnight, the knock came. Come in. Hello. You act as if you were expecting me. I was. The only thing I'm not sure about is what you want. Or rather, how much. You should know. All the cash I've got is on the table. Nearly $500. Helen left you a good deal more than that. All right, I'll write you out a check. Name the amount. Everything you possess. What? Are you crazy? Do you honestly think, after the risks I took, the, the, the risks I'm still taking, I'd give everything away to a cheap blackmailer? Murder is an expensive hobby, Gordon. Well, not that expensive. If you want to be reasonable, say, 50000 I'm afraid there's no compromise. And I'm not just talking about money. Listen, this is your last chance. 50000 or... Or what, Gordon? Or you don't leave this room alive. You tried to kill me once before. Remember? Yeah, I lost my head. The car only stunned you, and I didn't make sure that you were dead. It'll be different this time. It's always going to be different, isn't it, Gordon? When you disposed of Ellen, you were going to lead such a rich, beautiful life. Mm -hmm. But what happened to it? Your music went. You couldn't play. You shut up. And then your heart went. You struck out at an old blind man. Listen, you. There isn't very much left now, except your mind. And that's starting to go, too. Sometimes you see me, sometimes you don't. I see you now. Large as life. But do you see this? That gun won't do you any good. Besides, you're pointing it the wrong way. I'm pointing it right between your eyes. That's what I mean. But you... He was gone. Yes, gone. Nowhere in the room. Then... Days. Mechanically, I opened it. Anything wrong, mister? What? 
Who are you? The house detective. I thought I heard... Oh, you must have seen him. He must have run past you in the corridor. Who? The stranger, the man who was in my room. Oh, I did Hey, be careful of that gun. Oh, I had to shoot him. He was threatening me. He was standing over there when I let him have it. Oh, yeah? What did he look like? He's about my height and build, wearing a gray suit. Like the one you're wearing? Hmm? Oh. Oh, yes. I thought so. Look. At what? The mirror. You shot at your own reflection. You mean, now do you know who I am, Gordon? There, didn't you hear him? Hear what? What are you talking about? No, no. No, you wouldn't hear. Only I would. And and now I do know who and what he is. I know why I couldn't escape him. Here. Here, take this gun. I want to give myself up. Give yourself up? My name is Gordon Ormsby. I killed my wife. I poisoned her. I made it look like suicide, and there never was any trial. Oh, I get it. Sure, It was a perfect sure. crime. At least, I thought it was a perfect crime until he came into the picture. Now, don't you worry about it one bit, Mr. Ormsby. You just now, wait come a along with Wait me. a minute. You, you think I'm making it up. But I'm crazy, don't you? No, You do no. think so. But it's true. Every word of it. Sure, I got a good friend who's a doctor. You tell him doctor. all about it. No. No, he won't believe me either. Nobody will believe me. They'll all think that I'm mad. Oh, don't you see? That's why I have to give myself up. Because that's the only way I can get away from him. If you hang me. But if you don't... They won't, Gordon. (gasps) They'll put you away. (laughs) And wherever you go, I'll be there too. Remember that? (laughs) Wherever you go. Taking him firmly by the arm, the detective leads the struggling Gordon out into the corridor. The corridor that grows darker and darker until it is completely black. Somewhere in that blackness, a voice is whispering. Whispering. And it continues to whisper until it is drowned by a clock striking twelve for... Murder! At midnight. by Barry Kroger. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leder. a chicken, huh? Hey, guys. Yeah, what do you know? Chicken's turning out to be a rooster all of a sudden. (laughs) Cock-a-doodle-doo. Cock-a-doodle. 
that. In case anybody here is interested, from here on in, the name is just plain Charlie Nix. <laughs> Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Trigger Man. Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Foremost Mystery Writers. Our story, written by Max Ehrlich, is different from any of the other tales you have heard in this program. Its mystery is not that of the supernatural, but of the unknown quantities in the human soul. And so, because it has suspense and complete credibility, we give you Trigger Man. Is that the door? No. No, not yet. Not that it matters. You can't get very far with a slug in your guts. But I can sit here. And when I come through that door, I'll show them what Chicken Charlie Nix can do with a gun. Sure. Maybe it'll be for the last time. But what can I lose now? Funny how it all comes back to you in the end. Just a year and a half ago that it all started. But I remember it like it was yesterday. I was standing back in the doorway waiting, waiting for some sucker to come along. It was down at the waterfront and it was plenty dark. I stood there, the rod cold in my hand, waiting. Finally, I heard footsteps. A man and a woman. I waited until they were almost opposite the doorway and then... Hey, buddy. Got a match? Why, yes, I think so. Never mind. Get your dukes up. Tell him he's got a gun. Oh, stick up, huh? Aren't you smart, sucker? Come on, reach. Get those hands up before I let you have it. Yeah. It's better. Okay, lady, let's begin with you. Oh, Tom, I... Hand over that purse. Better do as he says, Ann. All right, Tom. Thanks, lady. Thanks very much. Okay, buddy, let's have your wallet. I said come across with your wallet. Not tonight, chicken. What do you mean? Hey, wait a minute. How come you know my name? It's my job to know it. In your face, too. The name's Riley. From headquarters. Tom Riley? Plain clothes? Yeah. Keep up those hands. Keep them up, Rob, will you? I know you won't, chicken. Tom. Not for a lot more than I've got in my wallet. Tom, what are you doing? He'll kill you. I don't think he will. Will you, chicken? Keep away from me, flat foot. Don't come a step near you, here. No, the step now splatter you all over the sidewalk. You haven't got the nerve, chicken. You know it and I know it. Now, drop that gun. Keep away, keep away, do you hear? I ain't afraid to shoot. I'll tell you, I'll let you have it. Then what are you waiting for? That was for the gun, chicken. And this is for you. No, hold me up. No, no, you, 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 pull the gun on me, will you? Oh, Tom. It's okay, Ann. It's all over. You could have been killed walking straight into a hold-up man and knocking the gun out of his hand. Well, I knew he wouldn't shoot, Ann. You know, you knew, but how? His name is Charlie Nix. Chicken Charlie. Well, he... Oh, he carries a gun, yeah, but he's not a gunman. Because he's never used it and he never will. Just plain chicken-hearted. Yellow. That's why they call him chicken. Still, still, you took an awful chance, Tom. There's always the first time. <laughs> not for Chicken Charlie. Now then, you see if you can find a phone, honey, and call headquarters okay. while I keep an eye on this yellow skunk here. That's 
the way it was. I just didn't have the nerve to put the blast on anyone. Sometimes in my room, I'd put my gun on a table and just look at it. I'd keep thinking, if I only had the nerve, I'd be one of Angelo Danelli's trigger men instead of his errand boy. The rest of the mob would respect me instead of slapping me around and calling me chicken. That's what got me more than anything else, the way they laughed and called me chicken. It wasn't that I didn't try. That time I held up Riley, I was going to let him have it. I wanted to, but I don't know, at the last minute I got all cold inside. My fingers got stiff and numb. And it cost me a year in a pen. The day after I got out, I was sitting in the Boulevard Cafe, having myself a beer, when in walked the boss, Angie Danelli. Great having you back, chicken. Thanks, Angie. Thanks. By the way, I saw an old pal of yours the other day. Yeah? Who? Tom Riley. Riley, huh? Yeah, it's too bad you didn't knock him off that night, chicken. Yeah. But one of these days, Angie, I'm going to meet him, and then I'll... Oh, kid, I know how you feel. After all, when a guy takes your gun away, it makes you look like a chump. Yeah, yeah, he made me look like a chump, all right. But I'm different now, Angie. That year in a clink, well, I, I got a different kind of nerve now. Wait and see. Sure, I'm, I'm... sure, but take it easy, kid. There's plenty of time, plenty. You just got out of stir and you got yourself to worry about. What do you mean, Angie? I did my time, didn't I? I'm in the clear. Sure, chicken, sure. But if you ask me, the pen didn't do you any good. You, Well, you look kind of all in. You don't feel so good, do you? What? What makes you say that, Angie? Oh, I don't know. Your face ain't got any color and you're breathing hard all the time. Well, I... I I feel okay. Sure. I ain't saying anything's wrong with you, chicken. But you never can tell until a good doc checks you over, huh? Yeah. Maybe you're right, Angie. Maybe... Maybe I ought to see a doctor, huh? Now you're talking sense, kid. Tell you what I'll do. I'll take you to my own doctor, Dr. Leonard. He's a big specialist, and he'll give you the once-over right. Yeah, yeah, but he... He probably comes high and Forget I, it, but... chicken, forget it. I'll take care of it. Won't cost you a dime. Hey, that's pretty white of you, Angie. <laughs> Think nothing of it, kid. After all, you're one of my boys, ain't you? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Well, if there's one thing Angie Donnelly does, it's to take care of his boys. A couple of days later, Angie Donnelly set up an appointment for me with this Dr. Leonard. I went to his office and he gave me a real checkup from soup to nuts. And when he got through, I... Well, I didn't like the look on his face. Sit down, Mr. Nix, and uh, let's talk. Doc, what's the matter? Did you find something wrong? <clears throat> Care for a cigarette? Never mind, Mr. Allen. Doc, give it to me straight. Is it good or bad? I'm sorry, but it's bad. You mean my my chest? It isn't your chest. It's your heart. My, my heart? What about it? Now, you've got a severe aneurysm there. A what? What's that mean? Yeah, it means that you've got a serious weakness of the heart muscle wall. Yeah, yeah, but... How serious? I'm sorry, Mr. Nix, but you haven't got more than six months to live. Six months? Yeah, that's what he said. Six months to live. For a while, I didn't get it. You don't get things like that right away. And then... Six months, and He gave me six months to live. Someday I'll be just walking along and I may be sleeping and... Then it'll... It'll come. It's tough, chicken. Plenty tough. Yeah. I know how you feel. Nobody knows how I feel. Except maybe a guy in a death house. Yeah. That's what it's like. Like knowing when you're going to burn, waiting for it. Take it easy, chicken. Yeah. Have another drink, huh? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Angie. You're, you're okay. Okay. Maybe the doc was wrong. There's always a chance. No, no, Angie. Check me twice just to make sure. There ain't a thing I can do, not a thing except wait for it. Just sit around and wait. The croak. Listen, kid. You've got six months to live. Okay. You know what I'd do if I had six months to live? What? 
What would you do? I'd live. Huh? Yeah, I'd spend all my time living. Champagne, dames, I'd have them all. I'd do all the things I ever wanted to do, but didn't have the nerve to do before. You see what I mean, kid? I'd live a lifetime in six months. Sure, sure, but that takes dough. You can get the dough? Oh, from me. Huh? Look, chicken. You always wanted to be a trigger man, didn't you? Yeah. Well, I'm hiring you right here and now. At 500 a week. 500? But, Edgy, you know I ain't got the nerve. Sure, you have, but it's different now. You don't have to be afraid of a thing. Not a thing. Well, you can go around blasting guys like clay pigeons if you want to. But suppose the cops nail me. What do you care? Suppose they send you to the death house. You got nothing to lose anyway, have you? Your heart's bad, ain't it? You've only got a little while anyway, either way. That's right, Angie. That's right. What can I lose? Then Ellie was right. This was my chance. I packed a new gap and started to look for Riley. Riley, the dick who'd set me up. Yeah, he was going to be number one. You'll be coming along here any minute, kid. Yeah, yeah. This is it, chicken. There's Riley. There he is. No, chicken, not yet. Wait till he comes closer. Look, Angie, hey, I first one that comes hardest, kid. The rest are easy. <laughs> Look at him, pal. He knows from nothing. Take your beat on him. You can't miss. Okay, chicken, go ahead. Let him have it. Go ahead, blast him. <laughs> you did it. You did it. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I did. Flat on the sidewalk, colder than yesterday's hash. You did it, Charlie. Henry, I, I... You... You just called me Charlie. Sure, kid, why not? You're not chicken anymore. Now, maybe we better get out of here. <laughs> away up the street, leaving the body lying there in a pool of blood as the clock strikes twelve for murder at midnight. To Murder at Midnight, to the story of Trigger Man. Where are they anyway? I'm getting kind of anxious to see them. Even, even with a slug in my gut, I'll be able to give them quite a reception. Funny how a guy can change. How different it's all been since I put the blast on Riley. That was my first and the toughest one. After that, it was easy. There were plenty of guys in Angie Donnelly's way, and I aimed to please. Whenever I watch one of them fold up with that funny expression on his face, well, it kind of helped. It helped me to forget how it was with me. It was like a champagne drunk. But then the hangover would come, and... I'd remember that I had less than six months to live myself. Yeah, I was a different guy, all right. Take what happened a couple of days after I got Riley. We was having a meeting up at the hideaway on a new job when a character named Bummy Devine started shooting his mouth off. Hey, chicken. Still carrying around that pop gun of yours? What did you call me? Chicken. Ain't that your name? The name is Charlie. Charlie Nix. <laughs> hey, guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah? What do you know? Chicken's turning out to be a rooster all of a sudden. Cock-a-doodle-doo. <laughs> cock a doodle -doo. In case anybody else here is interested, the name from here in is just plain Charlie Nix. <laughs> he didn't laugh after that. No one did again, ever. I was it. I took chances where no other trigger man would. Why not? What'd I have to lose? In a few months, I'd be through anyway. There was a difference. 
Meanwhile, I lived. I painted the town red, bought myself tailored suits, hit the clubs every night, the gambling joints. <laughs> and the dames, why, well, I had to fight them off. You can do a lot with 500 bucks a week. Sure, I was hot, plenty hot. The cops couldn't figure out at the beginning who was doing all the fancy gun work, but they were getting warm, and they were getting close. I had to watch myself. And then one night, we were knocking off a fur warehouse. I was in the lookout car out front when suddenly... Hey, Charlie, a prowl car. Yeah, come on, Mike. Let's get out of here. They're shooting at us. Tommy guns. Hang on, Charlie. Here they come right after us. Hold it steady, Mike. I'm going to try to nail a tire. Charlie, Charlie, what's the matter? Uh, I'm hit. Keep, keep going, Mike. Not a ditch, Mike. I. Uh, uh, uh. When I opened my eyes, there was a smell of chloroform, and the doctor was just putting away some instruments. Mike was there too, with a gat in his hand making sure that the doc would cooperate. Hello, Charlie. How do you feel? I I don't know. What happened? The doc here just dug a slug out of your chest. Oh. How am I... How am I doing, doc? You'll be all right. Lucky you've got a good heart. Otherwise, you'd never have made it. What? Did... Did you say my heart was good? That's right. I don't get it. I, I thought I had a bad ticket. They told me I didn't have more than a few months to live. <laughs> With that heart, my friend, you can live to be a hundred. That is, if the police don't interfere. I spent three weeks laid up after that in bed. And every day the boss would send me flowers, comic books, and all kinds of stuff. A real thoughtful guy, Angie. But I was thoughtful, too. There were some things I had to add up for myself. I had to find out whether I was living on borrowed time or not. As soon as I could walk, I made a beeline for Angie Danelli's specialist, Doc Leonard. But I found out right away that Doc Leonard didn't live there anymore. A dentist was in the office instead. Then I looked up the superintendent. Yes, I'm in charge here. What can I do for you? If it's a bottom It apart- isn't. I'm looking for Dr. Leonard. Dr. Leonard? Oh, the one that was in the dentist's office before. That's right. You know where he went? No, he didn't leave any forwarding address. It's a funny thing about him. Yeah? Why? Why, he paid us a month's rent in advance and moved in, equipment and everything. But he only stayed two days. Moved out at night. No notice, nothing. Just came and went. I see. Never could figure it out. That's the way it was. Sorry, I couldn't be of more help, mister. That's okay. You've told me enough. All I want to know. So that was it. I had the answer. I went home, took my old gun out of the drawer, slipped it into my shoulder holster. It felt good there. Just like old times. I was just putting on my hat and coat when the phone rang. Hello. Hello, Charlie. How do you feel? Fine, Angie. Fine. Funny thing you calling up just now. Yeah, why? I was just thinking of you. Where are you now? I'm over at my apartment. Uh, Listen, kid, do you feel well enough to do a little job for me tonight? I feel fine, fine. That's well. Drop over to my place right away. Okay, I'll be right over. And, Angie. Yeah? Thanks for everything. The flowers and stuff. (laughs) Funny how a guy acts sometimes. I remember in the cab on the way over, I was like ice, cold inside and out. I should have been excited, but I wasn't. I came up to Angie's apartment and knocked on the door. Yeah, who is it? Me, Charlie. Oh, okay. Morning, Charlie. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Well, you're up and around, huh, kid? It's great, great. Yep, not that it makes much difference. You see, Angie... 
My six months is supposed to be up tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. You know something, Angie? I feel fine, fine. And yet, I'm supposed to croak. Well, it's just like I said, kid. Maybe Doc Leonard was wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Maybe he was wrong, you know, made a mistake. Sure, sure. So, this afternoon, I went up to see him. You would... You did, huh? Yeah, yeah. And you know what, Angie? He doesn't live there anymore. No. In fact, he only set up practice there a couple of days. Kind of set me to wondering. Uh Uh-huh. Wondering, uh, what? Whether this Doc Leonard wasn't a doctor after all, but just a phony. I, uh, I don't get it. Why, uh, why should he be? Suppose you tell me, Angie. (laughs) I, uh, I don't know what you mean. Oh, And suppose I tell you, Angie, this Doc Leonard was your boy. Between you, you framed me with this bad heart gag. You needed a gunster who could take chances, and I was your pigeon. Wait a minute, Charlie. It was easy, wasn't it, Danelli? Talking a chump like me into it. When I thought I only had six months to go, you knew I wouldn't be afraid anymore. Sure. What could I lose? And so you got me to do your dirty work for you while you were somewhere else with an airtight alibi. And when the heat was turned on, you knew it'd be on me. (laughs) You're wrong, kid. You see, you were supposed to live six months. And that's all you're going to live. Don't do any reaching, Angie. Don't! You... You taught me how to use a gun, Angie. You should have just let me stay. Chicken... Charlie Nix. Yeah. Yeah, he got me in the belly with his first one. But I got him before he could repeat. There he is. Lying on his own rug, soaking in his blood. As for me, well, there ain't much I can do but wait. Somebody must have heard the shots, called the cops. Funny how I feel now, how different it is. When you think of it, if I'd stayed Chicken Charlie, I wouldn't be here now with a slug in my guts. Like the doc said, I could have lived to be maybe a hundred. Well, if it ain't old Chicken Charlie. Hello, copper. What did you call me? Why, we've been looking all over for you, chicken, but it looks like somebody saved the state some dough. Not yet. I've still got enough stuff to stay where you are. Don't come any closer, you hear? No? Why not, chicken? Because I'm a killer, that's why. Because I got nothing to live for anyway. And keep away from me, you hear? Keep away or... Oh, what? Give me that rod. Oh, stop, you can't. You sure I can punch... Once a chicken, always a chicken. His eyes wide and incredulous, the hunched figure slips from the deep armchair, falls to the floor, next to the body of the man he killed. And somewhere in the distance, a clock in a church steeple starts chiming for... Murder! again when death is our unseen guest and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Chicken Charlie Nix was played by Bill Quinn. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight is directed by Anton M. Leader.
hang me like a common criminal. And I didn't mean it. You know I didn't. Oh, stop whining, Gerald. Take your medicine like a man. What? All right, Harvey. I'll stop. You're responsible for the whole thing. You know you are. And since they can only hang me once, even for two murders... Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight. When the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in... Death's Goblets. And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Sigmund Miller is Death's Goblet. It all began at one of Arthur Cunningham's parties. He always gave a party when he came back from one of his trips abroad. I went there with Gerald, my partner, and his wife, Susan. Beautiful Susan. Did I care for her? (laughs) People used to say so. But she was too self-centered a woman for me. I like to look at her just as I like to look at anything that's uh, lovely. That was all. As for Gerald, well, he was rich, which was the only reason he was my partner. But suppose I start at the beginning, at the moment we got to the party and Arthur came over. Well, hello, Harvey. Glad you came. Wonderful to see you back, Arthur. You know Gerald and his lovely wife, Susan. Of course. Hello, lovely wife, Gerald. Nice to see you again, Arthur. Good trip, I think. Marvelous. And you're just in time for a drink. Uh, let's get away from this mob. Come into the study. Oh, oh, nice. I just opened my last bottle of Chateau Albert. Oh, nice. Here we are. Oh, well, someone get the glasses out of the cabinet, will you? <laughs> Mom's <laughs> party's <laughs> making <laughs> very nervous. <laughs> <terrible, laughs> you know, I'd much yeah. rather... Here we are. Hi. What an odd goblet this one is. Oh, uh... Put that one back, Susan. Why, what's wrong, Arthur? Uh, Use any of the others, but not that one. Oh, I'll be careful of it, if that's what you're worried about. Oh, it's not that. I just don't want you to drink from it. What's all the mystery about, Arthur? Well, you'd all think I was mad if I told you. Uh, Take a look at it. It's a very strange-looking glass. Yes, looks uh, Venetian, possibly from Murano. It is. This red spot here on the side. Yes, it's supposed to be a drop of blood. That's very odd. How do you know that? Well, Gerald, this goblet has a legend, a terrible legend. And, of course, none of you will believe it, but the story is that anyone who drinks from this goblet will kill someone. Oh, that's wonderful. And you believe it? Why, yes, Gerald. You see, I've had proof. Good heavens. I, well, I once drank from this goblet. What? Arthur, you're joking. You mean that you... Yes, Susan, it was justifiable homicide, but after I drank from it, I did kill someone. He was a thief and he attacked me, but still I killed him. Well, you never told us about that. It's not anything that I care to remember particularly. Oh, how terrible for you, Arthur. Where did you get the goblet? From a murderer. A man who killed his wife. They were auctioning off his estate. Hmm. Extraordinary. May I look at the glass, Arthur? Yes, if you like. Everyone stared at the goblet in silence as I held it to the light. It had a delicate brown tint, reminding me of old blood, except that it sparkled and glittered. The spot of red did look like a drop of blood about to roll down the side. It seemed ridiculous that this inanimate object could make men commit murder, and yet there was something about it that that fascinated me, and suddenly I wanted to drink out of it. You seem very interested in my goblet, Harvey. Yes, will you pour some wine in it for me? What? No, Harvey. This happens to be one superstition, I believe. Everyone who has ever put his lips to this goblet has killed. I don't know why it's so, but it is. Oh, it's silly, of course, but why tempt fate? Oh, nonsense, Gerald, nonsense. I'm going to drink out of it. You'll have to pour the wine yourself, Harvey. All right, I will. Well, here's, um, health. And uh, long life. No, Harvey, I won't let you. Oh, well, Susan. 
You shouldn't have done that. You've spilled some of Arthur's best burgundy and ruined a good tablecloth. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm glad you did it, Susan. I won't let you or anyone else drink from that glass. It's strange to get so distressed about a ridiculous legend. I don't think murder is ridiculous. You know, I'd like to get rid of it. I was thinking of destroying it. Well, why don't you just fling it against the fireplace? No, I can't. Uh-huh. I've tried several times, but somehow I couldn't. Um, Arthur. Yes? How about uh, giving it to me? I'd rather not. Oh, come on. You want to get rid of it, and I have a fine glass collection. I, I'd, I'd like to add to it. I'll keep it locked up. You'll be sorry, but if you want it that badly, Harvey, it's yours. Arthur, please don't give it to him. Susan, what's the matter with you? You watch over Harvey as if, well, as if... As if what, Gerald? Oh, the whole business is absurd. Of course it is. Yes, and if I should drink out of it and commit a murder, that would be the most absurd thing of all. <laughs> I kept the goblet on the mantelpiece in my library where the lamplight made it glitter. I discovered that the red drop was not paint. It was ingrained in the glass. Oh, very cleverly. One night, both Susan and Gerald were at my home. As we chatted, I got up, went to the mantelpiece, and idly toyed with the goblet. That goblet... It's the one Arthur gave. Yes, yes, you remember. He gave it to me. Why don't you smash it, Harvey? Get rid of it. Ooh, it gives us all the creeps. Mm. Well, Gerald, you aren't really afraid of a piece of glass, are you? You don't believe Arthur's story at all, do you, Harvey? On the contrary, Susan, I do believe it. But uh, not the way you think. What do you mean? Well, I mean to say murder is not in the goblet. It's in me, in you. Even in, in Gerald. Oh, what a silly thing to say, Harvey. Oh, yes. You don't need a magic goblet to commit a murder. All you have to do is let yourself go. Let go of the civilized controls that tie you up. Why, oh. Gerald, if you had cause, you could murder me or even your lovely wife. Oh, I couldn't kill a fly. Oh, but you could if the fly gave you enough trouble. Now, supposing, uh, just as an example, supposing that you discovered that Susan was really in love with me and only married you for your money. <laughs> Wouldn't that make you want to murder her, Joe? Oh, you're crazy. That's not very funny, Harvey. Even you, Susan. What? Even though you have a lovely face and exquisite hands, even you could commit murder. Why, there must have been times when you hated Gerald, or only for a moment, of course. But in that moment... Eh, in that moment, if you were not so civilized... Stop it, Harvey. Why, you could even put your lovely hands around my throat. Oh, stop it, Harvey. <laughs> You're not that important to her. And then just why are we on this gruesome subject? That's Harvey's idea of humor. Susan looked at me, a touch of red at the point where the cheekbones make the skin taut. She seemed angry, but she wasn't really. Oh, yes, yeah, she loved me. I could see it in her face. She looked at me for a moment and then dropped her eyes. May I look at the goblet, Harvey? No, I'm afraid not, Susan. You might accidentally drop it. It might be a good idea. Well, I have an even better one, Gerald. And that's to go home before we get really serious about this murder business. I sat there staring at the goblet after they left. It... It fascinated me, glittering in the lamplight. And as I looked at it, it almost seemed as if the red spot of blood was uh, uh, moving, rolling down its side. Why, why shouldn't I drink from it? Why? And before I knew it, I'd taken it down and put it on the table. I got a bottle of burgundy, opened it, and I poured slowly, filling the goblet just up to the red spot. And then I drank from it. Uh, seemed to me that the wine had a, a different taste, although I had drunk this wine often and knew its taste well. It was delicious. Uh, I had another. It was heady. And it made me a little dizzy, although I felt fine and, and, and free. Yes, light and dizzy. But, but after a while, when the dizziness wouldn't go away, I decided to go for a drive, even though it was close to midnight. 
I drove fast. The speed and power of the car gave me a feeling of great exhilaration. I took the turns at full speed, enjoying the danger of the sharp curves. Then I came to a long, level stretch of road. I pressed down hard on the gas. The needle of the speedometer slowly moved upward. 60, 70, 80, 85. The road, like a black ribbon, rolled up in front of me. And then I suddenly saw him, but it was too late. I shot him with my right fender. He never made a sound. The car swerved a little from the impact. My heart in my throat. I stopped. Then I... I backed up. Backed up. Backed up. Backed up to where the body was lying sprawled grotesquely on the edge of the road. One look was enough. He was dead. But no one had seen the accident. I stepped on the gas and drove off. Death's goblet and the man who drank from it corpse lying limp by the side of a lonely road, and the car speeding away as the clock strikes twelve for murder at to Murder at Midnight. Harvey challenged the curse of the goblet and found it true. He had just killed a man after drinking from it. Let's listen to him as he continues the story of Death's Goblet. I knew now that the story of the goblet wasn't a myth, and I also knew what I was going to do about it. The next night, I got Gerald to come to my house to do some work. Oh, oh, I can't make head or tail out of your cost estimates, Harvey. Well, now, really, Gerald, it's very simple. Just concentrate. Oh, why can't you take care of it like a good fellow? I'm awfully tired. Well, all right. Let's stop for a couple of minutes. Have a drink. Oh, what are you doing, Harvey? The goblet. Why, you don't really believe that story of Arthur's, do you? Well, You're much too intelligent for that. Oh. Well, you only pretended in front of Susan, didn't you? Well, I... <laughs> oh, yes. Had to pretend, you know, women. Well, of course. And even if you did believe it, I have a feeling that... Basically, you're pretty reckless, aren't you? Well, I used to be pretty wild when I was a young fellow. <laughs> on a motorcycle once. And... Yes, yes, I know, yes. Well, let's drink up. Find me a victim, will you, Gerald? Huh? Well, you know, according to the legend, I've got to murder someone. Uh, maybe even you. <laughs> Harvey the murderer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh. mm, very nice wine. How about another? Right. Well, here's to uh, your lovely wife. And um, how about switching glasses? Huh? Well, you might as well get a kick out of it, too. Um, well, uh, okay, here goes. I watched the fool swagger as he drank down the wine. In an hour, when he was alone, he'd be shivering with fright at what he'd done. <laughs> well, I did it. You certainly did. Uh, by the way, Gerald. Yes? I checked Arthur's story about this goblet. Yeah? And it seems that he's right. Everyone who ever put his lips to this goblet... Has committed a murder. You mean... Well, of course, it's all coincidence, but... Uh, then again, who knows? All the next week, I kept reminding Gerald about his drinking from the goblet. I wasn't really trying to get him to kill, but it was amusing to see him get upset and uneasy. And I noticed he was getting a little bolder, particularly with Susan, and had developed a temper. And one night, just as I was about to retire... Hello, is that you, Harvey? 
Yes, Susan, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. I'm just a little worried about Gerald. He oh. usually gets home at about six, and it's eleven o'clock now. Do you know where he might be? Why, he's having dinner with his sister. His sister? Yes, a tall, dark girl. She was in the office today, and... Harvey, oh, uh... Gerald has no sisters. Oh, he hasn't? No. Oh, uh, I, um... Uh, I guess I got him mixed up with someone else. Yes, yes, it was Les Gordon who was meeting his sister. Yes, Gerald had some business to take care of over in Milford. You're not very good at covering up, Harvey. I'm coming right over. Please wait up for me. (laughs) Good. Things are beginning to happen. It was becoming very interesting. Now we'd see. I want you to tell me everything. I must know. Who is this girl? Take it easy, Susan. Come, sit down, sit down. Oh, never mind that. What about Gerald? I don't know anything about Gerald's private life. And besides, you're not the one to talk. What on earth do you mean? You know perfectly well what I mean. You don't really care for Gerald. Actually, you're in love with me. Harvey. Well, you are, aren't you? Maybe. Sometimes I think I am. (laughs) Oh, but you're too cold-blooded. I'd never be sure I could trust you. As a matter of fact, you'd like to get rid of Gerald. Why why do you say that? Well, I'm just putting your thoughts into words. You never really loved him, did you? But Harvey... And he's finally become unbearable, hasn't he? Oh, Harvey, if you only knew... Do you know that the last time Gerald was here, he drank out of that goblet of Arthur's? It's... Possible that he wants to get rid of you, too. Stop it! Stop it, you hear? Well, I'm just telling you what I think you ought to know. Oh, you see, I left word at home that Gerald was to meet me here. And if he does come, well, we'll see. We sat and waited, not talking much. Susan's face was pale and agitated. It was most exciting. Susan, with all her charm and embellishments, was really a fierce animal underneath. I could almost hear her rage seething. Are you expecting anyone? Just Gerald. Well, let him in. Oh, hello, Harvey. Susan, what's up? Why did you leave word to meet you here? It's almost midnight. Where have you been all the evening? At Milford. With whom? What's going on, anyway? What are you so excited about, Susan? What were you doing in Milford? Why, I went there on business. Oh, really? You've been behaving very strangely lately, Gerald. If you don't love me, why don't you say so like a man? What? This is all your fault, Harvey. You've been filling her head with poison. I? I had nothing to do with this. I told her that you went to Milford. All he did was to make me see clearly something I've felt for a long while. And I think this is the time to do something about it. Sue, are you out of your mind? Put that gun down. You remember it, don't you? You gave it to me. Said it might be useful in an emergency. Harvey, take that gun away from her. She's liable to shoot. She won't shoot. She's only trying to frighten you. Am I? Let's see. Oh, my shoulder. Give me that no. gun. Give no. me <laughs> Harvey. She... She's dead. Yes, Gerald. And you killed her. But... But it was an accident. She shot at me, and I was only trying to get the gun away from her. You know that's what happened. I only know that you drank from that goblet and that you killed her. What? But... Oh, you... You dirty treacherous. You planned all this so that you could get rid of me. So that you could have Susan. So you could have the firm for yourself. You'll have to do better than that to beat the gallows, Gerald. The gallows? Please, Harvey... We've been friends for a long time. You can't let me down. You wouldn't have pressed the trigger if you hadn't had murder in your heart, Gerald. You shot her because you wanted to. That's what I saw. I believe in telling the truth. Harvey, I'll turn over the business to you. I'll do anything, anything, if you'll just... I don't accept bribes, Gerald. All right. But I'll fool you. I'll call the police myself. Well, there's the phone. I'll prove my case in court. They won't convict me. Operator. Operator. Give me the police. Hello? Police department? This is Gerald Hamilton. I I just accidentally shot my wife. And my friend's home. Yes, she's dead. The address is 411 Grove Street. That's right. I killed her. Accidentally. Yes. I'll be waiting here. Cigarette, Gerald? Treating me like a condemned man, huh? I'm not going to die. 
All I have to do is tell the truth about everything, including you. Oh, but you forget, Gerald. There must be fingerprints, your fingerprints on that gun. That won't look very accidental, will it? I... But... But Harvey... You did it, Gerald. I saw you. If you don't back me up, they'll hang me like a common criminal. Please, Harvey, don't let them do that to me, please. Oh, stop whining, Gerald. What? All right, Harvey, I'll stop. You're responsible for this whole thing. You know you are. And since they can only hang me once... He raised the gun, but I'd been expecting it. I grabbed his hand, pushed it against his chest. My finger pressed on his hand on the trigger. And suddenly, he went limp. You won't get away. My alibi was perfect. All I had to do was wait for the police that he himself had called. The minutes ticked slowly away. And then... Hello, Harvey. Arthur. Glad I found you in. Say, you look as if you'd been in a fight. Arthur, you'd, uh, you'd better not come in. Why? What's the matter? No, no, you, you'd better not come in. Well, but Why? Well, uh, uh, Gerald and uh, Susan, they, they had a quarrel, and he killed her. What? And then he shot himself. What are you talking about, Harvey? Well, all right, come in. Look for yourself. Good. Good Lord. Well, tried to kill me, too. But, but why? It doesn't sound like him or like either of them. Well, I don't know why. Fit of insanity? Or maybe it was the... The goblet. Your goblet. He drank out of it, you know. The goblet? Why, that's ridiculous. As he spoke, he picked up the gun. It made me furious. All those fine fingerprints of Gerald's were now erased. Put that gun down, Arthur. There are fingerprints on it. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. I tried to get hold of myself. The stupid fool, he was going to ruin everything. But I had to keep calm. What, uh... What... What were you saying about the goblet? Why, it has no curse or magic. I just made that story up. You, you, you made it, you mean... Of course, I bought the goblet in an antique shop. As a matter of fact, I have a whole set of them. The pulses hammered away in my head. A vast, uncontrollable anger seized me. Was it because of those precious fingerprints that he'd wiped out? Or because I had believed in the goblet myself? I don't know. I only know that I had to fight to keep from grabbing him by the throat. You know, I don't think you're telling me everything you know about this horrible business, Harvey. In fact... A red hot wave came over me. I don't remember exactly what happened. Let me go! Get your hands off me! (laughs) Arthur's body is lying there too now. Next to Susan's and Gerald's. But the police will be here any minute, so I have to hurry. First, the goblet. There. That's done. That... No. Some of the broken fragments still glitter in the lamplight. I've got to crush them. Grind them to powder under my heel. But... But there are always other pieces that I can't find. There... They're hiding from me. They're afraid of me. But I'll find every piece. I'll find them. I'll find them. I'll find them. (laughs) Three bodies lying huddled on the floor. The madman crushing the fragments of the broken goblet to powder. As the police car drives up and the clock strikes twelve for... Murder at again when death appears at the door, wearing the face of a friend, and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. 
part of Harvey was played by Eric Dressler. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. tube was pointing at Matson's body. When the switch went in, there was a whining noise. And then a white light shot out of it. I know you won't believe this. When it hit the body, it, it went all soft. It was just like the bones had gone out of it. It just went all soft and kind of poured off the chair and onto the floor. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in... The Heavy Death. Now, Murder at Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story, written by Robert Newman, is a weird and fantastic nightmare called The Heavy Death. A road just outside the small town of Medford, and running up it, his face white and terror-stricken in the moonlight is a small, slight man. He pauses every once in a while, his breath whistling in his nostrils, listening, then runs on again. Finally, seeing the two green lights of the state police barracks, he moans oh. with relief and runs in. Oh, thank God, there's somebody here. I was afraid. Look, officer, you got to get me away from here fast. Huh? Yeah, just a minute, Mac. Take it easy. Uh, easy? You'll be here any minute coming after me. i got to get away, I tell you. And I'm I... telling you to take it easy. Just wait till I get through talking to Dr. Carden Dr. here. Dr. Carden? I'll... Are you Dr. Carden lives in the big white house near the river? Why, yes. Well, then you can tell him it's true. Otherwise, he won't believe me. Nobody will. It was you who swiped the big glass thing from, from your laboratory. A and... Geiger counter? You stole it? He made me do it. Oh, now, whoa. This is getting interesting. That's why Dr. Carden's here. You know anything about his assistant? Young chap named Matson? Yeah. He's dead. He killed him. Matson? Matson dead? Maybe you better start from the beginning. Tell us the whole story. Yeah, but I did it at any time. He'd be coming after me and... Oh, okay. Like I said, you won't believe it. My name's Sullivan. They call me Shell because I'm a come on with Brian's giant carnival. Weight guessing is my racket, but I turn my hand at almost anything. You know, Shell, game three, card Marty. Well, we hit town about, about ten days ago for a three-day stand. The first two nights was pretty quiet. The third one was when it happened uh, there was a pretty fair crowd around, and I was warming him up for some weight guessing, with maybe some side bets, when he came up. Okay, folks, okay, step up, step up, hurry up, and let Porky Sullivan guess your weight. A cupid doll about three pounds off, either way. Now, what do you say, lady? Your weight's not like your age, you know. Ha, <laughs> ha, it always shows. <laughs> what about you, sir? Guess your weight? Do you really think you can? Do I think? Ha <laughs> ha! Listen to him, folks. You bet your sweet life, brother. Oh, I have already. The question is, will you bet your sweet life? What? What do you mean? Look, do you want me to guess your weight or not, huh? On the terms I outlined, why, yes. I would be glad to have you try. Try, try, Sissy. Okay, folks, here we go. Now, let's see. Mm-hmm. A big man, a solid man. Hefty pair of arms on him. I say, uh, 
195 pounds. 195. And three pounds off either way, and you get a cupid out. Now, just sit right down here on the scale. There you are. Hey. Hey, what goes on here? You broke my scale. Yes. It only goes up to 350 pounds. 300. What do you got in your pockets? Would you like to look? Nah. Though I don't know how you did it, but more power to you, brother. When I lose that pay with a smile. Well, here's your QP. Thank you. No, that's not what we bet. What? What do you mean? I think you know what I mean. The carnival closes in about an hour. I'll be waiting. He went walking off slow and heavy. The crowd stood around for a couple of minutes, gaping at the broken scale and talking. Then they all decided it was some kind of a gag and went on and forgot about it. For me, I couldn't forget about it. Somehow I didn't think it was a gag. There was something about him, the way he moved, the way he talked, it scared the pants off me. I hung around for a while, getting my stuff together, and then I looked up Rube Thomas. Rube's a big guy. He used to be a wrestler, and he was just closing up his Wheel of Fortune. Hi, Rube. How are they going? Uh, not bad for one horse town. How's it you? Oh, not too bad. So some wise guy busted my scale. Huh? Busted your scale? Yeah. Um, well, Rube, that's why I come over. He was a queer duck. I just couldn't figure his pitch, but he, he said something about waiting for me when he closed up, so I thought... So, could... so you thought maybe you should have some protection walking down to the station. Yeah. <laughs> that's a hot one. What is? You're on your side bets. Well, don't worry about it. Ain't no one gonna lay a finger on you when you're with Rube Thomas. Help Rube take down the wheel. But even then, we were about the last to leave the fairgrounds. We went out through the main gate. It was pretty dark, but I wasn't worried anymore. I'd never yet seen anybody Rube couldn't handle. Then I heard footsteps. Slow and heavy ones. And then... There you are. And I've been waiting for you. Yeah? No kidding? Just a guy? Yeah, uh-huh. Okay, Bob. What's the pitch? What's your racket? Racket? There's no racket. Your friend and I had a bet. I've come to collect. Yeah? Well, I'll tell you a funny thing about carnivals. When we pull up stakes and get ready to go, all bets are off. I'm afraid this one can't be called off. You see, I need him. You need him? Yes. You bet your life, remember? And you lost. You mean you... Oh, you're nuts. There are people who have thought so, but I'm not. Shall we go? No. No, I ain't gonna. Rube. Take it easy, Shell. I told you all bets was off, mister. Now you're gonna blow am I gonna have to get rough with you. I wouldn't if I were you. No? Well, here's one just for luck. Oh, no, my hand. I warned you. Oh, you. I'll break your bloody neck. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't want to hurt you. <laughs> You probably won't believe what happened afterwards. He didn't swing or anything. He just kind of dropped his fist on Rube's head. And he smashed in his skull like it hit him with a lead pipe. Good Lord, you, you killed him. Yes. Shall we go? No, no, I... Look at me. Into my eyes. That's right. Now remember this. You're mine. Mine to do it exactly as I wish. And you do exactly what I wish. Do you understand? Yes, yes, sir, yes. Good. Then let's go. Something happened. Happened to me then and there. Something I ain't over yet. It wasn't just that I was scared, more scared than I've ever been in my life. It was something else. When I looked into his eyes, it was like I just plain didn't count. That no one or nothing did. Then I just had to do whatever he wanted, whatever he said. We got in his car and drove to his to your place, Doc, and we stopped in front of it, and he pointed at a kind of low building behind it. That is Dr. Carden's laboratory. He has something there I need, a Geiger counter. You're going in and get it for me. You mean swipe it? Yes. It would take too much time to make one of my own, and as I said, I need it. Now, it's a long glass tube, about this size, with filaments inside yeah, it. Yeah, but suppose somebody sees me. Suppose somebody comes... Gardens away in Washington with that childish atomic energy condition of theirs. There's only Matson, his assistant, and he must be sleeping. 
If he should try and stop you, well, you'll have to take care of him. But remember, I want that Geiger counter. Like I said, it was like I was numb. Didn't have a mind of my own. I did it. Found an open window. Went in and got what he wanted. Brought it out to him. He didn't say a word. He just put it in the back of the car and we drove away. It was about a quarter of twelve when we got to his place. Big rambling house at the foot of a mountain. He took me around the back to a kind of iron door and... Well, it was... It was like out of Buck Rogers, the 25th century. Big glass tubes, dynamos, wires. He must have noticed me staring because he said... Go ahead, look around. There's equipment here that doesn't exist any place else in the world. Yeah, but... What's it all for? And if I told you, you'd be even more frightened than you are now. By the way, what's your name? Sullivan. Sean Sullivan. I'm Dr. Vance. Dr. Brian Vance. Doctor? Of nuclear physics. Without doubt, the greatest scientist in the world today. Do you know anyone else who has been able to convert most of the elements of the human body into the heavy isotopes? Uh, look, I don't know what you mean, but is that... Yes. That is why not only my weight, but the entire atomic mass of my body is... What's that? It sounds like a car. Yes, but who... Oh, Matson. You must have heard you in the laboratory. Followed us. Well, I was as quiet as I could be honest. Yeah, there's nothing to be worried or excited about. Hello, Matson. Vance. I should have known it was you. Should have known what was me? A Stolar Geiger. You've done an awful lot of strange things in your career, Vance, but this time you've gone just a little too far. This time I've got you dead to rights. I'm afraid it's just the other way around, Matson. What do you mean? What? Vance. You don't really think I'd let you or anyone interfere with what I'm doing, do you? You... You killed him, you... Of course. Drag him over there out of the way. There's a certain experiment I'm just about ready to try, and his body will come in very handy. Sullivan staring at him in abject horror, Dr. Vance turns away from the body on the floor, lumbers over to one of his instruments, and begins examining it. And far away, in the town's church steeple, the clock strikes twelve for murder at midnight. <laughs> Back to Murder at Midnight and The Heavy Death. It's just a moment later. Sergeant Rowe and Dr. Carden are staring incredulously at Sullivan as he pauses for a moment in his terrifying story. Then the trooper says, We did find Thomas's body out by the fairground, but it was an accident. Hit by a truck or something. You mean this Vance killed Madsen just like that? Shot him without ten and a half. Uh, sure sounds to me like... Dr. Carden, what do you think? I don't know, Sergeant. I do know Vance. I knew that he had a laboratory somewhere near here. And, well, it's true that he probably knows as much about nuclear physics as anyone in the world. We tried several times to get him to work with us during the war, but he laughed at us, said that what we were doing was childish. Yes, but, but, but this other business is changing himself, making himself heavy. Yeah, even his voice was heavy-like. Is that possible, Doctor? Theoretically, yes, I suppose it is. After all, Professor Yuri did it with hydrogen, made heavy water, and we've done it with uranium. Yes, but why would he want to do it? Why? There I can only guess. For all his genius, I've always felt Vance was a little mad. It's possible he believes that by changing the atomic weight of his body, he can make it immune to disease. Yeah, that's right. It's true. He said he was going to live forever. Ah. Well, go on, Sullivan. What happened after that? made me help him do things around the laboratory. Wire and stuff like that. Seems he got tired pretty easy and his hands was too heavy to do work that was delicate-like. Maybe that's why he needed someone else around. Finally, I couldn't keep my eyes open anymore and I fell asleep on a cot in a corner. I don't know if he ever slept or not. If he did, I never seen him. When I woke up, it was around noon and he had Matson's body propped up in a chair against a... just a kind of a silver screen. 
Will you finally get up, eh, Sullivan? I was just going to wake you. Uh, yes, sir. I... I'm kind of hungry, sir. Yes, food. Well, you're going to help me with a little experiment first, and then we can eat. Yes, sir. Uh, what kind of experiment? Do you... You mean... Why, yes. An experiment on our friend Matson's body. He won't mind. Just a little calcium transmutation. First... We switch on our alpha generator here. Then we make a few frequency adjustments. What? What are you going to do? You'll see. Over there, stand by that master switch on the converter. When I give the word... Yes, sir. You let it climb just a little higher. A little higher. Now! Oh, good Lord. No, no! There's a kind of glass tube pointing at Madsen's body. When I threw the switch, a white light shot out of it. And... I know you won't believe this. When it hit the body, it went all soft. It was like the bones had gone out of it. It just went all soft and kind of poured off the chair out of the floor. I must have faded or something when I come to. Vance was standing over me, smiling. Anything the matter, Sullivan? Don't you feel well? Uh, yes, sir. I, I'm all right. I was just a, That was the most awful, most terrible thing. Sullivan, if you were a soldier and you saw that happen to the man next to you, would you feel much like fighting after that? What? You, you mean you're going to do that? I'd that... advise you not to ask too many questions. We'll dispose of the rest of the body later, but now let's eat. Like I said, it was just about a week ago. I can't really tell you what happened after that because I was in a daze most of the time. We worked, him showing me what to do, wire and solder and stuff. We ate. Sometimes he let me sleep. Then this morning it happened. I woke up at about ten... He was standing looking at this thing we've been making. Well, Sullivan, it's finished. Just a few adjustments and we were ready to go. Yes, sir. And I'm profoundly grateful to you for your help. I will show you how grateful in a very concrete fashion. Hey, you mean you, you're going to let me go? You're going to let me go? go? Really, Sullivan? <laughs> That's a little foolish, isn't it? Well, I don't know. I just thought... Yeah, I, I guess it is. Well... Where are you going? Uh, inside to fix some breakfast. No, Sullivan, no food for you. Not today. No food? No, because tonight you're going to enjoy a tremendous experience. One I experienced myself several months ago. And the process is much simpler when the stomach is empty. Process? You... You mean you... You're going to make me like you? Heavy? Yes, Sullivan. I told you I was grateful to you and... Oh, no, Doc. No, please, will you? For heaven's sake... You're being rather childish. I'm not going to bother detailing what it will mean to you physiologically, the immunities it will give you. I will merely tell you that we'll do it tonight. Getting changed to become like he was. Heavy as lead. Well, it did something to me. It was like I'd been dope, hypnotized. All that time, afraid to do anything to make him mad. Now, now I was even more scared to stay. I made out like everything was fine, and I waited. I waited and watched. Then about an hour ago, I got my chance. He went into the house to get something. He didn't lock the door. I was out like a shot. Grabbed his car and started down the driveway. As I went past the house, I heard a window open. Gentlemen, come back! Come back! You'll regret this! You'll regret it! That's the story. I was so jittery, I went to a ditch just outside of town and had to run the west of the way. I don't care whether you believe me or not, whether you think I'm nuts, what you do to me. I just want one thing. Get me away from here. Get me far away fast. Because he's going to be coming after me. I know it. Well, I'm not saying what I think. Not yet. What about you, Dr. Carden? I, uh, I wouldn't like to say either. Knowing Vance, I believe he's capable of everything Sullivan told us. And theoretically, everything he described is possible. Oh, I told you, I don't care whether you believe me or not. Just get me away from here. I can't for an hour or so. I have to call Bridgeton and have them send down some men. Then we can really go into this. In the meantime, I'll... I'll put you in one of the detention cells. You'll 
I'll be okay there. Are they strong? Really strong? Plenty strong enough to keep you in and anyone else out. Come on. Gee, Sarge, I was starting to get a little worried. I was a... You. Yes, Sullivan. You didn't really think you were going to get away, did you? Oh. What are you going to do? You can't do anything. The cell door is locked. And if it... Let's see. Yeah, you see? You can't break it down. You can't. It's steel. <laughs> yes, Sullivan. But steel can be smashed if it has to be. No. I told you you'd regret running away, didn't no, I? No, no. I'll look, I'll come back. I'll do anything you want. I'm, I'm afraid it's too late, Sullivan. No. Too late for anything but this. Dr. Carton. Uh, did you hear it too? I'm not sure. But it did sound like... This way, quick. Good Lord. Look at that cell door. Oh. Sullivan, his, his skull smashed like an eggshell. Well, Sergeant, I guess I must be nuts, too. Or, look, Doc, he must have just left here. If we wait for the men from Bridgeton, give him time enough to get back to his place of those blasted ray things of his, there's no telling what he'll do, how many lives he'll cost. But if we leave right now, the two of us, maybe we can get there before him, cut him off. What do you say? You game? I'm game, Sergeant. Let's go. <laughs> Must be it. Right ahead. The laboratory's probably around and back. Well, Sergeant, the lights are on. Yeah. Maybe he left them on when he came into town and got Sullivan. Well, maybe... No. No, listen. He's back. We're too late. What in heaven's name is that? An electrostatic generator or a cyclotron. He's... Oh, good Lord. Up the mountain there. Look! Great Scott! Looks like a hole or something. But it's moving. A neutron beam. Disintegrating. Eating its way into the mountain. He must have found some way of harnessing... Dr. Garden, swinging his way. Must have seen us. Come on, run. No good, Sergeant. Seems to have a range of almost half a mile. But, but eating through solid rock that way. If it hits us... <laughs> You came to see just what Vance was doing, eh, Cotton? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, take a good look. The last one you'll ever take at anything. So you shall be the first to... Uh, did you think that you were going to get away with it, Vance? What? Who's that? Take a look at the guy. Gentlemen, it's too much. I've got to cut that down. And what'll happen when you release the load? But I, but I've got to cut it down. Besides, you're, you're just some of it. Yeah, that's because I'm dead that you join me. You can't do it alone. It's too heavy. Too slow. It's time to be high. Good Lord, I... The generator. I've got to cut that down, too. Dr. Garden. Dr. Garden, where are you? Over. Over here, Sergeant. Are you all right? A little shaken up, but yes, I'm all right. Oh, the laboratory. A whole house. Look. Yes. What happened? Something. Something got out of control. Too much centrifugal force. Or the load released too suddenly, and the whole thing exploded. Now there are things that we'll never know. Except something we knew already. That science can either be man's servant or his master and his doom. And as I stand there, gazing at the smoking ruins that were once Vance's laboratory, through the blessed silence comes the distant clang of the clock in the town's church steeple. For the second time, striking twelve for... Murder! 
again when death hovers like a dark cloud and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Shil Sullivan was played by Frank Reddick. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. to be, and now, and here, she's got to die. Oh, Betty. I say yes. Here, I'll hold her arm. All right, Betty, but... No, 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 don't! I don't want to die! Oh, Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight. When the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Nightmare. of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Joseph Ruskall is one of the most terrifying and fantastic nightmares we've ever heard. Its title, Nightmare. Twelve o'clock. Mm. I, I wish you'd let me get some sleep. Mm. Oh, thank heaven! Oh, it was must have been just a dream. Oh, thank the Lord! Oh, Ernie, it was so real. I dreamed somebody was leaning over me just now with a pillow. Oh, it was horrible. They were trying to smother me to death. And Ernie. Yeah? It was you. What? Oh, 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 oh,
Oh, that's a beaut. Uh, where's the light? Oh, my aching back. Why, why, you poor, foolish little... Come here, Butch. I'll kiss you back. Tonight. No, no, don't touch me. Keep away. Huh? What is this? That pillow in your hand. Oh, for crying out, Bells. Can't I even straighten it out? Oh, sorry, dear. Gee, don't mind me, but that, that horrible nightmare, it seems so real. Darling, wasn't that crazy? You, the sweetest, gentlest husband in the world. Well, then why... Oh, Ernie, now please don't look so hurt. Now I can't even look hurt. I just murdered my wife in her sleep, didn't I? No, you were just about to. I mean... I... Oh, no, what the... Everything's happening tonight. <laughs> Hello. What? Who? Wrong number. And what's more, this is a heck of a time to be ringing. Why, what a nerve. <laughs> On a night. Thought maybe that was the police you phoned in your dream. Now, now will you go to sleep? Ernie Kraft, I'm sure I didn't mean to insinuate anything. I was just telling you my dream. You asked, didn't you? Oh, you're a character. I guess I'll have to put you in that book I never wrote, too. Well, now what? That was in it, too. Huh? That book you never wrote. You've nagged about it so much, no wonder. Oh, and that look when you bent over me like a madman. Oh. Ernie, what on earth do you suppose made me have a nightmare? That's easy. You would insist on eating hamburgers after the show tonight. Yes, I did, didn't I, when we got out of the movies. Hamburgers, of course. Ernie, they were part of my dream, too. Hamburgers. Oh. Ernie, stop punching on that pillow, please. All right, all right. Go ahead, then. Better tell me your dream, all of it. Neither of us will sleep until you do. I'll just light this butt. Now, oh, let's have it. gruesome details. Well, I don't know if I can remember now. It was all so hazy and terrifying. Well, what happened before I smothered you with a pillow? A crazy quilt. Something about your job, and I was a millstone around your neck, and hamburgers, and you hated me, and July 15th. July 15th? Yes, I can't imagine what that meant. Look, look, start at the start. Why did I decide to murder you? Because of that other woman, your secret love. Huh? You promised her you'd kill me tonight when I was asleep. My... Secret love? Yes, she had you in her spell. Oh, that's kind of bad casting, isn't it, Butch? I'm the dishes and dustpan type, remember? In the five years we've been married, have I ever looked I at know, another... I know, I know. I told you it was a crazy dream. Maybe you want me to eliminate my one night a week out, too. My Saturday gin rummy with the boys. Oh, no. Uh, who was my secret love? Did she uh, have a face? <laughs> no, this is the silliest part of it, Ernie. It's absolutely ridiculous. It was that girl, Betty Daniels. Betty Daniels? <laughs> Who's she? You remember that tall, dark-haired artist I introduced you to at Cape Cod last summer? Cape Cod? At Co the exhibition. No, I don't... Oh, wait a minute. Trousers, <laughs> long cigarette holder, yes. very intense. Yes, very intense. But what the devil... What was she doing in your dream? We said hello to her, we walked off, and... That was that. Uh, casual. Yes, I know. I hardly remember her myself. I can't imagine why I dreamt of her. Why? No, no, no don't touch me. Don't. No. Oh, that dream. That awful dream. So crazy. And yet it seemed to be telling me something, warning me. <laughs> and weird. You know how dreams are. First thing I remember is Provincetown and us looking at the art exhibition just the way we did last summer. Only now the picture was about ten feet tall and hanging crooked. And then she came along. Betty Daniels. Just the way she did then. Hello, Helen. And I introduced you the same as I did then. Only not... Exactly the same. Like in a dream. You know, silly. Betty Daniels, this is my husband, Ernest. He is very faithful to me. How do you do? How do you do? We've never met. That's a marvelous Gloria painting, Helen, don't you think? Or 
Do you prefer hamburgers? Well, I... My wife prefers hamburgers, Miss Daniels. Oh. Oh, I didn't know. Only after a movie, though. Anyway, I'm sure I can't tell one painting from another. My husband's the art lover in the family, I guess. And I just tag along for the fish. Only I don't like fish. I like hamburgers. I know. You don't wear trousers like I do. You're... Luffy. Betty and I met on the beach here, and she's a painter. Our rowboats got tangled. That's how we met. Yes, it was all very casual. I hardly remember. Well, well. Ernie and I are going back to New York today. Isn't that a shame? I wish you two wouldn't stare at each other so. Well, we better run along, Helen. Lots of packing to do. Ernie has got to get back to his silly old job. He's a reporter. A reporter? Shouldn't he write a book he never wrote? Well, imagine that's what he always says. Well, goodbye. I'm wondering why I'm thinking of you now. Goodbye. 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 The scenes sort of dissolve into each other Like a kind of dream movie And I'm trembling with fright Because I have a feeling I know how the plot's going to end The next thing I remember, Ernie I'm in a penthouse apartment on Park Avenue Everything zigzag, even the butler And I'm the maid, Helen, there And what I'm doing is turning pages for Betty Daniels while she plays the piano for you, Ernie. Isn't that crazy? Neither of you hardly notice me at all, and I keep trying to open my mouth uh, 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 like that, but it's stuck, and I'm absolutely frozen at what I overhear. Darling. Yes, Butch. Love our loveness. Out of this world. Ah, this is heaven. Ernie, do you ever call your wife Butch? Never. What gave you that idea? I hate the very sight of her. <laughs> she's really a little ignoramus. You're telling me she prefers hamburgers. Ernie, do you think she suspects yet? Of course not. She thinks I meant a gin rummy game. Darling, you're blind, but she's not. She knows. She knows? How? How'd she find out? You may go, Helen. Helen, do you hear me? Why don't you go? Answer me. Have you lost her tongue? Oh, well, there's murder in the air. How'd she find out, Betty? Tell me. Darling, do you suppose she doesn't know what happened last summer in Provincetown? After we all said goodbye, you came to look for your cigarette lighter. She knew you hadn't lost your lighter, that you'd come back to ask me for my <laughs> New York telephone number. Uh, 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 she knew? Uh, of course, intuition. She knows we've been having a secret affair ever since. Uh, uh, I can't go on like this. I'm tired of being just a gin rummy excuse. Ernie, if you love me, you'll, you'll do what I promised. But I pity her so. Don't be a fool. Isn't it her fault you never wrote that book you never wrote? It's true. She wouldn't let me give up my job. She's a millstone around my uh, neck. Uh, and get rid of her, Ernie. Get rid uh, of her and I'll bring your genius to the world. I've plenty of money and you can, you can give up reporting and write that book. Fulfill your destiny. Fulfill my destiny. Oh, Betty, you'll help me. Yes. But only if you forget July 15th. You'll forget about July 15th. It won't mean a thing to you from now on. Not a thing. I promise. And you'll do away with it. The way I told you. Yes. Like you told me. The pillow. The pillow. Uh, 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 Don't let her hear. Just look at her standing there at the piano. You've been spying on us, Helen, haven't you? Haven't you? Answer, have you lost your tongue? Now, don't try to fool us. We know you're the real Helen and, and not the maid. She's heard everything you've said, Ernie. So we'll have to kill her now. Unless, unless she gives me a divorce. Will you give him a divorce? Answer or we'll finish you right now. Hey, well, here's the pillow, Ernie. Right now. I'll hold her on. Answer, Helen. Don't make me do it. Answer, Helen. I pity you, but I hate you. Let her cry. Look at me. Trick and dumb. Her mouth moving, but she's not saying anything. What are you trying to say? Helen, please don't make me do it. Will you give me a divorce? Tell me. Tell me. Ernie. Uh, Ernie, stop. Oh, we are. Do you want her body found here? Now hang for it. She's got to die. She's got to die. No, no, not here. Not like this. There must be some other way. Later tonight, Ernie. After the movies. Hamburgers. She'll get hungry for hamburgers. She's bound to. The waiter will ask her how she wants them. That'll give you the clue. And then, when she's asleep, 
<laughs> and they'll find her in her bed. <laughs> the perfect crime. Don't you see, Ernie? Hamburgers. A frightened girl reliving a dream that was more terrible than any reality. A dream that could even become more terrible. As the clock on the mantel takes on and the hands draw closer to 12 o'clock and... Murder! At midnight. And now, back to Murder at Midnight and... Nightmare. Well, let's hear the rest of this dream of yours, Helen. What happened after that? Well, it was after that that it really got bad. It was so crazy, but so real. I don't know what stopped you, Ernie. Kept you from killing me then, but you didn't. And still, I knew you were going to. You dragged me out into the street and then into a movie and then out again. And I looked at you and you were crying. Because you'd made up your mind to finish me off when we got home. You should have let me write that book, Helen. You should have. And I kept crying, I love you, Ernie. Don't kill me, please. Don't kill me tonight. But I've got to. I've got to. I pity you, but I've got to. And you pulled me along through the streets again. I was terrified. And then I saw a policeman and I cried to him, officer! Yes? What is it, lady? Please save me. My husband here wants to kill me. Oh, wants to kill you, eh? <laughs> Why, that's a crime. <laughs> a felony. Oh, why are you joking? Don't joke about it. Do something, please. I'm frightened to death. Don't pay any attention to her officer. She's dreaming. I'm not. Don't believe him. He wants to wait till I go to sleep tonight. And then as soon as I fall asleep... Oh, I'll come burn. now, lady. He wouldn't do it to you in your sleep. Why, you're cute. Not in her sleep now, would you, mister? Of course not, officer. Not in her sleep. As a matter of fact, we're stopping off first for a hamburger. She's hungry. No, 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 I'm not. I mean, I am, but I don't dare. I'm starving, but I don't dare. He's just waiting for me to order one, officer, to see what I'll say. And then he'll take me home and kill me. Oh, 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 oh. lady, stop. Sure, and you're breaking me hard. <laughs> Come along, dear. No, no, officer, please protect me. Don't let him take me. Please. Come along, I say, darling. And then we were in the little lunch room in our neighborhood, around the corner from our house, sitting on stools. The counter man came over to us. He winked at you, Ernie, and you winked back at him, and he said... Evening, folks. What do you have? You looked at me, but I shook my head. I shook my head and the tears were streaming down my face. I tell you what, Joe, make it two hamburgers. <laughs> right. Rare, medium, or well? Medium, Joe. Make mine medium. Right. And the little lady? How do you have yours, Helen? How do you like yours? <laughs> make hers medium, too. Two hamburgers. Medium. Two medium. Come on out. And what do you have on them, folks? Relish or onion? Relish. Make mine with relish, Joe. Right. And the little lady? The man's talking to you, Helen. How'll you have yours? Answer him, I say. Answer him. This is it. How'll you have yours? Well, I won't tell him. If I do, you'll know. You'll know how to do it. So I won't tell him. I won't. The next thing I dreamt, we were home again. Sitting in the parlor. Everything exactly the same, Ernie. Just like tonight before we went to bed. But in my dream, I was sitting paralyzed in a cold sweat, waiting for the word. The word from you that meant my death. Oh, well, Butch, I guess we better hit the hay. What do you say? What do you say, darling? No, uh... Wait, I, uh... Ernie... Did I tell that counterman how I wanted my hamburger, sir? Did of course, I... dear. What did I say? I can't seem to remember. Oh, I forget to come along to bed. No, no, I don't want to go to bed yet. Please don't make me go to bed. I'm scared. Helen. <laughs> come to bed, darling. Like a good little girl. 
Hmm? We went to bed. And then you said... And now, lights out, eh? I tried to think of everything I knew to keep awake. I wondered whether I ought to count to a hundred or whether counting would put me to sleep. I tried not to count, but I felt myself getting sleepier and sleepier. Asleep, honey? I heard, but I pretended not to. I fought to keep my eyes open. I knew I would die if I closed them. Asleep, Butch? I didn't answer. I couldn't if I wanted to. I was so scared. And then pretty soon I heard you stirring ever so quietly. And in a moment you were leaning over me. Oh, Ernie, I know it was just a dream, but it was so real. And there was hatred in your eyes and there was a pillow in your hand and I knew you were going to do it right then and I... <laughs> Oh, 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 that's a beaut, that's a honey. Oh, my aching back. Darling, when you have a nightmare, you sure do. That golden brown and crazy. Wasn't it crazy? <laughs> Oh, darling, wasn't it mad? Oh, oh, oh wait till I tell it around the office tomorrow. Oh, 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 oh this is too good, Jim. But, Ernie, how does a person have a horrible dream like that? What does it mean? Oh, it's a cinch. I'll interpret it for you. And without a dream book, you too. You will? Well, go on, then, Ernie. Tell me. Okay, then here it is. First of all, a dream always means the opposite, right? Did you ever hear that? Yes, I have. That's right, it does. Which means I must love you simply awful. Granted? <laughs> <laughs> Granted, silly. But goodness, what about the rest of it? Easiest thing in the world. Darling, where'd we go tonight? To a movie. What kind of a movie? It was a, a murder story. <gasps> Gee, that's right. Do you think that was... Now, don't interrupt, Butch. Who was starring in the movie? Betty Davis. Repeat the first name. Betty. And the villainous in the dream, my secret love, the girl we met last summer was also Betty. Betty... Daniel. Oh! Well, that gave you Betty on the brain when you went to sleep tonight, and movies, and murder, uh, and those hamburgers you did stop to eat after the show wrapped up the whole sequence. And no wonder, they're still lying on my stomach, too. <laughs> well, what was the pillow doing in it? Sweetness and light, what were you talking about early this evening? That chore you intend to get after someday? Oh, yes, I've got to stuff the pillows. They're caved in the way the feathers have come up. Right, that's your pillow you had on the brain, which uh, which brings me back to the hamburgers. Yes, I was going to ask you, I mean, that nonsense of how did I want my hamburgers, what did all that mean for heaven's sake? Precious, how did you order your hamburgers done tonight, remember? No, I can't recall. Oh, of course you can. Think now. How do you almost always order your hamburgers? Smothered in onions. Oh, Ernie, of course. Smothered in onions. Smother, pillow, smother with a pillow. <laughs> Jack. Oh, my heaven's sake, alive. Oh, my gosh. So that was it. <laughs> oh, if that doesn't be. Ernie, that was wonderful. Really. The way you did that figured that all out. I think you'd make a terrific detective. Yeah, so I'm a police reporter. Close enough. <laughs> Darling, it's made me think so. But maybe I have been a little bit selfish. What do you mean? Well, that book you always wanted to write. Maybe I ought to, to let you give up your job and try. Oh, and have us both starve? Nuts. Anyway, in my sane moments, Helen, I've always known the truth. I'm no writer. If I had it in me, it would have come out of me. Job or no job. I could go back to work again, you know. I could take up nursing again. It was pretty hard, no, but no, I... No, 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 nonsense. I won't have it. I won't say any more about it, and that's fine. You're a swell guy, though, Butch. Go off or two. Oh, there was one thing more, Ernie. Hmm? Yeah? What do you suppose that was... That was all that about July 15th, about you're forgetting July 15th. What did that mean, you know? Yes. Don't you? No, I can't. It does seem familiar, but I can't seem to... Where are you going? Get something out of my wallet. Wait a minute. What's the date of our anniversary, Ellen? Hmm? Oh, July 15th, of course. Tomorrow. What was that? Right. You've had that on the brain, too. Oh. Here. little present for you, darling. Oh, what on earth... 
take two railroad tickets to Montreal. Right again. We're taking an anniversary trip. I wanted to surprise you when you woke up, but... Well, anyway, happy anniversary, baby. Oh, Ernie, oh, you great big precious darling. How can I ever... You didn't forget. You always did before, but this time you didn't. Oh, Ernie, I just can't stand it. First that dream and then finding out that it did me just the opposite. No, 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 Helen, don't. It's don't. so sweet of you. I'm so thrilled. Montreal, where we had our honeymoon and you haven't forgotten. Oh, Ernie, I, I do hope I've been a good wife to you. And if there's anything I ever... I mean, if you want me to, I can always change. Oh, darling, I wouldn't want you any different for the world. I want you to stay just the same sweet little girl I married. And now, let's get some shut-eye, huh? Lights out? All right. And I'm going to put the tickets right here under the pillow. And have a happy dream for a change. <sighs> Good night, Butch. You haven't kissed me? Good night, dear. again when death appears out of the darkness, wearing the face of one you know, and the clock strike twelve for murder at midnight. Marlo Kellum was played by Elspeth Eric. Walter Vaughn was Ernie. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. kept on walking through the mist. And suddenly I started hearing footsteps behind me. I turned around, and then I saw him. He was walking along slow, dragging his feet, walking as if he couldn't see. His face was all covered with blood. But I know who it was. It was Miller, the guy I'd killed. 
Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest, our fear is the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute, then. The dead come back. <laughs> Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by William Morewood will threaten your sanity. Its title, The Dead Come Back. About one o'clock in the morning, on a dark, deserted street, standing in the doorway of a gloomy brownstone house, a man with a wild expression on his face rings the bell desperately. There is no answer. And he rings again. Then... Hey, Doc Padgett. Why, yes. The brain doc knows what goes on inside a guy's head. Well, yes, I'm a psychiatrist. I've got to talk to you. It's very late. If you come back tomorrow during office hours... Now, Doc. Something's been happening to me. Something that's driving me nuts. I'm that... sorry, but... Get inside. Well, be careful with that. He won't go off until I pull a trigger. <laughs> Sit down, Doc. Very well. And just to make sure we understand each other, I'll put this gun here on the desk. And my watch. We got just half an hour to get everything cleared up. And then? And then, I got a guy to kill. Suppose we start at the beginning. Your name? Lefty O'Connor. O'Connor? So you heard of me, huh? I'm not sure, but the Tilson murder case. That's right. But as I remember That's it... That's right. He decided I was nuts, put me away. But get this straight, Doc. Yes? I was never out of my head, and I ain't now. I see. Insanity was something that I cooked up to keep from burning. I played it up all right. Good enough to make monkeys out of the doctors and the jury. But when I got to the nut house, it was different. I didn't have to pretend no more. You know, Doc, some of them wax act just as sane as you and me. Yeah. I was getting along fine. Till two nights ago. When I was called in to see the superintendent. He was a white-haired old guy. Name of Miller. Ah, oh, sit down, Lefty. Cigarette? Thanks, Mr. Miller. Here you are. What's that? This? Just a music box. It plays when you open the lid. That ain't just a... What are you trying to do to me? Oh, what do you mean, Lefty? I just offered you a... That's the box they kept talking about at the trial. The one old Mrs. Tilson kept her jewels in. I'm afraid you're mistaken, Lefty. In a pig's eye. I know what you're trying to do. But I don't remember nothing. Nothing, you hear? Then why does this tune seem to disturb you, sir? Never mind why. Turn it off. Yes, of course. Take it easy, Lefty. I called you in here because I want to help you. You're trying to trick me into admitting I knew what I was doing when I hit old lady. Nothing of the kind. Next, you'll be asking me where I hid the jewels. Don't you think I know that routine? There's no routine here, Lefty. You're a liar, Mr. Miller. You got me in here to give me the third degree to try to break me down all over again. Well, you won't do it. Not again. I've had enough. Lefty, I'll put down that paperweight. I didn't have no idea of escaping when I hit him, Doc. I was just scared. I was scared of what would happen if he kept after me. When I found a gun in his desk drawer, I began making plans fast. I brought him around. I told him exactly what he had to do. We went out, got into his car, started for the gate. Okay, Miller, it's up to you now. I understand. Now remember, I'll be lying back here with this gun against your spine. Evening, Mr. Miller. Uh, hello, George. Going out kind of late, aren't you, sir? Uh, yes. Something unexpected came up. Uh, you wouldn't be smuggling out anyone under that rug and back, sir, huh? I might. <laughs> <laughs> yep, looks suspicious. Just the right shape for a man. But I'll take a chance on you, sir. Okay, Charlie. Open up for the super. Good night, Mr. Miller. Turn the left fork, 
Park here. Ah, the Ganville Road. I was afraid of this, Lefty. The Tilson Estate's up this way, isn't it? You're too smart for your own good, Mr. Miller. You can turn off here. But there's no road. In under the trees. What happens now? Do we walk the rest of the way? One of us does. Get out. You're no use to me anymore. Let you know. Put that gun away. You can't. You fool. You won't get rid of me this way. You are. I left him there beside his car and started walking. I don't know how long I was at it. Maybe an hour when I hit the outskirts of town. The light was kind of funny. It was different from anything I'd ever seen. It was kind of yellow. Kind of yellow mixed with a mist that was curling up. Maybe I was tired, I don't know. But suddenly I began to hear footsteps behind me. I looked around, and then I saw him. He was walking on the other side of the road, blind. As if he couldn't see where he was going. His feet were kind of dragging along. His face was covered with blood. But through the blood, I could see that it was him. Miller. I don't know what happened then, Doc. I must have passed out. Because the next thing I knew, somebody... People, faces bending over me. He's coming too, Tom. Yeah. How are you feeling, chum? Hey. He's as, as white as if he'd seen a ghost. Who, who are you? I'm Ruth Mason. This is my brother, Tom. We live right by. We heard you yell and came running out. Did did, did, did you see anyone else? I know. No road? No. You were lying <laughs> right in the middle of the road till we pulled you off. What happened? Did the car hit you? I don't remember. Well, take his arm. Help him up, Tom. Okay, sure. Here we go, Mo. <clears throat> the name is uh, Sims. Johnny Sims. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm all right. <laughs> you look kind of bushed tonight. Uh, I, I, I've been walking all night. Uh, out of a job, so he and broke. Uh, well, our house is right over there. You come on in and we'll... Oh, fix thanks. It. i got to keep moving. What's the rush if you're just looking for a job? Well, I... Uh, hey... Cops coming this way. Probably looking for that man that escaped from the state hospital. That's right. They said that. But, Johnny, what's the matter? You look as if you're going to faint again. I guess I must be worse than I thought. Look, does that invite still hold? Well, of course. Right this way. Something more, Johnny? No, thanks, Ruth. Couldn't manage another thing. Pull up. Oh, well, then you lie right down on that sofa. That is, if Tom will get off with his paper. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. I was just reading some more about that guy, Lefty O'Connor, that broke out of the asylum. Seems he forced a superintendent to drive him out in a car. Please, Tom, let's not talk about it. it. Gives me the creeps to think of anyone like that being loose. Maybe he ain't so bad. He's a murderer, Johnny. A homicidal maniac. How do you know? Maybe the super deserved killing. The super? Yeah. But the paper doesn't say anything about the super being killed. Well, Ruth said... I meant the old lady, Mrs. Tilson. Oh. Yeah, I I guess I must have heard. Uh, Maybe I just thought... I'll try the radio. Maybe there's some late news on it. Well, you're probably right, Johnny. The super wouldn't stand a chance. Sure. The way I figured... What's the matter, Johnny? Turn that off. What? I said turn it off! Why? Johnny. Hey, what gives? Well, I'm sorry. I, I don't like radios. Well, it's all right, Johnny. We understand. Now, suppose we show you to your room and you take a good long sleep. I must have slept like a dead man, Doc. It was dark when I woke up. There was nobody in the house. I switched on the lamp... And looked at my watch a few minutes before midnight. Didn't have much time if I wanted to get the jewels and blow town before morning. So I started for the door, 
But before I reached it, it opened. And standing there, smiling, kind of sad-like, was Miller. Hello, Lefty. Did you get the jewels? You! It can't be you. You're, you're dead. I told you you wouldn't get rid of me so easily. What do you want with me? Nothing, Lefty. Just what I wanted before, to help you. You're lying. You still think you can break me? Give me to confess, but I'll show you. I must have hit the lights, Doc, or maybe they were never on, because suddenly the room was all dark. I struck a match. I bent down to look at Miller, make sure that he was really dead this time. And... I ain't crazy, Doc. You gotta believe me. But the man lying face up on the floor was Tom Mason. A dead man who came back. And now, a second victim, as the hands of the clock move inexorably to the witching hour. And yet another. Murder at midnight. <laughs> to Murder at Midnight. To Lefty O'Connor, sitting in a psychiatrist's office with a gun in front of him, trying to convince the doctor and himself that he is sane. My hand was shaking so much that the match went out. It was Tom, all right. Tom Mason, dead. But it was better that way than what I thought because it meant that Miller hadn't come back from the grave. I probably just imagined I heard him talking to me. I frisked Mason, I got the keys to his car, and went out. It was a little coupe parked in the driveway. I opened the door. I was just getting in when... Hello, Johnny. Huh? Ruth. <laughs> you look a little better than you did before. How do you feel? Oh, I, uh, fine, fine. Oh, that's good. You were sleeping so soundly when I left it. Are you going somewhere? Well, yeah, yeah. There was something I had to do, and, uh, Tom told me I could borrow his car. Oh, all right. I'll go inside. No, and... you can't go in there. Well, what do you mean? Why not? Well, I mean, uh... Such a swell night. Uh, how about a little drive, Ruth? <laughs> but what about your errand? Well, that'll just take a minute. it will be swell having you along. Well, I don't know. I I don't suppose Tom will mind. But... I'm sure he won't. <laughs> well, then, all right. <sighs> I guess that's one of the wonderful things about life. You just never know when something completely unexpected will happen. <laughs> that's right, baby. You just never know. <laughs> so quiet, Johnny. Huh? <laughs> you asked me to come driving with you, and I do. You don't say a thing to me. What should I be saying? Well, you might start by telling me something about yourself. Like I said, I'm just a guy looking for work. What kind of a job did you have before? Chauffeur. Well, that sounds interesting. Did you work around here? Why? I just wondered. You seem to know the road so well. Listen, baby, let's not talk about me. I'd rather hear about you. There's not much to tell. I'm 21, fancy free, and I work for a living. I'm a nurse in a psychiatrist's office. A what? Psychiatrist. A doctor who, well, helps people who are disturbed mentally. Like people who, uh, see things that ain't there? Oh, yes. He gets a lot of those kind of cases. What does he do? Mm, Talks to the patients, explains away the hallucination. His name is Dr. Paget, and he's really wonderful. Johnny? Yeah? Where are we going? Why, baby? We've turned off the main road. This leads past the old Tilson mansion. What's that? The house where that terrible murder took place about a year ago. It's all boarded up now, of course. Yeah, but... yeah, that's the job Lefty O'Connor pulled, yes. huh? Yeah, he was old Mrs. Tilson's chauffeur. What? Chauffeur. Quite a coincidence, ain't it? Johnny, you're turning in the driveway. Yeah. See, a couple of nights ago, I broke into this place to sleep. It was just an empty house to me. I didn't know anything about no murder. I left the parcel behind. I want to pick it up. Oh, oh I, I see. You think I had any other reason for coming here? No, Johnny. 
Sit tight, baby. I'll be back in a minute. All right. All right, Johnny. I... Well, why are you taking the keys? Just to make sure the car stays here and you with it. But of course I'll stay. You better, baby. Or it'll be just too bad. Pull the board loose from one of the windows. Climb into the old house. There's blackest pitch inside. That musty, shut-in smell. Felt my way along the wall of the stairs. Climb to the second floor. The old lady's room was at the head of the stairs. It wasn't so dark in there. Windows hadn't been boarded and the moonlight was coming in. And I saw that marble fireplace with a gargoyle in the middle grinning at me. So I picked up the poker and smashed into it. And there, behind where I pushed it past a loose brick, was a paper bag containing the jewels. I looked inside to make sure that everything was safe. Moonlight sparkled on them shiners. And then, then Doc, suddenly, suddenly out of nowhere it started. That music started. Johnny, stop it! Stop it! Johnny, stop where it. are you? What? Who? Oh, Ruth! Ruth, what? get her to stop. Get her to stop. Oh, get her to stop. Mrs. Tilton, that tune. What tune? You mean you don't hear nothing? Well, no, Johnny. But you must... It's gone now. Johnny, you're shaking all over you. Johnny, what's that? What's what? Well, they're all over the floor. They look like diamonds, jewels. Didn't I tell you to stay in the car? What are you doing up here? I, I heard noises and you You were yelled. spying on me. No, I wasn't, Lefty. I... What did you call me? Nothing. I... So you guessed it, huh? Okay. I am Lefty O'Connor. And I came back for the jewels... That information ain't traveling far. Not with you, anyway. What do you mean? No! Don't touch me! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! I was rattled, Doc. The music did it. That and everything else. I left the lion there, and I picked up the jewels and beat it. She started to car fast. I just about hit the main highway when the wheels started acting funny. I stopped and got out to look. It was a flat. My luck had played out. If I took the time to change it, someone might come along. And just then I did hear a car coming. I, I froze, waiting for it to pass. Instead, it stopped. And... Hi, Johnny. Tom. Tom, miss. Got out as soon as I could. Which is the flat? What? How did you know? How did I know? Why, you just called me. You told me you couldn't find the tools. And... I called you? Why, yeah. Don't you remember? No, no, I don't. I couldn't have. I, 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 I... Of course, it's none of my business, Johnny, but... Look, you've been acting awful funny. I'm beginning to think maybe you ought to go see a doctor. Someone like Doc Patchett that Ruth works for. There's nothing wrong with me. Nothing. Okay. Okay. Get started with this, Jack. The rest of the tools are under the front seat. I'll get them. No, no, wait. Hey, what's this paper bag? Doing? Give me that! You're calling in for pebble collecting, huh? Pebbles? Yeah, look at them. Well, they are pebbles. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> What's happening to me? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> but I told you, you don't look well. <laughs> hey, where are you going? Hey, wh- wait a minute. I told you that was a borrowed car. Get off that round, boy. Yeah. I said get off. You're nuts, Johnny. You're nuts. You're crazy. <laughs> Doc. Yeah, huh? It's a story. I kept hearing what he said. Tom. Over and over again. I'm nuts. I'm crazy. I couldn't stand it anymore. So I looked you up in the phone book and I come over. Oh, what do you expect me to do, Lefty? Do? You're a brain doc. I'm not nuts. I know I'm not. Why am I seeing these things? What's happening to me? 
Well, it's rather difficult to make a diagnosis this quickly, but uh, I'd say that you were suffering from hallucinations because of a sense of guilt. Guilt? About what? Well, it probably started with that first murder, Mrs. Tilson, and it's been weighing, preying on your mind ever since. Now, if you could extrovert that, get it out of your system. But I, I did. Uh, that's true, but not as a confession, with all the details. That's the only way you can achieve a complete catharsis. Well, that's crazy. All right. You wanted my advice, but you don't have to take it. And you think... Okay. Okay, I did kill her. I knew all the time what I was doing. I waited for a night when there was only the two of us in the house, and then I beat her brains out with a tire iron. There... There, I said it, I told you. Yes, Lefty. And I think that now I can promise you you'll never be troubled by hallucinations again. You sure, Doc? Quite sure. That's good. Because... Remember I said that in half an hour I was going to kill someone? Yes. Well, a half hour is up. And you're the man. Am I, Lefty? Yeah. I'm sorry, Doc, but you know too much now. You're the only one who does, so... I wouldn't, Lefty. Why... Why are you sitting there like that? I shot you! Yes, Lefty, with blanks in your gun. All right, boy. Take it easy, Lefty. We got you covered. No. And Mason! Did you get it? Uh-huh. Every word. The... You're cops! No kidding. Then... The whole thing... Letting me escape and everything that happened afterwards was just a trick. That's right. You wanted to show I wasn't nuts, get me to confess. Smart boy. You made just one mistake, Lefty. Or rather, Ruth did. Following you into the Tilson mansion. She paid for that with her life. But now, now you're going to pay. No, no. Shut up. Yes, Lefty, for that and for the Tilson murder. And my only regret is that rats like you can only burn once. <laughs> Grim-faced men take hold of Lefty O'Connor. And Lefty knows that he's come to the end of the road. The road began when he first heard the clock in the old Tilson mansion strike 12 for... Murder! At midnight. again when death's face peers out of the darkened windows of deserted houses and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Lefty O'Connor was played by Joseph Julian. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Thank you.
and started to walk across the room. And as he turned, Martell moved. His face stayed dead, expressionless, but he moved. He picked up a heavy wrench, followed him, and then as Roy reached for the switch, he hit him. No! I heard his skull go like a rotten pumpkin shell, and he went down. Then Martell picked up a hacksaw and... No, no, I don't want to remember the rest. It was too awful, too horrible. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fear is the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight. When the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Terror Out of Space. And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story, which we prophesy will be long remembered as a classic, is by Robert Newman. A tale out of the news and out of man's deepest fears called Terror Out of Space. I sat up in bed, straining my ears, listening. The surf was rolling and pounding on the beach at the foot of the cliff. One of the dynamos was purring away next door in the experimentation shack. And that was all. Had I really heard anything? Or had I just imagined it, dreamed it? I didn't know. All I knew was that I was in a cold sweat, shivering even though it was a hot summer's night. But that wasn't surprising after what had happened. Just what had happened? Maybe I could get it all straight, fill in the gaps that had been bothering me if I went back over it again from the beginning. I hadn't wanted to before this. I'd fought against even thinking about it. But now, now it was as if something was making me think about it. That's right, John. Start way back, in the beginning. Then maybe you will remember. You've got to. You've got to. When was the beginning? When they assigned me here, I guess, miles from anywhere on the Jersey coast. I knew it was some kind of hush-hush project, and I'd been in the Army long enough not to ask questions. I had some ideas, though, and when I walked into administration and found Professor Martell there, I was pretty sure they were right. Lieutenant Larkin reporting for duty, sir. Hello, John. How are you? Fine, Professor. Uh, I mean, Major. Well, let's forget the Major. <laughs> I've been trying to... <laughs> I think the Army's a little sorry about the whole thing also. Well, that's not the way I heard it. Some of the things you've worked out in the last few years was something. Quite a break my getting assigned here. <laughs> you think it was an accident? You, you mean you requested me? Of course. What did I take you away from, by the way? Oh, nothing very much. Straight communications, a little radar. Mm-hmm. No chance to continue any of the research you started when you were at the university, huh? No. Afraid I've gotten rusty? Not really. But there are just going to be the three of us to do the bulk of the work. You, myself, and a chap named Roy Shields. He worked with Ramsey at Tech. And what's the project? Something big? I think so. We're going to try and establish radio contact with the moon. What? Theoretically, it shouldn't be too difficult, you know. Of course. It... And with the progress we've made during the war... We... Oh, Professor, it's terrific. One of the most exciting things I've ever heard of. <laughs> I think so. Well, don't you... Don't you remember when we used to talk about it in the lab? What it would mean to the astronomers, the astrophysicists, measurements that they've never even be, been able to take before? <laughs> yes, John, I remember. Well, then? I don't know. Somehow it... Well, it worries me. How we're going to do it? No, that's all cut and dried. What's going to happen when we do do it? Well, what do you mean? We're reaching out, John. Reaching out into places where man has never been before. 
We're pretty close to the secret of matter, to the origin of life and to the mystery of the universe. Sometimes, sometimes I become a little afraid. Afraid that we may stumble on something that's too much for us, too big and... <laughs> that's silly. Go pick out a bunk and get some rest, John. Tomorrow, we go to work. The work? I remember that all right, weeks of it. And finally, the big night, the night we were ready for our first test. It was clear and cool, the ocean still, not thundering, but whispering at the base of the cliffs, as if it were waiting. Every star separate and distinct, like signposts on the road to the infinite. Martell at the table in the center of the laboratory, with the charts and diagrams doing the computing. Roy at the power controls, and I at the director. Time, 2302. Fifteen seconds. Power, 10.12. Check. You reading, John? 93 degrees. Make it plus point two. Check. Time, 2302, 10. Power on. Three seconds. Four. Now. How long to wait? We should get it almost immediately. Lag of not more than... There, listen. Huh? That's it. That's it. We've done it. We're in contact with the moon. Yes, we'd done it. Reached out into space and done it. For the first time since man had walked erect, we had established contact with another heavenly body. Bridged the infinite with man-made electrical impulses. There was no work done during the next two days, just excitement. Public relations broke the story the next morning and we were swamped. Newspaper reporters, photographers, interviews, commentaries, prophecies. Finally, we got back to normal. And a couple of nights later... Yes... It's starting to come back to me now. I remember. I remember. It was the sound of the generators that woke me. I looked at my watch, almost midnight. Roy was asleep in his bunk, and I didn't wake him. I padded out along the duck boards to the laboratory. The lights were on. I went in, and there was Professor Martell. He was sitting at the control table, and he was... Well, he was funny. His eyes were open, but he didn't seem to see me. I said, hello, Professor. He didn't move. He didn't answer. I took a quick look at the control board, and the frequency had been changed. A little uneasy, I I tried again. Professor, what are you doing? And then, then something very strange happened. Half of him came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up. While his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitched. While his left one remained stiff. It was just for a fraction of a second. Then... What? Oh. Hello, John. Hello, Professor. Anything the matter? Matter? What am I doing in here? I don't know, sir. I heard the generators go on. I came in and found you here. Strange. Very strange. I went to bed about 10.30. Ever walked in your sleep before? No, not that I know of. Of course, I haven't been sleeping too well lately. Very disturbing dream. Did you change the transmitter frequency that way? But, no, sir. You must have done it yourself in your sleep. Exactly. That would make it more of a carrier instead of a transmitter wave. Uh, shall I shift it back? No, leave it. I'd like to take a look again in the morning. Some thinking about it. The next morning, somehow, neither of us mentioned it. I can't be sure now whether we didn't remember or just didn't think it was important. But that night, yes, yes, it was that night that we discovered what it meant, that we knew. It was the sound of the generators that woke me again. I looked at my watch a few minutes before midnight. And it was then that I noticed that Roy wasn't in his bunk. I lay there. And for some reason, I was terrified, trembling. There was something in the air, a feeling of... a feeling of menace that... I made myself get up. Slipped on a pair of sneakers and went out along the duck walk to the laboratory. The lights were on again. I didn't go in this time, but, but I looked in the window. There was Roy. 
And there was Professor Martell again. He was sitting at the control table with that... that same dead look on his face. And Roy was standing in front of him, talking to him. I could hear him through the window. What is it, sir? What's going on? Is anything the matter? In his sleep. Walking in his sleep. I better get Larkin and... Well, I can't leave the generator on, though. Got to shut that out first. He turned and started to walk across the room toward the master switch. And as he turned, Martell moved. His face stayed dead, expressionless, but he moved. He got up without a sound, took a heavy wrench from the work table, and followed Roy. And then, just as Roy put out his hand to throw the switch, he hit him. No! I heard his skull go like the shell of a rotten pumpkin, and he went down, dead. I, I couldn't move. I couldn't make a sound. I just stood there, frozen with horror. Martell looked down at him without batting an eye. And then, like a zombie, he walked over to the bench, picked up a hacksaw and went back. And then, bending over Roy's body, he started cutting off the top of his head. A voice from the void. And the midnight waking. Memories. Things best forgotten. Coming back again. Memories of the terror that came out of space and of murder at midnight. to Murder at Midnight and Terror Out of Space. That was, that's all I remembered then. When Professor Martell bent over Roy's body with a hacksaw in his hand, I must have fainted. When I opened my eyes, I was lying on the sand outside the shack, and there was Martell bending over me. No, Professor, no, no, don't! Why, don't, John! What's the matter? Leave me alone. Look at me. Don't touch me. I saw what you did in there. In where? Where? Just now in the shack to Roy. Aren't you well either, John? What? What do you mean? I just came up here from the cottage. I had a bad dream. I've been having quite a few of them lately, and I woke up with a very annoying headache. I came out to take a walk. It's a mare. I found you lying but, there. But I, I'm telling you, I saw you. I saw you in there with Roy and... And what? Well, I don't even want to think about it. But you killed him. Killed him? Huh. Let's go back to the bunkhouse, John. Take a look. The bunkhouse? Yes, when you see that Roy is where we should be in bed, maybe it'll convince you that you either dreamed or imagined the whole thing. He led the way to the bunkhouse, and I followed. Still shaken, but starting to feel a little foolish. This was the Professor Martell I had studied under... Known for years, the man who wouldn't hurt a fly. We went into the bunkhouse, and Roy's bed was empty. He wasn't there. Martell gave me a funny look and started calling. Roy! Roy, where are you? Roy! Without a word, we hurried back to the laboratory, and there was no sign of him there either. Nothing. He must have gone out for a walk, too, Professor, or maybe jeeped into town. If it was true, there'd be something here. His body, blood... There, John. Well, right there, in front of the switch. But there's nothing there. No. Except that it looks as if this floor was just scrubbed. The floor... What? You're right. John. Huh? Did you change the transmitter frequency this way? But no, sir. You must have done it. Just the way you did last night. Last night? You mean something happened last night, too? You don't remember? No. Tell me what you saw happen tonight. Everything you remember, whether you believe it now or not. Well, it was... It was pretty terrible, Professor. I was sitting there. And then, as quietly as, as if he were a laboratory specimen, you took a hacksaw and started to cut off the top of his head. Mercy. Talking to you now, I know the whole thing's mad, impossible, but... Yes, mad, impossible, <laughs> but... You... You mean it could have happened some way? 
without your knowing it? Sit down, John. Relax. Tell me what you know about the moon. Well, the moon is a satellite, a stellar body, probably formed by our sun in an encounter with some other stellar body. Yes, yes, probably formed at the same time as the Earth. But it may very well have supported life long before there was life here. Life? But we know what its atmosphere yes, is. we know what it is now. But how do we know what it was a million, several million years ago? Suppose, just suppose, that there was life there millions of years ago. Life that reached a level of development we cannot even imagine. Suppose it died out as a form of life that we could recognize, but remained in a form that is eternal. What? What do you mean? In the form of electrical energy. We know that thought is an electrical process. An electrocephalograph will give a definite reading when a man is thinking. Yes. Suppose intelligences continue to exist on the moon in the form of complex electric charges. And suppose a channel is suddenly opened between the moon and some other planet. The beams we sent out are our radar beams. You mean they, they could come down, down the beam, take hold of someone, you, and make you... I'm to... supposing, John, hypothesizing. But the fact is that the transmitter was set at carrier frequency, and none of us did it consciously. Of course, even if it's true, we have no way of knowing whether these entities are dangerous, malevolent or not. No way of knowing, but, but they killed. They made you kill. Made you kill Roy. Because he was going to shut off the transmitter, cut off contact with the place they came from. As for the rest, well, they would be intensely curious about the human body, particularly the brain. They would want to examine it. And of Good Lord, Professor, do you realize what you're saying? The taking over of a person's body? Yes, John, I do realize what I'm saying. Well, I don't believe it myself. Have you a gun? Uh, well, well yes. Yes, I never carry it. But... Well, start carrying it. And if you notice me doing anything strange, incomprehensible, don't hesitate. Shoot. I didn't sleep that night. I remember that now. And I was convinced that I would never sleep again. Because it was there then, the moon. It was there all the time, of course, day and night. But it was during the night when I was asleep that it would be easiest for them, that they might try and... and... <laughs> no, I can't think about it. I won't even now. <sighs> With the daylight, I felt a little better. Roy hadn't come back, but, well, there were a dozen possible explanations for that. I went to have another talk with Professor Martell. And he was gone, too. His bed was empty, as if it had never been slept in. I waited until about noon. Then I called headquarters. I had decided that I was going to tell them only facts, things I could believe myself. Hello? Hello, Colonel. This is Larkin over at Radar Experimental. Oh, yes, Larkin. How are you? Uh, pretty good, sir. Uh, I I'd like to report that both Sergeant Shields and Major Martell are missing. Huh? Missing? What do you mean? I don't know, sir. They were both gone when I got up this morning. Oh, no, sir, I, I couldn't. Not right now. Okay. Then you carry on until they get back, and then I'll arrange for you to do it uh, officially. So I stayed. Stayed there in the lonely shack on top of the cliff, alone. And that was the most awful, terrible week of my life. Only the wind, the pounding of the surf, and my fears. Fears that were with me constantly. There was work I had to do, but... I had to force myself to go into the laboratory. Then, on Friday, they found Roy's body. A phone call took me to town to the local funeral parlor. When I got there, the colonel was waiting. Um, you knew Sergeant Shields pretty well, didn't you, Larkin? Yes, sir. Uh, some fishermen found a body in their nets this morning. I uh, wish you'd look at it. Of course, sir. Uh, right here. Good Lord. Evidently, the fish were pretty hungry. Well, no one could be sure, sir, but I think that is Shields. All right, Larkin. Thank you. Yes, they found Roy's body. And that night, Martell came back. I'd taken something to make me sleep. It was the only way I could sleep. But the sound of the generators woke me again. 
I lay there listening, unbelieving but terrified because there was no one at the station but me. Then, picking up my gun, I went down the duck walk to the laboratory. I opened the door, and there he was, Professor Martell. His face was thin and haggard. His eyes were dead, lackluster, the way they'd been those other two nights. And when he spoke, his voice was hardly human, as if someone was using him, speaking through him. Too bad that you woke up, Larkin. You should not have come in here. What do you mean, Professor? Where have you been? We have been looking over your planet, studying it. Very interesting. And now we are ready to go. Go? Go where? What are you talking about? What? What? You? You said we, Professor Martell, have have they? Just a few preparations to make, and then, then the voice, that horrible voice, stopped, and Martell swayed as if he were going to fall. Uh, I grabbed him, and he opened his eyes. He was himself again, and when he spoke, it was with his own voice. John, John, for heaven's sake, help me, help me! How, Professor? How? Your gun. What I told you, don't you remember? Don't you understand? They got me. They took me that night. Took me all over the country, looking, examining, studying. They picked my brain. They sucked me dry. And now, now they're going to take me back with them. Back with them? Back to where they came from. Not my body. They're not interested in that. But the essential me. The the. It happens today. Shoot, John. Shoot and. And now we are ready. They had him again. As your friend told you, we are taking him with us. But you, you will not remember. You will remember nothing. Do you understand? Because someday we may come back. I stood there, frozen, still holding on to Martell. Like a sleepwalker with superhuman strength, he pushed me away. I staggered back against the wall. Stiffly and mechanically, he walked to the door, opened it, and went out. The surf was thundering, the wind blowing straight to the edge of the cliff he walked, and then went over. But before he fell, he seemed almost to hover for a moment, as if something in him was going not down, but up. Now, do you remember, John? Now, do you remember? Now, do you remember? You've got to remember. You've got to. I tricked them. Told them. That's how I was able to get through to you. But they'll be coming for me any minute. And... John, you've got to do something. You've got to. It's true. They do exist. And they've got me here. They may be coming back again for others. They... John, they're coming. They're coming. They'll do something. When I woke up about a half hour ago, I found this all written out on the pad I keep next to my bed. Written out in my own handwriting, but a little scrawled and jerky as if my hand wasn't quite steady. Some of it I remember. Other parts, like Roy's murder, Professor Martell's suicide, I don't recall at all. Either I'm mad, completely mad, or... No, no, I can't think about it. I mustn't. Anyway, if I showed this to anyone, the world would think I'm mad. So now I'm going to burn it. Burn it up completely. White and shaking, John Larkin tears the scrawled pages from his notebook, crumples them into an ashtray, and puts a match to them. And thus there disappears into ashes the only remaining evidence of the terror from out of space and of... Murder at midnight. <laughs> Remember to be with us again when death comes in some unknown form. And the clocks strike twelve for... Murder! At midnight. <laughs>
The part of John Larkin was played by George Petrie, and Peter Capel was Professor Martell. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Madman. He wants to kill me. Someone does. Like the other three, lying on the floor in a pool of blood. Almost twelve o'clock. At night. Any minute now, there'll be a ring. Or a knock. <laughs> Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight. When the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in... The Creeper. at midnight. On this program, we bring you the best and most blood-curdling stories ever written. And so now we bring you a tale which you may have heard before, a tale which we consider a classic in terror and suspense, The Creeper by Joseph Ruskall. In the kitchenette of the New York apartment, a man and his wife listened to the evening news broadcast. New York. The unknown killer called the Creeper has struck again, adding a third female corpse to his toll. Virginia Peters, a comely waitress, was found strangled to death in her third-floor apartment early this morning while her radio blared. As in the previous murders, a note was found scrawled on the wall with the victim's lipstick and the plea, For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Police insist... Now, why'd you turn it off? Oh, how Awful, and in this very neighborhood. Let's hear the rest. It's very interesting. Oh, you... Don't go turning that radio on again, Steve Grant. Heard enough, I'll go out of my mind, for heaven's sake. That's it. A good, solid clue. What is? For heaven's sake. How many men ever use that expression? Oh, shut up. Okay, Mrs. Grant, pass the biscuits, my little pigeon. Pass the biscuits, E-D-D. Three women in three days murdered in cold blood by a mad fiend right here in Washington Heights. I'm too sick to go out, too scared to stay in. The lock's broke. He sits there eating, 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 past the biscuits. There's nothing wrong with my appetite, my love. Of course. That's what costs you your job on the police force. When I even think of Some men drink to escape. I eat. Escape what? What? An ugly tongue, a beautiful face, and a roving eye. In short, a wife. So you're starting that again, you and your crazy jealousy. Yeah, maybe that's the creeper's way of escaping, too, Georgia. Who knows? Shut up. Go ahead and get a divorce. Go ahead. Can I help it if men look at me? Uh. I don't know why you come home at all. Where do you go? What do you do with yourself? Where were you this morning? Why'd you come back? To eat. But someday I'll lose my appetite for that, too. And when I do, my dear, there'll be no escape. And now I'm off again. Kiss. Still using stage lipstick. Wipe it off. How many times must I tell you? You're married now, remember? Steve, wait. Yeah? At least go buy my medicine. Sorry, I got no time. Don't leave me here alone. Stay home this evening. Please, I'm afraid. Oh, don't be silly, pet. Nothing will happen to you. You got a doorman here, an elevator boy, Mrs. Stone across the hall, a phone. 
You're safe enough. But the night lock, it doesn't work. <laughs> oh, now you can't lock me out anymore. It doesn't catch. Something's happened to it since last night. Steve. Get a new one. I can't get a locksmith. I've tried all day. Steve, please. If I want to phone you, where will you be? Out. Goodbye. Take care of your cold. <laughs> All pearly chase. How are you? Here you got thrown off the force, Steve. Yeah, I hear you got thrown off the news, Pearly. You heard wrong. I wasn't fired. I was just warned. I wasn't fired either. Just suspended for three days. Eating a lamb chop at Casey's when I should have been ringing in from the box of the 162nd with all that trouble up there. On my way to headquarters now for reinstatement. I eat too much, my trouble is. I drink too much. Here you're living up at the Heights, Steve. Yeah. That's funny, me too. Yeah? Here you're married now to a beautiful and lovely young... ...with admiration. <laughs> Say it again. I think I knew her. Wasn't her stage name Georgia Dixon? Yeah, that's her. I uh, love that wench, but... the uh, women. How does a guy handle them? You know, maybe the creeper has the right method. <laughs> Thank you for taking the words out of my mouth. Who's the creeper, Steve? Any angles? You tell me and I'll split the reward with you. <laughs> <laughs> Say, what do you think of Inspector Bradley's inside job yeah, theory? Nuts. Every janet is a creeper? And it's for that doorman, Jim Ellis? Just because he worked at two of the three murder apartments? Pure coincidence. Anyway, they've released him. One thing, though, and I don't think even Bradley's put it together yet. Yeah? In all three cases, just before the creeper struck, the door locks had already been tampered with. You don't say. You got a theory? Well, sure. I mean, uh, you take that note on the wall. For heaven's sake, in every case, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Right. Oh. Now, what man uses an expression like that? You want the lowdown? It's just this. A creeper is a woman. <laughs> a gimmick, huh? Yeah. Like the height of the message from the floor is a trick, six feet. And yet I'll lay odds the creeper's no more than a guy your height, say, or mine. Five nine, just like us, you or me. Only crazy. Yeah. How do you figure that? How do I figure lots of things? How do I know where the creeper's going to strike next? You do? Certainly. Creeper is not so smart. He's just crazy. You play along crazy and you're one jump ahead of him. That's the trouble with Inspector Bradley. Why, he's up a tree. You expect logical clues from a madman? Mm. You play along crazy. Make out you're the creeper. And what do you get? Well, go ahead. Let's see. All right. The victims are all redheads. Every one. You've noticed that, of course. Three in three days? Yeah, now that you mention they it. They all lived in the heights, right? Agnes Martin, Jane Krutsky, Virginia Peters? Right. What was the number of the apartment in each case? Agnes lived in 1A, Jane 2B, Virginia 3C. Don't ask me the why or wherefore. Don't ask me the logic. Just play along crazy. See what I mean? Where's he going to strike next? Huh? I don't get you. The next victim of the creeper also lives in the heights. She's a redhead. Her night lock's been tampered with. She's going to get hers today, and her apartment number's 4D. Well, why are you looking at me? Don't you like my arithmetic? Pearly, my wife's a redhead. We live in the Heights, and our apartment number is... <laughs> You're just a boozy reporter. Your apartment number? 4D, I told you. 4D, of course. It's pretty late, but I'll have it delivered. I was busy admiring your lipstick, Mrs. Grant. I've nothing like it in stock. 4D, I should have guessed it anyway. Why? Well, a face is a number. Believe me, since you've moved into the neighborhood, Mrs. Grant, for me it has a special number, like uh, Double Dandy Delicious Dream. <laughs> 4Ds, you see? Oh, go on. But you tell that to every customer. Female. I'm a ladies' man? Like the creeper? <gasps> what did I say? 
What's going on in this block? Raw nerves. He can't joke. The creeper, the creeper. That's all I hear all day. It's mass hysteria. There ain't such an animal. You... You don't think so? I assure you, Mrs. Grant, it's a fairy tale for circulation of the tabloids. I'll send your prescription up with the boy. No, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just wait here for it. Well, it'll take some time. You should go right home and stay there if you're just getting over the flu. I'll tell you what. I'll deliver it myself. It'll be a pleasure. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll wait. I, I may not go right back. I don't want to... I don't want to be there alone. I'm afraid. Very well. Suit yourself. Uh, have a seat. For heaven's sake, stop me before I kill you. What? I cannot control my... Wait! I was only joking, Mrs. Grant. Wait, Mrs. Grant, your prescription. Why, yes. What's your hurry, dear? I just got such a scare. Since these awful murders in this neighborhood. Yes, isn't it terrible? Oh, I'm simply frightened to death myself. You walking home? Yeah, I guess so. Well, I'll go with you. It's good we live in the same house. At least if I had a double lock, but the night one doesn't work. Oh, really? Well, I have a chain lock besides, and still the way it is, I sit and shiver when there's a sound at the door. Can't get a locksmith. Tried all day, but they're all so busy. Mr. Frank on the corner promised to, but didn't know when. Why are they all so busy? Well, my dear, because every woman in the neighborhood's changing theirs, too. Simply a nightmare. Oh, but don't you worry. We'll stay together this evening. Mr. Stone's out, too. Think of it, we've never visited, though we live right across the hall from each other. Isn't that like a big city, for heaven's sake? Or would you rather I dropped in on you? Well, uh, I, I don't well, know. Well, make it your it... place, then. Isn't it horrible, the ghastly things they're saying? The theories one doesn't know what to think next. You believe the latest? The latest? That maybe it's a woman, the creeper? <gasps> A woman? Can you beat it? I just can't imagine how in the world the police figure that, for heaven's sakes. Can you? I say, can you, Miss Grant? Oh, I don't know. I was just thinking of something my husband Though said. I can see where a married woman now, if her husband was faithless, well, I can understand such a theory because they take my husband now. Uh, you've met Mr. Stone, haven't you? Well, Mrs. Grant, why on earth are you staring at me like that, for heaven's sake? Oh, I... Don't feel well. I must get home. I uh, feel faint. But Mrs. Grant, feel for heaven's sake. Sobbing with terror, the woman with red hair runs up the dark street, back to her apartment and the door with the broken lock. As the hands of the clock move on towards 12 o'clock and... Murder at midnight. <laughs> And now, back to Murder at Midnight and The Creeper. Back to Georgia Grant, hurrying hysterically through the dark streets towards the apartment with the broken lock on the door. Good evening, ma'am. Oh. Out late, aren't you? Oh, yeah, you're the uh, new doorman? Just relieving Charlie. Nice night. Yeah, yeah it was very nice. Here, uh, let me ring the elevator for you. No, you don't have to trouble. No trouble, ma'am. There. Apartment 4D, huh? Uh, yeah. How did you know? Doesn't take long. Let me roll this elevator. Coming now. Terrible things, ma'am. The happenings. What? The creeper. It's sort of... Uh, Going up? Yeah, yeah. Up and down, up and down. The ups and downs of life, that's me. I'm a living milkshake, Mrs. Grant. Uh-oh. What's wrong, Jimmy? Stuck. Imagine getting stuck between a third and fourth with a production like you. Get going, Sonny. You want me to report you? Okay, okay. Can't you take a joke? <laughs> Maybe I misconstrued that smile you always give me. Maybe you shouldn't order to smile that way. Fourth floor. Let me out. 
If I drop in later, will you be more receptive? <laughs> oh, home. Oh, thank goodness. I must be going out of my mind. Gee, where's my key? Darn this lock. Darn the lock. Hello. Is the locksmith in yet? Well, I want to know how soon I can get my lock changed. Yes, I know it's late, but he promised. This is Mrs. Grant. Yes, 4D, yes. I know you just explained to me, but Hello, I must... Georgia. Yes? Yes, so, so won't you... I've please? been waiting for you. Oh, oh, Don't you little fool, it's oh, me. Do you want oh, the whole house to... Oh. That's better. What are you doing here? Oh, don't worry. You haven't got a thing to worry about now. I've come to protect you. Give me the phone. Hello? Never mind about the lock, thank you. Sit down. Make yourself at home. Been waiting here for you. Long time no see, Georgia. What do you want, Pearlie? Me? A headline. Your husband wants two. He wants I should keep an eye on you. What's that? Sure. You didn't think Steve and I were acquainted, did you? Oh, yes. From way back. Just met him at a bar. I don't believe you. What do you mean, keep an eye on me? Oh, just in case the creep... <gasps> oh. <laughs> oh. You heard of the character? You're mad. You've always been mad, Pearly Chase. Where is Steve? Why should he send you here? Why should he think the creeper will come here? What are you doing here? Told you. Playing along crazy. Got a drink? You're drunk now. And you're getting right out of here. You're nothing but a no-good rummy. And you're nothing but a no-good... You finish it. When I took the drink, it was to drown you out. And you know it. I'm still a rum pot, Angel. Which means I haven't got rid of you yet. Get out. You little two-timing redhead. You're all the same, you redheads. Even a wedding ring can't change you. Oh, don't play the innocent. My business is snooping. I make a living at it between drinks. So your new motto's love thy neighbor, huh? Mr. Stone across the hall? Poor dumb Steve. I'm warning you. Get out or I'll call the police. Stay where you are. All right, Pearlie. What are you doing with that gun? I wouldn't pick up that phone if I were you. You see, there's a big reward for the creeper and a heck of an exclusive, and I don't want to share it. I'm riding a hunch. Now, sit down, darling. Just play along with me while I play along crazy. Sit down. Oh. That's it. Like we're expecting company. <laughs> Let's have some music. Don't just sit. Let's have some music. I said turn on the radio. That's it. That's the good girl. Ah, dance music. Ah, let's dance. Give me your arm. Let's dance. Ah, like old times. Around and around like my brain. Why are you trembling? I still love you, you little fool. Ask me why. I love you. I love you, you lovely redhead. I could kill you and you deserve it. With the radio on, you could scream and no one would hear. I could put my hand on your throat like this and I could strangle you. Why are you crying? Stop it. I'm here to protect you. Stop crying. Cut it, I said. Cut it out. I can't stand it. I never could. Okay. You want me to leave? All right, I will. It's your funeral. What am I saving you for anyway? Where's my hat? In a few minutes, there'll be a knock or a ring or the door will just open. And you'll be lying in a pool of blood like the other three. Goodbye, my worthless... 
Give my regards to the creeper. <laughs> What if he comes back? He wants to kill me. Wants to kill me. Somebody wants to kill me. I must lie down. My head is splitting. <laughs> Trying to frighten me. Still a spite. That's it. Like the other three. In a pool of blood. Like the other three, like the other three. Almost, almost twelve o'clock. Any minute now, there will be a knock or a ring. <laughs> yes. This is the doorman, Mrs. Grant. Yes. The druggist is here with a medicine. Shall I let him up? A medicine. Uh, yes, let it... No, 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 no. Don't let that man up. You want me to bring it up? No, 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 no. I'm perfectly all right. I don't need any... I don't need it, you hear? Don't you dare come up. Don't dare him. <laughs> oh, please, please. I must have it changed right away. My lock, my door lock. Yes, this is Mrs. Grant. Yes, I do want it. Of course, anyone can get in, anyone. They want to murder me, but I don't know who. It's the creeper. Oh, you'll come right away? Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, but hurry. Please hurry or I'll go out of my mind. Oh, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Like the other three in a pool of blood. Any minute now, a knock or a ring. <laughs> Who? Who's there? It's me, dear, Mrs. Stone. Oh, what do you want? Well, I've been worried about you. Are you ill? No, I'm all right, Mrs. Stone. I'm feeling fine. Open up, dear. Don't you want me to keep you company? No, 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 thank you. I, I was just... Oh, stop that. Oh, do listen, you silly and weird. No, no, please, go away. I'm going to sleep. Go away. You hear me? Go away. Hello. Hello, Georgia. You oh. oh, Steve. Steve, I've been frantic. So good to hear your voice. Where are you? At headquarters. I'm coming right home. Sweetheart, is anything wrong? You said no, so. no, no, not now. Not when I hear you, Steve. I don't know what came over me all day. I've been imagining things so silly. My nerves. I'm sorry about supper tonight, honey. I wasn't myself. My job had me down, but now everything... Oh, of goes... course. Forgive me, Steve. I've been bad, bad, wicked. Oh, darling, if you knew what I've gone through tonight, the most dreadful state. And then that... Steve, did you send someone here today? Early Chase? Then you did? Yeah, to keep you company. Isn't he still with you? No, I just got rid of him. Oh, I wish you hadn't. He's an all right guy. Smart reporter. Lives in the neighborhood, too. Honey, it sounds cockeyed. I mean, Pearlie's theory, but I was kind of worried when I got to thinking, so... Listen, Georgia. Yes? Don't let anyone in the house till I get home. No, no, I won't, Steve. Not anyone, do you hear? Not anyone. Oh, uh, Steve, wait. What? Oh, wait, Steve, it's... Uh, thank goodness at last. Now I can breathe easy. Darling, just a minute. Georgia... Mr. Frank? Yes, Mr. Frank. Thank goodness you've come. Please, step in. It's the, the lock on this door. I want... Just a moment. My, my husband's on the phone. Can you hear me, Georgia? Steve? Yeah, what happened? There was something else I wanted to tell you. It's all right, darling. Everything's all right now, Steve. You needn't worry. Didn't I just hear you talking to someone? Was that somebody at the door? No, it's no one, dear. It's just Mr. Frank, the locksmith. The locksmith. What a load. Georgia, listen. Listen, Georgia, that's what I was going to tell you. What is... The police are on a new trail. They think maybe a locksmith. Georgia, you're listening. They think maybe the creeper's a locksmith. Oh. Get him out, quick. What oh. nice lipstick you Georgia, use, can you Mrs. Mrs. Grant. Oh. Oh. Yes. Very nice <laughs> lipstick. Georgia. Very nice. Can you hear me, Georgia? Georgia. Georgia. Hello, Georgia. Hello. Hello, who's this? Hurry. Catch me. 
before I kill more. For heaven's sake. Soft footsteps hurrying down the corridor, away from the door with the broken lock now standing ajar, the body of a red-headed woman. And still, should she not have known that her only visitor would be death? And the clocks struck twelve for... Murder at midnight. Remember to be with us again when death knocks at the door, wearing a familiar face. And the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Georgia was played by Ann Shepard. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Last time, Walt. Please let me go. Nuts. Then it has to be this way. Hap, no. Drop that gun. Uh, I'm sorry, Walt. Very sorry. I've known all along you had to die tonight. But I didn't know. I killed you. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in... The Man Who Died Yesterday. of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Our story by William Morwood is The Man Who Died Yesterday. Afternoon on a little traveled highway. A strange-looking man in threadbare clothes stands hopefully by the roadside. A car comes around a curve. Slows up. Stops. Looking for a lift? Are you headed for New York? That's me. Hop in. Thank you. It's very good of you. I am in a hurry to reach New York. I haven't much time, you see. Yeah, sure. I picked you right off for a big executive on his way to a board meeting. Oh, nothing like that. <laughs> it's just that oh, there's something terribly important I've got to do. A mission. Oh, Salvation Army, huh? No, United Nations. I have to see the Secretary General before midnight tonight. That leaves me only eight hours. The United... 
Are you feeling all right, pal? Yes. I was sick, but I'm feeling fine now. You don't look so good to me. Why does it go? Of course, you could do with a haircut, too. I suppose so. I'm afraid I've been out of touch with civilization a long while. By the way, my name is... Rather was... David Hepgood. I am. I'm Walt Griggs. Can't you drive any faster, Walt? We've still got a long way to go, and... Well, I'm worried about this part of the road. There's going to be a rock slide and... Rock slide? Oh, you mean those signs? Ah, that's nothing to worry about. They put them up on... What the... It's all right. Keep going, Walt. We got through safely. Yeah, but... There was a rock slide, just like you said. Of course. But... How did you know? I can see ahead, Walt. See into the future for 24 hours. The guy was nuts, of course, but... Still, what are the odds against calling a long shot like that? A million to one? A billion? I gave up trying to figure it. We drove along for about an hour and then stopped for gas. There was this hamburger joint right by... Where are we going, Walt? Grab a bite. Oh, but there isn't time. I've less than seven hours now, and by midnight we I... got a gas up anyway, and I'm hungry. Come on, Hep. Hi, you fellas. Hello, sugar. Sit down, Hep. What'll it be, boys? Hamburger for me, sweetheart, with onions. What's yours, Hep? I... I'm not hungry. Oh, busy with your speech for the United Nations, huh? Well, I'll just read this racing form while you're thinking. Racing form? Sure, I play the G's all the time. Got some important dough on today's meet. Fifty bucks on Alistair to win in the sixth. Alistair. Yep. I'm afraid you'll lose your money, Walt. What? Don't kid me. Alistair's the hot favorite. It's going to be a walk away. Marble the third won that race. Marble? What are you nuts? He's a rank outsider. A hundred... What do you mean won the race? It hasn't been run yet. Hasn't it? I didn't know. Look, I... Wait a minute. Sweetheart. Yeah? You think you can get the races in the radio? Oh, sure. It's all tuned in. A lot of our customers like to listen. Well, if we can't waste time like this, who can think about a horse race? I like... can. Remember my 50 bucks. But... Shh. The great race. The crowd is going wild with excitement. They're around the bend now, coming into the straight. Alistair is out in front by two lanes. Uh-huh. The rest of the horses bunched. Alistair is going strong. And a boy, where's your marble half weight? Entering the last stretch now. It's a walk away for Alistair. Nice, Four eh? lanes ahead and no challengers. Wait a minute. Alistair stumbles. Catering in stride. He's down. What? The jockeys don't clear, but Alistair is... The other horses have gone past. Number eight is out in front. Number eight. Marble the third. Marble the third. Marble the third. And marble wins. We go. Ah, turn that thing That's off. That's run for the books, folks. The most extraordinary... I'll be... You knew it all the time, Hep. You knew Marble had to win. Of course. Thought we've got to go. Sure. Sure, Hep, anything you say. You're the guy I've been waiting for all my life. I didn't need no more figuring to tell me Hep was a gold mine. And I had him first before anybody else could get their hooks into him. The only thing that worried me was the way he talked. All this about midnight, not having much time. I had to use him while I had him, even if it meant taking chances. So while we drove, I worked on a plan. Walt, we've left the New York road. The signs are pointing the other way. I know, I'm taking a shortcut through a town called Hassock. Hassock? Yeah. That name mean anything to you, Hap? Hassock? Think hard. Let me see. There's going to be a hold-up there tonight at the factory. Two men involved. They steal the week's payroll, ten thousand dollars. Ten grand, huh? They get away with it? There's a chase, but they take off the police. Great. Couldn't be better. Why? Where did two men have? You and me. What? No, Walt, no, I'm not a criminal. And I've something else to do with what little time I have left. You're coming with me, Hap. Maybe this will convince you. Her gun doesn't frighten me. Stop the car and let me out. I've got to get to New York. All right, look, I'll make a deal with you. You come with me on the stick-up and I'll drive you straight through to New York without stopping. Are you on? But, but I can't, Walt. My message concerns the whole world. That's the only way you'll get to deliver it. Well, if, if it is the only way, 
All right. Well, there's something more I've got to tell you, Walt. What's that? We leave a dead man behind. It was getting dark when we hit town. I drove down the main street and onto the factory building beyond. It was all dark except for a light in the cashier's office. Happen and I went in. There was a guy sitting at a desk. Who? Who are you? What do you want? There's a ten grand in that safe. This is a stick-up, brother. Y- you're crazy. There's no ten... Open up. I'll do the talking. I, I warn you, men. You'll be caught for... Shut the... up and start turning that dial. All right. Well, I guess you win. Come on, come on. Snap into it. I'm doing the best I can. That's it. Now hand out those greenbacks. Come on, get a move on. Watch out, Walt. He's turning in an alarm. Oh, you double cross and rat. Oh. Hey. Oh. Hey. You. Is the guy that had to be killed, Hap? Yes. Okay, then step on it. The cops will be swarming around like flies. Gaining on us, Walt. I can't go any faster. I'm down to the floorboards already. He'll start shooting soon. You sure we get away? There's no slip up? No. We get away all right. Good. Ah! Where did they get you, Walt? My arm. What do we do, Hap? Keep driving till we hit that bend in the road. Yeah? There's a clump of willows around the corner. Pull in there. Okay. Here goes. Starts the lights. Off. Just like you said. No hurry. Get back to the New York road. I've less than three hours left. Okay, but i got to stop and see a doctor. A doctor? Sure, my arm. Oh, what's the matter, Hap? I, I'm afraid of that doctor. Something happens there that I don't understand. What is it? I don't know. It's something I should have explained before. I can see into the future for you, Walt. And for everyone else. But not for myself. You the doctor? What can I do for you? Oh, my arm. I had a little accident. I was cleaning my gun and it went off. Come into my office. Okay. And this man? Oh, he's just a friend of mine. Nothing the matter with him. I don't agree. He looks much sicker than you do. No, doctor, really. Your face. It's the color of... No, and I'm all right. Believe me. Please hurry with my friend. It'll only take a second. Just get my stethoscope. Let's quit kidding around, doc. I'm the one Quiet. that... Hmm. Good Lord. What's the matter, Doc? Why are you looking at him like that? But it's it's impossible, of course, but there's no heartbeat. No. But but that's impossible. If if your heart wasn't beating, you'd be dead? Yes. I've been dead since yesterday. At midnight. Staring at him. The living corpse of the man who died yesterday, Walt, and the doctor draw back in horror. Just who is David Hapgood? Perhaps we'll know when the clock strikes twelve for murder at midnight. <laughs> Midnight and the man who died yesterday. The goose pimples were standing out on me. Here I found the guy. I'd been with him for hours through a hole up in a killing. 
And now I was hearing from his own lips that he was dead. He gave me the creeps. I wanted to take it in the land, but instead I was froze to the floor. I heard the doc saying, You've been dead since yesterday? Yes, doctor. But that's, that's impossible. There must be some explanation, some obscure heart condition. There is an explanation, but not that kind. You see, I was cheated out of 24 hours at the time of my birth, eh? and I'm just making up for it now. How do you mean? This will sound fantastic to you, but nevertheless, it's true. I was born on a ship crossing the international date line. I started coming into the world during the last moments of a Friday and finished up early on Sunday. So I skipped a whole day of my life. I've always been living 24 hours ahead of myself. But, but that's sheer... It's gospel, Doc. He can call the turn on anything like he was reading hmm. tomorrow's paper. Eh? I told you it would sound fantastic, Doctor. But it is true. When I realized it, I... Well, I tried not to use it for selfish ends. I wanted to help people. But I never could. People would never listen to me, believe me. Finally, I realized that there was no place for me in the world. That man wasn't meant to know the future. So I went away, up into the woods. Uh, how long ago? About ten years ago. Away from civilization, it was easier. I still knew what was going to happen, of course, but with no way to communicate my knowledge, my conscience was at rest. That is, until last night. Last night? I had caught a cold. It developed into pneumonia. I was deathly sick. I couldn't breathe. And uh, lost consciousness. Then suddenly, at midnight, I was well. Quite well. Not a trace of my illness. I knew what had happened, of course. I was dead. Duh. But I still had my missing day to live. I knew I must use it for the benefit of mankind. How? There's something I know. Something that involves the fate of millions of people. Unless some action is taken within the next few hours. What action? What is it? I'm sorry, but I can't tell you, Doctor. I can't tell anyone except the Secretary General of the United Nations. And I must reach him before midnight, before I'm really dead. It's getting on to ten o'clock. Now do you understand why I'm in such a hurry? I'll say, let's get going, Hap. Never mind about my arm. That can wait. No, listen to me, Hap. You can't leave. What? As far as you're being able to read the future is concerned, well, it doesn't matter whether I believe that or not. But that heart condition of yours, that's something unique in medical history. Now, you've got to let me take you to a hospital where it can be studied properly. Lay off that stuff, now, I'll phone for an ambulance. Stay away from that phone. He's mine. Yours. But do you realize what this can mean to science? To don't you? give me that talk. You just want to grab him off for yourself. Why, nonsense. Stop it. Stop it, both of you. I don't belong to anyone. I'm not a specimen to be examined. I've got a mission to perform for all of civilization. I've got to get to the United Nations before. Now, now, no matter how you've been deluding yourself, young man, you're terribly sick. I'm going to phone the hospital Okay, and... you asked for it. Do you? I must get away from here. Hap. Hap, come back here. Come back here. Okay, if you're dead, it won't hurt you. And if you're not... Oh! Holy smoke. That bullet went right through you and only knocked you down. Let go of me, Walt. You try to run away, huh? I've got to get to New York. Nothing can stop. You're coming with me, Hap. I got plans for us as long as you last. You've got your ten thousand. What more do you want? A chance to run it up to a hundred thousand, and we can do it. I know the place, and you can call the cars. But there's no time. I'm figuring on only a couple of hours. That's plenty. Listen, Walt. I'm asking you for the last time. Let go. Do a decent thing for once in your life. Nuts. What I'm trying to do, it's for you as much for millions of others. I never gave a cuss about the others, and I'm not starting now. All right, Walt. Then it has to be this way. Hap, drop that gun. Oh. I'm sorry, Walt. Very sorry. I'd known all along that you had to die tonight. But I didn't know that I'd kill you. Kind of a silent type, ain't you? Sorry? Oh, that's all right. I don't like fellows that gad too much. You know, it, it was nice of you to pick me up back there on the road. I was lonely. Besides, I, uh... Well, I needed reassurance. How's that? You see, I've been out of touch with civilization for some time, and the people I've met today weren't... inspiring. <laughs> You're a strange guy, do you know it? Am I? Yeah, I mean, the way you talk and look... You don't look quite real. Oh, now, now, now don't get me wrong. I, I like you a lot. Oh, I'm glad. 
Well, for instance, we've been driving for nearly an hour now, and you haven't even made a pass at me once. I'm afraid that wouldn't do either of us much good. Yeah, but just the same, a girl appreciates a little thing like that. Incidental, what's your name? You can call me Hap. Hi, Hap. I'm Hazel. How do you do? Well, I guess I ought to tell you something about myself. Well, I know a little already. Huh? You're going to New York to find your fiancé, aren't you? Yeah, a guy called... Say, how'd you know that? You're going to look him up in the phone book and call. Then you're going to uh, find out that he's married. What? Oh, you're kidding me. Jim wouldn't do a thing like that. He'd wait for me forever. He said he would. And Hey, why are we stopping? Almost out of gas. Howdy, folks. Uh, fill her up as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, how far to New York from here? Well, you ought to be at George Washington Bridge in about ten minutes. Fine. You folks hear about all the excitement on the highway? No, what happened? Well, the cops are looking for a crazy killer. Murdered three people. One was a stick-up, the other two was a doctor and his own sidekick. Oh, what's he look like? Well, according to the radio, he's got, got a chalk white face, a mop of hair that looks like it hasn't been cut in weeks, no hat, and, uh, and... What's the matter, bud? What are you staring at? You're... Your friend, I... I I gotta get something out of the office. I'll be back in a minute. He's going to phone the police. This is your chance to get out, Hazel. Oh, no. I'm staying with you, Hap. Now, you better get moving and keep moving. being followed. We may make it yet. Are you frightened, Hazel? Being with me? I guess I should be, but I'm not. Thank you. Somehow I I can't believe you're crazy. If you killed anyone, you knew what you were doing and you had a good reason. Thank you again. You don't know what that means to me. Have people always been scared of you, Hap? Most people. Till I met you. Why couldn't I have met you sooner, Hazel? Well, what's wrong with now? It's a little late. Not for me. You honestly mean that? Sure. Well, then perhaps it's going to be all right after all. Perhaps we'll meet again. What do you mean? I didn't mean to tell you this. Perhaps I shouldn't now. It may cause you pain. Go ahead. I can stand it. After you call Jim your fiancé and find that he's married... Start across the street in a daze. A taxi is driving too fast and... uh... It's got my number on it, huh? Yes, I'm sorry. And yet, in a way... uh, What did that sign say, Hazel? Uh, uh, George Washington Bridge, two miles. Oh, I'm going to make it. There's still time. The Secretary General is in his home. They'll let me in when they hear my message. I'll have most of an hour with him. It's not quite 11 yet. 11? Hey, your watch must have stopped. What? Look, look, there's a clock in the building. Where? Up to the right, there. Three minutes of 12. Oh. Well, what's the matter, Hap? Oh, I can't make it. Oh, I've lost. Unless... A telephone. There's still time for that. Well, what are you talking here? There's no phone. In that house. The family's all in bed upstairs. There's a telephone in the parlor. But the door is sure to be locked. They've forgotten to latch the parlor window. Hey, how do you know all these things? Never mind now. Goodbye, Hazel. But I'll be waiting here. No, you better start down the road. The police mustn't find you. But when you come back, I'll be here. I won't be back, Hazel. This is goodbye. For keeps. But you've got to come back. You've got to. Operator, get me the Secretary General of the United Nations at his home. Hurry, please, it's urgent. Hello? The Secretary General, please, it's terribly important. No, I've got to speak to him personally, I... Uh... Midnight. Hello? Will you get him for me? There's no time left and... Uh... Never mind. I'll tell you. It's... It's about... Sir, 
I'll swear to that. You must have climbed in this window. You better go in and have a look. There was a girl with him when he left my gas station. She ought to be around. Where's the light? Here. There he is. On the floor. And he looks... He's dead, all right. No wonder. Look at that hole in his chest. Wait a minute. There's something funny here. That wound never bled. Huh? The only way that could happen is... if he was dead before the bullet hit him. Two men staring at a corpse that is finally still. And still forever. The corpse of the man who died yesterday. While outside, somewhere in the night, the restless spirit keeps a rendezvous that none can avoid. And the distant clocks chime the last notes in epilogue for... Murder! At midnight. again when death brings time to a full stop and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of David Hapgood was played by Stuart Brody. Vandell Kramer was Walt. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Till Death Do Us Part. Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Joseph Ruskell is Till Death Do Us Part. I never saw a man who looked with such a 
wistful eye upon that little tent of blue which prisoners call the sky. Ruth, I want to tell you something. Put down that book and listen. Hmm? I love you. <laughs> Some too long. Some sell and others buy. Some do the deed with many tears and some without a sigh. You hear me, Ruth? I love you. Some do it with a bitter look. Some with a flattering word. Professor Clark. <laughs> yes, Professor Clark. Love me, darling. Wildly? Put the book away. Almost there now. Bridal sweet waiting. Oh, Frank. Promise you'll always love me. Till death do us part. Another glass, darling. Come on. It's sweet to dance to violins when love and life are fair. To dance to flute. To dance to lute is delicate and rare. But it is not so sweet with nimble feet. To, uh... to dance upon the air. Frank. Darling. You've hardly kissed me. Why are you looking at me like that? You're so lovely. Come over here to the couch. <laughs> A shy bridegroom in this day and age? Darling, why are you acting so strangely? Well, if the mountain won't come to Mohammed... Come here, my lord and master. Kiss me. Oh, Ruth, I love you so much. <sighs> Darling, why do you keep staring at me like that? Frank! Ruth, no. <gasps> Darling, what's the matter? I don't know. Please, Frank, after all. No, don't come near me. Don't touch I... me. Ruth, something terrible is happening to me. It's a feeling. It's too dreadful to believe. What is it? When I take you in my arms, when I kiss you... I love you and I want you so that I feel a hideous urge to... To what, darling? Strangle you to death. Darling? Hmm? Hurry, dear. The waiter just brought in breakfast. What are you doing? Shaving. Finishing up now. Morning, Professor. Morning, Professor. Life is wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> How? Thank you. Leave us enter the parlor, husband. Yes. Leave us eat, my bride. <laughs> <laughs> ah! What what feast is this that tempts me palate? Fall to, spouse. <laughs> ah! Citrus! My favorite ice squirt. <laughs> I, I'm so happy, I feel like dancing. It's sweet to dance to violin. Yeah, that's right, how's it go? It's sweet to dance to violin. When love and life are fair. Eat, dear. What's wrong? I guess I'm not very hungry. Frank, you're thinking of that incident last night again. You are, aren't you? How could I have said that to you? I can't understand it. What got into me? Now, darling, you're to forget it. Don't talk about it anymore. Don't even think of it. It was just your little joke. Some joke. Wonder I didn't frighten you to death. Well. The funny thing is, the next minute I was laughing at myself, and so were you. But when I said it, I... Ruth, I... I, I, I can't explain it. I can't eat now. Frank. It was like an obsession. Yes, that's it. It, 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 it was... It, it was an obsession. Ruth, you're a psychologist. What does it mean? To have felt that horrible urge to to do that to you. To you, I must have been mad. Now, darling, don't say that. Don't spoil our honeymoon with this nonsense. You'll be talking things into yourself. I don't know what it is. Your, your nerves are on edge from your accident. That terrible crash just three months ago. Please, Ruth, please. I don't want to think about it. I can still see it, that horrible, twisted wreck. Well, you're lucky you're alive. Be thankful, I She am. was hitting 80, showing off. I couldn't stop her, that daffy little sister of yours. Darling. I'm sorry, dear. I'm sorry. I guess I felt as awful about it as you did. Brilliant student could have been one of my best if she'd ever opened a book. The poor kid, what a way to die. Maybe if I, if I hadn't accepted a lift to town, who knows, she might still now, be... Now, please, please, darling, let's forget it. It's not good for you. You haven't been at all yourself ever since then. No, I haven't. 
Have I? Well, everything has its compensation, dear. After all, that's what brought us together. Closely, I mean. Yes, that's right. In the hospital, what... You were an angel. Oh. Well, you were just an angel from heaven, the way you helped to nurse me through all that time, when I was only half conscious, nursed me and read to me. Read to me. Yes, the way you read to me. Why do you say it like that, Frank? Well, I don't know. There's something you read to me over and over when I was barely conscious. I've heard it ever since, deep down... I can't seem to recall it, but I feel that it had something to do with my crazy behavior last night. A, a line. It's still with me. It never seems to leave me. It seems to make me want to do something horrible. Now, Frank, stop talking. You're ill again. You're pale as a ghost. What is that line? I've got to know. Please, darling, please, stop shouting. I'm with you. Your love is with you. Now, now kiss me, dear. Hold me tight. Oh, so lovely. Everything about you. Your eyes, your lips, your lovely white throat. Mm. I feel it pulsing. I can feel your throat pulsing, darling, in my hands. Pulsing. Oh, Frank, you're hurting me. Oh, you're choking me. No! No! Yes, sir. I'm checking out. Uh, room number 438. C uh, call me a cab. From the bridal suite? Well, just a moment. There's something wrong, sir. You and your wife just checked in last night. Any complaint? No, no complaint. Just call me a cab. Oh, an emergency. What business is it of yours? Where's another hotel? Why, you'll find it very difficult in New York without a reservation. And if you and your wife... I'm only... checking out. Who said anything about my wife? She's better off without me, do you hear? Well, what are you gawking at? She's very lovely, remember? Would she make a nice corpse in a bridal suite? <laughs> oh, go to the devil. Where to now, mister? Where now? Uh, just shake off that other cat. I did. Three hours ago. I told you ten times. What now? Just drive around the park. We've been around and around and around. How long can this go on? That line. What was that line? What was it? Huh? What was that line? Look, pal, we going over that again, too? What line? You want the 7th Avenue line? If I'm not talking out of turn, but you must have lifted quite a few today. Get me to a hotel. We tried a dozen. Remember, they're full up. Hey, just who are you, mister? What's your racket? What's that to you? Okay, okay, I just asked. I was a teacher, cabbie, in a woman's college. But that's only a blind. My name is Jack the Ripper, see? But some people just called me Bluebeard. <laughs> Blue huh? This is the end of my line, chum. Hey, Atman, get out. No, no, I won't. You can't make me get out. You can't. I can't, huh? No, because if I do get out, I may go back. And if I go back, don't you understand? I'll kill her. For richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health till death do us part. A bridegroom, dazed and obsessed, standing on a city street, fearing to return to his bride, because he knows if he does, it will mean... Murder! At midnight! Midnight and till death do us part. Yes? 
Yes? What do you want? Good evening, sir. My name is Blue Pierce. You're the proprietor of this charming boarding house. You're drunk. Forsooth, tis true. May I tarry the night? No vacancies. Go on now, get on your way. Where's his room? <sighs> Top floor, rear, Mrs. Clark. He came in about an hour ago. Drunk as you please. He asked for a single. I'm not one to rent to drunks, mind you, but uh, I can see he's really educated. And a gentleman, though a queer one, if you ask me, with his eyes all bloodshot. Well, here it is. Did he say when he'll be back? He said he was going for his bags. I'll just wait in his room, if you don't mind. Hmm. It's all right. I'm his wife, I tell you. Well, I don't know. Something mighty fishy about all this. Well, excuse me. There's the hall phone. If it's not one thing, it's another. All right. All right. Hello? Yes? Who? Who? Oh, just a minute. It's him, ma'am. He wants to talk to the lady who just came in. Let me speak to him. Hello, Frank. I saw you go in. What are you doing in my house? Darling, it's so good to hear your voice again. I was so worried. Answer me. What are you doing there? How did you know where to find me? I've been following you everywhere. I don't want you to leave me, darling. I love you. Get out of there. Stop haunting me. I'm no good for you. Haven't you had enough? Go away. I won't. You need me. I'm your wife. Come back to me, Frank. Frank, how can you still want me? What are you inviting? Why don't you take a train home? Do you want to die? You know I'll kill you the next time we're alone. You know I've gone mad. Now, don't say that. You're just ill, and I'll nurse you back to health. Oh, Frank, this is your wife talking. What sort of spineless thing do you suppose you've married? What would you have me do, run to the police and ask them to protect me from my husband? Run to the police and cry that the man I love wants to kill me? Run to the police and police? tell him... Police, that's right. Of course. Why didn't I think of that before? No, Frank. Frank. Frank, what are you going to do? Have a seat, Mrs. Clark. What is it you want of me, Inspector Wade? Why was I called here to the police station? You've no idea? No. Oh. Is he here, my husband? He told you? But I thought he was just drunk. Oh, I told him not to come here. I told him not to. Then it's all true? Yes. This beats anything I've ever heard. Man yes. loves wife so much he wants to strangle her. Kisses her. Gets an irresistible yen to choke her to death. And on their honeymoon. You want to prefer charges? Prefer charges? What for? Well, attempted homicide ought to cover it. I won't. He's my husband. I love him. I'll stick by him no matter what. But he ought to at least be sent to Bellevue for a mental... Oh, no, you won't. There's nothing mentally wrong with Frank. Nothing at all. It's simply nerves, the result of an accident he had recently. <laughs> this really takes the cake. Mrs. Clark, another thing that puzzles me. Yes? He kept raving about a line when he staggered in here. As if it were life or death. A line of poetry he couldn't remember. Wanted me to tell him what it was. <laughs> Confidentially, I've only read one poem in my life. Now, now, what's what's that all about? I haven't the vaguest notion, Inspector. Just part of his neurotic state, I suppose. When we get back to our hotel room... What? I... You want him back after what happened? Yes. Don't you see? I must cure him of that awful obsession. Who else can do it but me? I'd like to see him now, Inspector. Please release him to me. I'll take the consequences. He's not here. Not here? No. We held him overnight just to let him sober up like we would any other drunk. Thought it was just all boozy eyewash. Well, this morning he seemed a new man, laughed it all off. So we released him. Just a few minutes ago. Oh, wonderful. But then I had a hunch I ought to warn you anyway. Just a hunch. Warn me? Yeah. He said he was going to call on you tonight at the hotel for a little reunion. Oh, how marvelous. Maybe he's all cured. I don't know. I didn't like the way he, he smiled when he said it. Mrs. Clark, after what you just told me, I think I ought to have him picked up again. You'll do no such thing. It's taking your life in your hands. I think he's got wheels in his head. I don't care. I love him. You die just as dead when you're in love. I'm not afraid. I'll never leave him. Certainly not now when he needs me more than ever. Is that all, Inspector? Okay, lady. <laughs> You're 14 carat. He sure doesn't deserve a wife like you. And don't say I didn't warn you. 
It's your funeral. Thank you, Mr. Doctor. Goodbye. Oh, uh, Mrs. Clark, there's one more thing perhaps I ought to tell you. Yes. When I released him just a while ago, he said something else that puzzled me. That being in jail had suddenly given him revelation. He smiled very queerly when he said it. Oh? I think maybe he, uh, he found that line of poetry, Mrs. Clark. Hello? Ruth? Where are you, Frank? In the lobby. Come up. I don't know exactly what your game is, my sweet bride. But I'm warning you. I've had revelation. I know. It's high time. I'm going to finish it, Ruth, this time. You asked for it. Come up, Frank. Sure? Sure. Your funeral. Howard does it with a kiss. Come in, Frank. The door's open. Throwing a party, my dear? Yes. Who's invited? You and I. What are we celebrating? An uninvited guest at our honeymoon. Death has come with you, hasn't it, this time? Yes. Shall we drink to him? Why not? Do you still love me, Frank? Yes, I still love you. But I love you better when you're dead for what you've done. How much do you know? Not enough. It came to me in jail last night. The jail had something to do with it. How, I still don't know. But enough to make me remember something you whispered in the hospital when I was just coming to. You said... I'll get my revenge, Frank. Do you hear me? I'll get my revenge. Splendid. Hey, from memory. What else? Enough to make me realize that you hate me and have always hated me, although you pretended otherwise. Brilliant. Say loved and hated you. Go on. And that somehow, I don't know myself in what way, but I'm sure it must be a very clever way, as your psychology students would agree, you've been coldly, deliberately torturing me, trying to make me think myself a maniac, or have others think so. Close enough. Why, what I can't understand is why you did it, or why you weren't afraid that I'd really murder you. You'll soon find out. And I'm convinced now that you've done it all with a single line. A single line of poetry. In my jail cell, I was sure of it. The very walls seemed to tell me, I don't know why, that it was a line that you kept reading to me at the hospital over and over and over again that made me think I wanted to kill you. And what was that line? That's what I'm going to find out right now. Don't come any closer, Professor. Well, no, it's perfectly ridiculous. Looking at you now, close to you where I can almost touch you, that crazy obsession is still with me. I laugh at it intellectually. I know that you've tricked me into it by some very obvious power of suggestion, but I still... I still feel that way. Don't come any nearer. I'm warning you. Isn't it eerie? I still love you and can strangle you for my love. And will. Uh, Stay where you are. You're not going to kill me, darling. I'm going to kill you. Now, do you see why I wasn't afraid of you? That gun. You've had it all the time. Correct, my love. Right here in the wine table drawer. I've planned this all along, Angel. From the very first. Before we were even married. Yes, your intuition was right. From the day you and my little sister were brought to the hospital after the accident. From the day she died. And the doctor said you'd pull through. I planned it all. And it's worked out like a perfect equation every step of the way. Why? Why? I had to commit the perfect crime, and I've done it. Even the police will testify that it was self-defense against a homicidal maniac. And when they find you here with a bullet in your head, they'll congratulate me. But what's this? I still don't understand. It had to be the perfect crime because I must go free. You see, one life has already paid for yours. 
And quart for quart, your blood is worth no more than my family's. I don't understand this at all. What did I ever do? You killed my sister. I killed her? She told me before she left on that drive with you that she was going to crash the car. She left before I could stop her. She told me everything, Frank, including what you'd done to her. Everything. I see. So that's it. Well, I don't suppose it would be of any use my trying to convince you. No, no use. I've waited a long time for this moment. Revenge is sweet. And it was such fun to torture you. I used a weapon I knew. Of course, it was power of suggestion. Sure, you guessed it. But what a pity you don't know the line yet. What was it? What was it? Tell me. Tell me. Don't keep me in torture. Keep back. Think hard, Frank. Think all around it. What about a jail and the revelation it gave you? What about a famous poet who wrote a famous poem while in jail? Why? Yes, yes. Oscar Wilde. That's it. Yes, that's it from Oscar Wilde. A ballad. Of course, a ballad. The ballad of Reading Jail. How could it ever have escaped me? Why, you witch, you've even been reading from it on our honeymoon. <laughs> but what part? What verse? What line? What was the line? Don't take another step or I'll pull the trigger. Give me the line. I say I still can't think of the line. Keep back, keep back or I'll shoot. Oh, no, you won't. One more step and I'll shoot. Tell me that line or I'll kill you. All men kill the thing they love. Remember, Frank? How's the next line go, Mrs. Clark? <sighs> By all, let this be heard. So I heard. Too bad I was a little late. Inspector Wake. You know, ma'am, like I said, I only read one poem in my whole life. But ain't it the darndest thing? It happened to be the Ballad of Reading Jail. Till death do us part A honeymoon in the bridal suite Red wine spilled on the table And red blood on the floor As the clock strikes twelve for Murder! again when death's key turns in the lock and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Professor Ruth Clark was played by Elspeth Eric. Professor Frank Clark by Eric Dressler. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Midnight, 
the witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Murder's a Lonely Business. And now, Murder at Midnight. Unusual stories of terror and mystery by radio's masters of the macabre. This tale, A Study of Murder in Duet, is by William Morwood. Its title, Murder's a Lonely Business. At a cemetery... A burial is taking place. For as much as it has pleased Almighty God and His great mercy to take unto Himself the soul of our brother, the two chief mourners, Fred and Grace Tilson, stand beside the open grave. Earth to earth, and as he looks at his wife, ashes, bitter thoughts course through dust. Fred's mind. And sure and certain Look at her. Look at her standing there, dabbing her eyes with a handkerchief. Tears. Real tears after what she did. After what she made me do. She doesn't know what sincerity is or love or pity either. She's hard. Hard all the way through. And I never knew. Never even suspected to. Till we killed him. Now, after the way she acted, I'll never forget it. Never. A nightmare always. How can I go on living with her? How can I ever trust her again? What am I to do? Oh, Lord, I'd give anything for a drink. But think I ever married that sniveling creature. I believe he's really crying, really sorry. As if he cared a hoop about his Uncle Edward outside of the money he could get out of him. He was ready enough to help put the old man out of the way the other night. Now his nerve's gone. All he can think about is a drink. That's the only time I feel safe with him. When he's drunk. And not always then. The way he's been carrying on lately, Lord knows what he'll say or do next. I'll have to watch him every minute of the time. He's a fool. And through thy mercy, O oh our Lord, who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. 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 Goodbye, Uncle Edward. They're throwing dirt on your coffin now. But you won't mind. You're cold and silent now. Very different from the way you were three nights ago. Three nights ago. Was that all it was? Another lifetime, but... Yes, that's right. Driving up to his house in the dark. Letting ourselves in. Uncle Edward. He must be up in his study. I guess so. Servant's night out. Uncle Edward? The door above opened, and Uncle Edward started down the marble staircase. In my mind's eye, instead of Uncle Edward, I could see my friends, a whole crowd filling the room, and myself in a gorgeous gown descending to greet them. A much more fitting picture than the stodgy form of Uncle Edward as he came down toward us. Well, well, this is a surprise. I thought we'd drop in, Uncle Edward. It's been a long time. Six weeks, to be exact, Fred. How are you, Grace? Wonderful, thanks, Uncle Edward. I'm glad to hear it. You look a little uh, off your feed. Come on into the library. You'll be more comfortable here. Oh, uh, a drink, Fred? Why, uh... Don't be polite. From what I hear, you're rarely seen without one these days. <laughs> you sound as if you'd had spies watching us, Uncle Edward. It's entirely possible. What? I've certainly been interested in your activities. For instance, I hear you can be found at a gambling house almost every evening, Grace. Oh, only the fashionable ones, where everybody goes. You've got to keep in the swim nowadays. If you can afford it. You can't. Not on Fred's salary. That's the trouble. Well, frankly, Uncle Edward, that's why we've come here tonight. 
We're in a jam again. Hmm. Money? What else? And you want me to bail you out, huh? Well, I'll be equally frank with you. This time, I'm not going to do it. Well, just as well. I'm sorry I've helped you out of messes often enough in the past. Each time, I hoped you'd pull yourself together, settle down and lead solid, respectable lives. But each time, you disappointed me. Now, I've given up hoping. Uncle Edward, I promise you... Too late, Fred. I can't believe your promises anymore. I've given you and Grace every chance. Now, I'm washing my hands of you. You can't expect help from me ever again. Now or in the future. Exactly. What does that mean? My lawyer's coming here tomorrow. And I'm going to cut Fred out of my will. Cut him out entirely. Uncle Edward. Every cent I have is to be left to charity. Why, you're not serious. You can't be. It, well, it's not fair. I'm your only nephew and There's I... There's no use talking, Fred. My mind is made up. <clears throat> now, would you care to discuss the weather? No. I thought you wouldn't, Grace. Come on, Fred. Uh... Uncle Edward... I advise you to change your mind about this. I beg your pardon? Because if you don't, you may live to be sorry. We went outside. Grace was in a white rage. And I was all jumping myself. We walked around the garden paths, trying to get hold of ourselves before we started back to town. You know what this means, don't you, Fred? The end of everything. We'll never be able to get credit once it's known that Uncle Edward's cut us off. Yes, I know. Somehow... Some way, we've got to stop him from changing his will. But how? You know there's no use arguing with him. He's as stubborn as a mule. Besides, there's no time left. He's going to do it tomorrow. I know. Unless, of course, something happens to him before that. Such as? He could die. What? Suddenly. <sighs> Some chance he's as healthy. Grace, what are you thinking of? You know. You're mad. If you want to spend the rest of your life struggling with debts, not able to do anything, I don't. Everything's perfect for it. The old man's alone in the house. No one knows we call this evening. No one will. Stop it. I won't listen to you. Oh, be a man for once in your life. Everything you want. Money, luxury. For five minutes' work. Yes, but how? The gun. The gun he keeps in the desk in his study. You've seen it. Yes. We'll take the money, valuables, to make it look like a robbery. Well, what are you afraid of? The sight of a little blood? Grace, I I don't know you when you talk like this. I know what I'm after for both of us. It's our only chance of a future. Together. Are you coming? Hi. Yes. All right. Then let's go in. The servants will be coming back. We haven't any time to waste. We went back into the house, climbed the long staircase to Uncle Edward's study. My mouth was dry, my knees were shaking. We reached the landing. Knock on the door. Grace, suppose. It's too late to suppose anything. Knock. Yes? Come in. I was expecting you back. You were? Certainly. I didn't think you let the money go that easily. Not after Grace's threat. What? Uh, what do you mean? You should have been a man, Grace. You've a completely ruthless streak in you. You'll stop at nothing to get what you're after. No wonder you've led poor Fred around by the nose so long. Now, look here, Uncle Edward. Sorry to hurt your feelings, Fred, but you must admit it's true. Now, if you two will explain why you came back... We hope to make you change your mind. You should know me better than that. I've said my last word. Not your last, Uncle Edward. Not yet. What Grace means You is... don't have to explain, Fred. Her interest in my desk explains itself. <laughs> the right-hand drawer, Grace. Were uh, you by any chance looking for this? <gasps> The gun? Yes, I took the precaution of removing it. As I said, I was expecting you back. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, Uncle Edward. I, I was only looking for your checkbook. I thought the least that you could do was to help us out of our present difficulties. It's a good story, Grace, but not quite good enough. Now, as it's almost 12, perhaps you'd both be good enough to leave my house permanently. Well, you win, Uncle Edward. I suppose we were foolish to think that we could find a soft spot in that stone heart of yours. You were foolish, all right. This way. This reminds me of the old days when Fred and I were first married, when we used to come and visit you. You used to see us to the head of the stairs when it came time to go. Just like this. That was a long time ago. I wish those days could come back. <clears throat> Impossible. 
Well, good night, Fred, and goodbye. Well, aren't you going to shake hands with your only nephew? Well, since it's for the last time, goodbye, Fred. Hold him, Fred. No, Fred. Fred. Let go of me, no, Grace. Can't, Fred. Get him. What? No, no. I'll give you money, all the money you want. No, Fred. No. Oh, you monsters. I'll make you pay for this. They'll die. Grace, what, what did we do? What did you make? Get down there, quick! There's no pulse. His heart. He's dead. Grace, when did you find him? An accident. The old man tripped on the stairs and broke his back. The money's ours, Fred. Everything we wanted. What? What's that? What? white-faced couple staring at each other. Did they hear a voice from beyond? Is it possible for the dead to make the living pay for... Murder! At midnight. Grace Tilton to continue our story. It went according to plan. The inquest raised no ugly questions or suspicions. And then after Uncle Edward's funeral, we settled down in the great old mansion. I could have been happy. So happy. Except for Fred. He'd taken to drinking again. Haven't you had enough, Fred? Another little drink won't do me. (coughs) You're such an idiot. The way you've been acting ever since... Since... We did in poor Uncle Edward. Don't be afraid to say it, Grace. We're alone now. Why did you give up your job so suddenly? I'm a rich man now. No need to work. But it looks so suspicious. And the way you've let yourself slip. That dirty shirt. You haven't shaved in two days. (laughs) Don't tell me you're ashamed of me. I can't ask anyone to the house. And I had such plans for us. Entertaining parties, making a name for ourselves. Sorry, that's not my idea of a career. In heaven's name, what is? Drinks. More drinks. Then another one. I won't let you turn into a drunken bum. I won't be disgraced like that. I'll do exactly what I like, and you won't stop me. Don't forget, my love. We share a little secret together. I'm not forgetting. No matter what happens, you're tied to me for the rest of your life. I wouldn't be too sure of that, Fred. If I get a chance at what I want, you won't stand in my way. Nothing will. What did she mean by that? I thought about it, brooded over it, couldn't forget it. Then one evening as we sat together in a nightclub, things became clearer. Did you hear me, Fred? What? I said I wanted a cigarette. Oh, certainly, my love. Here you are. Match? If you can hold it steady enough. Why do you have to get soused every time we go out? A tribute to your intoxicating charm. Oh, don't be so... Oh, well, there's Ronnie. Good old Ronnie. Dowager's delight. Now, if you'll only look over this way. With that dress you're wearing? You will. Ronnie! Oh, Ronnie! The change that came over her. Smile. Sparkling eyes as he came over to our table. Well, hello there. <laughs> this is a pleasant surprise, bumping into you again, Tilson. Mm. Getting to be a regular routine. The theater, the races, everywhere I go with Grace. Yes, we seem to share a lot in common, Fred. Sit down, Ronnie. What do you have to drink? Oh, nothing, thanks. I've had my quota for the evening. Well, I'm glad someone knows when to stop. Maybe Ronnie's got other vices. <laughs> I have, Fred. <laughs> One of them's dancing. 
You mind if I take Grace out on the floor for a turn? Why ask me? I'm sure Grace will agree to anything you say. Fred, now what kind of a nasty... Oh, come on, Grace. Fred didn't mean anything. Well, see you later, old boy. They danced well together. As I watched them, I remembered the things I'd heard about Ronnie. Of his rich wife who died so conveniently. And the fortune he'd run through. I saw Grace look into his eyes. Their lips moved. The suspicion grew on me till it became a certainty. They were plotting my death. The veins stood out in my forehead. My hands grew cold. But I knew exactly what I had to do. I had to strike first. I had to kill them before they killed me. If only I knew what they were plotting. If only I could hear they were whispering to each other. Oh, Grace, darling, you're so silent. It's Fred. How dare he act that way? Well, he's a very unpleasant person. Of course, he's under the weather, but that's no excuse. Just means he doesn't give a rap for you. Never has. Well, don't let's talk about him. Right. Music's lovely. Yes. So are you. Ronnie. You dance like an angel. I could hold you in my arms forever. Oh, we're just made for each other. You know that, Grace, don't you? I'd rather not think about it. But you must. Have you considered what we talked about the other day? It's impossible. Why? I love you more than anything in the world. We have the same tastes and ambitions. We could be a wonderful success together. But... You love me, too, don't you? Oh, yes, yes. Well, then what's stopping us? What's so precious about the life of a drunken bum? Fred's my husband. Husband? Do you love him? Even respect him? No. I did feel sorry for him. But not anymore. Not after tonight. I hate him. That's more like it. Well, then there's nothing to interfere. Except... The danger? Leave that in my hands. You have just one job to do, Grace. And that? Get Fred up to my place in the mountains for a vacation. I guarantee he'll never come back. I don't know if I should have been suspicious. Fred agreed to go up to Ronnie's place with surprising ease. It was almost as if he'd been expecting the invitation. The night we planned to do it, we sat in the living room. Just the three of us. Ronnie was playing the piano. I'm afraid I'm awfully rusty. I haven't practiced in weeks. <laughs> it sounds grand to me, Ronnie. Why don't you join him, Grace? I know you're just dying to play with Ronnie. Duet, I mean. Well, that's all we have time for anyway. I promised the Pearsons we wouldn't be late. Oh, that beach picnic. Tell you the truth, I don't feel much like it. But you promised to go, Fred. Do your world of good, old boy. Wonderful night for a swim. You both seem very anxious to get me down to that lake. Why? <laughs> Why not at all. I... If you want Grace and me to go alone... All right, I'll come. But I've got to go upstairs for my bathing suit. Wait for me here. Well, hurry it up, old boy. All set, Grace? You know exactly what to do? Well, I think so. You make a great fuss about Fred drinking. That'll be remembered afterwards. I'll take care of him at the raft. Push his head underwater and... He'll struggle. He'll call out. Not in the condition he's in. He's as weak as a baby. It'll be all over in a few minutes. I'll swim back Ronnie. and... Ronnie... Yes? Isn't there some other way? We love each other so much. Can't we just... Run off together? Let's be realistic, darling. We need the money. His money. Love in a cottage isn't our style. I suppose not. Where is he? What's keeping him so long? Well, I'm just as glad. Come on, Grace. I want to make sure there's an extra bottle of whiskey for him in the car. This way, darling. Through here into the garage. Give me your hand, Ronnie. Now, well, darling, everything's going to be all right. Just being with you. Ronnie. Yes? I saw something moving. Where? Over there. Behind the car. A Fred. Hello. I thought I'd hurry things up by coming straight out to the garage. Well, you... You gave us quite a start. Why, Grace? Something on your conscience? Well, the Pearsons will be on our necks if we don't get started soon. Now, well, in you go. We're off to the races. But just try to pick the winner. <laughs> out to the road, the winding road that led down to the valley. I knew just the spot where I had to leave them. 
From there on, their only companion would be the man with a sickle. Slow down, uh, Ronnie. Ah? Huh? I'm not going to the picnic after all. My, my head's splitting. But it's too late to drive you back, Fred. Well, you won't have to. I'll, uh, I'll walk. Just let me out. Very well. But, Ronnie... It's all right, Grace. We don't want Fred to have a miserable time at the picnic when we can settle things so much better this way. Oh, thanks. I hate to run out on you, but I've got my health to think of. Oh, sure. Oh, incidentally, there's a shortcut back to the house uh, through the fence there. I don't see it. Uh, go on ahead. I'll turn the headlights on it. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, so long. Have a good trip. Where are you going? Fred, look out! Shut up! You ran him down. You killed him. It's what we wanted, isn't it? But not here. Not out here on the road. It'll look like a hit and run accident. We'll double back at the bottom of the hill and pretend we came from another direction. Oh, we won't get away with it, Ronnie. It's no use. They'll catch us this time. Get out of it, Grace. <laughs> Sorry. But you've got to get hold of yourself. Yes. Yes, I must. I can't go to pieces. My hands are coming. So... Where are you going? I'll take the wheel. You're going to drive. No, I can't. Now move over. Go on. No. Now drive. Your life depends on it. Both our lives. I started down the steep zigzag road, and slowly, my nerves relaxed. As the car swooped around the curves, I felt a strange acceleration. Easy on these curves, Grace. It's a sheer drop if we go over the cliff. Oh, are you scared now, Ronnie? Well, I want to keep my neck in one piece. You needn't worry. I'm a good driver. Fred always... Fred... What's the matter? Nothing. Keep your mind on the road. There's a hairpin bend ahead of here that... Hey, hey, look out. Okay, I see it. I pushed on the brake. The pedal went all the way to the floor, but nothing caught. Nothing. No, Grace. Now, do you know what I was doing there in the garage? I disconnected the brakes. He did it. Fred. The fence, Grace. The fence. Yes, Grace. I meant to kill you and Ronnie. Grace, slow down. Oh, Ronnie, for heaven's sake, don't stop. I can't. Slow down. It's coming this way. It's too late now. A long, long drop to the rocks. Ronnie. See you soon, Grace. to the car at the foot of the cliff. Three people, lonely no longer, as the clock strikes twelve for murder at midnight. <laughs> to be with us again when death plays host and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Grace was played by Helen Shields. Wendell Holmes was her husband. Carl Emery, her lover. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader.
it's not just an ordinary cane, my dear. Alec. It's a sword cane, see? Calhoun used it when he killed his wife, right where you're standing. Alec, you... You killed Sanders. Exactly. And now you're going to kill me. Yes. No, no, no. Keep away from me. I'm sorry. Keep away. My dear... Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The House Where Death Lived. <laughs> And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Our story is a ghostly nightmare by one of radio's best-known mystery writers, Robert Newman. Its title, The House Where Death Lived. large rambling house on top of a hill. A house whose windows are either shuttered or broken. A rusty iron fence surrounds it, and its grounds are waste and uncared for. A car grinds slowly up the hill, stops before the main gate, and two men get out. One of them is gray-haired but vigorous. The other wears a chauffeur's uniform. They push open the heavy gate... Start up the gravel path. Quite a joint. You can hardly expect it to be a show place after being empty for more than ten years. It's open. Yes. Well, I'm glad we didn't have to force it. All right, Sanders. You can go back to the car and wait for me. I should be out in about a half an hour or so. You mean you're going in alone? Why, yes. Somehow I don't think you're exactly suited by temperament for psychic research. Okay, Doc, I'll be waiting for you back in the car. Right. Now, let's see. I suppose the best place to start would be... Good evening. What? Oh, I... I'm awfully sorry. I hope I haven't made a mistake. This is the Calhoun house, isn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, this is very embarrassing. I was down to see the trustees just this morning. They gave me permission to go through the place and told me that there was no one living here, that no one had lived here for many years. Well, as you can see, that's not quite true. Not that it matters. I lead a rather lonely life, and I'm very glad you came. I'd be more than happy to show you around. Well, you're very kind. Uh, my name is Goff, Dr. Alexander Goff. Dr. Goff. For the past few years, I've been specializing in psychic research. Oh, yes. You've heard of me? Uh, I'm sorry, no. But I do know that scientists... The specialists in psychical research have been interested in the house for many years. There have been several books written about it. I read about it in the series of studies that Kinsey did. He said it was one of the most fertile fields for manifestations he'd ever come across. It has a long history of apparitions and hauntings. That's very true. And now, would you like to look around? Well, I'd like that very much. Very well. I imagine the best place to begin is with uh, the cellar. This way. The cellar. That's where Mrs. Calhoun was killed, wasn't it? Yes. Uh -huh. I keep the door locked now for that uh, and for several other reasons. May I? Uh, no, no, wait. Wait, don't try to go down. Uh, have you a match? Why, yes. There. there aren't any stairs. Exactly. That's how Mrs. Calhoun was killed. The stairs had become rotten, and Calhoun took them out, uh, put in that ladder. Mrs. Calhoun didn't know it, and she tried to go down, fell, and broke her neck. Uh, but she wasn't just killed. She was murdered, wasn't she? Well, that's hard to say. I don't think even Calhoun could tell you whether it was deliberate or not. For a long time, people didn't even suspect what had happened. They thought that she'd run away and disappeared. 
However, after she was killed, Calhoun buried her down there in the cellar. Uh, you see, over there, that uh, near that big flagstone. Hmm. Oh, I see. Ah. Well, uh, after that, there was something about a gardener, wasn't there? Uh, yes, yes, Burroughs. Ah. Uh, he had helped Calhoun take out the stairs. Considerably later, he was working in the cellar and found some bones, and he put two and two together and... and... went to the police. No, no, he did a lot better than that, from his own point of view. Shall we go back into the parlor? Oh, yes, of course. I'll just shut this door again. There. Uh, Burroughs began blackmailing Calhoun. Uh, Calhoun paid for a while, and then one day he called Burroughs in here, into the parlor... He was sitting over there at that desk. He had his cane with him. The cane that's on the desk there now. You can look at it if you like. Oh, thank you. I would like to look at it. Uh, uh, Twist the handle and pull on it. A sword cane? Yes. He killed Burroughs right here in this room. That stain on the carpet, there's his blood. Uh, This time he didn't even try to get away with it. He called in the police and he was tried and sent to an institution. Yes, but that's what I don't understand. If Calhoun had committed two murders, why wasn't he sent to jail or hanged? Because no one knew whether he was sane or not. As a matter of fact, I don't think Calhoun knew himself. You see, when they asked him why he had killed his wife and Burroughs, he said he had to, uh, that he'd been told to. Told to? By whom? Well, he wasn't sure by, by voices. He said they told him that they lived here in this house before him, that they had killed, and that he would have to kill too. Ah, excellent, excellent. Just what I've been looking for, what I've hoped for. Ah. A house with a, a tradition of hauntings, where each generation is affected by that tradition oh, and adds to oh, it. And, oh, what, oh, what's the matter? They, they've come for me. They're weighing me down. Dragging what? me back. They? Who? Oh. Oh, you're ill. Here, let me help you. No, it's, it's no use. You, you can't pick me up. It's too much on my hands. Uh. On my hands. Where is he? There, right there on the floor. I tried to pick, pick him up and put him on the couch, but I couldn't lift him. And now he's gone. Well, now, look, Doc, if he fell down, if he was as weak as you said it... Hey, wait a minute. Hey, what did he look like? Well, he was quite old, about 70, and very tall and thin. He had white hair and a white goatee. Holy smokes. What's the matter? Well, I was waiting outside for you... The guy that lives just down the hill came by, and we, we kind of talked a little. Yes? I told him you were inside here, and you described Calhoun to me, the guy that used to live here. And the old gent you say you spoke to sounds just like him. But, but it couldn't have been. Calhoun is still in an institution. No, he's not. At least not exactly. That's how this guy happened to talk about it. You see, he just read in the paper that Calhoun had died yesterday. Sanders, yeah? That was Calhoun's ghost. Oh, now, look, It uh, was, I tell you. It has to be. This is what I've been looking for for years. An apparition that manifests itself without a medium or any apparatus. It's exactly what I need for the last chapter of my book. And I'm going to stay here until he appears again. Not a sign of him. Maybe Sanders was right. Maybe I did imagine the whole thing. Either that. Wait a minute. He didn't die here. He died at the asylum. He'd lived here all his life, committed two murders here. Perhaps the aura, the forces here, were strong enough to evoke him once, but not to bring him back again. His wife and the gardener, they did die here. If I could establish contact, I might be able to evoke them. Or else... Or else if someone else died here, someone I knew and someone that knew me... Calhoun! Is that right? Is that what I have to do? What? Who's there? Me, Doc. 
Doc. Stand it. Oh, just a second. Oh, what a night. Well, I'll go get her. What do you want, Sanders? Well, the missus thought you she'd get a little worried about you. Thought you might be running low on food. Oh, no, I still have plenty. I haven't been eating much. Uh, any luck? No, he hasn't materialized again, but I'm sure he will. I know he will. If someone else died here, huh? someone you knew, and someone that knew you. Yes. What's the matter, Doc? Hey, why are you staring at me that way? Doc! Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, Sanders. Sanders, I was just thinking that if you stayed here with me, it might help. But I thought you said I was all wrong for this kind of stuff. You know I don't believe in ghosts, anything like that. I did say that, Sanders, but... Oh, this place is different. It's... This is such a powerful, fertile field for psychic manifestations that I think if you did stay, we could cure your skepticism permanently. Yeah? How? Well, this is such a perfect night for an evocation. Listen. I don't hear anything. Just a storm. Listen hard. There it is again. It's down in the cellar. Where's that? It's back there. Where? Go ahead, run. You're quicker than I am, Sanders. Run, hurry. Okay, but I still don't hear anything. I... A man with an obsession in a haunted house. A man with a corpse on his hands as the clock strikes 12 for... Murder at midnight. And now, to continue with our story. It's just a moment later. And Dr. Goff is still standing by the open cellar door. Lighting a candle, he peers down to where Sanders' body lies huddled on the flagstones below. Sanders? Sanders? I think I... I better make sure. in two places. I'm sorry, Sanders. Very sorry. But science is a hard mistress. I've been working on my book for seven years. This is the first chance I've had to make detailed and objective observations on a specific set of phenomena. And when Calhoun didn't materialize again, I'm sure you understand. The only problem now is the police. They're apt to be very uncompromising about something like this. There were only some way I could... I know. The car. It's quite late and the storm blowing. There's not likely to be anyone around. Yeah. Oh, come on, Sanders. You and I are going to take a little trip. Turned the car around before you came in, so it's headed downhill. Oh, splendid. Very considerate. Now, yeah, open the door and put you in. Oh, I'm up. Uh, just make sure you don't fall sideways. But you stay behind the wheel. Yeah, that's it. Oh, is there anything else? Anything I've forgotten? I don't think so. Well, let's take the brake off. And shut the door. 
and wait. There's no telling how far she'll go, especially with the street so bumpy. I only hope that she'll go far enough to pick up plenty of speed so that when she does... Ah, ah, she's... She's... She's swinging. Swinging to the right. Yeah. And now, I wait. Sanders? Sanders! Where are you? It's been four or five days now. Why haven't you come back? Haven't you wanted to? Or haven't you been able to find a way? This is where you died, remember? Or down here in the cellar. Are you down there? Sanders? Are you down there? No. Not down there. Not anywhere. What's that? Yes? Well, who's that? Who's there? What do you want, Jean? I want to talk to you. Let me in, please. Just a second. Alec. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, dear. I asked you, what do you want? Why did you come here? Why? It's been almost a week now since you've been home. Have you any idea how worried I've been? You didn't even phone me after Sanders was killed. I'm sorry. I just never thought of phoning you. I, I had other things on my mind. How did it happen, Alec? You read the verdict of the inquest. He probably fell asleep at the wheel waiting for me. The brakes slipped. The car rolled down the hill and... Crash. Poor Sanders. Somehow I can't help feeling... Feeling what? I... I don't know. Perhaps it's this horrible old house. It... Everything about it is just plain evil. Oh, Alec, why don't you give it all up? Give what up? This obsession of yours. You started writing a book, doing psychical research to prove that there were no such things as apparitions or ghosts. Suppose now... I found out that I was wrong. What? Yes, what would you say if I told you that I'd already seen one apparition here? And that I was expecting to see another one. Alec. Oh, no. Oh, yes, Jean. The first evening I came here, I saw Calhoun. I talked to him. He showed me around the house. And later on, I discovered that he had died the day before. I waited for him to come back again, but he never did. And I finally realized why. He couldn't come back because he hadn't died here. He died at the sanitarium. But now, I'm waiting for Sanders to come back. Sanders? But, but he didn't die here either. He... Died? Yes, Jean. I... I don't like it here, Alec. I'm afraid. I, I'm going. No, Jean. Don't go. You can help me. Huh? Come on in here. Into the parlor. But... But, Alec... Come on, Jean. Later I'll tell you a very interesting story about this room, about something that happened here a long time ago. But I... All right, Alec. That's a good girl. You know, Jean, I've just realized I've been very stupid. Calhoun couldn't come back again because he didn't die here. Sanders did die here, but he wasn't buried here. And now I'm beginning to think that a spirit can only materialize in the place where its body is. But, but what's that got to do with me? Dear, does anyone know that you came here tonight? Why, why, no, but... Good. What do you mean? And, and what are you doing with that cane? You remember I said I was going to tell you a story about something that had happened here in this room? Well, this cane played an important part in it. You see, it's not just an ordinary cane. This is a sword cane. It's what Calhoun used when he killed his wife, right where you're standing. Alec, you... You killed Sanders. Exactly. And now you're going to kill me. Yes, dear. I am no. going to kill you, and I'm going to bury you right here, down in the cellar where Calhoun buries his wife. Oh. Then at least you will be able to come back. No, don't. Don't try and run away. Oh. You, won't you see, I locked the door. 
Keep away, son. I'm sorry. Keep away. My... Help! Dear... No! Now, smooth that gravel a little. Doctor, very oh. nice indeed. You didn't do quite as neat a job as I did, but you, you did pretty... Cal, who? Yes, Doctor. You're dead. But you did come back. Yes, I came back to tell you how grateful I am to you. Grateful? For, for what? For having, shall we say, relieved me. You see, there's a curse on this house. When I was alive and lived here, even before I killed my wife and Burroughs... I saw the ghosts of those who had died before I was born. It was they who made me kill, because once I did kill, they were free. I don't understand. Don't you? As long as this house stands, someone must haunt it. Until I died, it was haunted by those whom I had killed. When I died, it became my job. I thought it would be years before I could find someone to take my place, and then you came along. You mean... Yes, Doctor, yes, the curse, the evil that was spawned here has been passed on to you. Now it's haunted by those whom you killed, and I am free and can rest in peace. But you, you must stay here and live with the evil you created until you die. No, 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 I, I won't stay. Yes, you will, Doctor. Oh, I didn't believe it either. I thought I could leave whenever I wanted to. But I found that I couldn't. I had to stay until they took me away. When you try to leave, you'll find out why. But, yeah, but I won't stay. I, uh, I tell you, I won't. Neither you nor they can make me stay. Nothing can make me stay. No. No. <laughs> Once more, you're right about this place. It is evil. But I'm not going to let that evil continue. It must be destroyed, along with every stick and stone in this house. And just how do you propose to do that? I'll show you. With fire. This can of kerosene. Oh, that no. pile of lumber there. <laughs> it won't do any good. Take my word for it. <laughs> no, you watch. There. The whole cellar, the whole house will go now. Yes, yes, Doctor, but you won't go. I won't. You watch me. But you can't go without me, Doc. What? Don't you remember? You carried me out to the car. You've got to take me with you. Sander. Yes, Doctor, your chauffeur. Let go of me, Sanders. Let go. I, I can't take you with me. I... And you've got to take me too, Allie. No, Jane. No. Let, let go. Both of you. You see, go. now you know why I couldn't go either. Let go. What dragged me back and weighed me oh, down. Please. Now you know why you're going to have to stay here. I won't stay. I tell you, I won't. Not even if I have to take both Sanders and Jean with me. I'm afraid that won't do any good, Doctor. You see, the ladder isn't very strong. Oh. Oh. It broke. It broke. I'm trapped here. Goodbye, Doctor. If you don't mind, I'll leave you now for good. No. Oh. Oh. Flames draw higher and higher as Dr. Goff screams and staggers backward. Far away, a bell starts tolling for murder at midnight. Remember to be with us again when death stretches out his bony hand and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Dr. Goff was played by Barry Kroger. 
With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leder. You can't see. Dr. Rudd, there, there at the bottom of the terrace. Professor Labarge. Labarge, why I... Oh, good Lord. What is it? He he must have fallen down the steps, broken his neck. He, he's dead. hour when the night is darkest, our fear is the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Kabbalah. Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Robert Newman is The Kabbalah. A rambling house on the outskirts of a small university town. And in the house, a room that seems more like the cell of a medieval alchemist than the study of a college professor... Its walls lined with ancient volumes and astrolabes and other curious instruments. Bent over his desk, Dr. Rudd does not hear the knock on the door at first. But when it's repeated, he says... Come in. Al is going, Father. He wanted to say goodnight to you. Oh, yes, Alan. Good night. I was terribly sorry to hear about the decision of the Board of Trustees, sir. I mean, they're refusing to give you a grant to go on with your research. Oh, that. Well, it doesn't matter. I've about decided to give up the whole project anyway. Your book? Yes. Father, you're not serious. I I thought you were almost finished with it. I am. All but the last chapter. I just can't seem to write that without additional research. And without the last chapter, why, the rest of the book is meaningless. Well, isn't there anyone you could talk to about it, sir? Anyone who could help you? I doubt it, Alan. I think I know as much about the occult as anyone in the world. Except perhaps one man. Who was that, Father? The man I studied under at the University of Paris. And I haven't heard from him in over ten years. I'm not even sure that he's still alive. (laughs) Too bad this is the 20th century, not the 12th. How so, Dr. Rudd? Oh, it would have been very simple then. A pentacle, a pair of corpse candles, and I could summon up someone who would make things very easy for me. Yes, right now I really believe I would sell my soul for the help I need. Father, you mustn't say things like that, even as a joke. Well, you're right, Pablo. And no one knows it better than I. Well, good night, Alan. See you in the morning. Right, Dr. Rudd. Good night. I'll walk you down to the road, Alan. Oh, fine, dear. Pretty depressed, isn't it? Father? Yes. Not that I blame him. Four years' work. The definitive book on occultism, the supernatural. (gasps) 
Alan. Yes, I see it too. Someone or something lying in the road. Come on. An, an old man, and he's dressed so strangely. He looks like an Arab. Wonder what he's doing around here. Anyway, he seems in a bad way. Here, I'll carry him into the house. You run ahead and tell your father. All right. In here, Alan, in my study. All right. They put him on the couch. What's wrong with him? Well, it's hard to say, but I think it's just exhaustion. Oh. Oh, his pulse is very weak. Barbara, call Dr. Stevens. Of course, Father. I... He's opening his eyes. Where... What is this place? Now, it's all right. You're among friends. We're sending for a doctor. A doctor? Oh, you're kind, but it's too late. Allah stretches his hand out for me. Nonsense. All you need is some food, rest. No, and... no, I, I'm dying. But if you are indeed friends, one last request. Will you grant it? If we possibly can. I am a hodge. A Sufi. I come of a long, ancient line. Will you see that I get proper burial? Oh, yes, of course. I have no gold, <laughs> money, but... <laughs> He's fainting. Loose this robe, Alan. Right. Mm. Yeah. Say, he's got something hidden here. A uh, parchment scroll. The cabal. You, you've taken the cabal. It's all right. No, no, you must not. It's accursed. Into the fire. Destroy it. If you use it. Father. Yes. Yes, he's dead. May his soul rest in peace. funeral? Huh? Our Arab friend? Oh, uh, yes, Alan. Partly. And partly about this. this. This parchment he had hidden in his room. It seems to be a form of the Kabbalah. That's right. That's what he called it when he got so excited. Wanted you to destroy it. But the Kabbalah is just the science of letters and numbers, isn't it? Mm, it's much more than that, Barbara. It's the science of the mystical attributes of letters and numbers. The basis for almost all occultism. But this system is different from any I ever saw before. Different? How? Well, this particular system tells how a question can be written out, the letters changed into numbers and manipulated. And when the numbers are changed back into letters, they will answer the question. Listen, Professor, what do you say we try it? Try it? Sure. Of course, it's a lot of nonsense, but, well, why not? Oh, well, all right. This paper and pencil's on my desk. So what are you going to ask, Father? Oh, something simple, something we can check. Me? I'm going to ask something really practical. Okay, Professor, let's go. How are you coming, Father? Almost finished. Now, let's see. Zadek, Mem, Vav. Great Scott. What is it? Look at this. Here's my question. Will we have any visitors today? Mm-hmm. And here's the answer. Two visitors. Professor Laborde and someone else. Professor Laborde? Do you remember my telling you yesterday that there was one person in the world who could give me the help I needed to finish my book? Yes, that man was Professor Laborde. Father, you you don't really believe it, do you? I don't know. I told you I haven't seen or heard from him in ten years. But just the same... Dr. Rudd, look. Hmm? Look here, I got something, too. What is it, Alan? Well, here's my question. How can the professor get the money to continue with his research? Yes. Here's the answer. Call Mark Endicott. What? Of course. 
Oh, why don't you, Father? He's always been interested in you and your work. Well, I just never thought of it. I'll go in and call him right away. <laughs> Well, Father, did you get him? Yes. Yes, it's... It's very strange. In what way? He said that he's been thinking about me a good deal lately, and he's driving out here this evening to see me. There. That's the answer to your question. Two visitors. Professor Laborde and, and someone else. Well, he must be the someone else. You think so? Oh, of course. Somehow, I don't. Well, what do you mean, sir? I don't know. Except that I don't like it. Hmm. It's beginning to look as if our cabal is a washout after all. What makes you say that? Well, 11 o'clock and no sign of either Laborde or Endicott. I can't understand it. Endicott definitely said that he was driving out here and that he was leaving immediately. He probably changed his mind because of the storm. Well, it's still pretty bad out, isn't it? Yes, but it's not like him. You think he'd phone us and let us know? Oh, perhaps that's he now. Hello? Yes? This is Professor Rudd speaking. Who? Oh, yes. What? That's impossible. I spoke to him only a few hours ago, and... Why, I can't believe it. You're sure? Oh, I see. But thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Who was it, Father? That was Mark Endicott's attorney. His attorney? What did he want? Mark Endicott was killed at about six o'clock this afternoon. Killed? On his way here, an auto accident... His attorney called to tell me Endicott had left me a $5,000 bequest for research. What? Father, the Kabbalah. It said you were to call him for the money to continue your work. It didn't actually say he was coming out here. No. Wait a minute. You mean, you really think that... I don't know, Alan. But I do know that if I hadn't called him, he wouldn't have started driving here in the storm. He wouldn't have had the accident and been killed. And I probably wouldn't have gotten the money. But, Father, if it's true, it, if it has some sort of supernatural power, then what about Professor Laborde? It did say he was coming. Oh, please, Barbara, I told you I don't know. Endicott was my friend. Now he's dead. And somehow I feel as if I... Father, the door. Yes. Yes, let's, let's see who it is. Great Scott, Professor, if it is Laborde, do you realize what this means? Yes, Alan. If it is, why, well, the thing's priceless, absolutely priceless. Why, well, I, I don't... I beg your pardon. I'm sorry to trouble you, oh, but... Come in, Professor Laborde. Come in. We've been expecting you for some time now. An ancient manuscript which can foretell the future. A dead man and a visitor from the dead as the clock strikes 12 for murder at Midnight and the Kabbalah. It's just a moment or two later, and Professor Laborde is being shown into Dr. Rudd's study. In here, Professor Laborde. Barbara, will you take the professor's things? Oh, of course, Father. Thank you, my dear. You're very kind. But there's something I do not understand, Dr. Rudd. When you opened the door, you said you had been expecting me. Since early this afternoon. But that is impossible. Completely impossible. I'm here entirely by accident. I had no idea you lived here or anywhere near here. I lost my way in the storm 
They knocked at your particular door by chance to, to ask for directions. Nevertheless, we've been expecting you. But excuse me, how could you have been? Alan. Yes, sir. Show Professor Laborde the Kabbalah, will you please? Right, Professor. Here you are, sir. Kabbalah? Look at it, Professor. Tell me what you think of it. Uh, interesting. Very interesting. Of course, I cannot be sure without examining it thoroughly. But it appears to be even older than the black grimoire. And its form resembles that of the key of Solomon. Professor Laborde, it's my belief that it is the key of Solomon. What? But it can't be. It's been written about for centuries, of course, mentioned in hundreds of works from Trismegistus down. But there's never been any proof that it ever actually existed. And still, where did you get it? From an old Arab who came here last night and died here. The main thing is we tested it. Tested it? Yes, yes we asked two questions. The answer to one of them prophesied your coming here. And the other, well, that came true, too. But this is beyond words. If it's true, then it's the most priceless discovery that has ever... Professor Rudd, may I try it? Use it to ask a question, too? Well, I... I don't know, Professor Laborde. I... Uh, please. For years now, ever since I began studying the supernatural, there's been something... One thing I've always said I'd give my very life to know. If it can tell me that, you must let me, Rod. And you must let me do it while I'm alone. Well, all right. Ah, good. Come on, Alan, Barbara. We'll wait outside. Professor? It's 20 hours. Hmm. He's been at it for quite a while. Yes. If he doesn't call us in another minute or two, we'll go in. I'm probably being very silly, but I don't like this, any of it. Why not, Father? I don't know, but... Oh, What's no, that? No, Professor no, Laborde, yes, come on. No, Professor Laborde, what is it? What's happened? What... What are you doing? He's burning something in the fire. Oh, Father, it's his hands. He's holding them in the fire, burning. Oh, great Scott, Professor Laborde, oh, stop. So stop. Have you gone mad? Fire! Only fire can burn my hands clean again. I asked. Now I must pay. Laborde. Let me go. Let go. I am coming. I'll pay. I'll Professor Laborde, come back. Pay. Quick, Alan. Okay. Which way did he go? That way. Down through the garden. The storm. It's so dark you can't see. Dr. Rudd. There. There, at the bottom of the terrace. Professor Laborde. Laborde, why... Oh. oh, good Lord. Well, what is it? He... Oh, he must have fallen down the steps. Broken his neck. He... He's dead. <laughs> Gently. Yes, sir. Father, are you sure that... Yes, Barbara, I'm sure. He's dead. But what made him do it? Go running out there that way? It, it must have been something to do with the Kabbalah. He was going to ask it a question. Yes, Alan, it has something to do with the Kabbalah. And, and standing there with his hands in the fire, as if he were trying to burn them clean. Father, what was the question he asked? What answer did he get? I think... Perhaps I can guess. The old Arab, he warned us, remember? He said it was accursed, evil, that if we used it... Wait a minute, Dr. Rudd. Hmm? Laborde said he'd give his life to know the answer to that question, and now he's dead. Yes, Alan, that's what was in my mind, too. That and one more thing. Do you remember what I said just before you found the old Arab in the garden? That I'd make a pact with the devil, sell my very soul for the help I needed to finish my book? No, Father, you're not serious. 
You don't mean you really believe... I've lived too long, my dear, seen too many strange things to disbelieve anything. If the Kabbalah is everything we think it is, if it is the key to the future, to all knowledge, if it can answer any question we put to it, then there are only two sources from which it can draw its power. One good and one evil. And... and you think... If God had wished us to be able to foresee the future, we should be able to foresee it. On the other hand, if it's evil, well, there's usually a penalty involved. The board. He said something about pain, too. Who, who must be paid, and how? There's only one way to find out, through the Kabbalah itself. Give it to me, Alan. No, please, no. I'm sorry, Barbara, I must. There's no need for you to stay here, or Alan. No, Father. We'll stay, both of us. Very well. Then, here goes. Shivering, darling. Are, are you cold? Shall I build up the fire? No, Elma. I'm not cold. What was that? It sounded like the outside door opening. Oh, I... Father. Uh, Father, what is it? Are you finished? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm finished. And... And what... Look. Here's the question. Who must be paid? And how? And here's the answer. Turn around, and you will see. Father, the door, the door behind us, it just opened. Yes. I don't dare turn around. You needn't. Right in front of you, there on the wall. Look. Something black, like a stain, a blot. But it's spreading, moving. Like an octopus. Or like... It's shadow. It's... It's coming toward us. What... What in heaven's name is it? Whatever it is, whatever happens to us, no one shall ever again be cursed as we've been cursed. The Kabara, give it to me. Father, what are you doing? What I should have done when I first saw it. Destroy it. Throw it into the fire. It's coming closer. Closer. Professor, isn't there anything we can do? Anything that... <gasps> Father, look. The parchment burning. They are in the wall. The shadow of the Andions. In the shape of the crooks on Sata. The first cross. Good Lord. The shadow, it's wavering. Drawing back, retreating. I'm going to turn around. See what... No, wait. Wait until... All right. Now. There's... There's nothing there. The board? The board? Dr. The board? Someone just came in. Who's there? Who is that? Oh, excuse me. I, I'm terribly sorry. I'm looking for someone. An old man with white hair and white beard. His name's... Holy smoke, there he is. Dr. The board. Dr. The board. I can't answer you. He's dead. Dead? Who are you, anyway? Well, an attendant at a private hospital in town. We've been taking care of him ever since he got to this country. Nervous breakdown. He disappeared this afternoon, and... He'd been talking about you so much lately that I had a hunch he might have come out here. Talking so about me? But he said he had no idea I lived here. Of course he knew. I told you he wasn't right in the head. That was one of the signs. Father, if it's true, if his mind was going, that would explain what he did. Burning his hands, running away like that. You mean the Kabbalah didn't have any occult power? What about the money from Endicott? Oh, just a coincidence. And what just happened? That shadow we saw on the wall? Well, it was only a shadow. It could have been just our imagination. Yes, Barbara, it could have been. But somehow, I don't think it was. An old professor stands next to the body of his friend, staring at the fireplace where the secret of the ages has gone up in smoke as the clock strikes twelve for... Murder! At midnight. <laughs> 
remember to be with us again when death whispers from the darkness in an unknown tongue and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Dr. Rudd was played by James Van Dyke. With music by Bert Berman, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Mr. Thompson. The, uh, the King of Hearts. Colonel Moore. The Five of Clubs, Mr. President. Count Rizzini. Come, Count, we are waiting. What is your card? Lasso di Spada. I beg your pardon. The Ace of Death. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Ace of Death. at midnight. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Our story, based on Robert Louis Stevenson's immortal suicide club, is by Max Ehrlich. Its title, The Ace of Death. I stood there on the bridge and stared down into the swirling fog. It hid the river like a white shroud. I shivered. It'd be cold down there, freezing cold. I would go down, down, deep into the black, watery depths, my ears bursting and my lungs fighting for breath. And then, finally, there would be silence. Silence. And eternal peace. Somewhere, a clock began to chime eleven. The last hour, the last hour of a man's life, my life, I, John Evans, ill and broke without family or friends, sick and weary of the constant struggle among earthbound mortals, looked forward to my new future, death. I put one foot over the bridge rail, my heart pounded, my head throbbed. And then someone came out of the mist and seized me from behind. No, no, no you fool. Don't yes. do it. Not no, this way. Let no. me go. Let me go no, while I still got the courage. Did you hear what I've got to say? Why did you stop me? Why? I wanted to die. I wanted to. I sympathize with you, young man. You see, I too am tired of life and, and seek death. You? You want to die? Yes, but not by drowning. No, my boy. I've made other arrangements. The river is not only a dull way to die, it's positively sordid. The very idea makes me shudder with distaste. Wait, I, I don't understand. Oh, it's I... very simple, young man. Well, most of us are too commonplace about the, about the hereafter. We enter it with, with morbid fear and without imagination. Actually, death can be glorious. Glorious? Yes, a great new change from our ordinary lifetime routine. A journey into an uncharted world. A man should meet death on the wings of adventure. It should be an exciting and delightful experience. Death? 
exciting and delightful. Why not? I've already arranged my decease along these lines. And since you and I have an interest in common, why not join me? Huh? We'll seek death's private door together. Come, young man. Come along with me. Where? To my club. I'll be glad to recommend you for membership. Your club? Yes. It caters to a clientele of gentlemen like ourselves. We call it the Hereafter Club. The whole thing was mad, insane. And yet... Yet it was intriguing, too. I looked hard at the elderly gentleman who'd come out of the fog to pull me from the brink of death, only to offer me a pleasanter and more delightful variety later. He repeated his invitation to join him, and I could see that he was perfectly sincere. I decided to go with him, even though I secretly considered him some kind of a madman. After all, what could I lose now? We took a cab and stopped at a grim-looking building in the silk stocking district on the east side. My elderly friend, whom I now knew as Frederick Whitney, took me into a luxurious reception room and asked me to wait there until he saw the president of the club. Finally, the president himself came out to greet me. He was a man of about 50 with a bald spot on his head, piercing gray eyes and a thin mouth. He smiled and extended his hand to me. Welcome to the Hereafter Club, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Whitney has recommended you very highly, and I'm delighted to count you among our members. I am pretty vague as to what all this is about, but Mr. Whitney mentioned something about a $400 initiation fee, and, well, I'm tut, afraid tut, I... Tut, my boy, Mr. Whitney knew you were in delicate financial straits and took your initiation fee upon himself. Oh. You were fortunate indeed, Mr. Evans, that he happened along and rescued you from the river. Such a morbid way of entering the hereafter would have been tragic indeed. <laughs> Isn't death in any form uh, tragic? By no means, Mr. Evans. Death can be a triumph, a fine, heady wine, when so designed by a connoisseur. Come, Mr. Evans, follow me. You are about to embark on an exciting and unforgettable experience. <laughs> Like a man in a dream, I followed the president into a large room. There was a green, baize table in the center of it, and several men in evening dress lounged around the room, drinking champagne. They seemed uh, nervous and distraught. And when they laughed, it was high-pitched and too loud. They seemed to be waiting for something to happen, some event to begin. As the president and I stood at the door, he turned to me and smiled. These men, Mr. Evans, are charter members of the Hereafter Club. They come from all walks of life, but they have one common desire, death. I see. And uh, what happens now? Our procedure is very simple. We all play a game of cards. A game of cards? A simple but fascinating game of cards. That is, these gentlemen play... As president of the Hereafter Club, I am the dealer. And uh, what is the game? Each man draws a card and turns it face up. The man who is fortunate enough to draw the ace of spades dies. For this is the card of death. And uh, how does he die? By the hand of the man who draws the ace of clubs. Oh, I see. The ace of clubs <laughs> eliminates the ace of spades. <laughs> Precisely. I... How many of these games do you play a night? Just one. But as you can see, Mr. Evans, during its course, a man can live a lifetime of adventure. For well, this makes of death an exciting game of chance, a game to whip the blood and make the pulses race. You see, one never knows whether he will draw the fatal ace of spades tonight or whether he will survive for weeks or even months. A question, Mr. President. Yes? How much of this can a man stand? I can only answer in this way, Mr. Evans... Our members always come back to the Hereafter Club night after night until they draw the Ace of Spades. Once a devotee of the game, it's impossible to resist. <sighs> now, but come, we're ready to begin. In a kind of hypnotic trance, I followed the president into the room. But when the members saw him, their conversation stopped suddenly. 
They put down their champagne glasses, straightened. Their faces grew pale and tense. Their eyes, brilliant with a mixture of fear and anticipation. The president took a fresh pack of cards from his pocket, and like a magnet attracting iron filings, the men drew close to the baize-covered table. I found myself standing next to Frederick Whitney as the president spoke. Gentlemen of the Hereafter Club, the game is about to begin. Someone here tonight will draw the Ace of Spades. Whoever he is, let me assure him that we will arrange his death so that it will appear to be an accident with no breath of scandal and with no unnecessary anguish to his family. We all know that life is only a stage to play the fool upon, as long as the part amuses us. Now we are wearied of our daily performance and have chosen a civilized and exciting way to quit that stage. Gentlemen, the deal. It was a fantastic, weird, monstrous experience. The green baize table, the president puffing on his cigar and dealing a card to each man face down. Each man his face like a graven image turning his card up. I, I could feel the sweat pouring down my forehead. My heart pounded like a hammer. And next to me, Frederick Whitney stood rigid, his eyes shining as the president's voice drawn down. Mr. Thompson, your card. And they're here. The three of diamonds. Colonel Moore. The six hearts. Mr. Denison. It's... It's the Jack of Spades. Count Rizzini. The Eight of Clubs. Mr. Evans. Our new member. The... <coughs> the Queen of Hearts. <laughs> Mr. Whitney. Uh, Mr. Whitney, what is your card? The... The Ace of Clubs. Well, Mr. Whitney. Congratulations. You shall be the official agent for tonight. Now let us see whom you will guide into the hereafter. Frederick Whitney left the game and went directly into the president's private office. There was only one card to be drawn now, the ace of death. The tension was almost unbearable. I felt like running away from that table, screaming at the top of my voice, but I didn't. I only stood there, riveted, staring at those cards, listening to the president's hypnotic voice. Mr. Benedict. The tray of spades. Mr. Wallace. Nine of diamonds. Mr. Thompson. The uh, king of hearts. Colonel Moore. Your card. The five of clubs. Count Rizzini. Count Rizzini, we are waiting. What is your card? La Sadispada. I beg your pardon. The Ace of Death. <laughs> I stumbled from that horrible place into the cold night air. I went directly to my room, shaken to the core at what I had seen. In the cold, gray light of the morning, it took on the aspect of a bad dream. A macabre nightmare. I resolved to shrug it off, forget the whole thing. But when I bought a newspaper... The headline struck me like the blow of a hammer. Quickly, my heart beating wildly, I read the lead paragraph. Count Pietro Rizzini, prominent Italian nobleman, was hit and instantly killed at midnight when he stepped off the curb into the path of a speeding taxicab. The Count, who had recently lost his fortune, was with a friend, Mr. Frederick Whitney, when the unfortunate accident occurred. <laughs> And so, in the darkness of the night, a man who has played a grim game and lost goes to his death as the clock strikes twelve for... Murder! At midnight! Here is John Evans again to continue his story. Yes, the Hereafter Club was really a murder club. A racket conceived and created by the polished gentleman who called himself the president. He made a game of death and grew rich on it. For each night, although he lost a member, he made $400, the member's initiation fee. 
And as the members dropped out, according to Hoyle, there were always plenty of disillusioned neophytes like myself ready to replace them. My first impulse after reading that grisly newspaper announcement was to run to the police. But I had pledged my word to secrecy. And besides... Besides, I wanted to go back. I had to go back. The thrill of the game was in my blood. I fought to resist it, but... It was like a hypnotic drug. Time after time, I went back to the Green Bay's table, and then, one night... Your card, Mr. Whitney? Come, sir, what is your card? The Ace of Spades. Now, my friend, Frederick Whitney, the man who'd introduced me into the Hereafter Club, had drawn the Ace of Death. His string had run out. He was through. I stared at him. He was calm, and there was a half-smile on his face. He seemed almost glad that for him the game was over. The president kept on dealing. Mr. Thompson, your card? The uh, Jack of Hearts. Colonel Moore? The Fool of Speech. Mr. Denison? The the Ace of Diamonds. Mr. Benedict? Ten of Club. Mr. Evans? They were waiting for me. Come, come, Mr. Evans. Your card? The ace of clubs. Congratulations, Mr. Evans. Only your sixth evening at our club, and you draw a winning card. Now, if you'll join Mr. Whitney and myself in my private office, we'll arrange the details. The instructions were simple. I was to drive Mr. Whitney into the garage of his home... Leave him in the car with the motor running. That was all. And so without a word, I got behind the wheel and drove my elderly benefactor to the appointed place. We looked at each other there in the garage, and then he said... John, if anyone had to draw the ace of clubs, I'm glad it was you. No, Mr. Whitney, look here. I I don't want to kill you. I, You know I don't. Let's end this farce. Let's go to the police and end this monstrous thing. No, John. You forget I, I'm a murderer. I have already killed. And I'd rather die by carbon monoxide gas in this comparatively painless way than in the electric chair. But the police will never know that you were responsible for Rizzini's death. If we expose the hereafter club, the president would be sure to tell them. There death. must be a way no, somehow. No, my boy. I have chosen death. And my time has come. In a way, I'm glad <laughs> everything is resolved. There is no more waiting. Waiting for the fatal card. No, it's over now. <coughs> go. Go, my boy. Leave the garage. Slam the door. No, no, Mr. Whitney. <coughs> for God's sake, turn off the motor before... Go. <coughs> go, John, before it's too late. Hurry. Don't worry about me. I have sought death for weeks. Now I welcome it. Meet it gladly. I staggered to the garage door, went out and slammed it shut. I heard the motor still going. Five minutes. Ten minutes. I knew that it was the end now for Frederick Whitney. I looked at my luminescent watch. It was just midnight. I walked the streets for hours after that. Now I was a murderer. True, I had killed with my victim's consent, but I had killed. Now, as the dawn came, I began to shake with a cold rage against the connoisseur of death who called himself the president. Men killed. Men died, and he profited without risk. He always dealt the game and never participated. He was a prince of ruin. And unfortunate men like myself could not resist what he had to offer. And so, like a smiling Satan in formal clothes, exerting a demoniac spell upon the fools who played his game, he watched them destroy each other. That night, I went to the Hereafter Club, and just before the game confronted him... Ah, good evening, Mr. Evans. I see you are back again tonight. Yes, Mr. President, I am back again. And I want to congratulate you... Indeed? On what? On your financial vision in starting this club... By simple mathematics, it nets you a handsome profit. We play five evenings a week, 
and each evening you make $400. That, Mr. President, adds up to $2,000 a week. Yes, it's a tidy sum, Mr. Evans, to be sure. But to tell you the truth, tonight we play our last game. Our last game? Yes, to be frank with you, Mr. Evans, the sport of the game is beginning to pall on me. I've decided to retire to the country and pursue the delights of horticulture. Flowers are my hobby, you know. Oh, I see. Even you can tire of sending men to their debts. And just what do you mean by that, Mr. Evans? I mean that you are a coward, Mr. President. You have created a monstrous game. And yet you haven't the courage to play it yourself. You question my courage, then, Mr. Evans? I do. And I question your honor, too. It seems to me that if you profit by your clients, you should take the same risk they do. Hmm. You are a very impertinent young man, but I cannot let your accusations go without rebuttal. <laughs> Indeed, it might be an interesting experience to play this last game myself. A kind of fitting climax to a successful career. Of course, Mr. Evans, I'll demand a handsome apology when it's over. You don't mean that you are actually going to take a chance. Yes, why not? I've often been intrigued by the excitement of my clients. Now, I might as well savor that excitement myself. Before I close the Hereafter Club. The news that the president was going to play created a sensation among the members. He dealt a round. And then another. And the third time around, for the second night in a row, I drew the murder card. The ace of clubs. The president smiled his congratulations at what he called my phenomenal luck and continued. Mr. Thompson, your card. The uh, two spades. Colonel Moore. The king of hearts. Mr. Dennison. The seven of clubs. Mr. Benedict. Queen of diamonds. And now, gentlemen, I'll turn over my own card. <gasps> Congratulations, Mr. President. You have drawn the ace of spades. The president's face was immobile. Not an eyelash flickered. We went into his private office and his words were calm as he explained the evening's arrangements. I had drawn the murder card and he had drawn the death card. Yet, judging by his unworried attitude and serene bearing, it might have been the other way around. I couldn't help a flicker of admiration for him. As for me, I was eager to do my part. To kill this man who had been caught at the last moment in his own net. He had sent many a man to his death. And now he had to meet it himself. There is a railroad bridge on the outskirts of town, Mr. Evans. It has a low railing and below it an express train passes exactly at midnight. You will push me over that rail into the path of the locomotive. And now, if you're ready, let us go. We didn't speak on the trip out to the bridge. It was a cold night. We stood there, shivering and waiting. Finally, in the distance... That was it. The midnight train. I could see its bright headlight flickering as it approached. Then the president spoke. Mr. Evans, of course we are not going through with this. Of course we are, Mr. President. Look here, my dear boy. As you know, the Hereafter Club is disbanded. Unlike my clients, I have no desire to die. There's no point in doing so. Well, you are going to die, Mr. President, just as you have sent others. I'll see to it myself. Be reasonable, Mr. Evans. I have everything to live for. And so can you have. Now then, I'm a very wealthy man, and I'm quite sure you could use, say, $10,000. Get close to that rail, Mr. President. I suggest you listen to reason, Mr. Evans. The others died without a whimper. You sent them into the hereafter, and now you're going yourself as you deserve. You're a very stubborn young man, Mr. Evans. That's... No, drop that gun. Don't. Try to kill me, will you? Well, you got me in the arm, that's all. And now you're going over that field. Don't, don't. I'll give you anything. Anything over you. No. 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 Ah. Ah.
When the train had passed, I saw what was left of his body on the tracks. Slowly, with dragging footsteps, I walked down the street toward the twin green lights of the police station. Now, like the others, I'm ready for the end. The doors of the police station open and close on the man who trumped the ace of death. The man who now seeks his own dark destiny as the clocks strike twelve for... Murder at midnight. Remember to be with us again when death deals his final hand and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of John Evans was played by Carl Swenson. The president of the Hereafter Club was John Griggs. With music by Bert Berman, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. I said, who are you? What are you doing here? My name is Gabriel. I am butler to the Holloway. Gabriel? But you... You can't be. Well, you're... You're dead. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest... And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The House That Time Forgot. <laughs> Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Sigmund Miller is The House That Time Forgot. Early evening on a desolate part of the Virginia coast, along a road near the beach comes a car with two people in it. I guess we've done enough looking for today, Eva. Oh, it's really beautiful country around here, dear. Wild and lovely. Mm-hmm. Darling, if we can't find a house, perhaps we should buy some land and build. Well, we'd better start back to town. It's getting dark, and I, I think we're in for a storm. Oh, look, Fred. Hmm? Look at that house we're coming to. Huh. Oh, now, isn't it a beauty? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nobody that owns that one would want to sell it. Drive slowly, dear. I'd like to take a good look at it. All right. There's a for sale sign. Yeah? This house for sale. See Mr. Cecil Smith, Westfield, Virginia. Oh, that's interesting. Well, let's drive in there, into the grounds. I'd oh, like we to... can come back tomorrow, Evie. It's really starting to blow up. But it'll only take a minute. I've, I've just got to have a close look. All right, but we're going to get caught in the rain. I'll back in to save time. We'll watch the fenders on that side. All right, dear, I would. Come ahead. Am I clear? Okay, you're all right. Fine, fine. 
Ah, there's a light in one of the gable windows. Well, I guess somebody's home. It's beautiful, Fred. Simply magnificent. Yeah, the grounds look a little neglected, though. Grounds? Who cares about that? Go ahead and knock. Okay. I wish they'd hurry. We're going to get caught in the storm. Oh, don't worry about it. They don't seem to answer, do they? Try knocking again. Mm. That's odd. Must be somebody home. We saw a light in the window. Mm. Maybe they can't hear us. Let's try calling them. Oh. Hello there. Hello? <laughs> That's very strange. Yeah, I... What? I hear something. Listen. It's a clock striking. Now, let's, let's try the door. Oh, it's not loud. Uh, what do you think? Uh, well, uh, let's go in. It's a big place, but lovely. Oh, wait a minute. Dear. Anybody home? Well, if there is, they can't hear us or don't want to. Uh, come on, dear. We'll, we'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> place needs fixing up, but it's worth the fixing. Shall we take it? Well, I... Well, I don't know, Eva. We'll talk to the agent in Westfield, and then... Well, we'll see. Interested in buying the Holloway house? Yes, Mr. Smith. It's just the kind of house we've been looking for. Uh, <clears throat> it's a fine place, all right. Even got a private inlet to moor a large-sized boat. It's got everything except... Uh... Except what, sir? Well, it's only fair that I tell you all its uh, defects. <laughs> what defects, Mr. Smith? Well, you see, Mrs. Jordan, it's kind of hard to put your finger on it. There's something very queer about the house. Huh? Oh, <laughs> you mean it's haunted? Well, I don't know exactly, Mr. Jordan. No one has seen a ghost there yet. <laughs> well, we we don't mind ghosts, do we, Fred? <laughs> no, no, we don't believe in them. Well, I, I didn't say it was haunted, but, well, people say that the house is alive, that that it has a life and a will of its own. A life? Well, I don't know what you mean. Well, I've had four caretakers in the Holloway house since I took possession of it, and none of them stayed more than a few days. Well, why did they quit? I don't know. They didn't see any ghosts or apparitions, but they all felt the same way, that, that the house was alive. Every one of them. Oh, well, there must have been something that scared them away. Well, I'd better tell you the whole story. Yes, we'd like to. Please do. Now, the house originally belonged to Richard Holloway. Mm -hmm. Seven years ago, in 1939, Richard and his wife, Diana... Went on a short cruise in their yacht, the, the Viking Second. Oh, that's an interesting name, isn't it? They never came back. Oh? They had two friends visiting them who refused to go with them. The strangest part about it is that these friends warned them that they'd never return alive from the cruise. The Holloways laughed at them. Oh, well, well how did they know, th these friends, that the Holloways wouldn't come back? I don't know. Nobody knows. Well, dear... Did, did you talk to these friends? No, I never saw them. Uh, I only know about it through John Gabriel. He was the Holloway's butler. Oh. Been dead for two years now. As a matter of fact, even Gabriel didn't know these friends. He'd never seen them before. Uh, it's a mystery that I've thought about for years. Uh, I'm afraid it's going to be a mystery forever. Hmm. Very interesting, but uh, we'd still like to buy the house. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh... There was a light shining in one of the windows when we were there yesterday, and we also heard a clock chiming. Mm, that's funny. No one's been inside that house in over a year. Oh? Uh, Eva, perhaps we ought to think this over. Oh, huh? nonsense, darling. You're not going to let some old wives' tail bother you, are you? No, no. But how could a clock still be going if no one's been in that house for a year? Well, there's a life boy not far from the house. You might have mistaken it for the clock. Now, you see, everything has a logical explanation. Yeah, what about the light in the window? Well, it was probably a reflection from the sun or something. We'd like to take the house, Mr. Smith. Well, if you wanted, I'd be glad to sell it to you. I just thought it fair to tell you all about it, so if anything happens, you can't blame me. <laughs> Well, 
here we are, darling. Our house. Mm, I hope we'll like it. Oh, of course we will. Let's go in. Mm-hmm. Do you have the key, dear? Yes, but we don't need it. The door was open, remember? Oh, yes, yes, that's right. Hey. Huh. It's locked again. Oh, Mr. Smith must have locked it. There we go. There you go, dear. Well, look. Hmm? Darling, everything clean. Dusted. Why, it's spotless. Oh, now, Mr. Smith really is a dear. Hey, it looks lived in, doesn't it? <laughs> I, I told you we'd like it. Uh, I suppose. Hmm, he also put flowers around. He does smell of flowers, roses. But let's look around. Hmm, bright-looking kitchen, isn't it, Fred? Yeah. And this wonderful big refrigerator. And it's full of food. No. Fresh food. Oh, that Mr. Smith, why, he thought of everything. Well, the bedroom is even bigger than I thought. Look at the beds. What? Someone has slept in them. That man Mr. Smith sent to clean the house must have slept in it. Yes, and he apparently slept in both beds. (laughs) This library. Darling, look at that paneling. Yeah, yeah. It's a very lovely room. Everything is charming. But... But what? Look at the fireplace. Well, what's wrong with the fireplace? There's just some half-burnt logs in it. Yes, yeah, just some half-burnt logs. Still <laughs> smoldering. Well, it was the cleaning man. I don't think there was a cleaning man. Now, don't be absurd, Fred. Huh. The clock we heard the first time we were here... Eva, I just can't shake off the feeling that someone is still living here. You're being ridiculous. Well, maybe I am, but I I feel like an intruder. Oh, darling, it's, it's that story Mr. Smith told us about the Holloways and their mysterious friends. It, it, it's got you all keyed up. Yeah, well, I'm going to call Mr. Smith and find out about that cleaning man you think he sent here. Uh, operator. Oh, operator, give me Westfield 403. You're really being a fuss, part, Fred. Yeah, we'll see. I'll try... Oh, h- hello, Mr. Smith. Yes? Uh, This is Fred Jordan. Oh, hello, Mr. Jordan. How's everything up at Holloway? Oh, everything seems fine. Uh, Thanks for having the house cleaned up. Cleaned up? I don't understand you. Didn't you send a cleaning man to straighten up the house? Uh, No, Mr. Jordan. The house was sold as is. I never sent anyone over. Uh, Might interest you to know we found the house in a spotless condition. Cleaned and ready for occupancy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. I'll be in touch with you later. Such a lovely night, darling. I'm glad we came out. Yeah, we'd better go back to the house. Oh, now, please don't be upset. There, there must be some logical explanation. Mm. Maybe... Maybe somebody took advantage of a boarded-up house and was living in it rent-free. I'd like to correct you, dear. Someone is still living in it besides ourselves. Sometimes, Fred, you get very ridiculous. Mm, Maybe. Let's go back inside. Look. What? There's a fire burning in the fireplace. Well, now, what's wrong with that? I haven't touched this fireplace since we got here. You didn't. Look, the table is set for tea. Did you do this? No, I... I I didn't. Oof, the teapot is hot. Somebody... Somebody must be here, hiding. If they are, I'll... I'll find them. Come on. I I don't understand it. I, I just... Cellar to attic, and there's no one here. But it's incredible. Someone is living here, and we can't see them. It doesn't make sense. There's somebody here right now. Right in this room. It sounds crazy, but I know it. Fred. What? The clock. What about it? It it just struck midnight, and it's it's only ten o'clock. <laughs> house that is deserted, except for invisible tenants, and a clock that is running backwards. Has it just struck twelve for murder at 
Midnight and the house that time forgot. Fred. Hmm. Fred, wake up. Huh? Get up. Huh? Uh, what? What is it, dear? What's the matter? Look out there, out the window. Why? Get up and take a look. Oh. At what? That boat out there in the inlet? It must have put in while we were sleepy. Can't you read the name, dear? Huh? It's the Viking Second. The Viking Second? Yes. Wasn't that the Holloway's yacht? The one that never came back? That's what Mr. Smith said. Uh, either Mr. Smith is a fantastic liar or something very fantastic is happening to us. Perhaps the Holloway's have finally come back. After seven years? But it doesn't make sense. None of it. Yeah, that's putting it mildly. Darling, we... We ought to take a close look at the boat. You don't sound very enthusiastic about it, but... Yes, I suppose we ought to. Whoever's on it might be able to tell us something. Well, the plant is down. Mm. Somebody must have come off the boat. Well, they couldn't have, dear. At least they didn't come up to the house. Well, let's, let's go up and see. Hmm? All right. No one on deck. There. Anyone here? No answer. Maybe they're down below. They must be. I'd rather not go down there. Oh, we've got to find out. Let's uh, let's both go down together. All right. You keep right behind me. Oh, don't worry, dear. I will. <laughs> Here's the stateroom. Oh, that's... There's nobody here either. Anybody here? No one. At least... Yeah, but the beds are still warm. Somebody just left the stateroom a little while ago. It, it seems so. Let's get out of here, Eva. I've got a peculiar feeling down my body. It, it, it is chilly. Well, we'd better go back to the house. <laughs> lights are on in the living room. Did you put them on? Just one of the lamps. A floor lamp. Well, all the ceiling lights are lit. I can see that, dear. Let's go in. Here. The door's locked. We didn't even close it when we went out. No. I remember. We left it open. Good evening. Who are you? I beg your pardon. I said, who are you? I'm John Gabriel, butler to the Holloways. Gabriel? What? That's right, ma'am. Whom do you wish to see? Oh, we don't want to see anyone. We, we live here. I'm afraid you're mistaken, sir. The Holloways live here, have been living here for years. But this is our house. We bought it. And, and, and the Holloways are dead. Dead? Yes. I'm afraid someone has misinformed you. Oh, listen, this is like a nightmare. Look here, Gabriel, or whoever you really are. We bought this house from Cecil Smith, a real estate agent in Westfield. He's not the kind of a man who plays practical jokes. No, he's not. He's a very sober man indeed. He told us you were dead, too. As you can see, madam, I'm very much alive. Oh, the, this is crazy. We'd better talk to the people who call themselves the Holloways. Perhaps you should. They'll be in any minute. Please come in, won't you? Will you excuse me if I close the windows? We're going to have a storm. Perfectly all right. Would you care for some tea? Yeah, look here, Gabriel. We've been waiting an hour for Mr. Holloway and his wife. They haven't shown up, and I don't think they will. Now, just what is your game? Would you care for some tea, Mrs. Jordan? No, thank you. Did you hear what I said? Yes, sir, I did. As soon as Mr. and Mrs. Holloway arrive, I'm sure you'll be convinced of your error. They should be here any minute since they plan to leave tonight on a cruise. Oh, this is mad. Fantastic. Uh, ah, they've come. Just missed the storm, Gabriel. Oh, hello. I don't believe I know you. This is Mr. and Mrs. Jordan, Mr. and Mrs. Holloway. Oh, I'm glad to meet you, Mrs. Jordan. Mr. Jordan. Well, thank you. Are you Richard Holloway? Yes. I can't believe it. I... It's all terribly confusing, Mr. Holloway. These people claim that this is their house. What? That they bought it from Cecil Smith. 
They also claim that you, Mrs. Holloway, and myself are dead. Somebody's playing some kind of a joke on them. I'd say it was a very unpleasant joke, Dick. We've been living here for years and years, Mr. and Mrs. Jordan. Oh, uh, before I forget, Gabriel, uh, get our suitcases aboard the yard, will you? We'll be leaving in a few minutes. Yes, sir, right away. Fred, do you suppose that maybe we're dreaming this? Well, if we are, we're dreaming it together. I'm sorry, I don't know how this happened to you. Uh, perhaps you'd better stay here for the night. There's plenty of room. And we'd be delighted to have you. Uh, would you mind if I called, Mr. Smith? Oh, please do. The phone's right there on the table. I know, thanks. Operator, operator, let me have Westfield 403. Never. Hello, Mr. Smith? That's right. Uh, this is Mr. Jordan. Who? Uh, Fred Jordan. Remember, you sold me the Holloway house? The Holloway house? Yes. You must be mistaken. I never sold it. That property's not for sale. What are you talking about? Who is this? Listen, Mr. Smith, you know very well who I am. You won't get away with this. I'll have you brought into court now. I never heard of you in my life. You must be crazy. Goodbye. Hello. Hello. He, he hung up. What did he say? Well, he said he never sold the house and he'd never even heard of me. You must have been taken in by someone who posed as Mrs. Smith. That's really a shame. You have to be very careful these days. We'd be glad to have you stay here until you find other quarters. Well, I... As a matter of fact, you can stay for a few days until we get back. We're taking a trip on our boat. Perhaps you'll be able to get it all straightened out in the morning. I, I, I just don't understand it. The Mr. Smith we had dealings with wasn't a crook. I know he wasn't. Well, that was my feeling, too, but I... Oh, you're not going out to sea in this kind of weather. Oh, we don't mind a little rain. My husband's a very good sailor, Mrs. Jordan. He can handle the Viking second in any kind of weather. It sounds like a gale coming up. No, we like them. Exciting. Well, it's dangerous to set out in this weather. It's very dangerous. Oh, now, don't worry about us. We don't drown easily. Oh, darling, we'd better get started. Oh, yes, yes. I, I'm all set. Uh, are the suitcases aboard? Yes, uh, Gabriel took them. Uh, uh, something's wrong with your grandfather clock. It, it only struck eight times. Uh, yes, it's correct. Now, my watch says eight o'clock, too. Well, how can that be? It's, it's after midnight. <laughs> you really are mixed up, Mr. Jordan. It's only eight o'clock. Well, my watch says one thirty. Uh, well, so does mine. Well, I'm afraid ours is right, Mrs. Jordan. It's very old, but very accurate. Of course, there's a legend about it. The story is that it will sometimes go backwards in time. Has, has that ever happened? <laughs> no. No, it's only a story. It's never gone anything but forward, like any other clock. But it's a nice story, isn't it? Yes. Yes, delightful. <laughs> but might even be true. Mrs. Holloway. Yes? Uh, what is today's date? What? I believe it's September 10th. What, what year? <laughs> 1939, of course. 1939? Yes, yes, of course, Fred. Uh, Mrs. Holloway, I'd, I'd like to ask you and Mr. Holloway something. Yes? Please, please, don't go out on this trip you're planning. Why not? Because if you do, I, I don't think you'll ever come back. What? What a terrible thing to say. Please, Mrs. Holloway, please. I don't know what's wrong with you two. You came in here with a strange story about owning my house, and now you tell us we're never going to come back. She's right. You won't come back. You'll pardon me for saying so, Mr. Jordan, but I think you're both crazy. I don't care what you think, but please don't go. Why, Mrs. Jordan? I, I have a hunch about it. We don't believe in hunches. Well, it's more than a hunch, Mr. Holloway. I know you're not coming if back. If you'll excuse us, I think we'd better get started. Come along, darling. I'm ready. I've put everything on board. Is there anything else, sir? Uh, yes. Uh, just take care of our guests. So that they're comfortable. Goodbye, Gabriel. Goodbye. A pleasant voyage. Make yourself at home, and we'll be back, despite your hunches. Oh, you must go, please. Oh, well, it's gone. If you wish, you can occupy the master bedroom. I'll go up and make it ready for you. Was there anything else you wished, Mr. Jordan, ma'am? Uh, no, Gabriel. Just go to bed. We'll, we'll sit here for a while. It's rather late, sir. Nearly midnight. By your clock, Gabriel, but it, it seems to have stopped. So it has. It needs rewinding. It's going now. Yes, Seems to be ticking rather fast. Something's wrong. It never did that before. 
Fred. Something's happening. As soon as I find the switch. So what, what happened? I, I don't know. Maybe the storm. Lightning. Where's Gabriel? Oh. Gabriel. Gabriel. Never mind, dear. Can, can't you find the switch? Uh, here it is. Oh. Fred. Fred. All, all that dust. Like the first time we saw the house. Tell you, it's as if it no one had been here for years. Where's Gabriel? There, there is no Gabriel. We're back in 1946. And that means he's dead. You mean the clock did go backwards? Something else. You understand, too, now, don't you? We were the friends that Mr. Smith told us about. The mysterious friends that urged the Holloways not to go on that trip. Yes. Fred. What? Clock is stopped. Well, it needs rewinding. No, 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 don't touch it. We we won't wind that clock again, ever. A house without tenants, except for the dead, and the clock that runs backward in time. If it was your clock, would you wind it? Or are you afraid it would keep you up nights while you waited for it to strike 12 for... Murder at again when death comes out of the past, out of time gone by, and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The Jordans, husband and wife, were played by Vinton Hayworth and Elsie Hitz. With music by Bert Berman, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Well, I tell you, they're ringing. Look, mister, the heat's got you. Well, you're in the middle of the desert right now. There ain't any bells within a hundred miles of here. But there must be. There has to be. Murderer? No. 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 <laughs> in just a minute in Death Tolls a Requiem.
And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Our story by Mac Ehrlich is Death Tolls a Requiem. I came into the room and quietly closed the door behind me. It was a room ready and waiting for death. The curtains were drawn, blotting out the bright afternoon sunlight. The air was hot and stifling. The silence oppressive and unearthly. I stared down at the face of the old man in the bed. The old man I hated. His eyes were closed, two sunken shadows against the white lintel skin. His waxen hands hung limply over the coverlet. For three days he'd lingered while I'd waited for him to die. Now for a moment I thought... But no, his pale lips moved. How are you feeling, Father? Uh, I'm not long to go, my son. Not long. It's only the bells that keep me alive. The bells? Yes, over there in the tower. I lie here and wait to hear them. They seem to rally me. I live for the sound of them, Father. Yes, Father. What? What time is? Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Peter must be there now. There in the tower, pulling on the ropes, starting them swinging. The Pedwick bells are there. Uh, there they are, my son. Listen to them. Your inheritance. Listen to them ring. Oh, what music they make. What beautiful, vibrant music. They give me the strength, the will to live a little longer. How I hated him, the sentimental old fool, my father. He spent a half million dollars to bring those bells over from Pedwick, England, the place of his birth. And with them, he brought the bell tower, brick by brick, and the English bell ringer, Peter Griggs. A half million dollars, my inheritance, hung in that bell tower. There was no money left, nothing. My father had lost everything, left me nothing. Nothing but those accursed bells. Ding dong, ding dong, they seemed to mock me, taunt me, jeer at me. I hated the very sound of them. But the old fool in the bed battled on. Oh, my son... Those bells bring back the past to me. When I was a boy in Pendrick, I heard them toll out the hour, every hour. I married your mother to the sound of those blessed bells. And I buried her to the sound of them. Stop! Stop raving about those bells! Uh, uh, Stop it! uh, There's evil in your face. Evil! You cheated me out of my inheritance, left me penniless. You cheated me, do you hear? No. Listen to the bells. Yes, they no. know. Can't you hear them jeering at me, mocking at me? You're penniless, they say. Penniless. Penniless. Die, you little fool. Die. 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 You bought those bells, now let them ring your requiem. stopped finally. My father lay there, dead. I turned from his white, still face and half walked, half stumbled toward the bell tower across the grounds of our estate. Something stronger than myself drew me to it. I entered the tower and stared up into the gloomy belfry. Yes, there they were, the bells, gleaming dimly in the half-light, their bronze mouths yawning down at me. And then as I stared up at them, I heard a step behind me. Who's there? Why, it is only me, Mr. Brook. It is only Peter. Oh, I didn't see you standing there in the shadow. So you've come in to look at my little brood, eh? You've come to admire my three children. Yes. Ah, Mr. Brook, in all the world, there are no finer bells than my wee babies. It was none other than Christopher Hudson himself who cast them in the 17th century. I, the master himself. 
my father rung him, and his father before him, and his father before him. And these, these are the bills my father paid a half a million dollars for. Aye, and he got them cheap, sir. These are historic bills, known to all of England. And the folk of old Pigwick parted with them hard. They gave him as a gift, you might say. Your father gave the town an orphan asylum and a hospital. And now he has the bells. But now they'll hang up there forever. Aye, and tis well, for they're in good hands. Your father is of old Pedwick, sir. And like me, he loves the bells and knows what they say when they talk. Peter, I... My... Father will never hear the bells again. Hey, what do you mean by that, sir? He died 15 minutes ago. Huh? Oh, Mr. Brooke, he dead? Yes. <gasps> dust we are, and to dust we shall return. So it is written, and so shall it be. Oh, he was a fine man, sir. Thank you, Peter. Both me and my children up there. We'll miss him. I will miss him so. Oh, little Davy. Big George. Oh, my beautiful Betty, my pretty hussy. You hear? The master is dead. You, you call the bells by names? You talk to them? I like a father to his children, and they talk to me. They talk to you. The bells talk to you. Why and why not? They have tongues and they have hearts and souls. Come, my babies. The good master is dead. Come, little Davy. Cry the sad tidings. Come, big George, awake. Cry, my father. Weep, my winsome Betty. Weep, girl. Weep, little Davy. The master is dead. Sing! Sing a sad song, my lady one. Of the lost one. Higher! And higher! Weep, weep, my baby. Pour out your tears. Cry out to the countryside. The master is dead! He pulled one rope, then another, and worked another bell by means of his foot thrust through a loop in a third rope. The bells rang and clanged, throbbed and echoed, beat against my brain in jangling tones and overtones. I looked up at them as they swayed, and their mouths seemed to accuse me of my father's death. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it any longer. I turned and ran from the bell tower. <laughs> After my father's funeral... I dropped in at the office of Frederick Denny, my father's attorney and executor of what was left of the estate. There were certain things I wanted to discuss. So you want to tear down the Brook Memorial Tower and sell the bell? Yes, Mr. Denny. From what my father told me, they have considerable value. Yes, Arthur, they do. Their intrinsic value, aside from their worth as historic relics and antiques, runs into hundreds of thousands. I've already had two offers of purchase. You have? Yes. One from a university, one from a museum. Good. However, the bells are not for sale. What? Mr. Denny, you know the condition of the estate. Why, why I'm penniless. Dad left me nothing. Nothing. Unless I can realize something from the bells. I'm sorry, Arthur, but the terms of your father's will are quite specific. Then I'll break the will. I'm my father's rightful heir, and whatever I can sell those bells for belongs to me. I'm sorry, my boy. I drew up this will myself, and I can assure you it's airtight. There was nothing I could do. Nothing. I was beaten, and I knew it. And day after day, night after night, every hour on the hour, I heard those blasted bells. Ding dong. Ding dong, they mocked me, taunted me, jeered at me, laughed at me. <gasps> they seemed to talk to me. They talked to Peter the Bell River, and now they talked to me. Mocked me every hour on the hour. 
Oh, I hated them, cursed them, blocked my ears against them, but they kept on ringing and ringing and ringing until I thought I'd go mad. Finally, I could stand it no longer. I had to silence those hateful bells once and for all. I had to steal their cursed tongues forever. That night late, I went to the bell tower, fevered, in a kind of frenzy, determined to blot out their voices somehow. I entered the bell tower. Peter was there, ringing the bells. Peter! Hey, Mr. Brooks! Stop ringing those bells! Stop it, I say! Huh? Stop the bells? Yes, now! Now, do you hear? No! No, I will not! Ah, there's evil in your face. You don't like the bells like your father. You hate my little children. You mean them hard. Well, I told you to stop those bells. I'll make you stop. Well, Mr. Brooks, what are you going to... No, no. Who... Don't tell me. No, no. You're joking, my Never ring those cursed bells again. I can't <laughs> was still. The awful pressure in my head went away. It had been easy to strangle Peter. His foot had caught in the pedal noose of the bell rope. And he never had a chance. Now I had to make it look like an accident, like suicide. I picked the bell ringer up, tied one end of the bell ropes around his neck, and gave him a long push. <laughs> He swung in the bell tower like a grotesque pendulum, the rope crawling under his weight. <laughs> well, little Davy up there, Big George, pretty Betty, why don't you talk now, eh? Why don't you talk now? <laughs> mad with the sound of the bells, shaking his fist and laughing at his bronze torturers as he stops them from striking twelve for murder at midnight. <laughs> Here is Arthur Brooke again, continuing his story. There was an investigation of Peter's death. The county medical examiner and I went to the bell tower and looked at the bell rope on which Peter's body had been found hanging. Hmm. The way I see it, Mr. Brooke, it's a clear case of suicide. The deceased fastened this rope around his neck, climbed up on the belfry ladder, and flung himself out into space. Yes, Yes, Mr. Holcomb, it, it looks as though as though he did just that. Mr. Brooke, there's one question I want to ask you. Me? What? Well, what is it? Well, a man usually doesn't commit suicide unless he has a motive. Did you notice anything peculiar about this bell ringer's behavior uh, before this happened? Why, why, no, nothing except that he, he was deeply depressed when my father died. You see, my father loved the bells as much as Peter did, and... Mm, that might account for it. But I understand this English bell ringer was rather a queer duck, anyway. What? What's that? Hmm? What? What? Mr. Holcomb, the bells. They're ringing, they're ringing. How can they? Take it easy, Mr. Brook. Take it easy. The tower door is open and wind just came through. Made the bells tinkle a little. Oh. Oh, yes, of course. It, it was the wind. I'm sorry. Well, that's all right, Mr. Brooke. After what you've been through, I don't blame you for being jumpy. Finally, the verdict was official. Suicide. And for two weeks, the bell tower was closed and the bells silent. It was then that I had an idea. I went straight to the executor of my father's estate, Mr. Denny, and told him what was in my mind. Arthur, I'm sorry, but what you ask is impossible. We can't take those bells down. But, Mr. Denny, you've read the papers. This bell ringer's suicide has made a mockery out of the tower. 
all the cheap publicity in the newspapers, the sensationalism, the people coming to stare at the bells, why, why, I feel that my father's memory is being desecrated. I know, Arthur. The whole thing's been very unfortunate, but we cannot let you tear down the tower and sell the bells, as you know. Yes, yes, I know the will, my father's will. Precisely. And his last wish must be respected. Very well, let the bell stay. But for the love of heaven, Mr. Danny, can they remain silent? Must they ring anymore to remind everyone in town of the tragedy? Your father specified that they must be rung on the hour, every hour, just as they did in England. And that's the way it'll have to be, Arthur. We're already negotiating for a new bell ringer. Mr. Denny, listen. Listen, do you hear them? Hear what? Bells. Bells? Yes, can't you hear them? Can't you hear them? You, you must hear them, Mr. Denny, you must. Oh, yes, I do now, very faintly. Your sense of hearing, Arthur, is remarkably acute. Those bells are from the next town, Silver Valley. Sometimes you can hear them here when the wind's right. Oh, oh why don't they stop? Why don't they stop talking? Talking? Bells <laughs> talking? What do you mean? Oh, nothing, nothing. Look here, Arthur, something's wrong. You're on edge, ill. Why don't you go away for a good long rest, say a month or so, it'll do you good. Go away. Yes. Yes, why not? Rest. That's what I need. Rest and quiet. Away from the bells. There was a quaint that Lee and I knew in the mountains, a hundred miles away. The food was good, and a golf course nearby, and, well, I made reservations. For a week, I ate, slept, played golf, rested. And then one afternoon, I was in the lobby of the inn, chatting with the proprietor. Hey, Judge, you stay here, Mr. Brooke? Oh, yes, Frank. Fine, fine. Well, you've been lucky in the weather. <laughs> I never did see such nice weather. Well, Frank! Can... What's that? What's what? Do you hear? Bells. Bells? Of course I do. Yeah, from the church at Greenville, two miles away. But why are they ringing? Why are they ringing? Oh, Mr. Brooke, what's come over you? It's Sunday, and that's... Frank! Lady... Frank, I'm checking out. Checking out? Now? But, Miss Brooke, you made reservations for a month. I'm leaving out of you here, right away, just as soon as I can get my bags back. The bells. I had to get away from the bells. That was it. That was all I needed. I remember the place when I went when I was a boy. An island off the seacoast. There was an old fisherman there, a friend of mine, and I knew he'd put me up. The place was miles from anything, from the mainland, from bells. I took a train chartered a small boat and spent three quiet days there. Then, on the fourth day, as we were surf casting for striped bass. All right, Mr. Brook, let's see you cast way out into the surf. Nice long one, that was. Now, if a striper just hooks onto that bait of yours, why, you're going... Well, what is it, Mr. Brook? I hear bells. Bells? Why, sure you do. The Coast Guard's testing a new bellboy out on those reefs over there. <laughs> oh, what's wrong, Mr. Brook? You're as white as a sheep. I've got to get away from here. I've got to get away. Bells, bells, bells. Everywhere I went, they pursued me, ringing their accusations in my ears. I left the island, got into my car, drove. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't care. I just had to get away from those bells. And then, some days later, I, I was driving through a desert area in the southwest. I was deep in the desert, reeling off mile after mile on the highway, when suddenly from far off I heard... Bells! I set my teeth, gripped the steering wheel tight. Enough was enough. I'd fight them now. Fight them to the bitter end. I wouldn't let the master me tear me apart, drive me mad. No! I had to beat them, and I'd do it now! I drove on and on and on, and the bells followed me. They must come from a train running parallel to the highway somewhere over the rim of the desert. Yes, it must be a train. It couldn't be anything else. Mile after mile I drove, and mile after mile the bells followed me. I began to wonder, when would the tracks cross the highway? Tracks always crossed highways somewhere. They just didn't run parallel indefinitely. And then, and then off I hit. I, I saw some trucks and men. It was a construction crew fixing the road. I stopped the car and hailed the foreman. Uh, what is it, mister? Doesn't, doesn't the... Train crossed the highway somewhere up ahead. Train? What train? There's no railroad in this area of the desert. But there must be. I hear train bells. Bells? 
I don't hear any bells, mister. Well, I tell you, they're ringing. Look, mister, you must have sunstroke or something. There ain't no plane within a hundred miles of here. But there no must bells be. bells either. There must be. There has to be. <laughs> now I knew what I had to do. I had to go back to the estate, back to the Brook Memorial Tower and destroy the accursed bells I'd inherited. I had to close their bronze mouths, pull out their wagging tongues, smash their glittering faces. They had possession of me. They were driving me out of my mind. I had to free myself of them once and for all. Only then would I be at peace. I headed for home. And every mile, every hour, the bells pursued me, ringing in my ears, day and night, pounding and relentless. Oh. Back at the estate, I went to the garden's tool house, picked out a heavy sledgehammer, headed toward the bell tower. The car was just coming up the driveway. It looked like Danny's but I paid no attention. I ran into the bell tower and climbed the ladder into the bell frame. Now, now is the time. There were the bells leering at me, grinning at me. I'd smash them now, now and forever. I lifted the sledgehammer and brought it down to the first bell. I'll smash it a bit. Why don't you break? Why don't you break? Arthur! Arthur! What do you do? There in the bell frame. I'll smash them. I'll break them into the pieces. It's the last thing I do. Arthur! You got it, man. Stop it, I say. Stop it. Why don't they stop ringing? Why don't they stop? No! No, don't! Don't say it anymore! I can't stand it any longer! I can't! I can't! I can't! I must compliment you on this mental institution of yours. It's run very efficiently. One of the finest in the state. Thank you, Professor. Oh, by the way, it must be close to midnight. I didn't expect to stay here this late, but uh, it was so interesting. Uh, what is the time, anyway? Well, I don't have a watch on me, Professor, but... Uh, uh, just a second. Listen. To the bells! There they go again! There they go! Can't you hear them? Stop them! Ah, the time now, Professor Alvin, is exactly midnight. How do you know that, Doctor? That patient you just heard, Professor, the one who just cried aloud, is a very remarkable case. A human timepiece. He has no watch, of course, but every hour on the hour, he hears bells. He hears bells every hour on the hour? Precisely, Professor Alvin. And he's never more than a second or two out of the way. <laughs> So a man lies on a bed in a padded cell and hears the bells ringing, ringing, every hour, on the hour, just as he once heard the real bells strike twelve for murder at midnight. <laughs> Michael Fitzmaurice, with music by Bert Berman, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader.
that knife. What are you going to do with that knife? Why, nothing, Kitty. Nothing at all. I'm just going to cut you open and see if you've got a heart. See, I don't believe you have. And I just want to prove how a body can walk around without one. Mickey, don't! <laughs> Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? you learn the answer in just a minute in The Thirteenth Floor. <laughs> Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Winifred Wolfe is The Thirteenth Floor. Well, tell corridors scare me late at night. They're too long and too creepy. I'm always afraid the walls, like big, flat plaster hands, are going to close in on me. I wish somebody was around. Any... No, 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 not anybody. Anybody might be Mickey. And his hands aren't made out of plastic. They're bone and they're blood. And they want to choke the breath out of me. I just better get down this corridor and close the door behind me. I'll lock it and hide under the covers till I turn on the radio and I hear that switch. It's pulled in a little room. And Mickey's dead, full of hot barks and his big hands hanging like bloody. Then I won't have to be afraid anymore. It's what happened tonight, just just now. It's making the inside of me all curdled and sour and sick. Even if I live a million more days, I won't forget how I came into that lobby. Just like always. I walked over to the desk. Hi, Joe. What's a good word? Yeah. Got a rent statement from the hotel. No letters. Oh. Uh, still is hot out, isn't it? Sort of muggy and sticky. Think it's going to rain? Maybe. Uh-huh. You don't like me very much, do you? No, not very much. You'll excuse me, I'm quite busy, Miss Hey, Owen. you're a fresh little punk. I ought to tell the manager. It's a fine way to treat guests who pay their bills. Don't I always pay my rent on time? Sure. Why not? $5,000 lasts a while if you take care of it. Why, you... Hey, wait a second. Hold that elevator. We dreamed, Miss Owen. I said hold the elevator a second. What's the idea almost slamming it in my face? Sorry, Miss Owen. Yeah, yeah, I bet you are. Oh, Mr. Talbot. Good evening. Good evening. Sure is hot out, wouldn't you say? I was saying to Joe, muggy and sticky. Yeah. Um, I was, uh... Just did an awful good movie. It's a Franklin. Tomorrow night they're having Lana Turner. You like Lana Turner? Very much. Yeah, me too. A lot of women don't because they're jealous of the way she looks. Me, though, I got blonde hair myself. <laughs> I was uh, planning to see it tomorrow night. Uh, do you plan to... Sorry, Miss Owen. I have an appointment tomorrow evening. Oh. Ah, ah, ah. You run the elevator, you fresh punk what you're hired for. Oh, uh, by the way. Me? No, uh, Tommy. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Will you let me in with your pass key? I forgot mine. Yeah, sure thing, Mr. Talbot. The car stopped and I got out. I was glad to get out. Your floor. Yeah, thanks for nothing. That's when it began, right there. The light from the elevator looked like a lot of lemonade only being poured the wrong way up instead of down. Hey, I remember thinking that. I need to remember it now. I looked at my watch for two minutes to midnight. I started down the hall. I'm feeling something's wrong. Don't be to get the jitters for nothing. Everything looked the same. Nothing was any different. 
My room was at the end of the hall. I took my key out and shoved it in the lock. I am open. I kept twisting it and pushing it. Yeah, I stick with my knee. Then, all of a sudden, I looked up and realized what was wrong. The number on the door was 1307. That's not 1407. Was on the wrong floor. That was it. That rotten little kid. I'll fix him. I was ready to bet he'd done it on purpose. Then. Give Nikki a kiss, baby. Aren't you glad to see me? Nikki. Come on in. I've been waiting for you a long time. I said come in. I'm getting a draft. Nikki, let me go on my arm. You're hurting me. <laughs> Sorry, baby. Maybe I don't know my own strength, huh? What do you want? How'd you get in here? One thing at a time. Don't rush me. What'd you lock the door for? I don't like interruptions. You never used to either when you were alone with me. Remember, Kitty? I don't remember nothing. Yeah, I know. you got a memory like a faucet. You turn it off and on, off and on. Wonderful. Take me, for instance. I have the kind of a memory you can't turn off. It keeps running all the time. The longer it runs, the hotter it gets. So hot now, Kitty, it'll stride you. Look, uh, Nicky. I am looking. It's still a nice looking number, you know. I always did like the way your waist curves in, how white your neck you is. You didn't come here to tell me how I look. Or toss your hair over your shoulder <laughs> like it gets in your way. Go ahead, Kitty. Toss your hair back for Nicky. What are you trying to do? Dangle me on a string? Yeah, you're still a good looking number. I don't look so hot, though, do I? You think maybe I lost a little weight? Uh, Nikki, please. My face let, looks let me... kind of pasty. Let... That's because you don't get much chance for fresh air, sweating what's left of time away in a death cell. If I scream, the police will come and get you. If you come near me, I'll you scream. You won't scream. No, come one step closer now. You me. won't scream because there's not that much sound left in you. It's all frozen and sticking in your throat like an ice cube. Because you're afraid. You're afraid of me. Try screaming, Kitty. I... Uh, you see? What'd I tell you? Nicky, I can help you. I can hide you here so they won't find you. Then I can help you get away, Nicky. Anywhere you want. I promise. I asked you before to kiss me. You still haven't, you know. No, no, don't, don't, don't come near me, please. You used to like it. You never used to wait for me to no. ask you. Nicky, don't. No. Sometimes you used to come over to me without me asking. Well, what's the matter? Do I look as bad as all that? Oh, you afraid I'll get your pretty dress dirty? Well, you got to give me a chance. I can explain. I know I'm not clean. You know, I crawled for a half a mile in the mud until I couldn't hear the dogs chasing me anymore. If I'd known you were going to act like this, I would have said... you got to give me a I break. I would have said, Warden, call me a taxi. A nice, clean taxi so I can go see my girl, Kitty Owen. A cheap little squealer who sold me down a river for five G's. Five thousand lousy Give me a little bucks. Hands off me. Oh, I like to hold your face like this. Such a little face. Such big eyes. Big green eyes like a small tiger. Kitty, kitty. Like a cat. A sly, sneaky cat with long blonde hair. Don't you remember how I used to kiss you? Oh, look at it. Oh, look at it. Okay. Uh, you act like you do remember. You remember, too, don't you? You remember how it used to be with us, Mickey? Feel my hair the way it used to go and you like to do it. You said it was soft like silk. Feel my hair, Mickey. You're not mad at me, are you? I said I was sorry. I went crazy. I didn't know what I was doing. I help you now, Mickey. Come on, run your, your fingers through my hair. <laughs> you old lousy little tramp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't make me laugh. You crying, huh? Cat crying crocodile tears. Are you crying because you're sorry for me? You're sorry because sooner or later the cops will catch up with me, drag me back, and I'll burn to a crisp in the chair, huh? Are you crying because you know what I'm going to do to you? Remember how it used to be with us, Nicky? I know when I broke out they'd find me, but I wanted to say goodbye to you first. I wanted to kiss you. See if it still did the same things to me. I'll tell you something, Kitty. You leave me cold. Uh, that knife. What are you going to do with that knife? I'm going to cut you open and see if you've got a heart. 
I don't believe you have. I just want to prove how come a body can walk around without a heart. Just arms and legs stuck together with nothing to make them run. I'll get you through this to fourth yeah. What are they going to do? Electrocute me first, then take me out and hang me? What's the difference? I'll tell you, Mickey, how it was. Just let me tell you. After you held up that, that jewelry store and, and the old dame was killed, when they put up the 5,000 bucks, I went crazy. Yeah? Honest, Nicky, I must have been clear out of my head. I've been sorry ever since, but I figured the cops would get you for it anyway. And that I'd be left with nothing. I didn't have a cent. So you didn't wait. You turned me in yourself. But I didn't I... know what I was doing. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to kill you, Kitty on. It won't help any. It will help me. Stay away from me. The only prayer Sam, it should be good for a laugh. No, no, please. Kitty, 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 like a cat. No. Yes, I'm going to kill you. I'm I got him. Following me slow like that, he didn't notice when I backed up to the table, picked up the vase. And after I hit him, he didn't notice then either. Just went down looking surprised. I knew he wouldn't be out long. So I bent over and took the key out of his pocket. He moved and made a funny little noise through his lips. And I stopped breathing all together. I had the key. I was free. The hall was empty. No one around. I started to run down the narrow little corridor of the 13th floor. I pressed the elevator button and I waited. Help. That was the only way I could get it. It seemed like hours instead of seconds. Finally, I heard it coming. I felt like I was standing on hot coals. My insides wouldn't stand still. The hand of the clock above the elevator climbed slowly from five to six and to seven. I was going crazy to see them there. In seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And my heart exploded. My legs were soft, sticky pieces of dough, hardly able to hold my body up. The elevator had stopped at twelve and then went on to fourteen. Fourteen! Then I remembered it wasn't going to stop. It couldn't stop. Because in this building, there wasn't any 13th floor. A man from the death house. And the girl who betrayed him playing cat and mouse on a floor that doesn't exist. The hand of the elevator indicator did not stop at 13. But the hand of the watch on Kitty's wrist have stopped at 12. All ready for... Murder at midnight. And now, back to Murder at Midnight and... The 13th floor. The 13th floor. Yeah, that's where I was. A floor that didn't exist. So how could I get out? How could I get away? What was I going to do? I didn't understand. I didn't understand anything. Pretty good little slugger, baby. Nick. You took so much trouble to unlock the door, you should have taken a little time to lock it again after you. Don't come after me with that knife. Please, don't. <laughs> I don't want to die. You think I did? Why don't you give me another chance? What Nicky? chance did you give me? Oh! Well, I didn't think you had that in you. Well, why doesn't somebody come, huh? Maybe it's because there isn't anybody besides us. Cozy, huh? Uh. <laughs> Try it again. Go ahead. Try it on again. Maybe you'll have better luck. <laughs> He was leaning against the door halfway down the hall, just leaning there and watching me because he knew he hadn't cornered. But I wasn't cornered. I turned and I ran the other way around the corner and down another hall. I didn't know if I'd really heard him running after me. But it was just the pounding in my head making a noise. I got to the end of the hall. Then I stopped out of breath and looked behind. He wasn't there. No sign of him. I sucked in my breath so even that didn't make any sound. And I listened. I listened to nothing at all because it was so quiet. It was so awful quiet I could hear it. The wall I leaned against was big and flat and gray, and the corners jutted out under the into the hall like dead fingers. 
I looked to the right side of me, down the corridor. Like he wasn't there. So I turned my head. I looked at the hall, almost hoping in a way I'd see him and get it over with instead of this weight. I wasn't there either. I tried to squeeze myself, my shoulder blades, into the wall so I could hide. But it was hard and cold. It wouldn't move. Nicky. Nicky. Nicky, where are you? For the love of heaven, say something so I'll know where you are. Don't just keep standing here. I can't take it. Nicky. I'm sick. My stomach's sick. So am I. Just, just make some noise. Nikki, where are you? Found myself back at the elevator again. I knew he was around somewhere. Around one of those corners that were jutting out like dead fingers waiting. The elevator was coming up again. The hand was up to 11. I had to stop. I pressed the button through all my weight against it. And it did. It did. The big door was sliding open, and I was safe. Going up or down, Kitty Owen? I'll take you wherever you want to go. Nicky. Oh, not again. I can't stand. I'll take you for a ride. No, I won't go. But didn't you ring me? I heard you ring. Come on. <laughs> Get in. Just the two of us. We'll go for a ride. Only just one of us will come back. I said, get in. All the time he was talking, I was backing away, was backing away. And then all of a sudden, I saw at a door with a bright red sign that said, stairway down. My last chance, I almost leaped to it. I opened the door and I flew down the stairs. It wasn't easy with high heels. But even so, the sound of it was like music. Sweet, hot music from a clarinet, because I knew they were taking me down. Faster, faster. Uh, I fell a couple of times. I caught myself. I cleaned to the bandits. <laughs> I was still there. So I kept running. There I was. I was out on the street again. Now I was really safe. There were always a lot of people on the streets. I didn't see any people. Just a big policeman with a red face. Boy, he sure looked good to me. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Now, 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 take it easy, miss. Don't get excited. Hey, look, Nicky Carstairs, he's in that hotel. He's after me. Carstairs? Yeah. Sure, and who are you wanting the kids? It can't be. Look... He's out, I tell you. I saw him. He wants to kill me. But Nicky Carstairs is in the death cell. Don't you read the papers? Hey, I'll have you reported. What kind of a cop are you anyway? What kind of a woman are you without a heart? Just arms and legs stuck together with nothing to make them go. You're not a policeman. You're Nicky. You're still Nicky. You didn't look like Nicky a second ago. I don't understand. I don't understand. Why, it's a get-up. How do I look? Nicky, please, no, not anymore. I told you we were playing cops and robbers, and this time I'm the cop. And I'm still going to kill you, Kitty Owen. It was no beast. I had to run again. My last stronghold. My last hope, the hotel lobby. If there was no one there, I'd just give up. I was through. As I ran around the corner, I thought the war had ended all over again because there was confetti coming out of all the windows, so much of it. Well, and the sidewalks were beginning to look like it had been snowing for a long time. I ran over them like a cop. I ran with my eyes down, and I could see the headlines. Nicky, Carstairs, in death house, prison. No one had to tell me this. I ran into the lobby to find people. To tell him where he was. There was no one there either. Only Joe at the desk. Joe? How oh, early the night, Miss Owen. Not uh, quite midnight. Look, Joe, I know you don't like me, but you gotta help me. Reading the papers about Nikki Carstairs breaking out? Yeah. 
That's what I'm trying Five thousand dollars should last you a little while if you take care of it. Hey, Joe, he's here. He's in the hotel. He's chasing me. That's a lot of money. Five thousand dollars. What's to kill me? You've got to help me. Sweet dreams he's, for so He's here. Can't you understand? He's on the 13th floor. There's no 13th floor in he's, this He's there. I tell you. Sweet he's... dreams, Miss Owen. I know there wasn't any use to arguing, and he wouldn't believe me. Even if he did, he wouldn't help me because he didn't like me. Going up. No one would believe me. There was only one thing left for me to do. Lock myself in my room on the 14th floor. Stay there until they caught Nicky. <laughs> I leaned against the back of the car, crouched in a corner. My eyes closed because I was so tired. I was so tired. I kept thinking of a bed, a big white bed, three white sheets to crawl between, and the door was locked. Sorry to have to bother you about that pass, Tommy. I just forgot to pick mine up at the desk. It's like a glass of cold water had been thrown on top of me. I opened my eyes. That Talbot guy was in the car again. No. I can't steal. And he was talking about the pass key the way he had before. No, not before either. Because when I looked at my watch, it was still a minute to midnight. Then I suddenly knew I was so weak with relief I wanted to cry. Yeah. I heard him say it. Sometimes you can see your whole life pass by in just a second. That lifetime I lived in the elevator. All in my head. Was sandwiched in between a couple of floors. It never really happened. It was just that I had been dreading it for months coming back some night, finding Mickey there waiting for me. My mind had invented a 13th floor. When it never was there at all. And the cop and the newspapers that said Mickey was out. All a part of it. That crazy half dream. Of course he wasn't out. I told myself it was all part of it. I never got out of the elevator. I was there all the time. All the time. Your floor, Miss Owen. Fourteen? Sure, fourteen. Ain't that your floor? You're sure this time, aren't you? What are you talking about, this time? I mean... <laughs> never mind. Fourteen, oh, one. I was on the first door. I was on the right floor this time. I was I'm feeling better already. What a fool I'd been. I started to walk down the hall. I had a feeling Talbot and the boy in the elevator was watching me. I used to shut the door and go on. Say, Mr. Talbot. Yes? Did you read about Nicky Costas? No, what? He escaped. Got out of the death house. Is that so? He's on the loose. Good night, Miss Owen. Yeah. Hotel corridors scare me. They're too long and too creepy. I'm always afraid the walls, like big flat plaster hands, are going to close in. Now I know it was more than just dreading it for weeks. Made me imagine. Nicky was out and after me. Must have known it all along. Had a feeling I wasn't safe. I'm going to go to my own room. I'll lock the door and hide under the covers till I hear they found him. Took him back. Till I hear he's dead, I won't have to be afraid anymore. Not anymore. Give Nikki a kiss, baby. Oh. Aren't you glad to see me? <laughs> the fourteenth floor this time. A floor that does exist. But the hands of the watch on Kitty's wrist still stand at twelve for murder at Remember to be with the 
as again when the door marked exit only opens and the clock strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Kitty was played by Ann Shepard and Paul Mann was Nicky. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. I have a little surprise for you. Uh, look there, right in front of you. Tombstone. Three of them. The first one is your mother. The second one is your brother. They're both sleeping soundly under them. And the third one... Is... It's mine. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the grave gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a moment in The Man with the Black Beard. <laughs> And now, Murder at Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Sigmund Miller is The Man with the Black Beard. A few minutes before 12 o'clock midnight, Charles Corbett is sleeping peacefully, but not his wife, Evelyn. No. No, don't touch me. There's no use running. You can't get away. Please. Please let me alone. You mustn't be afraid, Evelyn. You. That black beard. I've seen you before. Of course you've seen me before. Everybody does. Sooner or later. No. I don't want to see you. And I won't. Scalpel, please. What are you doing? You can't operate on me. You can't. Well, just hold still. After this first incision, you won't feel anything. Well, there's nothing wrong with me. Let go of me. No one's holding you. Get up. No, Evelyn. Your face. You're growing a beard. Yes, Evelyn. A black beard. You're the man with the black beard who's been following me. Yes, Evelyn. No. I'm afraid you're going to die. The prisoner will rise. Prisoner? I find you guilty. Guilty of trying to run away from the man with the black beard. You are sentenced to be guillotined. No. No, please, I didn't do anything wrong. Step up these stairs, please. My husband. 
Let me call my husband. No time for that. Raise the guillotine. Please, give me another chance. You'll only run away again. Head down, please. No, no, no. Oh, why do you hate me? Why do you want to kill me? Because you hate me. And for this, you must die. No! No, no, no. Evelyn! Evelyn, for heaven's sake, what's the matter, darling? Charles, help me. Evelyn, stop it. You're perfectly safe. Look, darling. Look, look, you're you're in bed. I'm, I'm in bed? Yes. Oh, Charles. Oh, what was it, darling? What was it? Was, was it a bad dream? Oh, Charles. It was the most dreadful dream I've ever had. Oh, there, there. There was a man with a black beard. And he was trying to kill me. No, darling. At first he was a doctor. He was going to operate on me. And then he tried to guillotine me. Evelyn. And the knife was just going out. Oh. But you... Poor darling, it's all my fault. I... Oh, no. Why is it your fault? I'm telling you about that latest case of mine, that, that murder case. No, no, Charles. No, I don't think it was that. No, I've dreamed about that man with the black beard before. Hmm? Charles, it means something. When, when, when did you dream about it before? I don't know. It was about a month ago. Oh. Oh, yes. That, that, was, that was when I got my new job. That makes sense. No. No, Charles, there's something else. I can't help feeling it. I can't help feeling that I'm going to die. Don't say that, Evelyn. No, I feel it in my bones, Charles. I'm certain. I'm going to die. Soon. Corbett speaking. Uh, Mr. Corbett, I'm glad I got you. Central Hospital's been trying to reach you. Who? Uh, Central Hospital. Oh, they must have the wrong Corbett. I, I don't know anyone there. Oh, they said it was about your wife. My wife? What? what about her? Uh, well, she collapsed on the street, and uh, they brought her into the hospital. Okay, okay. I, I, I'm going right over. Right. <laughs> What is this? I, I came right over. What Charles. is it? Charles. Oh, baby. Please. Please, honey, don't cry. Oh, look. Tell me. Charles. Huh? Charles, I saw him. You, you saw who? The man. What man? The man with the black beard. The, the one you dreamed about last night, you mean? Yes. Where? Well, he was in the street. In the street? No, I, I left the office. I was going out for lunch. And I, w- I was just going out of the lobby. When I saw him, a man with a black beard. Oh, not darling. I stared at him. I tried to place him. And then I realized that he was the man from my dream. He nodded to me, Charles. I guess I must have fainted. Oh, well, Evelyn, honey, it, 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 it can't be the same man. It's... It... Just your imagination. No, Charles, it's not. It was the same man. I remember his face in every detail. No. I don't see... Oh, I guess... I guess we have to do something about this, darling. What can we do? Look. Look, suppose suppose we go to see Dr. Lieber. He should be able to help you. Uh Uh-uh, no. It's no use, Charles. He's after me. The man with the black beard. I'm going to die, Charles. (laughs) I'm going to die. Can you describe the man to me, Mrs. Corbett? Yes, doctor, I can. He he has a long, narrow face, deep-set black eyes, and a black beard. Had you ever seen him before, this... uh... Before you dreamed of him? No, no, I don't think so. And you believe the man you saw in the street and the one you dreamed about are the same? I know they are. I know they are. You say he nodded to you, as if he knew you. Oh, he knew me, all right. He wants me to die. You met him twice? Yes, and both times he nodded. Hmm. 
I can understand your being afraid of him. But I think you also hate him. You do hate him, don't you? Hate him? Doctor, I could kill him without even thinking twice about it. I see. What do you think, Dr. Lieber? If she did not hate him, the explanation would be simple. She might have seen this man with a black beard before she dreamed of him just passing in the street. Then she could have had a nightmare about him. But hate... Hate is important. Hating him the way she does, that means he has become a symbol to her. A symbol? Then you don't believe he's a real person, do you? That he's really threatening me? Not in the way you mean. What we'll have to do is to find out just what he does stand for. But, Doctor, I tell you, I know what he stands for. He stands for death. I'm not going to tell you to forget him, Mrs. Corbett, because you won't. But if you'll come back again tomorrow, well, we'll see if we can find out a little more about him. Why, Charles, what are you doing here? Waiting for you, darling. We're going to have lunch together. You mean you'd like to take a look at the man with the black beard? Well, yes. Look, you, you, you say you met him right here on the street corner, Yes, right? right here. Twice. Oh, Charles, are you doing this because you believe me or because you don't believe me? Or is it because you think I've gone mad? Oh, my dearest, what a question. Well, maybe he won't show up today. Well, then I'll try again. Yes, and maybe that I can see him and maybe you can't. Maybe it's just a... Charles. Huh? Look. Where? There. Coming towards us. Well, I'll be... Oh, just just as you described it. Then you do see him. How do you do? Uh, he spoke to me. He never did that before. He's getting into that car. Hey, you, wait. Wait, I want to talk to you. He isn't paying any attention, Charles. He's driving away. You can't let him get away. Taxi. Come on. Yes. Taxi. Here, inside, Evelyn. Quick. Right. Where'd you, bud? Follow that black car. We've got to see where he goes. <laughs> Listen, mister, how much longer are we going to keep tailing this guy? We're way outside the city limits. Yeah, yeah, now. yeah, yeah, we're going to tail him until we find out where he's going. You you haven't lost him, have you? No, he can't go much further because this road... Hey, he's turning off. Huh? <laughs> Into the cemetery. What? What did you say? The Cypress Cemetery. He's going in. Well, step on it, will you? I'm going to catch him. Don't worry, there's just this one road, and the entrance gate's on either side of this curve. There's an attendant there. He'll have to stop and show a pass or something. Holy smoke. He's gone. He... Hey, stop at that gate, will you? Yes, sir. Excuse me, we're looking for a big black car that just came through here. Uh, Did... Black car? Uh, there hasn't been a car through here for an hour. You see, sir, you see, I told you. Stop it, Evelyn. I told you. Stop it. Look, there, there must have been one. We, we followed it all the way from town. A man with a, a black beard was driving it. Mister, I say there hasn't been a car through here for an hour. With or without a beard. A man with a black beard and a black car vanishing into thin air at the gates of a cemetery. But then, where would you expect a trail to end that began with a nightmare? A dream of... Murder! At midnight! And now, back to Murder at Midnight and... The Man with the Black Beard. We find Evelyn deep in another terrifying encounter with the man who haunts her day and night. Evelyn. It's you. You again. What are you doing here? Waiting for you. No. You were looking for me, remember? You and your husband right here in the cemetery. No. no, I've got to get up. This is just another dream. It's a nightmare. Is it? Yes. Look at me. 
I am very real. Here, touch me. No, no. No, you're cold. Always. Oh, why don't you leave me alone? Why are you pursuing me? It's you who are pursuing me. It's a lie. I hate you. <laughs> Naturally. I have a surprise for you. I don't want to see your surprise. Oh, I've got to wake up. I've got to. First, you must look at my surprise. Look there, right in front of you. Tombstone. Three of them. The first one is your mother. No. The second is your brother. And the third one, do you recognize that? It's my own. Can you read the inscription? No. It says, Evelyn Corbett, <laughs> beloved wife. Simple, but dignified. No, it's horrible. It's horrible. Now, if you kindly step down into your grave, our business will be finished. No, I won't do it. I won't. I don't want to die. I'm afraid I must insist. No, no, I won't. This time you can't help yourself, even by waking up. This time in you go. Evelyn. Evelyn. What, what are you doing on the floor? What is it? Oh. Darling, what's the matter? It was he again. Who? It was the man with the black beard. He, he threw me into my grave. Oh, no, 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 darling. You fell off the bed, that's all. Oh, no. Here. Here, darling, let me help you up. Back on the bed. There. Oh, Charles. Oh, oh, Charles, if this keeps up, I'll go out of my mind. I know, darling. Oh, Charles, do something. You just got to do something. You say you actually saw him, this man with the black beard, Mr. Corbett? I certainly did. He, he looked just as Evelyn described him, too. And he disappeared at the cemetery? Yes, Doctor, he did. Well, that isn't so mysterious. He might have gone off on a side road or something like that. But he didn't, Doctor. He just vanished. Into thin air. Mrs. Corbett, I want you to try to remember how many times you've dreamt about him. Now, it's important. Yes. Three times. Are you sure? Well, I... I think I am. When was the last time someone close to you died? Died? About six years ago. Who was it? It was my brother. My only brother. Were you very fond of him? Yes. Did you have nightmares then? Well, I... Yes, I think so. Did you dream about the man with the black beard then? I'm not sure. Think back. No, I, I, I can't remember. I have a feeling that I did. Only I can't be too certain. It will come to you. Maybe uh, not now, maybe tomorrow, the day after. Let me know immediately when it does. I don't, I don't get this, Doctor. What has that got to do with the immediate problem? A great deal, Mr. Corbett. But the man with the beard is a real person. No, he isn't. He isn't a real person. But he was so there. I think he's death, hunting for me. I see. Of course, one way we can prove he's not is to get hold of him. Talk to him. Well, I'll take that job. I'll find him. And when I do, he's going to do a lot of talking. Hello. Uh, Mr. Corbett? Yes? Oh, this is the office calling. Uh, the boss wants you to uh, investigate a new case. Yeah, yeah. The body of a Mr. Hampton was found in the river today. He was heavily insured, and they want you to go down uh, to the city morgue uh, to look at the body as soon as possible. Okay, I'll, I'll go down right now. Goodbye. When was that body fished out of the river? Several hours ago. Uh-huh. Okay. You can put the sheet back. So what do you think? Murder, suicide, or accident? Well, I don't know yet. Hey! Hey, there he is! Here! He? Who? The man with the black beard. He just walked out of the slab room. I didn't notice. Hey, I... hey, hey, hey wait a minute! Oh, gone. He must have taken the elevator. All right. Oh, I've got to find that guy. Come on. I don't care. Watch your step. Did, did you just take down a man with a black beard? No, sir. But you must have. He came out of here just a minute ago. 
Well, maybe you walk down. It's only two flights. Oh? Where, where are the stairs? Right over there. Okay, I'll see. Hello? Uh, hello, Dr. Lieber? Yes? Th this is Charles Corbett. Anything wrong? I just saw the man with the black beard again. You did? Where? Down at the morgue. Did you talk to him? No, he, he disappeared. I ran after him, but he, he, he just vanished. That's too bad. We've got to get a hold of him, Doctor. Perhaps we can meet him at the street corner near my wife's office. She's seen him there several times. I have a very heavy schedule, but when's the best time? Uh, about one o'clock. I'll be there. Look, sh should I have Evelyn come too? Yes, that might be a good idea. Good. Maybe we can clear this up today. <laughs> I'm afraid. Oh, there's no reason to be afraid, dear. I'm with you, and Dr. Lieber will be here any minute. Yes, well, if I see him again, I don't know what'll happen. Nothing will happen. Believe me, darling. Look, once we talk to him... Here he comes. Where, John? Right there. Uh, Dr. Lieber. Oh, oh! I thought you... You startled me. Hello. I'm glad you could come, Doctor. And I'm terrified. Doctor, do we have to do this? It's the quickest way of getting to the bottom of it. What time have we got, Mr. Corbett? I have five to one. Yes, it's just about the time he passes by. I hope he doesn't keep us waiting too long. Dr. Lieber, really, you've been wonderful about this whole thing. If it hadn't been for you, for you and Charles, I don't... <gasps> what is it, Mrs. Corbett? What's the matter? Look, over there. It's, it's he. And he really does have a black beard. I've got to get away. I've got to get no, away. Stay here. Nothing's going to happen to you. He's coming over here. Good. Oh, no, no, no. Don't let him touch me. Don't. Please, Mrs. Corbett. Good don't... afternoon. How do you do, sir? I believe you are the people who are looking for me. How, how did you know that? The guard out at the cemetery told me. He described you and the lady perfectly. Oh, oh look out. Oh. I've got her. Evelyn. She's fainted. Evelyn, better no. take her someplace quiet where she well, can. My place is just up the street there, a few doors. If it won't bother you too much, we... Of course not. Show us. Here we are. But this... This is... It says Blakely's Funeral Parlor. Yes, I'm Mr. Blakely. An undertaker? Yes, a mortician. Of course. This is finally beginning to make sense. Put it down on the couch there, Corbett. Make sense? How? Do you know Mrs. Corbett, Mr. Blakely? I've seen her a few times in the street. We seem to have lunch at about the same time. She stared at me, and I assumed she knew me, so I nodded to her. You've had no other dealings with her? Not that I know of, no. What was your wife's maiden name, Corbett? Huh? Uh, uh, Harper. Why? Would you look that name up in your files, Mr. Blakely? Why, yes, of course. Let me see. Hadley Halton uh, Harper. Cecilia M. Died January 26, 1926. Buried at... Why, that was her mother. And that's the answer. She loved her mother very much. Very much. Yes, she, she was only six years old at the time, but she, she always six. said... An age of deep feeling, without any real understanding of cause and effect. Her mother died, and Mr. Blakely came and took her away. As a result, she attributed her death to him. He came to represent death to her and thus became an object of terror and hatred. But I, I don't understand. After all these years... She didn't I... remember him consciously because she wanted to forget about him. But a subconscious mind never forgives or forgets. She must have seen him in the street without really being aware of it. Then her subconscious mind went to work, started creating those nightmares. And you think that when we tell her all this and we explain... I'm sure of it. Huh. Yes, but, Doctor, how, how can we explain the attendant at the cemetery and the guy at the morgue? You know, they said they hadn't seen him. Now that we know that Mr. Blakely, the bearded man, is an undertaker, uh, a mortician, the explanation is simple. He was such a familiar figure at the cemetery and the morgue that his presence did not quite register on their conscious mind. Just as we never notice our waiter at a restaurant. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. I, I see. Now, let me take a look at her. She should be coming to now. And... Good. Good Lord. What is it? Doctor, what's the matter? I... I don't seem to find any pulse. 
I'm afraid. The strain and the shock. You mean... You, you mean... I... I'm afraid she is, Mr. Corbett. After all, when we believe someone to be death, <laughs> they can be death. A woman, dead of fear, created in her own mind, lying on a couch in a funeral parlor. The logical place to end a story that began with a nightmare. A terrifying dream of... Murder! At midnight! Remember to be with us again when death steps smiling from behind a tombstone. And the clocks strike twelve for... Murder at midnight. The part of Evelyn Corbett was played by Mercedes McCambridge. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. started to walk across the room, and as he turned, Martell moved. His face stayed dead, expressionless, but he moved. He picked up a heavy wrench, followed him, and then as Roy reached for the switch, he hit him. No! I heard his skull go like a rotten pumpkin shell, and he went down. Then Martell picked up a hacksaw and... No, no, I don't want to remember the rest. It was too awful, too horrible. <laughs> Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fear is the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Terror Out of Space. <laughs> Murder at Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story, which we prophesy will be long remembered as a classic, is by Robert Newman. A tale out of the news and out of man's deepest fears called Terror Out of Space. <laughs> I sat up in bed, straining my ears, listening. The surf was rolling and pounding on the beach at the foot of the cliff. One of the dynamos was purring away next door in the experimentation shack. And that was all. Had I really heard anything? 
Or had I just imagined a dream that I didn't know? All I knew was that I was in a cold sweat, shivering even though it was a hot summer's night. But that wasn't surprising after what had happened. Just what had happened? Maybe I could get it all straight, fill in the gaps that had been bothering me if I went back over it again from the beginning. I hadn't wanted to before this. I'd fought against even thinking about it. But now... Now it was as if something was making me think about it. That's right, John. Start way back. In the beginning. Then maybe you will remember. When was the beginning? When they assigned me here, I guess, miles from anywhere on the Jersey coast. I knew it was some kind of hush-hush project, and I'd been in the Army long enough not to ask questions. I had some ideas, though, and when I walked into administration and found Professor Martell there, I was pretty sure they were right. Lieutenant Larkin reporting for duty, sir. Hello, John. How are you? Fine, Professor. Uh, I mean, Major. Well, let's forget the Major. <laughs> I've been trying to. <laughs> I think the Army's a little sorry about the whole thing also. Well, that's not the way I heard it. Some of the things you've worked out in the last few years was something. Quite a break my getting assigned here. <laughs> you think it was an accident? You, you mean you requested me? Of course. What did I take you away from, by the way? Oh, nothing very much. Straight communications, a little radar... Mm. No chance to continue any of the research you started when you were at the university, huh? No. Afraid I've gotten rusty? Not really. But there are just going to be the three of us to do the bulk of the work. You, myself, and a chap named Roy Shields. He worked with Ramsey at Tech. And what's the project? Something big? I think so. We're going to try and establish radio contact with the moon. What? Theoretically, it shouldn't be too difficult, you know. Of course it... And with the progress we've made during the war, we... oh, Professor, it's terrific. One of the most exciting things I've ever heard of. <laughs> I think so. Well, don't you? Don't you remember when we used to talk about it in the lab? What it would mean to the astronomers, the astrophysicists, measurements that they've never <laughs> even been able to take before? Yes, John, I remember. Well, then? I don't know. Somehow it... Well, it worries me. How we're going to do it? No, that's all cut and dried. What's going to happen when we do do it? What do you mean? We're reaching out, John. Reaching out into places where man has never been before. We're pretty close to the secret of matter, to the origin of life, and to the mystery of the universe. Sometimes, sometimes I become a little afraid. Afraid that we may stumble on something that's too much for us, too big and... <laughs> that's silly. Go pick out a bunk and get some rest, John. Tomorrow, we go to work. The work, I remember that all right, weeks of it. And finally, the big night, the night we were ready for our first test. It was clear and cool, the ocean still, not thundering, but whispering at the base of the cliffs, as if it were waiting. Every star separate and distinct, like signposts on the road to the infinite. Martell at the table in the center of the laboratory, with the charts and diagrams doing the computing. Roy at the power controls, and I at the director. Time. 2302. 15 seconds. Power 10.12. Check. You're reading, John. 93 degrees. Make it plus point two. Check. Time 2302. 10. Power on. Three seconds. Four. Now. How long to wait? We should get it almost immediately. Lag of not more than... There, listen. Huh? That's it. That's it. We've done it. We're in contact with the moon. Yes, we'd done it. Reached out into space and done it. For the first time since man had walked erect, we had established contact with another heavenly body. Bridged the infinite with man-made electrical impulses. There was no work done during the next two days, just excitement. Public relations broke the story the next morning and we were swamped. Newspaper reporters, photographers, interviews, commentaries, prophecies. Finally, we got back to normal. And a couple of nights later... Yes. It's starting to come back to me now. I remember. I remember. It was the sound of the generators that woke me. I looked at my watch almost midnight. Roy was asleep in his bunk and I didn't wake him. 
I padded out along the duckboards to the laboratory. The lights were on. I went in, and there was Professor Martell. He was sitting at the control table, and he was... Well, he was funny. His eyes were open, but he didn't seem to see me. I said, Hello, Professor. He didn't move. He didn't answer. I took a quick look at the control board, and the frequency had been changed. A little uneasy, I, I tried again. Professor, what are you doing? And then, then something very strange happened. Half of him came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitched while his left one remained stiff. It was just for a fraction of a second. Then... What? Oh. Hello, John. Hello, Professor. Anything the matter? Matter? What am I doing in here? I don't know, sir. I heard the generators go on, and I came in and found you here. Strange. Very strange. I went to bed about 10.30. Ever walked in your sleep before? No, not that I know of. Of course, I haven't been sleeping too well lately. Very disturbing dream. Did you change the transmitter frequency that way? No, sir. You must have done it yourself in your sleep. That would make it more of a carrier instead of a transmitter way. Uh, shall I shift it back? No, leave it. I'd like to take a look at it again in the morning. Do some thinking about it. The next morning, somehow... Neither of us mentioned it. I can't be sure now whether we didn't remember or just didn't think it was important. But that night... Yes. Yes, it was that night that we discovered what it meant. That we knew... It was the sound of the generators that woke me again. I looked at my watch a few minutes before midnight. And it was then that I noticed that Roy wasn't in his bunk. I lay there. And for some reason I was terrified, trembling... There was something in the air, a feeling of a feeling of menace that I made myself get up. Slipped on a pair of sneakers and went out along the duck walk to the laboratory. The lights were on again. I didn't go in this time, but, but I looked in the window. There was Roy, and there was Professor Martell again. He was sitting at the control table with that that same dead look on his face. And Roy was standing in front of him, talking to him. I could hear him through the window. What is it, sir? What's going on? Is anything the matter? Hmm. He's asleep. Walking in his sleep. I better get Larkin and... Well, I can't leave the generator on, though. Gotta shut that off first. He turned and started to walk across the room toward the master switch. And as he turned, Martell moved. His face stayed dead. Expressionless, but he moved. He got up without a sound took a heavy wrench from the work table and followed Roy. And then, just as Roy put out his hand to throw the switch, he hit him. No! I heard his skull go like the shell of a rotten pumpkin, and he went down, dead. I, I couldn't move. I couldn't make a sound. I just stood there, frozen with horror. Martell looked down at him without batting an eye. And then, like a zombie, he walked over to the bench, picked up a hacksaw and went back. And then... Bending over Roy's body, he started cutting off the top of his head. A voice from the void and the midnight waking. Memories, things best forgotten, coming back again. Memories of the terror that came out of space and of murder at midnight. <laughs> to Murder at Midnight and Terror Out of Space. That was, that's all I remember then. When Professor Martell bent over Roy's body with a hacksaw in his hand, I must have fainted. When I opened my eyes, I was lying on the sand outside the shack, and there was Martell bending over me. 
No, Professor, no, no, don't, Why, don't. John, what's the matter? Leave me alone. Don't come near me. Don't touch me. I saw what you did in there. And where? Where? Just now in the shack to Roy. Aren't you well either, John? What? What do you mean? I just came up here from the cottage. I had a bad dream. I've been having quite a few of them lately, and I woke up with a very annoying headache. I came out to take a walk, get some air. I found you lying but, there. But I, I'm telling you, I saw you. I saw you in there with Roy and... And what? Well, I don't even want to think about it. But you killed him. Killed him? Huh. Let's go back to the bunkhouse, John. Take a look. The bunkhouse? Yes, when you see that Roy is where we should be in bed, maybe it'll convince you that you either dreamed or imagined the whole thing. He led the way to the bunkhouse, and I followed Still shaken, but starting to feel a little foolish. This was the Professor Martell I had studied under, known for years, the man who wouldn't hurt a fly. We went into the bunkhouse, and Roy's bed was empty. He wasn't there. Martell gave me a funny look and started calling. Roy! Roy, where are you? Roy! Without a word, we hurried back to the laboratory and... There was no sign of him there, either. Nothing. Wait, he, he must have gone out for a walk, too, Professor, or maybe jeeped into town. If it was true, there'd be something here. His body, blood... There, John. Well, right there, in front of the switch. But there's nothing there. No. Except that it looks as if this floor was just scrubbed. The floor... What? You're right. John. Huh? Did you change the transmitter frequency this way? Well, no, sir. You must have done it. Just the way you did last night. Last night? You mean something happened last night, too? You don't remember? No. Tell me what you saw happen tonight. Everything you remember, whether you believe it now or not. Well, it was... It was pretty terrible, Professor. You were sitting there. And then, as quietly as, it, as if he were a laboratory specimen... You took a hacksaw and started to cut off the top of his head. Mercy. Heavens. Talking to you now, I know the whole thing's mad, impossible, but... Yes, mad, impossible, <laughs> but... You... You mean it could have happened some way without your knowing it? Sit down, John. Relax. Tell me what you know about the moon. Huh? The moon is a satellite... Stellar body, probably formed by our sun in an encounter with some other stellar body. Yes, yes, probably formed at the same time as the Earth. But it may very well have supported life long before there was life here. Life? But we know what its atmosphere yes, is. We know what it is now. But how do we know what it was a million, several million years ago? Suppose, just suppose, that there was life there millions of years ago. Life that reached a level of development we cannot even imagine. Suppose it died out as a form of life that we could recognize, but remained in a form that is eternal. What? What do you mean? In the form of electrical energy. We know that thought is an electrical process. An electrocephalograph will give a definite reading when a man is thinking. Yes. Suppose intelligences continue to exist on the moon in the form of complex electric charges. And suppose a channel is suddenly opened between the moon and some other planet. The beams we sent out are radar beams. You mean they they could come down down the beam, take hold of someone, you, and make you... I'm to... supposing, John, hypothesizing. But the fact is that the transmitter was set at carrier frequency, and none of us did it consciously. Of course, even if it's true, we have no way of knowing whether these entities are dangerous, malevolent or not. No way of knowing, but, but they killed. They made you kill. Made you kill Roy. Because he was going to shut off the transmitter, cut off contact with the place they came from. As for the rest, well, they would be intensely curious about the human body, particularly the brain. They would want to examine it. And I... Good Lord, Professor, do you realize what you're saying? The taking over of a person's body? Yes, is... John, I do realize what I'm saying. Well, I don't believe it myself. Have you a gun? Uh, why, why, yes. Yes, I never carry it. But... Well, start carrying it. And if you notice me doing anything strange, incomprehensible, don't hesitate. Shoot. I didn't sleep that night. I remember that now. And I was convinced that I would never sleep again. Because it was there then, the moon. 
It was there all the time, of course, day and night. But it was during the night when I was asleep that it would be easiest for them that they might try and... and... (laughs) No, I can't think about it. I won't even now. (sighs) With the daylight, I felt a little better. Roy hadn't come back, but, well... There were a dozen possible explanations for that. I went to have another talk with Professor Martell. And he was gone too. His bed was empty as if it had never been slept in. I waited until about noon. Then I called headquarters. I had decided that I was going to tell them only facts, things I could believe myself. Hello? Hello, Colonel. This is Larkin over at Radar Experimental. Oh, yes, Larkin. How are you? Uh, Pretty good, sir. Uh, I'd like to report that both Sergeant Shields and Major Martell are missing. Missing? What do you mean? I don't know, sir. They were both gone when I got up this morning. A-W-O-L, eh? <laughs> well, that's my fault. You men have been working awfully hard. I meant to suggest that you take leaves. Uh, why don't you go missing, too? Oh, no, sir. I-, I couldn't. Not right now. Okay. Then you carry on until they get back, and then I'll arrange for you to do it uh, officially. So I stayed. Stayed there in the lonely shack on top of the cliff, alone. And that was the most awful, terrible week of my life. Only the wind, the pounding of the surf, and my fears. Fears that were with me constantly. There was work I had to do, but I had to force myself to go into the laboratory. Then, on Friday, they found Roy's body. A phone call took me to town to the local funeral parlor. When I got there, the colonel was waiting. Um... You knew Sergeant Shields pretty well, didn't you, Larkin? Yes, sir. Uh, Some fishermen found a body in their nets this morning. I uh, wish you'd look at it. Of course, sir. Uh, Right here. Oh, good, good Lord. Evidently, the fish were pretty hungry. (sighs) Well, no one could be sure, sir, but I think that is Shields. All right, Larkin. Thank you. Yes, they found Roy's body. And that night, Martell came back. I'd taken something to make me sleep. It was the only way I could sleep. But the sound of the generators woke me again. I lay there listening, unbelieving but terrified because there was no one at the station but me. Then, picking up my gun, I went down the duck walk to the laboratory. I opened the door, and there he was, Professor Martell... His face was thin, haggard. His eyes were dead, lackluster, the way they'd been those other two nights. And when he spoke, his voice was hardly human, as if someone was using him, speaking through him. Too bad that you woke up, Larkin. You should not have come in here. What do you mean, Professor? Where have you been? We have been looking over your planet, studying it. Very interesting. And now we are ready to go. Go? Go where? What are you talking about? What? What? Are you... you... You said we. Professor Martell, have, have they... Just a few preparations to make. And then... Then... The voice, that horrible voice stopped. And Martell swayed as if he were going to fall. Oh. I grabbed him and he opened his eyes. He was himself again. And when he spoke... It was with his own voice. John, John, for heaven's sake, help me. Help me. How, Professor, how? Look, I'm... What I told you, don't you remember? Don't you understand? They've got me. They took me that night. Took me all over the country. Looking, examining, studying. They picked my brain. They sucked me dry. And now... Now they're going to take me back with them. Back with them? Back to where they came from. Not my body. They're not interested in that. But the essential me. The... The... In heaven's name, shoot, John. Shoot and... And now we are ready. They had him again. As your friend told you, we are taking him with us. But you, you will not remember. You will remember nothing, do you understand? Because someday we may come back. I stood there, frozen, still holding on to Martell. Like a sleepwalker with superhuman strength, he pushed me away. I staggered back against the wall. Stiffly and mechanically, he walked to the door, opened it, 
and went out. The surf was thundering, the wind blowing straight to the edge of the cliff he walked, and then went over. But before he fell, he seemed almost to hover for a moment, as if something in him was going not down, but up. Now do you remember, John? Now do you remember? You've got to remember. You've got to. I tricked them, fooled them. That's how I was able to get through to you. But they'll be coming for me any minute and... John, you've got to do something. You've got to. It's true. They do exist. And they've got me here. They may be coming back again for others. They... John, they're coming. They're coming. Do something. Do When I woke up about a half hour ago, I found this all written out on the pad I keep next to my bed. Written out in my own handwriting, but a little scrawl and jerky as if my hand wasn't quite steady. Some of it I remember. Other parts, like Roy's murder, Professor Martell's suicide, I don't recall at all. Either I'm mad, completely mad, or... No, no, I can't think about it. I mustn't. Anyway, if I showed this to anyone, the world would think I'm mad. So now I'm going to burn it. Burn it up completely. White and shaking, John Larkin tears the scrawled pages from his notebook, crumples them into an ashtray, and puts a match to them. And thus there disappears into ashes the only remaining evidence of the terror from out of space and of murder at midnight. <laughs> Remember to be with us again when death comes in some unknown form. And the clocks strike twelve for... Murder! At midnight. The part of John Larkin was played by George Petrie. And Peter Capel was Professor Martell. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. out of its frame. No. They're on the floor. Sylvia. Good. Good Lord. Her head twisted almost off and her body looks as if every bone in it was broken. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a moment in Death's Worshipper. And now... Murder at 
Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Jay Williams is a tale of fear from afar called Death's Worshipper. On the surface, it's a New York apartment like thousands of others. In a house with a brownstone front on a dark little street. But to Kate Bonney, living here with her brother Peter, it has become a prison cell, a place of menace, a house of terror. I can't explain, Peter. It's as though I were caught in a spider's web, waiting helplessly while the spider comes closer. But, Kate, you still haven't told me just exactly what's troubling you. It, it's real, Peter. It's a feeling that, well, like in a nightmare, when you know something something awful is after you and you can't escape. It's drawing closer. It's coming here to this room to find me. What'll I do, Peter? What shall I do? Please, Kate, pull yourself together. You've got to. I'm sorry, Peter. I'll try. Oh, that's better. Now then, let's have it. I can't come home every night to a sister who's afraid of the dark. What's it all about? Do... Do you remember the weekend I spent at Quinton's place in the country? Just after he got back from India? Yes, of course. You couldn't make it and I went alone? The conference in Chicago, I remember. Reminds me, I wonder why I haven't heard from him since. Those letters he wrote about some discoveries he made. Discoveries? Don't... Don't mention them. Why not? Because I have an idea that... that they're behind everything that happened. What do you mean? He... He didn't even mention the expedition until after dinner that first night. There were just the three of us. Quentin, Sylvia, and myself. He went into quite a bit of detail describing his reasons for going. The long trip through the jungle. We finally came to a little gone village and tackled what I was sure was the last belt of jungle. That last stretch took us six hours. At last we broke out into a clearing and there it was, towering above us... The Temple of Shiva the Destroyer. Oh, that must have been a thrilling moment. Thrilling? You can't possibly know what that meant to me. I was just frightened. Oh, Sylvia frightens rather easily. That's not true, Quentin. It's just that this... It looked like some kind of crouching beast with a single devil's horn. Rubbish. It was... It was breathtaking, Kate. Imagine a great square block of stone set in a riot of jungle foliage... Out of it rises a tremendous three-cornered spire fully a hundred feet high. Oh, that must have been magnificent. Yes, and the whole thing covered with a lace tracery of stone carving. And this is what you had set out to find? This was it. You see, the Hindu Trimurti, or Trinity, is composed of three deities. Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. Yes. Well, in this tiny district in the hills, there had once been a local cult which worshipped only the destroyer in a curious and perverted way. Well, I... Well, the worshippers became their god. I, I don't understand. When they prayed to Shiva, the god himself entered and took possession of them. They, well, they were Shiva with all the powers and all the frightful energy of the god. Good, good heaven. And no, not a very good heaven. For well, you see, the heaven of these worshippers was nothingness. Nothingness? Yes. For them, the ultimate goal of man was destruction. The merging of oneself into a kind of cosmic non-existence. Now you can understand how I felt, Kate, when I first looked at that temple. Yes. I suppose that, yes, even a greater mind than yours, Sylvia, might well shrink before the majesty of a concept like that. Well, I... I know I would have been frightened, too. But India is a place where just such a concept would originate. Life means nothing there. Death flourishes in a thousand forms. I climbed the spire of the temple and looked down over the sea of jungle to the brown river in the distance and the thread of smoke that marked the village. I was a midget, an ant, crawling over the surface of a giant's house. Shiva is the giant, and humanity? <laughs> We're so insignificant, so worthless. I wonder if they weren't right after all, those worshippers of the destroyer. Quentin. Perhaps death, nothingness, is the greatest goal. Stop it, Quentin. Stop it. Stop it. Do you hear? Sylvia. Oh, don't worry, Kate, and don't bother. Oh, but I don't... I'm all right. No. Sorry, Kate. I think I'd better go to bed. Yes, you're tired, Sylvia. I am tired. These wild ideas of yours. 
of all this talk about Shiva, destruction. I wish you'd get those thoughts out of your head, Quentin. You haven't been the same man since... Good night, Sylvia. Sylvia, are you sure you're all right now? Yes. Yes, Kate. I... I'm fine. But she wasn't fine, Peter. And it wasn't just the Teague that was bothering her. She was frightened, I could see that. Frightened out of her wits by... by something. And Quentin was different. When Sylvia had left us, he sat looking at me silently for a long while. And when at last he spoke, it was on another note. You know, Kate, all this talk of nothingness and death makes me believe more firmly than ever that... Man must try for happiness while he's alive. I agree. At least it's a pleasanter subject than what we've just been talking about. I'm glad you think so. Because I'm not happy now, Kate. But, but I thought you and Sylvia... Sylvia. There's nothing between us. Nothing. Hasn't been for years. But I... No, not even when we first got married. But you... When I first met you with your brother Peter years ago, something... Something happened to me. My heart sang. It was as though I had burst out of my shell. I knew then. Quentin, you, you don't know what you're saying. I do. For the first time in years, I know exactly what I'm saying. I found a philosophy I can believe in, Kate, in a troubled world. And for the first time, I found strength to tell you that I love you. Quentin, please. Kate, listen. Don't be alarmed. It would be so easy to go away together. Anything is possible for me now. Anything. We will go away. It doesn't matter where. No. We'll find a new life together. The power I know can be yours, too. I love you, Kate. We can make a new world for ourselves. We can be the gods of that world. Quinn, stop. I see. I didn't really expect you to say yes immediately. It is quite a decision. Perhaps I can get you to change your mind. Quentin, you you mustn't think. You're right. I mustn't think. I must act. I knew I wouldn't be able to sleep after that. I, I didn't even try. I went out for a walk. And when I got back about a half hour later, there was a light in the studio at the far end of the garden. I was curious enough to walk over and look in the window. The room within was hung with oriental tapestries, with odd, crooked eastern swords. Quentin sat alone, staring at a figure on the table before him. I could hear him through the window. His face was set, wooden, expressionless, but his eyes seemed to shine in the candlelight like, like a cat's. And the figure before him, it, it was horrible. It was a bronze statuette with a serene but awful smile on his face. A smile of hellish triumph. A dozen arms sprang from each shoulder. It bore a club with a skull at its tip. And it seemed to dance upon the back of a crouching dwarf. And Quentin, staring at it, was speaking to it. Approach not the Raja I don't... I, I didn't know what it meant. I... I only knew that it was awful. And in some dreadful way, Quentin was trying to make his beliefs come alive. I, I ran up the lawn, and the clouds that spread over the moon seemed like dark shapes rising from some infernal pit. I, oh, I, oh. Wings seemed to be beating about the house as the wind rose. And in my ears rang Quentin's chanting. Even in my room I could hear it, mingle with the moaning of the wind. The moon had disappeared. I, I couldn't see the light in the studio. I, I was too far to hear it. But the chanting went on. I, I don't know. Oh, oh, oh. I seemed to hear voices in the wind. Many voices chanting with Quentin. Thunder growled up from the darkness. Then there was a single flash of lightning and a clap of thunder. And on the heels of the thunder... <laughs> Room. This way, quick. Oh. She must have been having a nightmare. Or oh. 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 Quentin. Quentin, look. The window. 
torn right out of its frame. No. No, there. On the floor. Sylvia! Good, Good Lord. Is, is she? Let's see. Good. Good heavens. Her head twisted all around until... And her body. It looks as if almost every bone in it is broken. Staring at the broken body which has been flung against the wall with unimaginable force, lying there like a shattered doll, Kate sways weakly in horror. Is this the work of some demon called up by Quentin's incantation? Or is it something else? Then, as a clock strikes somewhere in the silent house, she is certain of at least one thing in a reeling world, that she is in the presence of... Murder! At midnight! Now, back to Murder at Midnight and Death's Worshipper. Pale and shaking, Kate Bonney continues telling her story to her brother. It was as though something with superhuman strength had twisted her head around and then, then just tossed her aside against the wall. Every bone in her body was broken. It must have been pretty ghastly, but surely you're not going to let the memory of that... It has nothing to do with memory. Something... Something that's more than human, I don't know what, kills Sylvia. And now it's after me. After you? Haven't you seen the papers in the last few days? No, you know I've been up to my neck in work. What's that got to do with it? Oh, look here. These clippings, I've been saving them. Let's see. Another unsolved murder. Police admit bafflement. No motive. Well? Go on. Read the rest of it. Middle-aged man, identified as J.D. Brathwaite, broker. Neck was wrung, apparently, by someone with tremendous physical strength. Yes, and this one. An unidentified woman. Neck wrung and the body thrown against the wall. And this, and this, and this. All the same. Hey, darling, this is all perfectly ridiculous. No. No, look. Here's a map of our neighborhood. The first death took place up here. The next, two blocks further south. Don't you see? One after the other, they're coming closer to this house. To me. Kate. Now, listen. It's no. quite clear what's happened. You were upset by Sylvia's death, naturally. Just because of the coincidence of these crimes, you have an obsession that someone or something is haunting you. You've been working too hard. And I suppose you've been having nightmares, too. They're not nightmares. I'm going to run across the street to Dr. Sanford. No, Pete. You lie down and try to rest. I'll bring Sanford over and have him take a look at you. You're all run down. No, Peter, don't leave me. You don't know what I... Pour yourself a drink, Katie. I won't be a minute. Who's that? Peter. Is that you? Peter, answer me. Is that... Who is it? Quinn. Hello, Kate. How are you? Don't come any closer. I'll call Peter. Why, Kate? What's the matter? I suspected then when it happened. And now these last few days I know. Sylvia... You did it. You killed her, Quinton. I, I don't know how, but you You're did... mistaken, Kate. It wasn't I. I was only the instrument of something greater, stronger than man. Quinton? What, what do you mean? Don't be afraid. He's really benign. He? Shiva. Shiva the destroyer. Oh. It is his love for mankind that allows him to bring the blessing of annihilation. Oh, no. I worshipped him, and he came. He came in a rush of wind on the thunder and took possession of me. I was Shiva. Using my body, he climbed the wall, burst the window, and he killed Sylvia. Oh, no, no, no. Yes, Kate, I became Shiva. Oh. At least I, I must have. I, I don't remember it clearly, but there were great wings, lightnings. And when I came to myself, I, I was seated in my studio again. And those others? You know about them? Yes, I killed others. I don't remember how many. 
But all life will end in nothingness, and man's highest goal is to dissolve into dust. I was conferring on them the highest possible blessing, obliteration. Then you're mad. Your discovery My made you... discovery has made me a god. Now, now he's starting to come to me now without the incantation, without my willing it. Sometimes at night I feel the great wind of his coming. I turn to ice as the god approaches to seize upon me, and... Kate, I'm afraid. But... But why did you come here? What do you want of me? I... I need you, Kate. I'm afraid. That's the truth. I'm afraid of the blackness, of the nothingness, of the inevitable end of all things. When I'm alone, I feel the horror of it, of the darkness. You can save me, Kate. You're the only one who can help me. Sylvia's gone. There's nothing to prevent... You don't know what you're saying. Come in, Doctor. Oh, Quentin. Hello. I was just... Stay where you are. Don't come any closer. A gun? Now, look, Quentin. I warn you, don't come any closer. Stand still, Peter. Kate, for the last time, will you come? Quentin, please, please listen to reason. Put that gun down. Quentin, easy, Peter. I wouldn't mind killing you, Peter. But if you wish to live, stay where you are. And don't follow me. Has he gone mad or what? Kate, what happened? I... I'm not sure. He killed Sylvia. He admitted it. And he's killed... I don't know how many others. What? It's true. He believes that Shiva, the destroyer, controls him. He believes that when he kills, he's granting a blessing to the one he destroys. But that... That's crazy. No, not so crazy, Peter. May I say something? Uh, Of course, Doctor. I thought there was something wrong with him the minute I saw him. His eyes, I... I think it's a case of self-hypnosis. Something like the Moros practice when they run amok. They believe that they're possessed by God, and while in this state, they can actually perform amazing feats of strength and endurance. A number of primitive peoples have the same belief. Dervishes, Indian fakirs. Your friend must induce this state by an incantation of some kind, or by concentrating on some object until the hypnotic state is induced. That's true. I heard him, I saw him, praying to the image of Shiva. That's how he must do it. Well, if it is true, he's extremely dangerous. We'd better get the police. May I use the phone? Wait, wait. I can't believe it. He certainly wasn't joking about that gun, Peter. And according to your sister, he's already killed several times. I... No. No, he mustn't do that. Peter's right. We're his friends. And he... He loves me. He said I was the only one who could help him. He, he really is afraid and alone. Of course, Kate. Doctor... Quentin and I were kids together. If he's in trouble, we've got to do something to help him, not call the police down on him. Where do you think he's gone? I'm sure he's gone back to his house in the country. We could try there anyway. My car is just around the corner. I I think we're taking an awful chance, but on the other hand... It's a chance we've got to take, Doctor. He told me that Shiva comes to him now without incantation. I'm terribly afraid of him and... Of what might happen. But I'm more afraid of what he may do now to himself or to someone else. We turn right here below the toll gate. That dirt road? Yes. Look. Isn't that a tail light up ahead? Another car. It may be his. Hmm, there's a storm coming up. If it'll just hold off for a while. A storm. Just, just like that first night. There, the other car's turning off. That's the driveway to Quinton's house. Step on it. is dark. Perhaps we were wrong. No. I know where he is. This way around to the back. There's a light. That's the studio. Quiet. Quiet. Let's have a look first. Well, he 
He's there, alone, sitting behind the table with some sort of statue in front of him. The statue of Shiva. The door's open. Come on. Quentin, what are you doing? The incantation. He's calling up that demon. Quentin, stop! Quentin, it's Kate. Don't you hear me? Stop it, please. Please, Quentin. Kate. Kate, is that? Approach He's in a trance, shall we? No, no, don't touch him. The slightest thing now might turn him into a raging maniac. Let your sister try. Quentin, you must stop. This awful thing, it, it isn't you anymore. It's not what you want. You, you said you loved him. If that's true, you must shake this madness off. Kate, calling me? I can't. He's too strong for me. Try, Quentin. Try. You can do it. Come back, Quentin. If you really love me, fight it. Fight it. I can't. He's coming. Coming. Can't you hear them? Get away, Kate, before he comes. Only one thing left. One thing I can possibly... I... The statue. Smash it and... Don't move, Peter. What? What was it? I... I can't see. That flash. Lightning. It must have struck... Quentin... Quentin! Let me look, Kate. He's... He's dead. That lightning bolt killed him immediately. Dr. Sanford. Hmm? What's that on his forehead? Burn. Lightning does curious things. Yes, but... There. The head of the statue he smashed. The same mark on its brow. Like an eye, a third eye, the mark of Shiva. The vengeance of a thwarted god or coincidence? Kate and her brother look at each other, and then again at the contorted face with that inexplicable burn etched like the mark of Cain upon its forehead. And in the distance... From some far-off steeple, a clock begins to chime the hour. Twelve strokes for... Murder! At again when death hovers on dark bat wings and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Kate was played by Bess Johnson and Carl Emery was Quentin. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Thank you.
you hear them? Do you hear the bells? Bells? I don't hear any bells, mister. Well, I tell you, they're ringing. Look, mister, the heat's got you. Well, you're in the middle of the desert right now. There ain't any bells within a hundred miles of here. But there must be. There has to be. Murderer? No! 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 <laughs> in just a minute in Death Tolls a Requiem. And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Mac Ehrlich is Death Tolls a Requiem. I came into the room and quietly closed the door behind me. It was a room ready and waiting for death. The curtains were drawn, blotting out the bright afternoon sunlight. The air was hot and stifling. The silence oppressive and unearthly. I stared down at the face of the old man in the bed. The old man I hated. His eyes were closed, two sunken shadows against the white lintel skin. His waxen hands hung limply over the coverlet. For three days he'd lingered while I'd waited for him to die. Now for a moment I thought... But no, his pale lips moved. <laughs> How are you feeling, Father? <laughs> I'm not long to go, my son. Not long. It's only the bells that keep me alive. The bells? Yes. Over there in the tower. I lie here and wait to hear them. They seem to rally me. I live for the sound of them, Father. Yes, Father. What? What time is it? Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Peter must be there now, there in the tower, pulling on the ropes, starting them swinging. The Pedwick bells are there. Uh, there they are, my son. Listen to them. Your inheritance. Listen to them ring. Oh, what music they make. What beautiful, vibrant music. They give me the strength. The will to live a little longer. How I hated him, the sentimental old fool, my father. He spent a half million dollars to bring those bells over from Pedwick, England, the place of his birth. And with them he brought the bell tower, brick by brick, and the English bell ringer, Peter Griggs. A half million dollars, my inheritance, hung in that bell tower. There was no money left, nothing. My father had lost everything, left me nothing. Nothing but those accursed bells. Ding dong, ding dong. They seem to mock me, taunt me, jeer at me. I hated the very sound of them. But the old fool in the bed battled on. Oh, my son, those bells bring back the past to me. When I was a boy in Pendrick, I heard them toll out the hour, every hour. I married your mother to the sound of those blessed bells. And I buried her to the sound of them. Stop! Stop raving about those bells! Uh, uh, what, Stop it! Uh, there's evil in your face. Evil. You cheated me out of my inheritance. No, Left me penniless. No, you cheated me, do you hear? No. Listen to the bells. Yes, I no, know. No. Can't you hear them jeering no. at me, mocking at me? You're penniless, they say. Penniless. Penniless. Oh, oh, oh. Die, you little fool. Die. 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 You bought those bells, now let them ring your requiem.
bell stopped finally. My father lay there, dead. I turned from his white, still face and half walked, half stumbled toward the bell tower across the grounds of our estate. Something stronger than myself drew into it. I entered the tower and stared up into the gloomy belfry. Yes, there they were, the bells, gleaming dimly in the half-light, their bronze mouths yawning down at me. And then as I stared up at them, I heard a step behind me. Oh, who's there? Why, it is only me, Mr. Book. It is only Peter. Oh, I didn't see you standing there in the shadow. So you've come in to look at my little brood, eh? You've come to admire my three children. Yes. Ah, Mr. Brook, in all the world, there are no finer bells than my wee babies. It was none other than Christopher Hudson himself who cast them in the 17th century. I, the master himself. My father rung them, and his father before him, and his father before him. And these, these are the bills my father paid a half a million dollars for. Aye, and he got them cheap, sir. These are historic bells, known to all of England. And the folk of old Pigwick parted with them hard. They gave them as a gift, you might say. Your father gave the town an orphan asylum and a hospital. And now he has the bells. And now they'll hang up there forever. Aye, and tis well, for they're in good hands. Your father is of old Pedwick, sir, and like me, he loves the bells and knows what they say when they talk. Peter, I... My father will never hear the bells again. Hey, what do you mean by that, sir? He died 15 minutes ago. Huh? Oh, Mr. Brooke. He did? Yes. <gasps> dust we are, and to dust we shall return. So it is written, and so shall it be. Oh, he was a fine man, sir. Thank you, Peter. Both me and my children up there, we'll miss him. I will miss him so. Oh, little Davy, big George. Oh, my beautiful Betty, my pretty hussy. You hear? The master is dead. You, you call the bells by names? You talk to them? I like a father to his children, and they talk to me. They talk to you. The bells talk to you. Why and why not? They have tongues, and they have hearts and souls. Come, my babies. The good master is dead. Come, little Davy. Cry the sad tidings. Come, big George, awake! Cry, my father. Weep, my winsome Betty. Weep, girl. Weep, The master is dead. Sing! Sing a sad song, my late one. Of the lost one. Higher! Higher! Weep, weep, my baby. Pour out your tears. Cry out to the countryside. The master is dead! I watched him, fascinated, as he pulled one rope, then another, and worked another bell by means of his foot thrust through a loop in a third rope. The bells rang and clanged, throbbed and echoed, beat against my brain in jangling tones and overtones. I looked up at them as they swayed, and their mouths seemed to accuse me of my father's death. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it any longer. I turned and ran from the bell tower. After my father's funeral, I dropped in at the office of Frederick Denny, my father's attorney and executor of what was left of the estate. There were certain things I wanted to discuss... So you want to tear down the Brook Memorial Tower and sell the bells? Yes, Mr. Denny. From what my father told me, they have considerable value. Yes, Arthur, they do. Their intrinsic value, aside from their worth as historic relics and antiques, runs into hundreds of thousands. I've already had two offers of purchase. You have? Yes. One from a university, one from a museum. Good. However, the bells are not for sale. What? 
Mr. Denny, you know the condition of the estate. Why, why I'm penniless. Dad left me nothing. Nothing. Unless I can realize something from the bills. I'm sorry, Arthur, but the terms of your father's will are quite specific. Then I'll break the will. I'm my father's rightful heir, and whatever I can sell those bells for belongs to me. I'm sorry, my boy. I drew up this will myself, and I can assure you it's airtight. There was nothing I could do. Nothing. I was beaten, and I knew it. And day after day, night after night, every hour on the hour, I heard those blasted bells. Ding dong. Ding dong, they mocked me, taunted me, jeered at me, laughed at me. <gasps> they seemed to talk to me. They talked to Peter the Bell River, and now they talk to me. Mocked me every hour on the hour. Oh, I hated them, cursed them, blocked my ears against them, but they kept on ringing and ringing and ringing until I thought I'd go mad. <laughs> Finally, I could stand it no longer. I had to silence those hateful bells once and for all. I had to steal their cursed tongues forever. That night late, I went to the bell tower, fevered, in a kind of frenzy, determined to blot out their voices somehow. I entered the bell tower. Peter was there, ringing the bells. Peter! Hey, Mr. Brooks! Stop ringing those bells! Stop it, I say! Huh? Stop the bells? Yes, now! Now, do you hear? No! No, I will not! Ah, there's evil in your face. You don't like the bells like your father. You hate my little children. You mean them hard. Well, I told you to stop those bells. I'll make you stop. Well, Mr. Brooks, what are you got? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> don't bell <laughs> you. Wrong. You're joking me. Never ring those cursed bells again. I can't <laughs> was still. The awful pressure in my head went away. It had been easy to strangle Peter. His foot had caught in the pedal noose of the bell rope. And he never had a chance. Now I had to make it look like an accident, like suicide. I picked the bell ringer up, tied one end of the bell ropes around his neck, and gave him a long push. <laughs> He swung in the bell tower like a grotesque pendulum, the rope crawling under his weight. <laughs> well, little Davy up there, Big George, pretty Betty, why don't you talk now, eh? Why don't you talk now? <laughs> mad with the sound of the bells, shaking his fist and laughing at his bronze torturers as he stops them from striking twelve for murder at midnight. <laughs> Here is Arthur Brooke again, continuing his story. There was an investigation of Peter's death. The county medical examiner and I went to the bell tower and looked at the bell rope on which Peter's body had been found hanging. Hmm. The way I see it, Mr. Brooke, it's a clear case of suicide. The deceased fastened this rope around his neck, climbed up on the belfry ladder, and flung himself out into space. Yes, yes, Mr. Holcomb, it... It looks as though, as though he did just that. Mr. Brooke, there's one question I want to ask you. Me? What? Well, what is it? Well, a man usually doesn't commit suicide unless he has a motive. Did you notice anything peculiar about this bell ringer's behavior before this happened? Why, why, no, nothing except that he, he was deeply depressed when my father died. You see, my father loved the bells as much as Peter did, and... Mm, that might account for it. 
But I understand this English bell ringer was rather a queer duck anyway. What? What's that? Hmm? What? What? Mr. Hawkins, the bells. They're ringing, they're ringing. How can they? Take it easy, Mr. Brook, take it easy. The tower door is open and wind just came through. Made the bells tinkle a little. Oh. Oh, yes, of course. It, it was the wind. I'm sorry. Well, that's all right, Mr. Brooke. After what you've been through, I don't blame you for being jumpy. Finally, the verdict was official. Suicide. And for two weeks, the bell tower was closed and the bells silent. It was then that I had an idea. I went straight to the executor of my father's estate, Mr. Denny, and told him what was in my mind. Arthur, I'm sorry, but what you asked is impossible. We can't take those bells down. But, Mr. Denny, you've read the papers. This bell ringer's suicide has made a mockery out of the tower. All the cheap publicity in the newspapers, the sensationalism, the people coming to stare at the bells, why, why, I feel that my father's memory is being desecrated. I know, Arthur. The whole thing's been very unfortunate, but we cannot let you tear down the tower and sell the bells, as you know. Yes, yes, I know. The will, my father's will. Precisely. And his last wish must be respected. Very well, let the bells stay. But for the love of heaven, Mr. Danny, can they remain silent? Must they ring anymore to remind everyone in town of the tragedy? Your father specified that they must be rung on the hour, every hour, just as they did in England. And that's the way it'll have to be, Arthur. We're already negotiating for a new bell ringer. Mr. Denny, listen. Listen, do you hear them? Hear what? Bells. Bells? Yes, can't you hear them? Can't you hear them? You, you must hear them, Mr. Denny, you must. But, oh, yes, I do now, very faintly. Your sense of hearing, Arthur, is remarkably acute. Those bells are from the next town, Silver Valley. Sometimes you can hear them here when the wind's right. Why don't they stop? Why don't they stop talking? Talking? Oh, Bells talking? What do you mean? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Look here, Arthur. Something's wrong. You're on edge. Ill. Why don't you go away for a good long rest? Say a month or so. It'll do you good. Go away. Yes. Yes, why not? Rest. That's what I need. Rest and quiet. Away from the bells. <laughs> It was a quaint little inn I knew in the mountains, a hundred miles away. The food was good, and a golf course nearby, and, well, I made reservations. For a week, I ate, slept, played golf, rested. And then one afternoon, I was in the lobby of the inn, chatting with the proprietor. Hey, enjoyed you staying here, Mr. Brook? Oh, yes, Frank. Fine, fine. Well, you've been lucky in the weather. <laughs> I never did see such nice weather. Well, Frank, can... what's that? What's what? Do you hear? Bells. Bells? Why, of course I do. They're from the church at Greenville, two miles away. But why are they ringing? Why are they ringing? Oh, Mr. Brook, what's come over you? It's Sunday, and that's... Frank! Lady... Frank, I'm checking out. Checking out? Now? But, Mr. Brook, you made reservations for a month. I'm leaving now, do you hear? Right away, just as soon as I can get my bags packed. <laughs> I had to get away from the bells. That was it. That was all I needed. I remember the place when I went when I was a boy. An island off the seacoast. There was an old fisherman there. A friend of mine. And I knew he'd put me up. The place was miles from anything. From the mainland. From bells. I took a train. Chartered a small boat. And spent three quiet days there. Then, on the fourth day, as we were surf casting for striped bass... All right, Mr. Brook, let's see you cast way out into the surf. Nice long one, that was. Now, if a striper just hooks onto that bait of yours, why, you're going... Well, what is it, Mr. Brook? I hear bells. Bells? Why, sure you do. The Coast Guard's testing a new bellboy out on those reefs over there. Oh, what's wrong, Mr. Brook? You're as white as a sheep. I've got to get away from here. I've got to get away. Bells, bells, bells. Everywhere I went, they pursued me, ringing their accusations in my ears. I left the island, got into my car, drove. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't care. I just had to get away from those bells. And then, some days later, I, I was driving through a desert area in the southwest. 
I was deep in the desert, reeling off mile after mile on the highway, when suddenly from far off I heard... Bells! I sat my teeth, gripped the steering wheel tight. Enough was enough. I'd fight them now. Fight them to the bitter end. I wouldn't let the master be tear me apart, drive me mad. No! I had to beat them, and I'd do it now! I drove on and on and on, and the bells followed me. They must come from a train running parallel to the highway somewhere over the rim of the desert. Yes, it must be a train. It couldn't be anything else. Mile after mile I drove, and mile after mile the bells followed me. I began to wonder, when would the tracks cross the highway? Tracks always cross highways somewhere. They just didn't run parallel indefinitely. And then, and then off I hit. I, I saw some trucks and men. It was a construction crew fixing the road. I stopped the car and hailed the foreman. Yeah. What is it, mister? Doesn't, doesn't the train cross the highway somewhere up ahead? Train? What train? There's no railroad in this area of the desert. But there must be. I hear train bells. Bells? I don't hear any bells, mister. Well, I tell you, they're ringing. Look, mister, you must have sunstroke or something. There ain't no train within a hundred miles of here. But there no must bells be. bells either. There must be. There has to be. <laughs> now I knew what I had to do. I had to go back to the estate, back to the Brook Memorial Tower and destroy the accursed bells I'd inherited. I had to close their bronze mouths, pull out their wagging tongues, smash their glittering faces. They had possession of me. They were driving me out of my mind. I had to free myself of them once and for all. Only then would I be at peace. I headed for home. And every mile, every hour, the bells pursued me, ringing in my ears, day and night, pounding and relentless. <laughs> Back at the estate, I went to the garden's tool house, picked out a heavy sledgehammer, headed toward the bell tower. The car was just coming up the driveway. It looked like Danny's but I paid no attention. I ran into the bell tower and climbed the ladder into the bell bridge. Now, now is the time. There were the bells leering at me, grinning at me. I'd smash them now, now and forever. I lifted the sledgehammer and brought it down to the first bell. I'll smash it a bit. Why don't you break? Why don't you break? Arthur! Arthur! What do you do there in the bell break? I'll smash them. I'll break them into the pieces. It's the last thing I do. Arthur! You got mad. Stop it, I say. Stop it. Why don't they stop ringing? Why don't they stop? No! No, don't! Don't say it anymore! I can't stand it any longer! I can't! I can't! I can't! Dr. Williams, I must compliment you on this mental institution of yours. It's run very efficiently. One of the finest in the state. Thank you, Professor. Oh, by the way, it must be close to midnight. I didn't expect to stay here this late, but uh, it was so interesting. Uh, what is the time, anyway? Well, I don't have a watch on me, Professor, but... Uh, oh. huh, just a second. Listen. The bells! There they go again! There they go! Can't you hear them? Stop them! Stop them! Ah, the time now, Professor Alvin, is exactly midnight. How do you know that, Doctor? That patient you just heard, Professor, the one who just cried aloud, is a very remarkable case. A human timepiece. He has no watch, of course, but every hour on the hour, he hears bells. He hears bells every hour on the hour? Precisely, Professor Alvin. And he's never more than a second or two out of the way. And so a man lies on a bed in a padded cell and hears the bells ringing, ringing, every hour on the hour, just as he once heard the real bells strike twelve for murder at midnight. <laughs> Remember to be with 
was again when death tolls a requiem and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Arthur Brooke was played by Michael Fitzmaurice. With music by Bert Berman, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Gun away, Joe. Stop him, Freddy. He can't hear you, Smalley. He's busy singing. Uh, I've been playing you to sleep. Hey, Baker. Baker. He can't hear you neither. We rocked him off long ago. Joe, listen. Don't do it, please. I'll cut the take again any way you say it, but don't push the switch on me. Don't. <laughs> hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest end. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Red Wheels. <laughs> Now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Our story by Jack Gordon is Red Wheels. The desert, flat and empty under a heavy night sky. Speeding along its only road is a large bus. Lulled by the hum of the tires, its smooth motion... The passengers sleep. All of them. Except one. Shh, Joe. Joe, hey, wake up. Uh, what? I said, wake up. What? Oh, let me alone, will you? Let me sleep, will you? Hey, Joe, you don't think nothing went wrong? You don't, do you? All right, I'm up. You know, kid, you got a face that talks too much. I want to make sure everything's all right, that's all. Joe, I want to make sure. This makes three times tonight you got to make sure. It's starting to get me, see? All right, now, I'll tell you once more. There ain't nobody following us. Okay? But there was. There was. You said so yourself. There was at first. That was a couple of days ago. And it was the newspaper said so, not me. Now, will you put that imagination of yours in mothballs? Nobody's following us. Nobody knows we killed them. And if they did, they'd probably be erecting a monument for us back in Denver this minute. So you just turn your nose against the window and watch the desert. Yeah, but... It's pretty sand in the desert. But, Joe... Will you turn your nose like I say? Yeah, Joe... You picked your lucky seat. You're in seat seven, ain't you? Yeah, sure, Joe. Well, turn around. Watch the sand in the desert. That's right. And you found a penny. That's the sign you're always blabbing about. Sitting in seat seven and found a penny. <laughs> lucky guy, that's you. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, so let me sleep with you. That's me, lucky guy. Only I can't rest since that night we gave it to Smalley. Look out of the window, Freddy. Okay. What time is it? It's almost 12. Smalley coming yet? Said he was going to be here at midnight. No, but the cop... What about him? Well, he keeps coming back like he's fishing for something here. Uh, He's just making the rounds. 
Don't you worry about him. I don't like it, Joe. There's a smell about it. Yeah, it stinks to me, too. Those two guys playing us for suckers. Baker and Smalley, a pair of shovelfoot dopes. Doing a little insurance on their own, and they won't cut us in on the take. Okay. Maybe... Maybe we just ought to go away, Joe. Set up our own system somewhere, Zoe. And let them get away with a double cross? You kidding? It's arranged perfect, ain't it? Baker out like a light in the other room from that Mickey. We use his gun, and we're a thousand miles away when he fries for killing his best friend. Hey, but Joe, don't forget me. I'm a jinx, I tell you. It'll backfire. Everything happens to me. L- let's let it alone. <laughs> just stroke that lucky rabbit's foot you bought today, and I'll do the word. Hey, what's that? What? It's Smalley. Yeah, yeah, all right. Now, just, just get to that piano and play him a little lullaby. Hey, Joe, the cops go. Get to the piano, I said. Yeah. Maybe my luck switched because of the rabbit's foot. Hi, brothers. Hello, Smalley. We've been waiting for you. That's good. Is it? It's not so good. We ain't happy. No? No. The whole thing grizzles me. That's too bad. Where's Baker? Do you think we'd sit around like a couple of stumps and let you collect all that protection without a peep? I think you're getting too tall, Joe. <laughs> Only five foot eight. That's four inches and 40 pounds weaker than you, Smalley. Just the same, Freddy and me. We want our share. You got what's coming to you. But you ain't got what's coming to you, Smalley. You see? This cuts you down to size. Put that away, Joe. Now you're 40 pounds, four inches. They'll make no difference. I say put that gun away, Joe. Stop him, Freddy. (laughs) Freddy can't hear you, Smalley. He's busy singing. Uh, I mean, playing you to sleep. Hey, Baker. Baker. (laughs) He can't hear you neither. We rocked him off long ago. Joe, listen, now, don't do it. I'll I'll cut the take again. Any way you save it, don't push the switch on me. Don't. (coughs) Keep playing, Freddy, like nothing's happened. I I, I didn't figure on this kind of a cut. (sighs) I said keep playing, Freddy. Nothing's happened. I can't. All right, then just keep stroking your rabbit's foot. It'll be okay. Let's see now. Oh, let's get out of here. It's only half done, kid. Let's plant the gun on Baker before we blow. Okay. There, he's beginning to stir in there. Let's get out of here. Hey, say, say, I told you to cop downstairs. Oh, easy, kid, easy. That's perfect. Now he'll catch Baker just as he's getting up. So through the window and let the cops take over from here on out. Oh, 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 okay, kid, out you go. Come on. Come on. And a boy. Breaking the door down? You keep stroking that rabbit's foot. You'll wear it out. <laughs> hey, the cop got in. So now we got a grandstand seat to watch the go with Baker right in the middle. Oh, no. No, Joe, let's beat it while we can. What, 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 what do we want to look for trouble for? Come on. Let's... This I got to see. <laughs> Here he comes, the lunk. Staggering out of the bedroom. Is he dopey from that stuff we give him? Jerk. You don't even know he's got that gun we planted on him. Please, Joe, I'm dancing around like crazy inside. Let's get out of here before they decide to look this way. This ain't smart, Joe. (laughs) Okay. I've had my fun. Let's blow. Make it Hollywood, Freddy. There's a lot of money out there. Easy picking. Oh, they'll come after us, Joe. I got a feeling. Don't be a dope. What do they want us for? They got Baker, ain't they? Well, they'll look for us as witnesses. <laughs> yeah. They know they're well rid of Smalley. All they want is a goat. And we left him in the stable back there. Yeah, but the paper said... Never mind the paper said. Sure, they'd say they want us around. But if we ain't there, we ain't. Yeah. Hey, look, a penny. Pick it up, kid. Yeah. Brings good luck, Joe. You see? <laughs> now we got nothing to worry about. <laughs> What time does your next bus leave for L.A., ma'am? One's leaving in about five minutes. Okay, two for L.A. That's 21.5 out of 25. Here you are. Thanks. Come on, kid. Hey, Joe. Yeah? Uh, you got a penny? What for? I want to weigh myself. I'll get a fortune ticket. What about that penny you picked up? Oh, no, Joe. That's a good luck penny. I mustn't spend that. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, gee, Thanks. What's the good news, kid? Uh, it says uh, 
Uh, it says... Okay, so go on. What does it say? What it says... You're going to take a long, unexpected trip. <laughs> say, that's pretty good. That's right, ain't it? Maybe... Maybe it don't mean that. Maybe it means the cops will get us and... Finish reading it. Okay. It says... You are too easily taken in and influenced by those around you. What are you looking at me for? Uh... Oh, nothing. Nothing, Joe. <laughs> Come on, kid. There's our bus pulling in. Well, there she is. Let's get out, huh? Joe, let's wait for the next one, Joe. Are you nuts a three-hour wait? What for? That's got red wheels. Pretty, ain't it? Well, red means danger. Let's take the next bus, huh? Oh, you dope. Stroke your rabbits. Oh, but Joe, I got a feeling. Good, so have I. And it says let's get to L.A. double quick and pick up some of that gold dust. Hey, driver. Yeah? When do we pull into L.A.? Day after tomorrow. About this time. Thanks. Come on, Freddy. The red wheels is on the outside. I... I... Okay. Seven and eight. That's us. Give me your bags. I'll yeah. shove it up here. There we are. Joe. Hey, Joe. Now what? Hey, you let me... Let me sit by the window, will you? You can't see the wheels anyway. Yeah, but you... Oh, I get it. It's the number, huh? Yeah. You want the lucky seven. Oh, sure, kid. Sit and see seven if it'll make you happy. <laughs> Red wheels. Red wheels. Red wheels. Red wheels. Hey, are you still up? Oh, I wish I could sleep. Oh, look out the window. The night and the sand. You'll not off. Yeah. Yeah, okay, Joe. Out the window. The night and the sand. Night and the sand. Night and the sand. Sand. Sand like a gray smoke screen. Hiding us from the rest of the world. No eyes watching us the way away. Red wheels don't mean beans. That's nothing. I'm no pin cushion for that lady luck. She's on my side. I add it all up. Rabbit's foot, that's one. Finding a penny, that's two. And, and seat seven, three. That's three against Red Wheels. <laughs> three against Red Wheels. <laughs> uh, what's that? I know. Oh, it can't be. Hey, Joe. Joe, wake up. Oh, he, he said not to wake him. He said he wanted to sleep. But the bus. The bus. Look. Look, it's still moving, Joe. It's speeding over the great clouds of sand, and the driver's seat is empty. The bus is speeding, and there ain't no driver. <laughs> bus with red wheels on a desert road. Where can a bus be going without a driver? Where would you expect to go after murder at midnight? And now, back to Murder at Midnight and Red wheels. Back to the bus, speeding through the desert, without a driver. How could a bus move without a driver? It's crazy. Just close your eyes, Freddy. You're dreaming. Now, when you open your eyes again, you'll see. Now, straight ahead and see. There is a... Ah! No, no. I'm imagining things because I'm scared. Joe. Uh, hey, what's eating you now? Look, Joe, look. Coppers? No, no, no. Worse. It's this bus. It's moving. Well, what'd you expect? Now, look, Brady Park. Yeah, yeah. That's just the point. Look. Straight ahead there. Look. What the devil? That's it. The devil. The devil's riding with us. He's holding the wheel. That's just why we can't see him. You see, there's no driver. Holy smokes. I, I don't get it. What's making it move? Something we can't see, Joe. Something. Shut up. The bus is red wheels, Joe, remember? Red burns like fire. Can take it only one place. That's where we're going. 
Maybe some of these dopes sleeping can dream a way out. Hey, everybody, wake up! Wake up! What's all the racket? Darling, don't cry. What's the big idea? I'll tell you the big idea. Look. Look straight front and see for yourself. Yeah, okay. oh, Holy shit! It's a good driver, it's a good driver! Wait a minute, everybody. Don't get excited. What do you mean, don't get excited? Well, if you listen to me, I'll tell you. There wasn't anybody awake I'll tell time. you who's driving this bus. It's the devil. And that means... You know where we're going? Hey, you're creating a ride, you idiot. Let me talk. Sure, talk, talk. That's just what we need. This bus is riding us all where we got to do a lot of fast talking. Dead people got to tell why they should be led into heaven or to that other place. Hey, what the Boy, devil are you... The devil, see? We talk about him all the time, the devil. That's the guy we're going to have to see, I know. I know there's no other place for me. It must be the same for all of you. Uh, I guess so. You know the hat. We're not dead, oh, ain't we? Ha! We're on a bus. And the bus has got no driver. And the bus has got red wheels. And if you look outside, you can't see a thing but clouds of sand. Nothing. Nothing, just a bus moving. And if you add up what you did during your lifetime, I'll bet you'll find there was plenty wrong. Hey, you, fat boy. How'd you do it? With an axe, maybe? No, I don't pay any attention to him, everyone. If you'll just listen to me... Hey, you, I'll... lady. Small little dame with a gray hair. What's the devil got against you? And you. What's laying so heavy on your chest that you won't let me talk? Yeah. I'll tell you. I was Why up do you the... keep jabbering? Nothing to get excited. Oh. There's plenty to get excited about. Go ahead, kid. Go no, on. no, no, Freddy. When someone gives you the green light to yap, that means to shut up. We put on a good show, Joe and me. We did it with music. I say button up. No odds now, Joe. I can yeah. sing in any key. What's the difference now if he is a cop? We're all going to the same place. I say shut up. I played Smiley a lullaby. Joe rocked him to sleep with a bullet. Freddy. With a plain everyday gun. No fancy trimming. You're two for a second, idiot. Am I, Joe? Am I? Maybe I was once, but no more. I'm not going to take what's around waiting for us. You dopes can stick here like pigs in a slaughter pen if you want, but me, I'm finding a way out. Hey, come back. Hey, stop him, somebody. Hey, stop him. Ah, that did it. Door open just for me. You chunks can fry where you're gone, but not me. Son, son. Hey, I made it. I got to run now. Run. Run. Space. Pack space between me and our devil wings. Space. Oh, I'm getting tired. Yeah. Hard running on sand. Get you tired, also tired. Oh, but the bus is gone. I'm free of it. I'm alone now. That's right, mister. You and me. We're all alone. Sure. Sure, we... Hey, who are you? I'm Mr. Rat. Mr.? Yeah, Mr. Desert Rat. I've been here 22 years. Got off a bus just like you. And been wandering around ever since. Well, how? Why? Why don't you get out of here? Because once you jump off, there ain't no other bus will stop to pick you up. You're all alone. Hey! Hey, Mr. Wright! Yes, Freddy? Where are you going? Gotta keep wandering. Keep wandering. Keep wandering. The desert. The sand and nothing else for 22 years. Maybe another bus will pick me up. Maybe I shouldn't have jumped. Maybe it might have been better the way it was before I changed it. No. No, there is something else. A tavern. Come on, Freddy. Pick him up and lay him down. Let's get to those people. Oh, nice town. Got a road. One, two, three, or five buildings. Hey! Hey, anybody around? Anybody home? Well, there must be. There, in that saloon there. Oh, brother, could I use a drink? A beer, yeah, that's for me. Hey! Hey! Hey, what happened, everybody? What? Hey, no, no, stop that. Not that song. That's what I was playing when... Stop it. Do you hear? Where are you? Through this door, maybe another room. Stop it, I said. Stop it. Oh, no. Oh, no, not again. A bus without a driver. A piano without anybody playing it. Just the keys moving by themselves. I got to 
I didn't have nothing to do with it, Smalley. Honest, it was Joe. Have a drink, Freddy. You must be awful thirsty. Nah, uh-uh. I know I'm thirsty with that slug in my guts. Now keep away from me, Smalley. So why not? Let's have one together. A nice double Mickey. I said keep clear of me. You're scared, Freddy, aren't you? You're afraid of the dark and the desert and being here alone with me in a ghost town. Joe? Joe? When Joe isn't around, you get scared, kid, don't you? Too bad Joe isn't here to give you a little gumption. Fight me, Freddy. Get me, Freddy, or I'll get you first. No, honest, Smalley, honest. I ain't got nothing against you. We gotta, we gotta stick together here. It's, it's dark. And don't play with rats. I squash them. Now keep away from me, I, I tell you. No. No. Where are you gonna run to, Freddy? There ain't no place to hide. Not here. I got a gun. Mm. That makes you big shot again, don't it? I'll let you have it, Smalley. I swear I will. That gun sort of takes Joe's place, don't it, you weak little... I warned you. Have a drink, Freddy. With a Mickey. With a Mickey and... I didn't want to do it, Smalley. Not again, honest. I just got him before he got me, that's all. It's all mixed up. I don't know how he got here, but... I'm alive. Uh, luck's coming my way again. This time for good. I got a feeling... Lucky rabbit's foot, lucky penny, everything lucky. Lady Luck, she's on my side now. I see a car, a car outside, I hear it. Yeah. Moon eye headlights straight at me. Yeah. Just hop a ride to L.A., I'll be okay. Hey, hey, you! Just wave my hands like this, he'll stop. Up and down, up, down, up, down. Good, good. Slow down, I'm okay now. Lift, mister, lift. No, no. My bus with the red wheel, and it's still a new driver. Bus number twenty-two checking in, Tom. Okay, Johnny, I'll take you. Yeah, hey, I hear a little excitement. Excitement? Yeah, I guess so. What do you mean you guess so? You... Now, a couple of murderers on your bus, man. Well, there uh, wasn't no excitement in it for me. What? You see, I wasn't there. They were all asleep when the bus broke down. There was no one to talk to, so after the tow car hooked onto the bus, I went up front in the tow car to chew the rag. Yeah, yeah, so? So nothing. When this guy wakes up, he went nuts. Started yapping about a murder and jumped off the bus. We had to chase him all through the desert, and he was so far gone, he didn't even see the tow car when we found him again. So what happened to him, then? It was nuts, I tell you, off his rocker. Yeah? Sure. We turned him and his buddy over to the cops in the next town at just about 12 o'clock midnight. A bus without a driver and a ghost town in the desert. Perhaps our two friends will make that same trip again, and very soon, when they make their final payment for their... Murder at Midnight.
again when death takes the wheel on a lonely journey and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Freddy was played by John Sylvester. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leder. Finally caught up with her. Crane, please, please. That ape, get him out of here. I'll do anything, anything. You treated me like an animal, Cecily. And now an animal shall treat you as you deserve. Choke you to death. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest and our fears the strongest. Our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a moment in The Eighth Song. And now, Murder at Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Peter Martin is The Ape Song. Night and fog shroud a nondescript freighter just in from Africa and now unloading its cargo in New York Harbor. Down in the ship's deepest hole stands Crane Folligat, the famous big game hunter. Before him is an iron cage containing his latest conquest, a restless thing of panic and hysteria and insensate passions, a huge ape. Quiet. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to kill you, hurt you. I've killed too much already. And besides, I need you to live, need your help. Now, that's better. Yes, my friend, you shall live to save me from death. A death in life. I'll be taking them off in a minute. Huh? Oh, good. Lucky thing we were able to get a hold of another truck. Why the university forgot to send their truck is beyond me. Still, I don't think keeping the animal in my cellar overnight will harm him or anybody. Nah. Look at him shake, though. He's scared. Well, not scared, exactly. That's because, like all apes taken from their natural habitat, he imagines he's in the presence of death. Death? Yes. What's he doing now, opening and closing his mouth as if he were trying to sing or something? How, how did you know? No. Know what? Oh, I'm sorry, no, you you wouldn't know. They can sing, though. Yeah? They do. But only when they're in the presence of death. We rode home through the foggy night in the truck, 
the ape and I. The house was dark when we got there, and I had to give the driver and his helper an extra $20 to take the canvas-covered crate holding the ape around to the back door and into the cellar. Walking up the cellar stairs, I entered the front hall and... Uh, what is it? Is that you? Dr. Murchison. Yes, welcome home. Uh, what, what are you doing here? Your wife was just going out when I came here, but she let me in and I've been waiting for you. Waiting for me? Yes. I was about to go myself when I heard a noise downstairs. Oh, I suppose you want to know where the ape is. Well, he's downstairs in the cellar. I see. Folliot, why did you bring the ape here rather than to my laboratory? Well, the laboratory truck never arrived. What? That's impossible. I personally arranged for it to meet you at the pier. Why are you questioning me, Dr. Murchison? You don't really think I want an ape as a house guest, do you? The only thing I was interested in was to get the ape to a safe place until morning. Then I was going to call you. I see. Uh, can't you wait to start cutting him up, whatever you intend to do with him? Do you want to take him with you now? Well, you know that's impossible, Folliot. And you know we don't intend to cut him up. Well, I, I'm sorry, Doctor, but the strain taking care of him, you know what delicate animals they are. Uh, won't you come into my study and we can talk? Thanks, Folliot, but now that I know he's safe, I must be running along. As you wish. When, uh, when will you send the truck around and take him to the laboratory? Oh, around noon, I should say. Good. Get some sleep, man. You look terribly tired. Yes, good, peaceful sleep at last. Hello, someone's at the door. Uh, yes, yes, I imagine it's my wife. Oh, oh, Crane. Hello, Cecily. You're back. Yes. Why? Why? That's a strange question. You know Dr. Murchison, don't you? Yes. I was just about to leave, Mrs. Folliot. You must excuse my wife, Doctor. She's so pleased at seeing me that she's forgotten her manners. I understand. Well, I'll be in touch with you. Brian? Good night, Mrs. Folliot. Good night. Crane, you promised you'd stay away until November. Yes, I know I did. But the thought of you all alone in this big house doing nothing but waiting for me to return to your welcoming arms... What else could I do but rush home as quickly as I could, my dear? Don't be sarcastic, Crane. On the contrary, my dear. I'm not being half as sarcastic as I'd like to be. Excuse me, I, I'm going to bed. But uh, don't you care for me just a little, Cecily? Just enough to kiss me goodnight? Let me pass. I've never asked very much of you, you know. No more than the friendly pat on the head you give to your dog. I said let me pass. Yes, Cecily. But first, there's something I must tell you. How tired I am of being a hunter, of killing wild animals instead of enjoying the happiness of my home with you. You seem to enjoy your hunting trips well enough. You're always going on them and bragging about them to everybody. Now, let me pass, Crane. Please believe me, Cecily. Hunting is only a substitute. A very unsatisfactory substitute for the love I hope to receive from you. I never do. I thought we'd settled all that. Yes, but I... I never dreamed you'd treat me like some loathsome animal you couldn't bear near you as though I wasn't a man but an ape. When are you leaving on your next trip? When? Yes. Because until you do, I'm going away. If you hate me so much, my dear, why don't you go to Reno and get divorced? You know my family doesn't approve of divorce. Of course they don't. Especially when it's a matter of losing the foliot millions along with a husband. How can you be so disgusting? Something terrible has happened to me, Cecily. Something which forbids me ever to go hunting again. Don't make silly excuses. You know you love to hunt. Not uh, anymore, Cecily. Something has happened that makes me terrified ever to hunt again. What on earth are you talking about? I really can't explain it, my dear. But on this last trip, every time I killed a wild animal, I imagined I was killing... I was killing you. <laughs> I watched her run up the stairs in terror. I heard the slam of her bedroom door. Stood there at the foot of the stairs for a moment, dazed. Yet more certain than ever of what I had to do. And then quite unexpectedly, I felt the wet sting of tears on my cheeks. Yes, there were tears. But no sound. 
I thought of the ape in the hold of the ship silently opening and closing his mouth. Some outside force seemed to be guiding me now as though I was a mechanically controlled robot. I began walking down the hallway to the cellar door. The darkness didn't frighten me. It was my friend. I went down the cellar steps in perfect calm, never thinking to snap on the light. No, it was the darkness that soothed me, whispered to me. The darkness and the presence of my friend. He sensed me, of course. And more than that, he expected me. He knew I was coming. I went to him. There he was, outlined in the dim light of a faraway street lamp, coming into the cellar from the grating over my head. (laughs) Yes, my friend. You want to be free, don't you? (laughs) Yes, and why not be free? But before I let you out of your cage, we must understand each other. There is a price you must pay for your freedom. Am I really being so unreasonable? Listen, you shall do what I command you to do with an ecstasy of satisfaction. Do you hear? For this time, it is no animal you will see die, but a human being. And more than that, my friend, you will not only see her die, but you yourself shall kill her, shall avenge all the terrible deaths I have dealt your fellow brothers of the animal kingdom. Ah, ha, ha. I see you are pleased, and you should be. Didn't I kill your mate? But I tell you, Cecily drove me to it in my need to quench my murder lust against her. And now, my friend, you shall act as my conscience. You shall kill Cecily in revenge. Your spirit shall be my spirit, and Cecily will die. Yes, yes, you do understand. Here in my hand is the key to your cage. The key to your freedom and mine. We have made our bargain, haven't we? Yes, yes. We understand each other as though we were two brothers. Yes. Come out. Now, upstairs to her room. It is there that you shall sing at last. Yes, your song of freedom. Your ape song. And so man and ape start for the room of their victim. Start up the stairs side by side in the darkness as the clock strikes twelve for... Murder! At midnight! And now back to Murder at Midnight and The Ape Song. Crane Folliot and his ape continue up the steps to Cecily's room. We went up the cellar stairs together. And it didn't seem strange when the ape took my hand as though wishing me to guide him. And then for a moment I was afraid of trouble. The ape became fascinated with the heavy carpeting in the hallway, patting it with his hand as an infant plays with sand. But finally, I got him to stand up and come with me. We made hardly any sound as we climbed the main staircase leading to her room. Uh, who, who is it? What is it, my dear? What's the matter? Oh, something in the room. I hear it. I see its eyes. But that's fantastic, my dear. There. There it is. Crane. Crane, what are you doing to me? I see nothing. I hear nothing. Crane, let go of my arm. In a moment. But won't you kiss me, please? You... You're going to kill me. Oh, no, no, not I. Come, aren't you going to kiss me just once, as you used to in the old, old days? All right. Yes, anything. But let me go. Good. Now. Let me hold you in my arms. Oh, Cecily, I need you so. 
Why have I lost you? Why did you forsake me, Cecily? Cecily, come back. Don't run. You can't get away. Very well. If that's the way you want it. It was quite a chase. I followed them as they ran through the house from room to room, floor to floor. She seemed to be making for the roof, but I knew if she got away from me, she'd never, never shake off the ape. Finally, on the top floor, we caught up with her in the attic. Crane! Please! Please, that ape! Get him out of here! Crane, I'll do anything! You treated me like an animal, Cecily. And now an animal shall treat you as you deserve. Choke the life out of you. There she is! Over there in the corner. No, no, Crane. She made me kill your mates. Kill her. Kill her. Kill her. Crane. Crane. Goodbye, Cecily. I felt wonderful. I stood over her body and thought I could smell the sea and hear the pounding of the clean waves. And I felt sleepy again. Really sleepy again. I knew I could sleep now. I don't know how long I stood there or how long the doorbell was ringing until I remembered that it wasn't I that had killed her, but the ape. I was safe. Why not go downstairs and open the door? Couldn't get a taxi, and I wanted to see the ape first thing in the morning anyway, so I thought I'd come back to that comfortable sofa of yours. Dr. Murchison, the ape has escaped. Escaped? Yes, he jumped out of a window into a tree after killing my wife. Fulliot, what are you saying? Yes, right after you left. The first I knew of it was when she screamed. I ran upstairs to her room, but... Queer. What was that? I merely said it was queer. I can't tell you how sorry I am, Fulliot, for you. Sorry? For me? Shouldn't I be? In a way. Yes, it's lucky you did come back. We'll have to organize a search for the ape, of course. Call the police. Yes. I am sorry for you, Fulliot. Terribly sorry. The days that followed were the happiest of my life. At the inquest, the coroner's verdict was death by accidental strangulation. The ape could not be found, and the official opinion was that he drowned in the river, his body carried out to sea. Everything had worked out perfectly until I began to become aware of something strange and frightening and horrible. All this was happening to me. One day on the street. You dropped a coin, sir. Oh, thanks, that dime. I... I have it. Uh... Did you hurt your finger? Here, let me pick it up for you. Uh, thank you, my thumb. Somehow I can't seem to bring it across. My thumb was no longer opposable. I couldn't bring it across my fingers. I never realized what it could mean until a few days later at a ball game. Get your scorecard at the game. Can't tell nothing without a scorecard, mister. Never mind. Come on, mister. Only a dime a scorecard. You don't want to spoil the pleasure of the game just for a dime, do you? Move on, you idiot. Yeah, who are you? A quiz kid or something? I said get out of here. Take your hands off of me, you ape, you. What was happening to me? I could hardly force myself to think about it, but I had to, especially after what happened at my club. I say there, fellow, you old man, have a seat in the check. Uh, thank you, Sam, but I've got to be going. Uh, yes, of course. I see. You see what? Lumbago, eh? Can't straighten up your back. Uh, going to a doctor, eh? You think it would help, do you? I don't know, but you certainly can't spend the rest of your life bending over like that. With your hands hanging halfway to your knees. A half hour later, I was in Murchison's office. Now, now, you must take it easy, Folliot. We all have our off days, you know. You've got to help me, Dr. Murchison. You don't know what I'm going through. I wonder. You do look rather... I can't stand wearing shoes anymore. They torture me. And I can't straighten my back up. Have you ever had rheumatism? Any severe back injury? Rheumatism? 
You sit there talking like that when I've caught myself making sounds like an ape. Don't you realize what's happening? That's what I'm becoming, an ape. You're a psychiatrist, aren't you? We'll do something. You've got to do something. Quit your whimpering and listen. I can help you, but only if you cooperate. I'll do anything. Admit you arranged for your wife's murder. What? With the ape's help. Everything points to it, Folliot. Bringing the ape to your house, your strange behavior before and after I left. And now the transference. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. It's quite simple. Arranging for the ape to strangle your wife put you legally in the clear. But you can't strangle your guilt. You can only suppress it. And unconsciously in your guilt, you have taken on the actual characteristics of the ape. If you say that again, I'll kill you. Killing me would only prove your guilt twice over. Be sensible, Folliot. Trust me. I've taken extensive note on your case. You've taken note? Yes, because I knew that some sort of reaction would set in. Oh, you no, no, keep away from me. No, you... you're going to turn me over to the police. You're against me, too. Everyone's oh. against me trying to hunt me down, but you won't get me. No. You won't. Please, Please stop dropped him, and he fell to the floor gasping. And then I tore open the door and ran. I didn't know where I was going, what I was going to do next. I only knew I had to hide. I found an abandoned house, hid in the cellar, and there, there in the darkness, it all became clear. Ape. The ape who had killed Cecily. I was the ape. That meant he was Crane Folliot, and that meant... Yes. I had to find him somehow. Kill him for killing Cecily. And that way, that way become my old self again. Where could I go? Where would I hide if I were he? Where there is green. Yes, and trees. And rocks. Ape, yes. In the park. night in the park, I threw off my shoes and walked barefoot, concealed in the night as I hunted my mortal enemy. Piece by piece, I discarded my clothes, my jacket, my shirt, my trousers, walking like the animal I had become. My eyes were sharper than they'd ever been. I could see even in the darkness. And then... As the moon started to go down, I climbed a ridge. There were caves, cages, stone houses, the zoo. And then I heard something, something that made the hair prickle on the back of my neck. My fingers itched and my body shook as I heard the sound that told me I had found my enemy, the ape. I jumped down toward the sounds, my lips puffing in and out with my heavy breathing, my head pounding like a trip hammer, my entire body aflame with the hot blood of murder. I ran to where the sounds came from, and there was a locked steel door. The ape was snarling, daring me to come near him. I ran around to the other side, wrenched a fire axe from the wall, and came back to the door. I smashed at the lock with a sharp edge of the axe. Opened the door and leaped into the cage. He reared at me with his hind legs and I sprang at his throat. Pull him out. Jake, get your gun quick. There's a man in there. Yeah. Put me so, up now. Die. Die for killing Cecily. And die in me too. Let me be Folia. Folia, do you hear? Watch out. The cage is open. It's dead. And I free. <laughs> there he is, Chick. Let him out. Yes, it's he. I pronounce him dead. 
Who'd have thought a man could make a sound like that? It was dark, and we thought the ape had killed him, so Jake just fired. What gets me is his trying to kill an ape with his bare hands and doing it. Mm. To his crazed mind, this was the same ape he provoked into killing his wife. I'll never forget that sound as long as I live. Never. The complete transference into ape. Yet he could have been saved. Look at them lying on the ground. Too bad we couldn't have gotten here a minute sooner. Sure left an easy trail, dropping his shoes and clothes after him piece by piece. Ape and men on the ground, side by side. It ain't pretty. His toes turned in, puffs of hair from the ape's throat still clutched between his fingers, his teeth biting into his lower lip. Poor Foliot. Or should I say poor humans? How close to animals we really are. Two bodies lying side by side in the darkness, with no one to say which was the victim, as the clock strikes twelve for murder at midnight. be with us again when death pads through the night with glowing eyes and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of the big game hunter was played by Raymond Edward Johnson. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Too sure about that, Wentworth. What do you mean? Don't forget that skeleton there. He was once a man, too. Until he was trapped in here. Or murdered. What of it? Oh, nothing. Nothing except this. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. Our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Line is Dead. of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Our story by Faith Blau is The Line is Dead. The gash in the green lawn of Brookside Memorial Park awaits the body of Albert Lockridge, scientist and explorer. There are few who have followed him to his last resting place, 
for Albert Lockridge was not one who was prodigal with his affection. And so beside the yawning grave stands his wife, Lenore. Albert. Finishing the short service, the minister says, And so, unto dust, you are now committed. <laughs> you may lower the casket. Strong hands grasp the straps attached to the coffin. The pulleys sing their discordant dirge, a strange melody heard over the soft weeping of Lenore Lockridge. Suddenly... Where's Lockridge? Listen, Lockridge. Lockridge in the coffin. Albert! Albert, we hear you. We know you're alive. Raise the casket. Raise the casket. Yes, sir. all right, isn't he, Dr. George? He seems to be, but... But uh, what? Well, you can't blame me if I'm a little hesitant in giving my opinion. You mean you're not sure that he'll... that he will? Yes. Oh. After all, Mrs. Lockridge, my position is a little awkward. I signed the death certificate feeling certain that your husband was dead. And now I'm naturally reluctant to predict just what course his convalescence will take. I think I understand. The only thing that really matters is that my husband's lying in his bed at home and not in the cold, black earth of Brookside. Isn't that true? Well, you're a very sensible woman. Albert will get better. Yeah, probably. But we'll have to watch his heart. His heart? Are these strange spells when his heart seems to stop, uh, when I thought it had stopped. Each attack is an added strain. But the strain of regaining consciousness in the coffin, he withstood that with even a, when even a healthy person might not have. Well, he's a hard person to kill. Oh, thank goodness for that. Well, this time it was a pretty close call. If he'd come to even ten minutes later, Mrs. Lockridge, no one would have ever known. <laughs> The doctor says you'll be fine if you'll only rest. I, I, I can't rest. I've got to ask you a question. Dear, you've been through so much, too much for any one person, so save any questions you may. No, this question can't wait. That sealed envelope, Lenore, the one on my desk. The one I'm supposed to read after, after you're, you're... Yes, yes, after I'm dead. Lenore? You know, you haven't read it, have you? No. No, Albert. I plan to read it after after the funeral, just as you told me to. Sure? You haven't read it? Of course. Get it for me. I want to see for myself. Albert, no, you've so little strength. But I must know. You will. I must know now. Because if you read it, I don't want to live. Albert, I swear, I swear I haven't. Please believe me. You saw it? No. Look at me. You can see I'm telling the truth. Look at me. Yes. Yes, I think you are telling the truth. <laughs> Lockridge, another few days, and we'll have you out of that wheelchair. Sometimes I wonder why you go to all this trouble with me, Doctor. It's my job. Yes, but there's so many people who really enjoy life and yet die. Twice now I've been pronounced dead, only to return to life almost reluctantly. Reluctantly? Yes. <laughs> you tried awfully hard to get out of the coffin. <laughs> the sheer horror of being buried alive. I've always been terrified of it. Uh, since uh, childhood? Yes. My nurse locked me in a closet whenever I misbehave. I always thought I'd be left to die there. Oh, it's it's not the fact of being death that bothers me. It's uh, it's the fear of being buried alive. It's the choking, the futility of crying out. Yes, it would be a horrible way to die, but... Excuse me, Doctor. There's a Mr. Burton here to see you, Mr. Lockridge. Good. Show him in, nurse. 
Uh, nurse, take our patient out on the sun porch. I'll send his visitor there. Mr. Lockridge? Sit down, Mr. Burton. Thank you. The nurse, if you don't mind. Not at all. If you need me, just call. Now, Mr. Burton... As I understand your business... I'm a telephone engineer specializing in special types of telephone systems. Yes. But perhaps you've read about me in the paper. Yeah. <laughs> sure I have. You're the guy who came back from the grave. Yes, I'm the guy who came back from the grave. And it strikes me, Mr. Burton, that an occasion might again arise when I might want to do the same thing. That's why I called you. Come again? Sometime, a doctor again may pronounce me dead. Perhaps I will be. Perhaps I won't. And if I'm not, I'd like to feel that I could call for help. I don't get it. Mr. Burton, in case it should happen again, I'd like you to install a private telephone from this house to my grave. must promise to keep the phone installed and in working condition for a year after I'm buried. A year? Darling, that doesn't make any sense. Well, this stop and go hard of mine doesn't make any sense either. But, Albert, a year. The first time, my heart stopped for six hours. The next time, nearly two days. Who can tell? Well, a week, a month, perhaps. I think I'm asking very little. Well, then think of me, darling. Think of waiting day in and day out for the ring of that telephone. Think of the jumping at every stray bell, at every noise. Darling, you're condemning me to a slow death, like like being in a grave above ground. I still think my request is a modest one. And the least that a wife who loved her husband would do for him. Albert, don't start that again. After all, I shall be in my grave. Perhaps... Perhaps I shall be waiting, too, waiting for help that will never come. Will you please stop this morbid talk? Nothing else seems to be on your mind lately. Besides, it's terribly late, almost midnight. Let's... When death comes to a man slowly, he gets time to think about it. Too much time. Stop it, please. It seems to me that you are only too anxious to get rid of me. Oh, but how can you even think such a thing after... I've been a good wife, haven't I? Yes, but you might have made Oliver Wentworth an even better one. Albert, please, please don't bring that up again. What would have happened if Oliver had come back from that expedition? I he? don't know. You would have married him, wouldn't you? Perhaps. I don't know. No. How can you say that? You were engaged to him, weren't you? An engagement doesn't always mean marriage. You did intend to marry him, didn't you? Of course I did. What of it? You know I intended to. And you only changed your mind because he was killed. That's why you turned towards me. Well... I was nothing in your life. You were very sweet to me, Albert, then. I could see that you loved me in your peculiar way. I, I, I appreciated everything you did for me. Appreciate. Oh, Albert, why dig, dig, dig looking for a sore spot? It's not fair to me or to you. I was nothing in your life, was I? As long as Oliver was alive. What are you trying to prove? All the time we've spent together, I've played second fiddle to Oliver Wentworth. Look, Albert Lockridge, when we married, I said I'd put all thoughts of Oliver out of my mind. Well, I've done it. At least... At least? At least what? You mean you've tried, but you couldn't. Oh. I knew it. I knew it. You've never loved me. He's always been in your heart. What are you talking about? You just said it. If I had died, you would never have given me another thought. But all the time, here, in my own house, he's been living his own memory, haunting you, haunting us. I can't go on like this. I just can't go on. I've struggled with him long Albert. enough. He's got to go. No matter what I have to do to crush his memory, I've got to kill it. I've got... Uh, Albert. Uh, uh, Lenore. What is it? Uh, Lenore, help me, help me. Is a chair in my heart. I've got you. Now, slowly. No, slowly. I, I don't think... I can make it. Of course you can. Of course you can. You've got to. Oh, I can't. I... Ah! Doctor, are you sure? Absolutely, Mrs. Lockridge. And this time, the two heart specialists agree with me. But, Doctor, in view of what happened before... We've tried to take that into consideration. But even so... Well, can't you postpone signing the certificate? I'm sorry, Mrs. Lockridge. My colleagues and I all agree that your husband is dead. There can be no delay. Very well, Doctor. Thank you for everything. Goodbye, Mrs. Lockridge. Goodbye, Doctor. Hello?
Hello? Mr. Burton? This is Mrs. Lockridge speaking. My husband died yesterday. He used to be buried tomorrow at Brookside. Will you please be there as he desired to install a telephone in his grave? A man who was afraid, not of death, but of being buried alive. A telephone to a sealed grave and the great beyond. Will we hear from Albert Lockridge again before the clock strikes 12 for... Murder at Midnight. And now, back to Murder at Midnight and... The line is dead. One, one minute. Oh, Dr. George. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Lackey. It's awfully nice of you to call. I was worried about you. Oh, I'm all right. I'm fine. I couldn't come to the funeral. I tried to phone you, but... The phone's uh, disconnected. So they said. And so I came over. I rang the bell several times. No answer either. Finally, I knocked. I've had the doorbell disconnected, too. You mustn't cut yourself off from the world like this, Mrs. Lockwood. Believe me, Doctor, that's not my intention. As long as I stand guard at this telephone, I want to be sure that the only bell that ever rings in this house is the one that tells me that Albert's not dead, that he's still alive there in his coffin, that he needs help. You're really going through with this? He asked me to. It doesn't seem too much. No, you're only deluding yourself, Mrs. Lockridge, believe me. Waiting this way is only a perverse and completely futile sort of morning. I know you can't understand. I can't. But I do know that this morbid watch will only deepen your grief, prevent you from making any kind of adjustment to his death. What difference does it make? Now, you're a young woman, Mrs. Lockridge. You have a whole life ahead of you. All the more reason for spending some of it as he wanted me to. Doctor, my husband was not the sort of person who inspired affection. I know. But in his odd, sometimes unaccountable way, he did love me. Now that he's gone, no one on earth holds any fond memories of him but me. A heavy responsibility, Mrs. Lockeridge. Still, uh, you must take care of yourself. I will, Doctor. Assume that he is dead. Mourn him, as you will. But don't live in a state of suspended animation. For instance, if he's left a will... Don't put off reading it. There are some papers which I was supposed to read after his death. They're in a sealed envelope in his desk. Uh, read them. Uh, read them immediately. No, not uh, yet. You should. Perhaps they'll contain some message of comfort. Uh, get the envelope now. Not now, Dr. George. But very soon. <laughs> Just a moment. Yes? Oh. Oh. Lenore. Oh, no. No, I can't. It is. I know I shouldn't have come just like this without warning. But I thought... I've always thought... That I was dead. Yes, I know. That's what Albert told me, and you, you never came back. No. Why? It's a long story, Lenore. A story you ought to hear. You know that Albert died yesterday? I know. That's why I came. Why didn't you come sooner when he was alive? Were you afraid to meet him? I was afraid to meet you. Me? Why, Albert? By the time I returned, you and Albert were already married. But even so, we both would have waited. I wonder. You see, I knew you thought I was dead. No good would have come of such a meeting. But now, now everything is different. Different? Yes, of course. I loved you then. I love you now. Oliver. I've come back for you. Oliver, you don't understand. H how can I even think of such things today? Lenore, I had to come. I've waited so long. I couldn't wait a day longer. Can't you see? It's useless even to think about that now. He may still be alive. I know. But... No, it's not right to speak as you do. Not today. I was afraid you'd think so. Oh, no, I wanted to avoid this, but now I see I must tell you. Lenore, 
Neither of us knew Albert Lockridge. After all, Oliver, I've lived with I him. I still don't think you ever really knew him. I never did, even though I worked with him for many years. That is, until the day we stood in the great hall of the old Aztec temple. The temple we found on that last expedition. The one from which I was not supposed to come back from. We were trying to find a door to an inner chamber. There must be an opening here somewhere, Wentworth. In every Aztec temple ever found, there was always a room near the altar used to keep ceremonial objects. I know, I know. Now, wait a minute. Hmm? Sounds like a little hollow here. Now, what about that slab on the floor? What about it? I think that it might... It certainly sounds different. If I were an Aztec priest, and I stepped on it like... This. What? Went with the door. We found the door. Solid stone. And still working after all these centuries. Let's take a look inside. You got the flashlight? Yes, take the hammer. Right. Uh Oh. It's not very pretty. Uh, It is a human skeleton, isn't it? Yes. Probably trapped in here and left to die. Ugly death. Look, Lockridge. Those dishes. Hmm, swing the flashlight over. Gold. Solid gold. There are more over here. Look, stacks of them. What? We found the treasure. Now, now, wait a minute, Lockridge. Let's get this straight. In the first place, I don't think we'd be let out of the country with these gold plates. How about we, we can melt them down and smuggle them out? Melt them down? Now, these things are priceless. Besides, the university sent us here. If the gold belongs to anyone, it's there. No one ever has to know. Oh, yes, they do, because I'll tell them. Huh? Huh. It's all very well for you to play the heroic fool. You've everything you want. What the devil do you mean? You know perfectly well. You've got all the money you need. Besides, you have Lenore. What's she got to do with it? You do have Lenore, haven't you? You act as if I took her from you. You were afraid of me. Oh, Lockridge, don't be an idiot. Lenore would no more look at you than... Oh, wouldn't she? She'd marry me if you weren't in the way. I know it. Oh, you fool. She's just being friendly to you because I asked her. We'll see. If you weren't around... But I am around. And as far as the gold plates are concerned... I said we'll see. After all, that skeleton there, he was once a man, too. Until he was trapped in here. What of it? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Nothing except... I was there in the dark. Flashlight, the gold plates gone. Left there to die. Trapped behind a stone door. Oh, no, Oliver, no. When Albert Lockridge closed that door in his heart, in his twisted brain, there was only one intention. Murder. How did you get out? By luck more than anything else. I had the hammer and I knew where the stone latch was. I started chipping away at it. This day, I don't know how long it took me, but when I finally got out, I was a sick man, exhausted. And by the time I was well enough to travel, come home here, you were already married. And he told me that you'd been killed by natives. Of course, that was a lie, but... Oliver, I still can't believe that your story is completely true either. But why? A man who's been the victim of an attempted murder would see that the murderer was punished. You didn't. Didn't even try to. Well, Lenore, how could I? He was your husband. Well, why should that? Could I brand you as the wife of a murderer? Loving you as I did, as I do? I had to wait. But now let's forget this horrible past. I can't, no matter how I feel I can't. After all, there's no proof. Lenore, don't you believe me? It's not just that. Don't you see? At any moment, the telephone may ring, telling me that he's alive. If I knew your story were true, perhaps I'd feel differently, but... Now my place is here. I must stay here. No, no, please. If you feel any love for me at all... Will you go, Oliver? Please. If that's what you wish. Yes, Lenore. I'll go. But remember, I love you. I don't know why it should matter now, but I still hope you told the truth, Oliver, for then. The papers in the sealed envelope. 
I promised Dr. George I'd read. And... Lenore, there are many things on my mind as I sit writing this last word to you. Many things which no human mind should have to bear without telling another. As I look over my life, I know now it has been an empty mind. I've never had a straightforward human emotion and acted on it. My work has been a sort of shadow play which gave my hollow existence an outward tinge of reality. No friend has really touched me, for I cannot be reached. I married you more out of perverse vanity than love. And yet, perhaps because of your loyalty, some spark of love has been kindled in me. Bear this in mind when you go out to the garden. For there, underneath the sundial, you will find a treasure of gold <laughs> which should take care of you when I cannot. I had intended to use this gold myself, but I could not because it might incriminate me in the murder of Oliver oh, Wentworth. People, People might I ask questions, but you... <gasps> the murder of Oliver Wentworth. Then his, sto his story was true. Oliver! Oh, Oliver! <laughs> Oliver! Gone. Well, he can't have gone far, and if I hurry... Oliver! Oliver! house. A man who is not dead, lying in his coffin, fighting for breath and waiting, waiting for an answer that will not come. A fitting payment for murder at of Mr. and Mrs. Albert Lockridge were played by Mr. and Mrs. Raymond Edward Johnson with music by Charles Paul. Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. 